Chapter Twenty Nine. I found that no genius in another could please me. My unfortunate paradoxes had entirely dried up that source of comfort. Goldsmith. One morning, some weeks after her arrival at Lowick, Dorothea. But why always Dorothea? Was her point of view the only possible one with regard to this marriage? I protest against all our interest, all our effort at understanding, being given to the young skins that look blooming in spite of trouble, for these too will get faded, and will know the older and more eating griefs which we are helping to neglect. In spite of the blinking eyes and the white moles objectionable to Celia, and the want of muscular curve which was morally painful to Sir James, Mr. Casaubon had an intense consciousness within him, and was spiritually a hungered like the rest of us. He had done nothing exceptional in marrying, nothing but what society sanctions, and considers an occasion for wreaths and bouquets. It had occurred to him that he must not any longer defer his intention of matrimony, and he had reflected that in taking a wife, a man of good position should expect and carefully choose a blooming young lady, the younger the better, because more educable and submissive, of a rank equal to his own, of religious principles, virtuous disposition, and good understanding. On such a young lady he would make handsome settlements, and he would neglect no arrangement for her happiness. In return, he should receive family pleasures and leave behind him that copy of himself which seemed so urgently required of a man, to the sonneteers of the sixteenth century. Times had altered since then, and no sonneteer had insisted on Mr. Casaubon's leaving a copy of himself. Moreover, he had not yet succeeded in issuing copies of his mythological key, but he had always intended to acquit himself by marriage, and the sense that he was fast leaving the years behind him that the world was getting dimmer and that he felt lonely, was a reason to him for losing no more time in overtaking domestic delights before they too were left behind by the years. And when he had seen Dorothea, he believed that he had found even more than he demanded. She might really be such a helpmate to him as would enable him to dispense with a hired secretary, an aid which Mr. Casaubon had never yet employed, and had a suspicious dread of. Mr. Casaubon was nervously conscious that he was expected to manifest a powerful mind. Providence, in its kindness, had supplied him with the wife he needed. A wife, a modest young lady, with the purely appreciative, unambitious abilities of her sex, is sure to think her husband's mind powerful whether Providence had taken equal care of Miss Brooke in presenting her with Mr. Casaubon was an idea which could hardly occur to him. Society never made the preposterous demand that a man should think as much about his own qualifications for making a charming girl happy as he thinks of hers for making himself happy, as if a man could choose not only his wife but his wife's husband or as if he were bound to provide charms for his posterity in his own person. When Dorothea accepted him with effusion, that was only natural, and Mr. Casaubon believed that his happiness was going to begin. He had not had much foretaste of happiness in his previous life. To know intense joy without a strong bodily frame, one must have an enthusiastic soul. Mr. Casaubon had never had a strong bodily frame, and his soul was sensitive without being enthusiastic. It was too languid to thrill out of self-consciousness into passionate delight. It went on fluttering in the swampy ground where it hatched, thinking of its wings and never flying. His experience was of that pitiable kind which shrinks from pity, and fears most of all that it should be known. It was that proud, narrow sensitiveness which has not mass enough to spare for transformation into sympathy, and quivers thread-like in small currents of self-preoccupation, or at best of an egoistic scrupulosity. And Mr. Casaubon had many scruples. He was capable of a severe self-restraint. He was resolute in being a man of honor according to the code. He would be unimpeachable by any recognized opinion. In conduct these ends had been attained. 
but the difficulty of making his key to all mythologies unimpeachable weighed like lead upon his mind, and the pamphlets, or pererga, as he called them, by which he tested his public and deposited small monumental records of his march, were far from having been seen in all their significance. He suspected the archdeacon of not having read them. He was in painful doubt as to what was really thought of them by the leading minds of Brasenose, and bitterly convinced that his old acquaintance Carp had been the writer of that depreciatory recension which was kept locked in a small drawer of Mr. Casabon's desk, and also in a dark closet of his verbal memory. These were heavy impressions to struggle against, and brought that melancholy embitterment which is the consequence of all excessive claim. Even his religious faith wavered with his wavering trust in his own authorship, and the consolations of the Christian hope in immortality seemed to lean on the immorality of the still unwritten key to all mythologies. For my part, I am very sorry for him. It is an uneasy lot at best to be what we call highly taught and yet not to enjoy, to be present at this great spectacle of life and never to be liberated from a small, hungry, shivering self, never to be fully possessed by the glory we behold, never to have our consciousness rapturously transformed into the vividness of a thought, the ardor of a passion, the energy of an action, but always to be scholarly and uninspired, ambitious and timid, scrupulous and dim-sighted. Becoming a dean or a bishop would make little difference, I fear, to Mr. Casabon's uneasiness. Doubtless some ancient Greek has observed that, behind the big mask and the speaking trumpet, there must always be our poor little eyes peeping as usual, and our timorous lips more or less under anxious control. To this mental estate mapped out a quarter of a century before, to sensibilities thus fenced in, Mr. Casaubon had thought of annexing happiness with a lovely young bride, but even before marriage, as we have seen, he found himself under a new depression in the consciousness that the new bliss was not blissful to him. Inclination yearned back to its old, easier custom, and the deeper he went on in domesticity, the more did the sense of acquitting himself and acting with propriety predominate over any other satisfaction. Marriage, like religion and erudition, nay, like authorship itself, was fated to become an outward requirement, and Edward Casaubon was bent on fulfilling unimpeachably all requirements, even drawing Dorothea into use in his study, according to his intention before marriage, was an effort which he was always tempted to defer, and but for her pleading insistence it might never have begun. But she had succeeded in making it a matter of course that she should take her place at an early hour in the library and have work either of some reading aloud or copying assigned her. The work had been easier to define because Mr. Casbon had adopted an immediate intention. There was to be a new paragon, a small monograph on some lately traced indications concerning the Egyptian mysteries whereby certain assertions of Warburton's could be corrected. References were extensive even here, but not altogether shoreless, and sentences were actually to be written in the shape wherein they would be scanned by Brasenose and a less formidable posterity. These minor monumental productions were always exciting to Mr. Casaubon, Digestion was made difficult by the interference of citations, or by the rivalry of dialectical phrases ringing against each other in his brain. And from the first there was to be a Latin dedication about which everything was uncertain, except that it was not to be addressed to Carp. It was a poisonous regret to Mr. Casaubon that he had once addressed a dedication to Carp, in which he had numbered that member of the animal kingdom among the viros nullo evo perituros, a mistake which would infallibly lay the dedicator open to ridicule in the next age, and might even be chuckled over by Pike and Tench in the present. Thus Mr. Casaubon was in one of his busiest epochs, and as I began to say a little while ago, 
Dorothea joined him early in the library where he had breakfasted alone. Celia at this time was on a second visit to Lowick, probably the last before her marriage, and was in the drawing-room expecting Sir James. Dorothea had learned to read the signs of her husband's mood, and she saw that the morning had become more foggy there during the last hour. She was going silently to her desk when he said, in that distant tone which implied that he was discharging a disagreeable duty, "'Dorothea, here is a letter for you, which was enclosed in the one addressed to me.' It was a letter of two pages, and she immediately looked at the signature. "'Mr. Ladislaw, what can he have to say to me?' she exclaimed, in a tone of pleased surprise. "'But,' she added, looking at Mr. Casaubon, "'I can imagine what he has written to you about.' "'You can, if you please, read the letter,' said Mr. Casaubon, severely pointing to it with his pen, and not looking at her. "'But I may as well say beforehand that I must decline the proposal it contains to pay a visit here. I trust I may be excused for desiring an interval of complete freedom from such distractions as have been hitherto inevitable, and especially from guests whose desultory vivacity makes their presence a fatigue.' There had been no clashing of temper between Dorothea and her husband since that little explosion in Rome, which had left strong traces in her mind that it had been easier ever since to quell emotion than to incur the consequence of venting it. But this ill-tempered anticipation that she could desire visits which might be disagreeable to her husband, this gratuitous defense of himself against selfish complaint on her part, was too sharp a string to be meditated on until after it had been resented. Dorothea had thought that she could have been patient with John Milton, but she had never imagined him behaving in this way, and for a moment Mr. Casaubon seemed to be stupidly undiscerning and odiously unjust. Pity that newborn babe, which was by and by to rule many a storm within her, did not stride the blast on this occasion. With her first words, uttered in a tone that shook him, she startled Mr. Casaubon into looking at her, and meeting the flash of her eyes. "'Why do you attribute to me a wish for anything that would annoy you? You speak to me as if I were something you had to contend against. Wait at least till I appear to consult my own pleasure apart from yours.' "'Dorothea, you are hasty,' answered Mr. Casaubon, nervously. Decidedly, this woman was too young to be on the formidable level of wifehood, unless she had been pale and featureless, and taken everything for granted. "'I think it was you who were first hasty in your false suppositions about my feeling,' said Dorothea, in the same tone. The fire was not dissipated yet, and she thought it was ignoble in her husband not to apologize to her. "'We will, if you please, say no more on this subject, Dorothea.' "'We will, if you please, say no more on this subject, Dorothea. I have neither leisure nor energy for this kind of debate.' Here Mr. Casaubon dipped his pen, and made as if he would return to his writing, though his hand trembled so much that the words seemed to be written in an unknown character." There are answers which, in turning away wrath, only send it to the other end of the room, and to have a discussion coolly waived when you feel that justice is all on your own side is even more exasperating in marriage than in philosophy. Dorothea left Ladislaw's two letters unread on her husband's writing-table and went to her own place, the scorn and indignation within her rejecting the reading of these letters just as we hurl away any trash towards which we seem to have been suspected of mean cupidity. She did not in the least divine the subtle sources of her husband's bad temper about these letters. She only knew that they had caused him to offend her. She began to work at once, and her hand did not tremble. On the contrary, in writing out the quotations which had been given to her the day before, she felt that she was forming her letters beautifully, and it seemed to her that she saw the construction of the Latin she was copying, and which she was beginning to understand, more clearly than usual. 
In her indignation there was a sense of superiority, but it went out for the present in firmness of stroke and did not compress itself into an inward articulate voice pronouncing the once affable archangel a poor creature. There had been this apparent quiet for half an hour, and Dorothea had not looked away from her own table when she heard the loud bang of a book on the floor, and turning, quickly saw Mr. Casaubon on the library steps, clinging forward as if he were in some bodily distress. She started up and bounded towards him in an instant. He was evidently in great straits for breath. Jumping on a stool, she got close to his elbow, and said, with her whole soul melted into tender alarm, "'Can you lean on me, dear?' He was still for two or three minutes, which seemed endless to her, unable to speak or move, gasping for breath. When at last he descended the three steps, and fell backward in the large chair which Dorothea had drawn close to the foot of the ladder, he no longer gasped, but seemed helpless and about to faint. Dorothea rang the bell violently, and presently Mr. Casaubon was helped to the couch. He did not faint, and was gradually reviving, when Sir James Chetham came in, having been met in the hall with the news that Mr. Casaubon had had a fit in the library. "'Good God! This is just what might have been expected,' was his immediate thought. If his prophetic soul had been urged to particularize, it seemed to him that fits would have been the definite expression alighted upon. He asked his informant, the butler, whether the doctor had been sent for. The butler never knew his master to want the doctor before, but would it not be right to send for a physician? When Sir James entered the library, however, Mr. Casaubon could make some signs of his usual politeness, and Dorothea, who in the reaction from her first terror had been kneeling and sobbing by his side, now rose and herself proposed that someone should ride off for a medical man. "'I recommend you to send for Lydgate,' said Sir James. "'My mother has called him in, and she has found him uncommonly clever. She has had a poor opinion of the physicians since my father's death.' Dorothea appealed to her husband, and he made a silent sign of approval. So Mr. Lydgate was sent for, and he came wonderfully soon for the messenger, who was Sir James Chetham's man and knew Mr. Lydgate, met him leading his horse along the Lowick Road and giving his arm to Miss Vincy. Celia, in the drawing-room, had known nothing of the trouble till Sir James told her of it. After Dorothea's account, he no longer considered the illness a fit, but still something of that nature. "'Poor dear Dodo! How dreadful!' said Celia feeling as much grieved as her own perfect happiness would allow. Her little hands were clasped and enclosed by Sir James as a bud is enfolded by a liberal calyx. It is very shocking that Mr. Casaubon should be ill, but I never did like him, and I think he is not half fond of Dorothea, and he ought to be, for I am sure no one else would have had him. Do you think they would? "'I always thought it a horrible sacrifice of your sister,' said Sir James. "'Yes, but poor Dodo never did do what other people do, and I think she never will.' "'She is a noble creature,' said the loyal-hearted Sir James. He had just had a fresh impression of this kind, as he had seen Dorothea stretching her tender arm under her husband's neck and looking at him with unspeakable sorrow." He did not know how much penitence there was in the sorrow. Yes, said Celia, thinking it was very well for Sir James to say so, but he would not have been comfortable with Dodo. Shall I go to her? Could I help her, do you think? I think it would be well for you just to go and see her before Lydgate comes, said Sir James, magnanimously. Only don't stay long. While Celia was gone, he walked up and down, remembering what he had originally felt about Dorothea's engagement, and feeling a revival of his disgust at Mr. Brooke's indifference. If Cadwallader, if every one else had regarded the affair as he, Sir James, had done, the marriage might have been hindered. It was wicked to let a young girl blindly decide her fate in that way, without any effort to save her. Sir James had long ceased to have any regrets on his own account. 
his heart was satisfied with his engagement to Celia. But he had a chivalrous nature. Was not the disinterested service of woman among the ideal glories of old chivalry? His disregarded love had not turned to bitterness. Its death had made sweet odors, floating memories that clung with a consecrating effect to Dorothea. He could remain her brotherly friend, interpreting her actions with generous trustfulness. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 Qui vu de la seur de propos, las, Pascal. Mr. Casaubon had no second attack of equal severity with the first, and in a few days began to recover his usual condition. But Lydgate seemed to think the case worth a great deal of attention. He not only used his stethoscope, which had not become a matter of course in practice at that time, but sat quietly by his patient and watched him. To Mr. Casbon's questions about himself, he replied that the source of the illness was the common error of intellectual men, a too eager and monotonous application. The remedy was to be satisfied with moderate work and to seek a variety of relaxation. Mr. Brooke, who sat by on one occasion, suggested that Mr. Casbon should go fishing, as Cadwallader did, and have a turning room make toys, table legs, and that kind of thing. "'In short, you recommend me to anticipate the arrival of my second childhood,' said poor Mr. Casaubon, with some bitterness. "'These things,' he added, looking at Lydgate, "'would be to me such relaxation as toe-picking is to prisoners in a house of correction.' "'I confess,' said Lydgate, smiling, Amusement is a rather unsatisfactory prescription. It is something like telling people to keep up their spirits. Perhaps I had better say that you must submit to be mildly bored rather than to go on working. Yes, yes, said Mr. Brooke. Get Dorothea to play backgammon with you in the evenings. And shuttlecock now. I don't know a finer game than shuttlecock for the daytime. I remember it all the fashion— to be sure, your eyes might not stand that, Casabon, But you must unbend, you know. Why, you might take to some light study. Conchology, now. I always think that must be a light study. Or get Dorothea to read you light things. Smollett, Roderick Random, Humphrey Clinker. They are a little broad, but she may read anything now she's married, you know. I remember they made me laugh uncommonly. There's a droll bit about a postilion's breeches. We have no such humor now. I've gone through all these things, but they might be rather new to you. As new as eating thistles would have been an answer to represent Mr. Casaubon's feelings. But he only bowed resignedly, with due respect to his wife's uncle, and observed that, doubtless the works he mentioned, had served as a resource to a certain order of minds. "'You see,' said the able magistrate to Lydgate when they were outside the door, "'Casabon has been a little narrow. It leaves him rather at a loss when you forbid him his particular work, which I believe is something very deep indeed, in the line of research you know. I would never give way to that. I was always versatile. But a clergyman is tied a little tight. If they would make him a bishop now, he did a very good pamphlet for Peel.' He would have more movement then, more show. He might get a little flesh. But I recommend you to talk to Mrs. Casaubon. She is clever enough for anything, is my niece. Tell her her husband wants liveliness, diversion. Put her on amusing tactics. Without Mr. Brooke's advice, Lydgate had determined on speaking to Dorothea. She had not been present while her uncle was throwing out his pleasant suggestions as to the mode in which life at Lowick might be enlivened, but she was usually by her husband's side, and the unaffected signs of intense anxiety in her face and voice about whatever touched his mind or health made a drama which Lydgate was inclined to watch. He said to himself that he was only doing right in telling her the truth about her husband's probable future, but he certainly thought also that it would be interesting to talk confidentially with her, 
a medical man likes to make psychological observations, and sometimes in the pursuit of such studies is too easily tempted into momentous prophecy, which life and death easily set at naught. Lydgate had often been satirical on this gratuitous prediction, and he meant now to be guarded. He asked for Mrs. Casaubon, but being told that she was out walking, he was going away, when Dorothea and Celia appeared, both glowing from their struggle with the March wind. When Lydgate begged to speak with her alone, Dorothea opened the library door which happened to be the nearest, thinking of nothing at that moment but what he might have to say about Mr. Casaubon. It was the first time she had entered this room since her husband had been taken ill, and the servant had chosen not to open the shutters. But there was light enough to read by from the narrow upper panes of the windows. "'You will not mind this sombre light,' said Dorothea, standing in the middle of the room. "'Since you forbade books, the library has been out of the question. But Mr. Casaubon will soon be here again, I hope. Is he not making progress?' "'Yes, much more rapid progress than I at first expected. Indeed, he is already nearly in his usual state of health.' "'Do you not fear that the illness will return?' said Dorothea, whose quick ear had detected some significance in Lydgate's tone. "'Such cases are peculiarly difficult to pronounce upon,' said Lydgate. "'The only point on which I can be confident is that it will be desirable to be very watchful on Mr. Casaubon's account, lest he should in any way strain his nervous power.' "'I beseech you to speak quite plainly,' said Dorothea, in an imploring tone. "'I cannot bear to think that there might be something which I did not know, and which, if I had known it, would have made me act differently.' The words came out like a cry. It was evident that they were the voice of some mental experience which lay not very far off. "'Sit down,' she added, placing herself on the nearest chair, and throwing off her bonnet and gloves, with an instinctive discarding of formality, where a great question of destiny was concerned. "'What you say now justifies my own view,' said Lydgate. "'I think it is one's function as a medical man to hinder regrets of that sort as far as possible. But I beg you to observe that Mr. Casaubon's case is precisely of the kind in which the issue is most difficult to pronounce upon. He may possibly live for fifteen years or more, without much worse health than he has had hitherto. Dorothea had turned very pale, and when Lydgate paused, she said in a low voice, "'You mean, if we are very careful?' "'Yes, careful against mental agitation of all kinds, and against excessive application. "'He would be miserable if he had to give up his work,' said Dorothea, with a quick prevision of that wretchedness. "'I am aware of that.' The only course is to try, by all means, direct and indirect, to moderate and vary his occupations. With a happy concurrence of circumstances, there is, as I said, no immediate danger from that affection of the heart, which I believe to have been the cause of his late attack. On the other hand, it is possible that the disease may develop itself more rapidly. It is one of those cases in which death is sometimes sudden. Nothing should be neglected which might be affected by such an issue. There was silence for a few moments, while Dorothea sat as if she had been turned to marble, though the life within her was so intense that her mind had never before swept in brief time over an equal range of scenes and motives. "'Help me, pray,' she said at last, in the same low voice as before. "'Tell me what I can do.' "'What do you think of foreign travel? You have been lately in Rome, I think.' The memories which made this resource utterly hopeless were a new current that shook Dorothea out of her pallid immobility. "'Oh, that would not do. That would be worse than anything,' she said with a more childlike despondency, while the tears rolled down. "'Nothing will be of any use that he does not enjoy.' "'I wish that I could have spared you this pain,' said Lydgate, deeply touched, yet wondering about her marriage. Women just like Dorothea had not entered into his traditions. "'It was right of you to tell me. I thank you for telling me the truth.' 
I wish you to understand that I shall not say anything to enlighten Mr. Casaubon himself. I think it desirable for him to know nothing more than that he must not overwork himself, and must observe certain rules. Anxiety of any kind would be precisely the most unfavorable condition for him. Lydgate rose, and Dorothea mechanically rose at the same time, unclasping her cloak and throwing it off as if it stifled her. He was bowing and quitting her, when an impulse which, if she had been alone, would have turned into a prayer, made her say, with a sob in her voice, "'Oh, you are a wise man, are you not? You know all about life and death. Advise me. Think what I can do. He has been laboring all his life and looking forward. He minds about nothing else, and I mind about nothing else.' For years after, Lydgate remembered the impression produced in him by this involuntary appeal, this cry from soul to soul, without other consciousness than their moving with kindred natures in the same embroiled medium, the same troublous, fitfully illuminated life. But what could he say now, except that he should see Mr. Casaubon again to-morrow? When he was gone, Dorothea's tears gushed forth and relieved her stifling oppression. Then she dried her eyes, reminded that her distress must not be betrayed to her husband, and looked round the room thinking that she must order the servant to attend to it as usual, since Mr. Casaubon might now at any moment wish to enter. On his writing-table there were letters which had lain untouched since the morning when he was taken ill, and among them, as Dorothea well remembered, there were young Ladislaw's letters, the one addressed to her still unopened. The associations of these letters had been made the more painful by that sudden attack of illness which she felt that the agitation caused by her anger might have helped to bring on. It would be time enough to read them when they were again thrust upon her, and she had no inclination to fetch them from the library. But now it occurred to her that they should be put out of her husband's sight, Whatever might have been the sources of his annoyance about them, he must, if possible, not be annoyed again. And she ran her eyes first over the letter addressed to him, to assure herself whether or not it would be necessary to write in order to hinder the offensive visit. Will wrote from Rome, and began by saying that his obligations to Mr. Casaubon were too deep for all thanks not to seem impertinent. It was plain that if he were not grateful, he must be the poorest spirited rascal who had ever found a generous friend. To expand in wordy thanks would be like saying, I am honest. But Will had come to perceive that his defects, which Mr. Casaubon had himself often pointed to, needed for their correction that more strenuous position which his relative's generosity had hitherto prevented from being inevitable. He trusted that he should make the best return if return were possible, by showing the effectiveness of the education for which he was indebted, and by ceasing in future to need any diversion towards himself of funds on which others might have a better claim. He was coming to England to try his fortune, as many other men were obliged to do whose only capital was in their brains. A friend, Naumann, had desired him to take charge of the dispute the picture painted for Mr. Casaubon, with whose permission, and Mrs. Casaubon's, Will would convey it to Lowick in person. A letter addressed to the poste restante in Paris within the fortnight would hinder him, if necessary, from arriving at an inconvenient moment. He enclosed a letter to Mrs. Casaubon, in which he continued a discussion about art, begun with her in Rome. Opening her own letter, Dorothea saw that it was a lively continuation of his remonstrance with her fanatical sympathy and her want of sturdy, neutral delight in things as they were, an outpouring of his young vivacity, which it was impossible to read just now. She had immediately to consider what was to be done about the other letter. There was still time, perhaps, to prevent Will from coming to Lowick. Dorothea ended by giving the letter to her uncle, who was still in the house, and begging him to let Will know that Mr. Casaubon had been ill, and that his health would not allow the reception of any visitors. 
no one more ready than Mr. Brooke to write a letter. His only difficulty was to write a short one, and his ideas in this case expanded over the three large pages and the inward foldings. He had simply said to Dorothea, "'To be sure, I will write, my dear. He's a very clever young fellow, this young Ladislaw. I dare say will be a rising young man. It's a good letter. Marks his sense of things, you know. However, I will tell him about Casabon. But the end of Mr. Brooke's pen was a thinking organ, evolving sentences, especially of a benevolent kind, before the rest of his mind could well overtake them. It expressed regrets and proposed remedies, which, when Mr. Brooke read them, seemed felicitously worded, surprisingly the right thing, and determined a sequel which he had never before thought of. In this case, his pen found it such a pity young Ladislaw should not have come into the neighborhood just at that time, in order that Mr. Brooke might have his acquaintance more fully, and that they might go over the long-neglected Italian drawings together. It also felt such an interest in a young man who was starting in life with a stock of ideas, that by the end of the second page it had persuaded Mr. Brooke to invite young Ladislaw, since he could not be received at Lowick, to come to Tipton Grange. Why not? They could find a great many things to do together, and this was a period of peculiar growth. The political horizon was expanding, and, in short, Mr. Brooke's pen went off into a little speech which it had lately reported for that imperfectly edited organ, the Middlemarch Pioneer. While Mr. Brooke was sealing this letter, he felt elated with an influx of dim projects, a young man capable of putting ideas into form, the pioneer purchased to clear the pathway for a new candidate, documents utilized, who knew what might come of it all? Since Celia was going to marry immediately, it would be very pleasant to have a young fellow at table with him, at least for a time. But he went away without telling Dorothea what he had put into the letter, for she was engaged with her husband, and, in fact, these things were of no importance to her. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 How will you know the pitch of that great bell too large for you to stir? Let but a flute play neath the fine mixed metal, listen close, till the right note flows forth, a silvery rill. Then shall the huge bell tremble, then the mass with myriad waves concurrent shall respond, in low, soft unison. Lydgate that evening spoke to Miss Vincy of Mrs. Casaubon, and laid some emphasis on the strong feeling she appeared to have for that formal, studious man, thirty years older than herself. "'Of course she is devoted to her husband,' said Rosamond, implying a notion of necessary sequence, which the scientific man regarded as the prettiest possible for a woman. But she was thinking at the same time that it was not so very melancholy to be mistress of Lowick Manor, with a husband likely to die soon. "'Do you think her very handsome?' "'She certainly is handsome, but I have not thought about it,' said Lydgate. "'I suppose it would be unprofessional,' said Rosamond, dimpling. "'But how your practice is spreading! You were called in before to the Chettams, I think, and now the Casabons.' "'Yes,' said Lydgate, in a tone of compulsory admission but I don't really like attending such people so well as the poor. The cases are more monotonous, and one has to go through more fuss and listen more deferentially to nonsense. Not more than in Middlemarch, said Rosamond. At least you go through wide corridors and have the scent of rose-leaves everywhere. That is true, Mademoiselle de Montmorency, said Lydgate, just bending his head to the table and lifting with his fourth finger her delicate handkerchief which lay at the mouth of her reticule, as if to enjoy its scent, while he looked at her with a smile. But this agreeable holiday freedom, with which Lydgate hovered about the flower of Middlemarch, could not continue indefinitely. It was not more possible to find social isolation in that town than elsewhere, and two people persistently flirting could by no means escape from the various entanglements, weights, blows, clashings, motions, by which things severally go on. 
Whatever Miss Vincy did must be remarked, and she was perhaps the more conspicuous to admirers and critics, because just now Mrs. Vincy, after some struggle, had gone with Fred to stay a little while at Stone Court, there being no other way of at once gratifying old Featherstone and keeping watch against Mary Garth, who appeared a less tolerable daughter-in-law in proportion as Fred's illness disappeared. Aunt Bulstrode, for example, came a little oftener into Lowick Gate to see Rosamond, now she was alone. For Mrs. Bulstrode had a true sisterly feeling for her brother, always thinking that he might have married better, but wishing well to the children. Now Mrs. Bulstrode had a long-standing intimacy with Mrs. Plymdale. They had nearly the same preferences in silks, patterns for underclothing, chinaware and clergymen. They confided their little troubles of health and household management to each other, and various little points of superiority on Mrs. Bulstrode's side, namely, more decided seriousness, more admiration for mind, and a house outside the town, sometimes served to give color to their conversation without dividing them, well-meaning women both, knowing very little of their own motives. Mrs. Bulstrode, paying a morning visit to Mrs. Plymdale, happened to say that she could not stay longer, because she was going to see poor Rosamond. "'Why do you say poor Rosamond?' said Mrs. Plymdale, a round-eyed, sharp little woman, like a tamed falcon. She is so pretty, and has been brought up in such thoughtlessness. The mother, you know, had always that levity about her which makes me anxious for the children. "'Well, Harriet, if I am to speak my mind,' said Mrs. Plymdale, with emphasis, "'I must say, anybody would suppose you and Mr. Bulstrode would be delighted with what has happened, for you have done everything to put Mr. Lydgate forward.' "'Selina, what do you mean?' said Mrs. Bulstrode, in genuine surprise. "'Not but what I am truly thankful for Ned's sake,' said Mrs. Plymdale. "'He could certainly better afford to keep such a wife than some people can. But I should wish him to look elsewhere. Still, a mother has anxieties, and some young men would take to a bad life in consequence. Besides, if I was obliged to speak, I should say I was not fond of strangers coming into a town. "'I don't know, Selina,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, with a little emphasis in her turn. "'Mr. Bulstrode was a stranger here at one time. Abraham and Moses were strangers in the land, and we are told to entertain strangers. And especially,' she added after a slight pause, "'when they are unexceptionable.' "'I was not speaking in a religious sense, Harriet. I spoke as a mother.' "'Selina, I am sure you have never heard me say anything against a niece of mine marrying your son.' "'Oh, it is pride in Miss Vincy. I am sure it is nothing else,' said Mrs. Plymdale, who had never before given all her confidence to Harriet on this subject. "'No young man in Middlemarch was good enough for her. I have heard her mother say as much. That is not a Christian spirit, I think.' But now, from all I hear, she has found a man as proud as herself. "'You don't mean that there is anything between Rosamond and Mr. Lydgate,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, rather mortified at finding out her own ignorance. "'Is it possible you don't know, Harriet?' "'Oh, I go about so little, and I am not fond of gossip. I really never hear any. You see so many people that I don't see. Your circle is rather different from ours.' "'Well,' but your own niece, and Mr. Bulstrode's great favorite, and yours too, I am sure, Harriet. I thought at one time you meant him for Kate, when she is a little older. I don't believe there can be anything serious at present, said Mrs. Bulstrode. My brother would certainly have told me. Well, people have different ways, but I understand that nobody can see Miss Vincy and Mr. Lydgate together without taking them to be engaged. However, it is not my business. Shall I put up the pattern of mittens? After this, Mrs. Bulstrode drove to her niece with a mind newly weighted. She was herself handsomely dressed, but she noticed with a little more regret than usual that Rosamond, who was just come in and met in her walking dress, was almost as expensively equipped. 
Mrs. Bulstrode was a feminine, smaller edition of her brother, and had none of her husband's low-toned pallor. She had a good, honest glance, and used no circumlocution. "'You are alone, I see, my dear,' she said, as they entered the drawing-room together, looking round gravely. Rosamond felt sure that her aunt had something particular to say, and they sat down near each other. Nevertheless, the quilling inside Rosamond's bonnet was so charming that it was impossible not to desire the same kind of thing for Kate, and Mrs. Bulstrode's eyes, which were rather fine, rolled round that ample quilled circuit while she spoke. "'I have just heard something about you that has surprised me very much, Rosamond. "'What is that, aunt?' Rosamond's eyes were also roaming over her aunt's large embroidered collar. "'I can hardly believe it, that you should be engaged without my knowing it, without your father's telling me.' Here Mrs. Bulstrode's eyes finally rested on Rosamond's, who blushed deeply and said, "'I am not engaged, aunt.' "'How is it that every one says so, then, that it's the town's talk?' "'The town's talk is of very little consequence, I think.' said Rosamond, inwardly gratified. "'Oh, my dear, be more thoughtful. Don't despise your neighbors so. Remember, you are turned twenty-two now, and you will have no fortune. Your father, I am sure, will not be able to spare you anything. Mr. Lydgate is very intellectual and clever. I know there is an attraction in that. I like talking to such men myself, and your uncle finds him very useful.' but the profession is a poor one here. To be sure, this life is not everything, but it is seldom a medical man has true religious views. There is too much pride of intellect, and you are not fit to marry a poor man. Mr. Lydgate is not a poor man, aunt. He has very high connections. He told me himself he was poor. That is because he is used to people who have a high style of living. My dear Rosamond, you must not think of living in high style. Rosamond looked down and played with her reticule. She was not a fiery young lady, and had no sharp answers, but she meant to live as she pleased. Then it is really true, said Mrs. Bulstrode, looking very earnestly at her niece. You are thinking of Mr. Lydgate. There is some understanding between you, though your father doesn't know. Be open, my dear Rosamond. Mr. Lydgate has really made you an offer. Poor Rosamond's feelings were very unpleasant. She had been quite easy as to Lydgate's feeling and intention, but now when her aunt put this question, she did not like being unable to say yes. Her pride was hurt, but her habitual control of manner helped her. "'Pray excuse me, aunt. I would rather not speak on the subject.' "'You would not give your heart to a man without a decided prospect, I trust, my dear. "'And think of the two excellent offers I know of that you have refused, "'and one still within your reach if you will not throw it away. "'I knew a very great beauty who married badly at last by doing so. "'Mr. Ned Plymdale is a nice young man, some might think good-looking, and an only son.' and a large business of that kind is better than a profession. Not that marrying is everything. I would have you seek first the kingdom of God. But a girl should keep her heart within her own power. I should never give it to Mr. Ned Plymdale if it were. I have already refused him. If I loved, I should love at once and without change, said Rosamond, with a great sense of being a romantic heroine and playing the part prettily. "'I see how it is, my dear,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, in a melancholy voice, rising to go. "'You have allowed your affections to be engaged without return.' "'No, indeed, aunt,' said Rosamond, with emphasis. "'Then you are quite confident that Mr. Lydgate has a serious attachment to you?' Rosamond's cheeks by this time were persistently burning, and she felt much mortification. She chose to be silent— and her aunt went away all the more convinced. Mr. Bulstrode, in things worldly and indifferent, was disposed to do what his wife bade him, and she now, without telling her reasons, desired him on the next opportunity to find out in conversation with Mr. Lydgate whether he had any intention of marrying soon. 
the result was a decided negative. Mr. Bulstrode, on being cross-questioned, showed that Lydgate had spoken as no man would who had any attachment that could issue in matrimony. Mrs. Bulstrode now felt that she had a serious duty before her, and she soon managed to arrange a tete-a-tete -tete with Lydgate, in which she passed from inquiries about Fred Vincy's health and expressions of her sincere anxiety for her brother's large family, to general remarks on the dangers which lay before young people with regard to their settlement in life. Young men were often wild and disappointing, making little return for the money spent on them, and a girl was exposed to many circumstances which might interfere with her prospects. "'Especially when she has great attractions, and her parents see much company,' said Mrs. Bulstrode. "'Gentlemen pay her attention, and engross her all to themselves, for the mere pleasure of the moment, and that drives off others. I think it is a heavy responsibility, Mr. Lydgate, to interfere with the prospects of any girl.' Here Mrs. Bulstrode fixed her eyes on him, with an unmistakable purpose of warning, if not of rebuke. Clearly, said Lydgate, looking at her, perhaps even staring a little in return, on the other hand, a man must be a great coxcomb to go about without a notion that he must not pay attention to a young lady lest she should fall in love with him, or lest others should think she must. Oh, Mr. Lydgate, you know well what your advantages are. You know that our young men here cannot cope with you. When you frequent a house, it may militate very much against a girl's making a desirable settlement in life, and prevent her from accepting offers even if they are made. Lydgate was less flattered by his advantage over Middlemarch Orlando's than he was annoyed by the perception of Mrs. Bulstrode's meaning. She felt that she had spoken as impressively as it was necessary to do, and that in using the superior word militate, she had thrown a noble drapery over a mass of particulars which were still evident enough. Lydgate was fuming a little, pushed his hair back with one hand, felt curiously in his waistcoat pocket with the other, and then stooped to beckon the tiny black spaniel, which had the insight to decline his hollow caresses. It would not have been decent to go away, because he had been dining with other guests, and had just taken tea. But Mrs. Bulstrode, having no doubt that she had been understood, turned the conversation. Solomon's Proverbs, I think, have omitted to say that as the sore palate findeth grit, so an uneasy consciousness heareth innuendos. The next day Mr. Fairbrother, parting from Lydgate in the street, supposed that they should meet at Vincy's in the evening. Lydgate answered curtly, no, he had work to do. He must give up going out in the evening. What? You're going to get lashed to the mast, eh? And are stopping your ears? said the vicar. Well, if you don't mean to be won by the sirens, you are right to take precautions in time. A few days before, Lydgate would have taken no notice of these words as anything more than the vicar's usual way of putting things. They seemed now to convey an innuendo which confirmed the impression that he had been making a fool of himself, and behaving so as to be misunderstood. Not, he believed, by Rosamond herself. She, he felt sure, took everything as lightly as he intended it. She had an exquisite tact and insight in relation to all points of manners, but the people she lived among were blunderers and busybodies. However, the mistake should go no farther. He resolved, and kept his resolution, that he would not go to Mr. Vincy's except on business. Rosamond became very unhappy. The uneasiness first stirred by her aunt's questions grew and grew, till at the end of ten days that she had not seen Lydgate, it grew into a terror at the blank that might possibly come, into foreboding of that ready, fatal sponge which so cheaply wipes out the hopes of mortals. The world would have a new dreariness for her, as a wilderness that a magician's spells had turned for a little while into a garden. 
She felt that she was beginning to know the pang of disappointed love, and that no other man could be the occasion of such delightful aerial building as she had been enjoying for the last six months. Poor Rosamond lost her appetite, and felt as forlorn as Ariadna, as a charming stage Ariadna left behind with all her boxes full of costumes and no hope of a coach. There are many wonderful mixtures in the world which are all alike called love, and claim the privileges of a sublime rage which is an apology for everything, in literature and the drama. Happily Rosamond did not think of committing any desperate act. She plaited her fair hair as beautifully as usual, and kept herself proudly calm. Her most cheerful supposition was that her aunt Bulstrode had interfered in some way to hinder Lydgate's visits. Everything was better than a spontaneous indifference in him. Any one who imagines ten days too short a time, not for falling into leanness, lightness, or other measurable effects of passion, but for the whole spiritual circuit of alarmed conjecture and disappointment, is ignorant of what can go on in the elegant leisure of a young lady's mind. On the eleventh day, however, Lydgate, when leaving Stone Court, was requested by Mrs. Vincy to let her husband know that there was a marked change in Mr. Featherstone's health, and that she wished him to come to Stone Court on that day. Now Lydgate might have called at the warehouse, or might have written a message on a leaf of his pocket-book and left it at the door. Yet these simple devices apparently did not occur to him, from which we may conclude that he had no strong objection to calling at the house at an hour when Mr. Vincy was not at home, and leaving the message with Miss Vincy. A man may, from various motives, decline to give his company, but perhaps not even a sage would be gratified that nobody missed him. It would be a graceful, easy way of piecing on the new habits to the old, to have a few playful words with Rosamond about his resistance to dissipation, and his firm resolve to take long fasts even from sweet sounds. It must be confessed also that momentary speculations as to all the possible grounds for Mrs. Bulstrode's hints had managed to get woven like slight clinging hairs into the more substantial web of his thoughts. Miss Vincy was alone, and blushed so deeply when Lydgate came in that he felt a corresponding embarrassment, and, instead of any playfulness, he began at once to speak of his reason for calling, and to beg her, almost formally, to deliver the message to her father. Rosamond, who at the first moment felt as if her happiness were returning, was keenly hurt by Lydgate's manner. Her blush had departed, and she assented coldly, without adding an unnecessary word, some trivial chain-work which she had in her hands, enabling her to avoid looking at Lydgate higher than his chin. In all failures, the beginning is certainly the half of the whole. After sitting two long moments while he moved his whip, and could say nothing, Lydgate rose to go, and Rosamond, made nervous by her struggle between mortification and the wish not to betray it, dropped her chain as if startled, and rose too mechanically. Lydgate instantaneously stooped to pick up the chain. When he rose, he was very near to a lovely face, set on a fair long neck, which he had been used to see turning about under the most perfect management of self-contented grace. But as he raised his eyes now, he saw a certain helpless quivering which touched him quite newly, and made him look at Rosamond with a questioning flash. At this moment she was as natural as she had ever been when she was five years old. She felt that her tears had risen, and it was no use to try to do anything else than let them stay like water on a blue flower, or let them fall over her cheeks even as they would. That moment of naturalness was the crystallizing feather touch. It shook flirtation into love. Remember that the ambitious man who is looking at those forget-me-nots under the water was very warm-hearted and rash. He did not know where the chain went. An idea had thrilled through the recesses within him 
which had a miraculous effect in raising the power of passionate love lying buried there in no sealed sepulchre, but under the lightest, easily pierced mould. His words were quite abrupt and awkward, but the tone made them sound like an ardent, appealing avowal. "'What is the matter? You are distressed. Tell me, pray.' Rosamond had never been spoken to in such tones before. I am not sure that she knew what the words were, but she looked at Lydgate, and the tears fell over her cheeks. There could have been no more complete answer than the silence, and Lydgate, forgetting everything else, completely mastered by the outrush of tenderness at the sudden belief that this sweet young creature depended on him for her joy, actually put his arms round her, folding her gently and protectingly. He was used to being gentle with the weak and suffering, and kissed each of the two large tears. This was a strange way of arriving at an understanding, but it was a short way. Rosamond was not angry, but she moved backward a little in timid happiness, and Lydgate could now sit near her and speak less incompletely. Rosamond had to make her little confession, and he poured out words of gratitude and tenderness with impulsive lavishment. In half an hour he left the house an engaged man, whose soul was not his own, but the woman's to whom he had bound himself. He came again in the evening to speak with Mr. Vincy, who, just returned from Stone Court, was feeling sure that it would not be long before he heard of Mr. Featherstone's demise. The felicitous word, demise, which had seasonably occurred to him, had raised his spirits even above their usual evening pitch. The right word is always a power, and communicates its definiteness to our action. Considered as a demise, old Featherstone's death assumed a merely legal aspect, so that Mr. Vincy could tap his snuff-box over it and be jovial, without even an intermittent affectation of solemnity and Mr. Vincy hated both solemnity and affectation. Who was ever awestruck about a testator, or sang a hymn on the title to a real property? Mr. Vincy was inclined to take a jovial view of all things that evening. He even observed to Lydgate that Fred had got the family constitution after all, and would be as fine a fellow as ever again, and when his approbation of Rosamond's engagement was asked for, he gave it with astonishing facility, passing at once to general remarks on the desirableness of matrimony for young men and maidens, and apparently deducing from the whole the appropriateness of a little more punch. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 They'll take suggestion as a cat laps milk. Shakespeare, Tempest the triumphant confidence of the mayor founded on Mr. Featherstone's insistent demand that Fred and his mother should not leave him was a feeble emotion compared with all that was agitating the breasts of the old man's blood relations, who naturally manifested more their sense of the family tie, and were more visibly numerous now that he had become bedridden. Naturally, for when poor Peter had occupied his armchair in the wainscoted parlour, no assiduous beetles for whom the cook prepares boiling water could have been less welcome on a hearth which they had reasons for preferring than those persons whose featherstone blood was ill-nourished, not from penuriousness on their part, but from poverty. Brother Solomon and Sister Jane were rich, and the family candor and total abstinence from false politeness with which they were always received seemed to them no argument that their brother in the solemn act of making his will would overlook the superior claims of wealth. Themselves, at least, he had never been unnatural enough to banish from his house, and it seemed hardly eccentric that he should have kept away brother Jonah, sister Martha, and the rest, who had no shadow of such claims. They knew Peter's maxim, that money was a good egg, and should be laid in a warm nest. But Brother Jonah, Sister Martha, and all the needy exiles, held a different point of view. 
probabilities are as various as the faces to be seen at will in fretwork or paper hangings. Every form is there, from Jupiter to Judy, if you only look with creative inclination. To the poorer and least favored, it seemed likely that, since Peter had done nothing for them in his life, he would remember them at the last. Jonah argued that men liked to make a surprise of their wills, while Martha said that nobody need be surprised if he left the best part of his money to those who least expected it. Also, it was not to be thought, but that an own brother lying there with dropsy in his legs must come to feel that blood was thicker than water, and if he didn't alter his will, he might have money by him. At any rate, some blood relations should be on the premises and on the watch against those who were hardly relations at all. Such things had been known as forged wills and disputed wills, which seemed to have the golden hazy advantage of somehow enabling non-legatees to live out of them. Again, those who were no blood relations might be caught making away with things, and poor Peter lying there, helpless. Somebody should be on the watch. But in this conclusion they were at one with Solomon and Jane. Also, some nephews, nieces, and cousins, arguing with still greater subtlety as to what might be done by a man able to will away his property and give himself large treats of oddity, felt in a handsome sort of way that there was a family interest to be attended to, and thought of Stone Court as a place which it would be nothing but right for them to visit. Sister Martha, otherwise Mrs. Cranch, living with some wheeziness in the chalky flats, could not undertake the journey, but her son, as being poor Peter's own nephew, could represent her advantageously, and watch lest his uncle Jonah should make an unfair use of the improbable things which seemed likely to happen. In fact, there was a general sense running in the Featherstone blood that everybody must watch everybody else, and that it would be well for everybody else to reflect that the Almighty was watching him. Thus Stone Court continually saw one or other blood relation alighting or departing, and Mary Garth had the unpleasant task of carrying their messages to Mr. Featherstone, who would see none of them, and sent her down with the still more unpleasant task of telling them so. As manager of the household, she felt bound to ask them in good provincial fashion to stay and eat, but she chose to consult Mrs. Vincy on the point of extra downstairs consumption now that Mr. Featherstone was laid up. "'Oh, my dear, you must do things handsomely where there's last illness and a property. God knows I don't grudge them every ham in the house, only save the best for the funeral. Have some stuffed veal always, and a fine cheese in cut. You must expect to keep open house in these last illnesses.' said liberal Mrs. Vincy, once more of cheerful note and bright plumage. But some of the visitors alighted and did not depart after the handsome treating to veal and ham. Brother Jonah, for example, there are such unpleasant people in most families, perhaps even in the highest aristocracy, there are Brobdingnag specimens, gigantically in debt and bloated at greater expense. Brother Jonah, I say, having come down in the world, was mainly supported by a calling which he was modest enough not to boast of, though it was much better than swindling either on exchange or turf, but which did not require his presence at Brassing so long as he had a good corner to sit in and a supply of food. He chose the kitchen corner, partly because he liked it best, and partly because he did not want to sit with Solomon, concerning whom he had a strong brotherly opinion. Seated in a famous armchair and in his best suit, constantly within sight of good cheer, he had a comfortable consciousness of being on the premises, mingled with fleeting suggestions of Sunday and the bar at the Green Man, and he informed Mary Garth that he should not go out of reach of his brother Peter while that poor fellow was above ground. The troublesome ones in a family are usually either the wits or the idiots. Jonah was the wit among the Featherstones, 
and joked with the maid-servants when they came about the hearth, but seemed to consider Miss Garth a suspicious character, and followed her with cold eyes. Mary would have borne this one pair of eyes with comparative ease, but unfortunately there was a young Cranch, who, having come all the way from the chalky flats to represent his mother and watch his Uncle Jonah, also felt it his duty to stay and to sit chiefly in the kitchen to give his uncle company. Young Cranch was not exactly the balancing point between the wit and the idiot, verging slightly towards the latter type, and squinting so as to leave everything in doubt about his sentiments except that they were not of a forcible character. When Mary Garth entered the kitchen and Mr. Jonah Featherstone began to follow her with his cold, detective eyes, young Cranch, turning his head in the same direction, seemed to insist on it that she should remark how he was squinting, as if he did it with design, like the gypsies when Barrow read the New Testament to them. This was rather too much for poor Mary. Sometimes it made her bilious, sometimes it upset her gravity. One day that she had an opportunity, she could not resist describing the kitchen scene to Fred, who would not be hindered from immediately going to see it, affecting simply to pass through. But no sooner did he face the four eyes than he had to rush through the nearest door which happened to lead to the dairy, and there, under the high roof and among the pans, he gave way to laughter which made a hollow resonance perfectly audible in the kitchen. He fled by another doorway, but Mr. Jonah, who had not before seen Fred's white complexion, long legs, and pinched delicacy of face, prepared many sarcasms in which these points of appearance were wittily combined with the lowest moral attributes. "'Why, Tom, you don't wear such gentlemanly trousers. You haven't got half such fine long legs,' said Jonah to his nephew, winking at the same time to imply there was something more in these statements than their undeniableness. Tom looked at his legs, but left it uncertain whether he preferred his moral advantages to a more vicious length of limb and reprehensible gentility of trouser. In the large wainscoted parlor, too, there were constantly pairs of eyes on the watch, and own relatives eager to be sitters up. Many came, lunched, and departed, but Brother Solomon and the lady who had been Jane Featherstone for twenty-five years before she was Mrs. Wall found it good to be there every day for hours, without other calculable occupation than that of observing the cunning Mary Garth, who was so deep that she could be found out in nothing, and giving occasional dry, wrinkly indications of crying as if capable of torrents in a wetter season, at the thought that they were not allowed to go into Mr. Featherstone's room. For the old man's dislike of his own family seemed to get stronger as he got less able to amuse himself by saying biting things to them. Too languid to sting, he had the more venom refluent in his blood. Not fully believing the message sent through Mary Garth, they had presented themselves together within the door of the bedroom, both in black, Mrs. Wall having a white handkerchief partially unfolded in her hand, and both with faces in a sort of half-mourning purple, while Mrs. Vincy, with her pink cheeks and pink ribbons flying, was actually administering a cordial to their own brother, and the light-complexioned Fred, his short hair curling as might be expected in a gambler's, was lolling at his ease in a large chair. Old Featherstone no sooner caught sight of these funereal figures appearing in spite of his orders than rage came to strengthen him more successfully than the cordial. He was propped up on a bedrest and always had his gold-headed stick lying by him. He seized it now, and swept it backwards and forwards in as large an area as he could, apparently to ban these ugly specters, crying in a hoarse sort of screech, "'Back! Back, Mrs. Wall! Back, Solomon!' "'Oh, brother, Peter, 
Mrs. Wall began, but Solomon put his hand before her repressingly. He was a large-cheeked man, nearly seventy, with small furtive eyes, and was not only of much blander temper, but thought himself much deeper than his brother Peter, indeed not likely to be deceived in any of his fellow men, inasmuch as they could not well be more greedy and deceitful than he suspected them of being. Even the invisible powers, he thought, were likely to be soothed by a bland parenthesis here and there, coming from a man of property who might have been as impious as others. "'Brother Peter,' he said, in a wheedling yet gravely official tone, "'it's nothing but right I should speak to you about the three crofts and the manganese. The Almighty knows what I've got on my mind.' "'Then he knows more than I want to know,' said Peter, laying down his stick with a show of truce which had a threat in it, too, for he reversed the stick so as to make the gold handle a club in case of closer fighting, and looked hard at Solomon's bald head. "'There's things you might repent of, brother, for want of speaking to me,' said Solomon, not advancing, however. I could sit up with you to-night, and Jane with me, willingly, and you might take your own time to speak, or let me speak. Yes, I shall take my own time. You needn't offer me yours, said Peter. But you can't take your own time to die in, brother, began Mrs. Wall, with her usual woolly tone. And when you lie speechless, you may be tired of having strangers about you, and you may think of me and my children. But here her voice broke under the touching thought which she was attributing to her speechless brother, the mention of ourselves being naturally affecting. No, I shan't, said old Featherstone contradictiously. I shan't think of any of you. I've made my will, I tell you, I've made my will. Here he turned his head towards Mrs. Vincy, and swallowed some more of his cordial. Some people would be ashamed to fill up a place belonging by rights to others, said Mrs. Wall, turning her narrow eyes in the same direction. Oh, sister, said Solomon, with ironical softness, you and me are not fine and handsome and clever enough. We must be humble, and let smart people push themselves before us. Fred's spirit could not bear this. Rising and looking at Mr. Featherstone, he said, Shall my mother and I leave the room, sir, that you may be alone with your friends? Sit down, I tell you, said old Featherstone, snappishly. Stop where you are. Good-bye, Solomon, he added, trying to wield his stick again but failing now that he had reversed the handle. "'Good-bye, Mrs. Wall. Don't you come again.' "'I shall be downstairs, brother, whether or no,' said Solomon. "'I shall do my duty, and it remains to be seen what the Almighty will allow.' "'Yes, in property going out of families,' said Mrs. Wall, in continuation, "'and where there's steady young men to carry on.' but I pity them who are not such, and I pity their mothers. Good-bye, Brother Peter. Remember, I'm the eldest after you, brother, and prospered from the first just as you did, and have got land already by the name of Featherstone, said Solomon, relying much on that reflection, as one which might be suggested in the watches of the night. But I bid you good-bye for the present." Their exit was hastened by their seeing old Mr. Featherstone pull his wig on each side and shut his eyes with his mouth-widening grimace, as if he were determined to be deaf and blind. None the less they came to Stone Court daily and sat below at the post of duty, sometimes carrying on a slow dialogue in an undertone in which the observation and response were so far apart that any one hearing them might have imagined himself listening to speaking automata, in some doubt whether the ingenious mechanism would really work, or wind itself up for a long time in order to stick and be silent. Solomon and Jane would have been sorry to be quick. 
what that led to might be seen on the other side of the wall in the person of Brother Jonah. But their watch in the wainscoted parlor was sometimes varied by the presence of other guests from far or near. Now that Peter Featherstone was upstairs, his property could be discussed with all that local enlightenment to be found on the spot. Some rural and Middlemarch neighbors expressed much agreement with the family and sympathy with their interest against the Vincies, and feminine visitors were even moved to tears in conversation with Mrs. Wall when they recalled the fact that they themselves had been disappointed in times past by codicils and marriages for spite on the part of ungrateful elderly gentlemen who, it might have been supposed, had been spared for something better. Such conversation paused suddenly, like an organ when the bellows are let drop, if Mary Garth came into the room, and all eyes were turned on her as a possible legatee, or one who might get access to iron chests. But the younger men who were relatives or connections of the family were disposed to admire her in this problematic light, as a girl who showed much conduct, and who, among all the chances that were flying, might turn out to be at least a moderate prize. Hence she had her share of compliments and polite attentions. Especially from Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, a distinguished bachelor and auctioneer of those parts, much concerned in the sale of land and cattle, a public character, indeed, whose name was seen on widely distributed placards, and who might reasonably be sorry for those who did not know of him. He was a second cousin to Peter Featherstone, and had been treated by him with more amenity than any other relative, being useful in matters of business, and in that program of his funeral which the old man had himself dictated, he had been named as a bearer. There was no odious cupidity in Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, nothing more than a sincere sense of his own merit, which, he was aware, in case of rivalry, might tell against competitors, so that if Peter Featherstone, who, so far as he, Trumbull, was concerned, had behaved like as a good soul as ever breathed, should have done anything handsome by him, all he could say was that he had never fished and fawned, but had advised him to the best of his experience, which now extended over twenty years from the time of his apprenticeship at fifteen, and was likely to yield a knowledge of no surreptitious kind. His admiration was far from being confined to himself, but was accustomed professionally as well as privately to delight in estimating things at a high rate. He was an amateur of superior phrases, and never used poor language without immediately correcting himself, which was fortunate, as he was rather loud, and given to predominate, standing or walking about frequently, pulling down his waistcoat with the air of a man who is very much of his own opinion, trimming himself rapidly with his forefinger, and marking each new series in these movements by a busy play with his large seals. There was occasionally a little fierceness in his demeanor, but it was directed chiefly against false opinion, of which there is so much to correct in the world that a man of some reading and experience necessarily has his patience tried. He felt that the Featherstone family generally was of limited understanding, but being a man of the world and a public character, took everything as a matter of course, and even went to converse with Mr. Jonah and young Cranch in the kitchen, not doubting that he had impressed the latter greatly by his leading questions concerning the chalky flats. If anybody had observed that Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, being an auctioneer, was bound to know the nature of everything, he would have smiled and trimmed himself silently with the sense that he came pretty near that. On the whole, in an auctioneering way, he was an honorable man, not ashamed of his business, and feeling that the celebrated Peel, now Sir Robert, if introduced to him, would not fail to recognize his importance. "'I don't mind if I have a slice of that ham and a glass of that ale, Miss Garth, if you will allow me,' he said, coming into the parlor at half-past eleven, 
after having had the exceptional privilege of seeing old Featherstone, and standing with his back to the fire between Mrs. Wall and Solomon. "'It's not necessary for you to go out. Let me ring the bell.' "'Thank you,' said Mary. "'I have an errand.' "'Well, Mr. Trumbull, you're highly favoured said Mrs. Wall. "'What, seeing the old man?' said the auctioneer, playing with his seals dispassionately. "'Ah, you see, he has relied on me considerably.' Here he pressed his lips together, and frowned meditatively. "'Might anybody ask what their brother has been saying?' said Solomon, in a soft tone of humility, in which he had a sense of luxurious cunning, he being a rich man and not in need of it. "'Oh, yes, anybody may ask,' said Mr. Trumbull, with loud and good-humoured though cutting sarcasm. "'Anybody may interrogate.' Any one may give their remarks an interrogative turn, he continued, his sonorousness rising with his style. This is constantly done by good speakers, even when they anticipate no answer. It is what we call a figure of speech, speech at a high figure, as one may say. The eloquent auctioneer smiled at his own ingenuity. I shouldn't be sorry to hear he'd remembered you, Mr. Trumbull, said Solomon. I never was against the deserving. It's the undeserving I'm against. Ah, there it is, you see. There it is, said Mr. Trumbull significantly. It can't be denied that undeserving people have been legatees, and even residuary legatees. It is so with testamentary dispositions. Again he pursed up his lips and frowned a little. "'Do you mean to say for certain, Mr. Trumbull, that my brother has left his land away from our family?' said Mrs. Wall, on whom, as an unhopeful woman, those long words had a depressing effect. "'A man might as well turn his land into charity land at once as to leave it to some people,' observed Solomon, his sister's question having drawn no answer. "'What? Blue-coat land?' asked Mrs. Wall again. "'Oh, Mr. Trumbull, you never can mean to say that. "'It would be flying in the face of the Almighty that's prospered him.' "'While Mrs. Wall was speaking, Mr. Borthrop Trumbull "'walked away from the fireplace towards the window, "'patrolling with his forefinger round the inside of his stock, "'then along his whiskers and the curves of his hair. "'He now walked to Miss Garth's work-table, "'opened a book which lay there, and read the title aloud with pompous emphasis, as if he were offering it for sale. Anne of Geierstein, pronounced Jeerstein, or The Maiden of the Mist, by the author of Waverley. Then, turning the page, he began sonorously. The course of four centuries has well nigh elapsed since the series of events which are related in the following chapters took place on the continent. He pronounced the last truly admirable word with the accent on the last syllable, not as unaware of vulgar usage, but feeling that this novel delivery enhanced the sonorous beauty which his reading had given to the whole. And now the servant came in with the tray, so that the moments for answering Mrs. Wall's question had gone by safely, while she and Solomon, watching Mr. Trumbull's movements, were thinking that high learning interfered sadly with serious affairs. Mr. Borthrop Trumbull really knew nothing about old Featherstone's will, but he could hardly have been brought to declare any ignorance unless he had been arrested for misprision of treason. "'I shall take a mere mouthful of ham and a glass of ale,' he said reassuringly. "'As a man with public business,' I take a snack when I can. I will back this ham, he added, after swallowing some morsels with alarming haste, against any ham in the three kingdoms. In my opinion it is better than the hams at Freshet Hall, and I think I am a tolerable judge. Some don't like so much sugar in their hams, said Mrs. Wall, but my poor brother would always have sugar. If any person demands better, he is at liberty to do so, but 
God bless me, what an aroma! I should be glad to buy in that quality, I know. There is some gratification to a gentleman. Here Mr. Trumbull's voice conveyed an emotional remonstrance. In having this kind of ham set on his table. He pushed aside his plate, poured out his glass of ale, and drew his chair a little forward, profiting by the occasion to look at the inner side of his legs, which he stroked approvingly, Mr. Trumbull having all those less frivolous airs and gestures which distinguish the predominant races of the North. "'You have an interesting work there, I see, Miss Garth,' he observed, when Mary re-entered. "'It is by the author of Waverley, that is, Sir Walter Scott. "'I have bought one of his works myself, a very nice thing, a very superior publication, entitled Ivanhoe. "'You will not get any writer to beat him in a hurry, I think. "'He will not, in my opinion, be speedily surpassed.' I have just been reading a portion at the commencement of Anne of Jeerstein. It commences well. Things never began with Mr. Borthrop Trumbull. They always commenced, both in private life and on his handbills. You are a reader, I see. Do you subscribe to our Middlemarch Library? No, said Mary. Mr. Fred Vincy brought this book. I am a great bookman myself, returned Mr. Trumbull. I have no less than two hundred volumes in calf, and I flatter myself they are well selected. Also pictures by Murillo, Rubens, Teniers, Titian, Van Dyck, and others. I shall be happy to lend you any work you like to mention, Miss Garth. I am much obliged, said Mary, hastening away again, but I have little time for reading. I should say my brother has done something for her and his will, said Mr. Solomon, in a very low undertone, when she had shut the door behind her, pointing with his head towards the absent Mary. His first wife was a poor match for him, though, said Mrs. Wall. She brought him nothing, and this young woman is only her niece, and very proud, and my brother has always paid her wage. "'A sensible girl, though, in my opinion,' said Mr. Trumbull, finishing his ale and starting up with an emphatic adjustment of his waistcoat. "'I have observed her when she has been mixing medicine in drops. She minds what she is doing, sir. That is a great point in a woman, and a great point for our friend upstairs, poor dear old soul. A man whose life is of any value should think of his wife as a nurse.' That is what I should do if I married, and I believe I have lived single long enough not to make a mistake in that line. Some men must marry to elevate themselves a little, but when I am in need of that, I hope someone will tell me so. I hope some individual will apprise me of the fact. I wish you good morning, Mrs. Wall. Good morning, Mr. Solomon. I trust we shall meet under less melancholy auspices." When Mr. Trumbull had departed with a fine bow, Solomon, leaning forward, observed to his sister, "'You may depend, Jane. My brother has left that girl a lumping sum.' "'Anybody would think so, from the way Mr. Trumbull talks,' said Jane. Then, after a pause, "'He talks as if my daughter's wasn't to be trusted to give drops.' "'Auctioneers talk wild,' said Solomon." Not but what Trumbull has made money. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 Close up his eyes and draw the curtain close, and let us all to meditation. Henry the Sixth, Part 2 That night after twelve o'clock, Mary Garth relieved the watch in Mr. Featherstone's room, and sat there alone through the small hours. She often chose this task, in which she found some pleasure, notwithstanding the old man's testiness whenever he demanded her attentions. There were intervals in which she could sit perfectly still, enjoying the outer stillness and the subdued light. The red fire, with its gently audible movement, seemed like a solemn existence calmly independent of the petty passions, the imbecile desires, the straining after worthless uncertainties, which were daily moving her contempt. 
Mary was fond of her own thoughts, and could amuse herself well sitting in twilight with her hands in her lap, for, having early had strong reason to believe that things were not likely to be arranged for her peculiar satisfaction, she wasted no time in astonishment and annoyance at that fact. And she had already come to take life very much as a comedy in which she had a proud, nay, a generous resolution not to act the mean or treacherous part. Mary might have become cynical if she had not had parents whom she honored, and a well of affectionate gratitude within her, which was all the fuller because she had learned to make no unreasonable claims. She sat to-night revolving, as she was wont, the scenes of the day, her lips often curling with amusement at the oddities to which her fancy added fresh drollery. People were so ridiculous with their illusions, carrying their fools' caps unawares, thinking their own lies opaque while everybody else's were transparent, making themselves exceptions to everything, as if when all the world looked yellow under a lamp, they alone were rosy. Yet there were some illusions under Mary's eyes which were not quite comic to her. She was secretly convinced, though she had no other grounds than her close observation of old Featherstone's nature, that in spite of his fondness for having the Vincies about him, they were as likely to be disappointed as any of the relations whom he kept at a distance. She had a good deal of disdain for Mrs. Vincy's evident alarm, lest she and Fred should be alone together, but it did not hinder her from thinking anxiously of the way in which Fred would be affected if it should turn out that his uncle had left him as poor as ever. She could make a butt of Fred when he was present, but she did not enjoy his follies when he was absent. Yet she liked her thoughts. A vigorous young mind, not overbalanced by passion, finds a good in making acquaintance with life, and watches its own powers with interest. Mary had plenty of merriment within. Her thought was not veined by any solemnity or pathos about the old man on the bed. Such sentiments are easier to affect than to feel about an aged creature whose life is not visibly anything but a remnant of vices. She had always seen the most disagreeable side of Mr. Featherstone. He was not proud of her, and she was only useful to him. To be anxious about a soul that is always snapping at you must be left to the saints of the earth, and Mary was not one of them. She had never returned him a harsh word, and had waited on him faithfully, that was her utmost. Old Featherstone himself was not in the least anxious about his soul, and had declined to see Mr. Tucker on the subject. Tonight he had not snapped, and for the first hour or two he lay remarkably still, until at last Mary heard him rattling his bunch of keys against the tin box which he always kept in the bed beside him. About three o'clock he said, with remarkable distinctness, "'Missy, come here.' Mary obeyed, and found that he had already drawn the tin box from under the clothes, though he usually asked to have this done for him, and he had selected the key. Now he unlocked the box, and, drawing from it another key, looked straight at her with eyes that seemed to have recovered all their sharpness, and said, "'How many of them are in the house?' "'You mean of your own relations, sir?' said Mary, well used to the old man's way of speech." He nodded slightly, and she went on. "'Mr. Jonah Featherstone and young Cranch are sleeping here.' "'Oh, ay, they stick, do they? And the rest, they come every day, I'll warrant, Solomon and Jane and all the young uns. They come peeping and counting and casting up. Not all of them every day. Mr. Solomon and Mrs. Wall are here every day, and the others come often.' The old man listened with a grimace while she spoke, and then said, relaxing his face, "'The more fools they. You hearken, Missy. It's three o'clock in the morning, and I've got all my faculties as well as ever I had in my life. I know all my property, and where the money's put out, and everything. And I've made everything ready to change my mind and do as I like at the last. Do you hear, Missy? I've got my faculties.' 
"'Well, sir,' said Mary, quietly. He now lowered his tone with an air of deeper cunning. "'I've made two wills, and I'm going to burn one. Now, you do as I tell you. This is the key of my iron chest in the closet there. You push well at the side of the brass plate at the top till it goes like a bolt. Then you can put the key in the front lock and turn it. See and do that, and take out the topmost paper, last will and testament, big printed. No, sir, said Mary in a firm voice, I cannot do that. Not do it? I tell you, you must, said the old man, his voice beginning to shake under the shock of this resistance. I cannot touch your iron chest or your will. I must refuse to do anything that might lay me open to suspicion. I tell you, I'm in my right mind. Shan't I do as I like at the last? I made two wills on purpose. Take the key, I say. No, sir, I will not, said Mary, more resolutely still. Her repulsion was getting stronger. I tell you, there's no time to lose. I cannot help that, sir. I will not let the close of your life soil the beginning of mine. I will not touch your iron chest or your will. She moved to a little distance from the bedside. The old man paused with blank stare for a little while, holding the one key erect on the ring. Then, with an agitated jerk, he began to work with his bony left hand at emptying the tin box before him. Missy, he began to say hurriedly, look here. Take the money, the notes, and gold. Look here. Take it. Y you shall have it all. Do as I tell you. He made an effort to stretch out the key towards her as far as possible, and Mary again retreated. I will not touch your key or your money, sir. Pray don't ask me to do it again. If you do, I must go and call your brother. He let his hand fall, and for the first time in her life, Mary saw old Peter Featherstone begin to cry childishly. She said, in as gentle a tone as she could command, "'Pray put up your money, sir,' and then went away to her seat by the fire, hoping this would help to convince him that it was useless to say more. Presently he rallied and said eagerly, "'Look here, then. Call the young chap. Call Fred Vincy.' Mary's heart began to beat more quickly. Various ideas rushed through her mind as to what the burning of a second will might imply. She had to make a difficult decision in a hurry. I will call him, if you will let me call Mr. Jonah and others with him. Nobody else, I say, the young chap. I shall do as I like. Wait till broad daylight, sir, when everyone is stirring. Or let me call Simmons now to go and fetch the lawyer. He can be here in less than two hours. "'Lawyer! What do I want with the lawyer? Nobody shall know. I say, nobody shall know. I shall do as I like.' "'Let me call someone else, sir,' said Mary persuasively. She did not like her position, alone with the old man, who seemed to show a strange flaring of nervous energy which enabled him to speak again and again without falling into his usual cough yet she desired not to push unnecessarily the contradiction which agitated him. Let me, pray, call someone else. You let me alone, I say. Look here, Missy. Take the money. You'll never have the chance again. It's pretty nigh two hundred. There's more in the box, and nobody knows how much there was. Take it and do as I tell you. Mary, standing by the fire, saw its red light falling on the old man, propped up on his pillows and bedrest, with his bony hand holding out the key, and the money lying on the quilt before him. She never forgot that vision of a man wanting to do as he liked at the last. But the way in which he had put the offer of the money urged her to speak with harder resolution than ever. It is of no use, sir. I will not do it put up your money. I will not touch your money. I will do anything else I can to comfort you, 
but I will not touch your keys or your money. "'Anything else! Anything else!' said old Featherstone, with hoarse rage, which, as if in a nightmare, tried to be loud, and yet was only just audible. "'I want nothing else. You come here. You come here!' Mary approached him cautiously, knowing him too well. She saw him dropping his keys and trying to grasp his stick, while he looked at her like an aged hyena, the muscles of his face getting distorted with the effort of his hand. She paused at a safe distance. "'Let me give you some cordial,' she said quietly, "'and try to compose yourself. You will perhaps go to sleep, and to-morrow, by daylight, you can do as you like.' He lifted the stick, in spite of her being beyond his reach, and threw it with a hard effort, which was but impotence. It fell, slipping over the foot of the bed. Mary let it lie, and retreated to her chair by the fire. By and by she would go to him with the cordial. Fatigue would make him passive. It was getting towards the chillest moment of the morning. The fire had got low, and she could see through the chink between the mooring window curtains the light whitened by the blind. Having put some wood on the fire and thrown a shawl over her, she sat down, hoping that Mr. Featherstone might now fall asleep. If she went near him, the irritation might be kept up. He said nothing after throwing the stick, but she had seen him taking his keys again and laying his right hand on the money. He did not put it up, however, and she thought that he was dropping off to sleep. But Mary herself began to be more agitated by the remembrance of what she had gone through than she had been by the reality questioning those acts of hers which had come imperatively and excluded all question in the critical moment. Presently the dry wood sent out a flame which illuminated every crevice, and Mary saw that the old man was lying quietly with his head turned a little on one side. She went towards him with inaudible steps and thought that his face looked strangely motionless. But the next moment the movement of the flame communicating itself to all objects made her uncertain. The violent beating of her heart rendered her perceptions so doubtful that even when she touched him and listened for his breathing, she could not trust her conclusions. She went to the window and gently propped aside the curtain and blind so that the still light of the sky fell on the bed. The next moment she ran to the bell and rang it energetically. In a very little while there was no longer any doubt that Peter Featherstone was dead, with his right hand clasping the keys and his left hand lying on the heap of notes and gold. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 First gentleman, such men as this are feathers, chips, and straws. Second gentleman, but levity is causal too, and makes the sum of weight for power finds its place in lack of power. Advance is session, and the driven ship may run aground because the helmsman's thought lacked force to balance opposites. It was on a morning of May that Peter Featherstone was buried. In the prosaic neighborhood of Middlemarch, May was not always warm and sunny, and on this particular morning a chill wind was blowing the blossoms from the surrounding gardens, on to the green mounds of Lowick churchyard. Swiftly moving clouds, only now and then allowed a gleam to light up any object, whether ugly or beautiful, that happened to stand within its golden shower. In the churchyard the objects were remarkably various, for there was a little country crowd waiting to see the funeral. The news had spread that it was going to be a big burying. The old gentleman had left written directions about everything, and meant to have a funeral beyond his betters. This was true, for old Featherstone had not been a harpagon whose passions had been all devoured by the ever lean and ever hungry passion of saving, and who would drive a bargain with his undertaker beforehand. He loved money, but he also loved to spend it in gratifying his peculiar tastes, and perhaps he loved it best of all as a means of making others feel his power more or less uncomfortably. If any one will here contend that there must have been traits of goodness in old Featherstone, I will not presume to deny this, 
but I must observe that goodness is of a modest nature, easily discouraged, and, when much privacy, elbowed in early life by unabashed vices, is apt to retire into extreme privacy, so that it is more easily believed in by those who construct a selfish old gentleman theoretically, than by those who form the narrower judgments based on his personal acquaintance. In any case, he had been bent on having a handsome funeral, and on having persons bid to it who would rather have stayed at home. He had even desired that female relatives should follow him to the grave, and poor sister Martha had taken a difficult journey for this purpose from the chalky flats. She and Jane would have been altogether cheered, in a tearful manner, by this sign that a brother who disliked seeing them while he was living had been prospectively fond of their presence when he should have become a testator, if the sign had not been made equivocal by being extended to Mrs. Vincy, whose expense in handsome crape seemed to imply the most presumptuous hopes, aggravated by a bloom of complexion which told pretty plainly that she was not a blood relation, but of that generally objectionable class called wife's kin. We are all of us imaginative in some form or other, for images are the brood of desire, and poor old Featherstone, who laughed much at the way in others cajoled themselves, did not escape the fellowship of illusion. In writing the program for his burial, he certainly did not make clear to himself that his pleasure in the little drama of which it formed a part was confined to anticipation. In chuckling over the vexations he could inflict by the rigid clutch of his dead hand, he inevitably mingled his consciousness with that livid stagnant presence, and so far as he was preoccupied with a future life, it was with one of gratification inside his coffin. Thus old Featherstone was imaginative, after his fashion. However, the three mourning coaches were filled according to the written orders of the deceased. There were pallbearers on horseback, with the richest scarfs and hat-bands, and even the underbearers had trappings of woe, which were of a good, well-priced quality. The black procession, when dismounted, looked the larger for the smallness of the churchyard. The heavy human faces and the black draperies shivering in the wind seemed to tell of a world strangely incongruous with the lightly dropping blossoms and the gleams of sunshine on the daisies. The clergyman who met the procession was Mr. Cadwallader, also, according to the request of Peter Featherstone, prompted as usual by peculiar reasons. Having a contempt for curates, whom he always called understrappers, he was resolved to be buried by a beneficed clergyman. Mr. Casabon was out of the question, not merely because he declined duty of this sort, but because Featherstone had an especial dislike to him as the rector of his own parish, who had a lien on the land in the shape of a tithe, also as the deliverer of morning sermons, which the old man, being in his pew and not at all sleepy, had been obliged to sit through with an inward snarl. He had an objection to a parson stuck up above his head preaching to him. But his relations with Mr. Cadwallader had been of a different kind. The trout stream which ran through Mr. Casabon's land took its course through Featherstone's also, so that Mr. Cadwallader was a parson who had had to ask a favor instead of preaching. Moreover, he was one of the high gentry living four miles away from Lowick, and was thus exalted to an equal sky with the sheriff of the county and other dignities vaguely regarded as necessary to the system of things. There would be a satisfaction in being buried by Mr. Cadwallader, whose very name offered a fine opportunity for pronouncing wrongly if you liked. This distinction conferred on the rector of Tipton and Freshet was the reason why Mrs. Cadwallader made one of the group that watched old Featherstone's funeral from an upper window of the manor. She was not fond of visiting that house, but she liked, as she said, to see collections of strange animals such as there would be at this funeral, and she had persuaded Sir James and the young lady Chetham to drive the rector and herself to Lowick in order that the visit might be altogether pleasant. "'I will go anywhere with you, Mrs. Cadwallader,' Celia had said, "'but I don't like funerals.' "'Oh, my dear, when you have a clergyman in your family, you must accommodate your tastes. 
I did that very early. When I married Humphrey, I made up my mind to like sermons, and I set out by liking the end very much. That soon spread to the middle and the beginning, because I couldn't have the end without them. No, to be sure not, said the dowager Lady Chetham, with stately emphasis. The upper window from which the funeral could well be seen was in the room occupied by Mr. Casaubon when he had been forbidden to work, but he had resumed nearly his habitual style of life now in spite of warnings and prescriptions, and after politely welcoming Mrs. Cadwallader, had slipped again into the library to chew a cud of erudite mistake about Cush and Mizraim. But for her visitors Dorothea too might have been shut up in the library and would not have witnessed this scene of old Featherstone's funeral, which, aloof as it seemed to be from the tenor of her life, always afterwards came back to her at the touch of certain sensitive points in memory, just as the vision of St. Peter's at Rome was inwoven with moods of despondency. Scenes which make vital changes in our neighbor's lot are but the background of our own, yet, like a particular aspect of the fields and trees, they become associated for us with the epochs of our own history, and make a part of that unity which lies in the selection of our keenest consciousness. The dreamlike association of something alien and ill-understood with the deepest secrets of her experience seemed to mirror that sense of loneliness which was due to the very ardor of Dorothea's nature. The country gentry of old time lived in a rarefied social air, dotted apart on their stations up in the mountain, they looked down with imperfect discrimination on the belts of thicker life below. And Dorothea was not at ease in the perspective and chilliness of that height. "'I shall not look any more,' said Celia, after the train had entered the church, placing herself a little behind her husband's elbow, so that she could slyly touch his coat with her cheek. "'I dare say Dodo likes it, she is fond of melancholy things and ugly people. "'I am fond of knowing something about the people I live among,' said Dorothea, who had been watching everything with the interest of a monk on his holiday tour. "'It seems to me we know nothing of our neighbors unless they are cottagers. One is constantly wondering what sort of lives other people lead and how they take things. I am quite obliged to Mrs. Cadwallader for coming and calling me out of the library.' "'Quite right to feel obliged to me,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Your rich Lowick farmers are as curious as any buffaloes or bisons, and I dare say you don't see half of them at church. They are quite different from your uncle's tenants or Sir James. Monsters! Farmers without landlords! One can't tell how to class them.' "'Most of these followers are not Lowick people,' said Sir James. "'I suppose they are legatees from a distance, or from Middlemarch.' Lovegood tells me the old fellow has left a good deal of money as well as land. "'Think of that now, when so many younger sons can't dine at their own expense,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Ah!' Oh, turning round at the sound of the opening door, "'here is Mr. Brooke. I felt that we were incomplete here, and here is the explanation. You are come to see this odd funeral, of course?' "'No, I came to look after Casaubon to see how he goes on, you know, and to bring a little news, a little news, my dear, said Mr. Brooke, nodding at Dorothea as she came towards him. I looked into the library, and I saw Casaubon over his books. I told him it wouldn't do. I said, this will never do, you know, think of your wife, Casaubon, and he promised me to come up. I didn't tell him my news. I said he must come up. "'Ah, now they are coming out of the church!' Mrs. Cadwallader exclaimed. "'Dear me, what a wonderfully mixed set! Mr. Lydgate is doctor, I suppose. But that is really a good-looking woman, and the fair young man must be her son. Who are they, Sir James, do you know?' "'I see Vincy, the mayor of Middlemarch. They are probably his wife and son,' said Sir James, looking interrogatively at Mr. Brooke, who nodded and said, Yes, a very decent family. A very good fellow is Vincy, a credit to the manufacturing interest. You have seen him at my house, you know. Ah, yes, one of your secret committee, said Mrs. Cadwallader, provokingly. 
"'A coursing fellow, though,' said Sir James, with a fox-hunter's disgust. "'And one of those people who suck the life out of the wretched handloom weavers in Tipton and Freshet. That is how his family looks so fair and sleek,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Those dark, purple-faced people are an excellent foil. Dear me, they are like a set of jugs. Do look at Humphrey. One might fancy him an ugly archangel towering above them in his white surplice.' "'It's a solemn thing, though, a funeral,' said Mr. Brooke. "'If you take it in that light, you know.' "'But I am not taking it in that light. I can't wear my solemnity too often, else it will go to rags. It was time the old man died, and none of these people are sorry.' "'How piteous,' said Dorothea. "'This funeral seems to me the most dismal thing I ever saw. It is a blot on the morning. I cannot bear to think that any one should die.' and leave no love behind. She was going to say more, but she saw her husband enter, and seat himself a little in the background. The difference his presence made to her was not always a happy one. She felt that he often inwardly objected to her speech. "'Positively,' exclaimed Mrs. Cadwallader, "'there is a new face come out from behind that broad man queerer than any of them, a little round head with bulging eyes.' a sort of frog-face. Do look. He must be of another blood, I think. Let me see, said Celia, with awakened curiosity, standing behind Mrs. Cadwallader and leaning forward over her head. Oh, what an odd face! Then, with a quick change to another sort of surprised expression, she added, Why, Dodo, you never told me that Mr. Ladislaw was come again. Dorothea felt a shock of alarm. Everyone noticed her sudden paleness as she looked up immediately at her uncle, while Mr. Casaubon looked at her. "'He came with me, you know. He is my guest. Puts up with me at the Grange,' said Mr. Brooke, in his easiest tone, nodding at Dorothea, as if the announcement were just what she might have expected. "'And we have brought the picture at the top of the carriage. I knew you would be pleased with the surprise, Casaubon.' There you are to the very life, as Aquinas, you know. Quite the right sort of thing. And you will hear young Ladislaw talk about it. He talks uncommonly well, points out this, that, and the other, knows art and everything of that kind. Companionable, you know, is up with you in any track, what I've been wanting a long while. Mr. Casaubon bowed with cold politeness, mastering his irritation but only so far as to be silent. He remembered Will's letter quite as well as Dorothea did. He had noticed that it was not among the letters which had been reserved for him on his recovery, and secretly concluding that Dorothea had sent word to Will not to come to Lowick, he had shrunk with proud sensitiveness from ever recurring to the subject. He now inferred that she had asked her uncle to invite Will to the Grange, and she felt it impossible at that moment to enter into any explanation. Mrs. Cadwallader's eyes, diverted from the churchyard, saw a good deal of dumb show which was not so intelligible to her as she could have desired, and could not repress the question, "'Who is Mr. Ladislaw?' "'A young relative of Mr. Casaubon's,' said Sir James, promptly." His good nature often made him quick and clear-seeing in personal matters, and he had divined from Dorothea's glance at her husband that there was some alarm in her mind. "'A very nice young fellow. Casaubon has done everything for him,' explained Mr. Brooke. "'He repays your expense in him, Casaubon,' he went on, nodding encouragingly. "'I hope he will stay with me a long while, and we shall make something of my documents.' I have plenty of ideas and facts, you know, and I can see he is just the man to put them into shape, remembers what the right quotations are, omne tulit punctum, and that sort of thing, gives subjects a kind of turn. I invited him some time ago when you were ill, Casaubon. Dorothea said you couldn't have anybody in the house, you know, and she asked me to write. Poor Dorothea felt that every word of her uncle's was about as pleasant as a grain of sand in the eye to Mr. Casaubon. It would be altogether unfitting now to explain that she had not wished her uncle to invite Will Ladislaw. She could not in the least make clear to herself 
the reasons for her husband's dislike to his presence, a dislike painfully impressed on her by the scene in the library, but she felt the unbecomingness of saying anything that might convey a notion of it to others. Mr. Casaubon, indeed, had not thoroughly represented those mixed reasons to himself, irritated feeling with him, as with all of us, seeking rather for justification than for self-knowledge. But he wished to repress outward signs, and only Dorothea could discern the changes in her husband's face before he observed with more of dignified bending and sing-song than usual. "'You are exceedingly hospitable, my dear sir, and I owe you acknowledgments for exercising your hospitality towards a relative of mine.' The funeral was ended now, and the churchyard was being cleared. "'Now you can see him, Mrs. Cadwallader,' said Celia. "'He is just like a miniature of Mr. Casaubon's aunt that hangs in Dorothea's boudoir. Quite nice-looking.' "'A very pretty sprig,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, dryly. "'What is your nephew to be, Mr. Casaubon?' "'Pardon me, he is not my nephew. He is my cousin.' "'Well, you know,' interposed Mr. Brooke, "'he is trying his wings. He is just the sort of young fellow to rise. I should be glad to give him an opportunity. He would make a good secretary now, like Hobbes, Milton, Swift, that sort of man.' "'I understand,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'One who can write speeches.' "'I'll fetch him in now, eh, Casabon? said Mr. Brooke. "'He wouldn't come in till I had announced him, you know. "'And we'll go down and look at the picture. "'There you are to the life, "'a deep, subtle sort of thinker with his forefinger on the page, "'while St. Bonaventure or somebody else, rather fat and florid, "'is looking up at the Trinity. "'Everything is symbolical, you know.' the higher style of art. I like that up to a certain point, but not too far. It's rather straining to keep up with, you know. But you are at home in that, Casabon, And your painter's flesh is good. Solidity, transparency, everything of that sort. I went into that a great deal at one time. However, I'll go and fetch Ladislaw. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Non, je ne comprends pas de plus charmant plaisir que de voir derrêter une troupe afflige, le maintien interdit et la mine allongée, lire un long testament au pâle, étant en leur lait sans bonsoir avec un pied de nez, pour voir où noterait leur tristesse profonde, je reviendrai, je crois, exprès de l'autre monde. Regnard, le légataire universel. When the animals entered the ark in pairs, one may imagine that allied species made much private remark on each other, and were tempted to think that so many forms feeding on the same store of fodder were eminently superfluous, as tending to diminish the rations. I fear the part played by the vultures on that occasion would be too painful for art to represent, those birds being disadvantageously naked about the gullet and apparently without rites and ceremonies. The same sort of temptation befell the Christian carnivora who formed Peter Featherstone's funeral procession, most of them having their minds bent on a limited store which each would have liked to get the most of. The long-recognized blood relations and connections by marriage made already a goodly number, which, multiplied by possibilities, presented a fine range for jealous conjecture and pathetic hopefulness. Jealousy of the Vincys had created a fellowship and hostility among all persons of the Featherstone blood, so that in the absence of any decided indication that one of themselves was to have more than the rest, the dread lest that long-legged Fred Vincy should have the land was necessarily dominant though it left abundant feeling and leisure for vaguer jealousies, such as were entertained towards Mary Garth. Solomon found time to reflect that Jonah was undeserving, and Jonah to abuse Solomon as greedy. Jane, the elder sister, held that Martha's children ought not to expect so much as the young walls, and Martha, more lax on the subject of primogeniture, was sorry to think that Jane was so having. 
these nearest of kin were naturally impressed with the unreasonableness of expectations in cousins and second cousins, and used their arithmetic in reckoning the large sums that small legacies might mount to, if there were too many of them. Two cousins were present to hear the will, and a second cousin besides Mr. Trumbull. This second cousin was a Middlemarch mercer of polite manners and superfluous aspirates. The two cousins were elderly men from Brassing, one of them conscious of claims on the score of inconvenient expense sustained by him in presence of oysters and other eatables to his rich cousin Peter, the other entirely saturnine, leaning his hands and chin on a stick, and conscious of claims based on no narrow performance, but on merit generally, both blameless citizens of Brassing, who wished that Jonah Featherstone did not live there. The wit of a family is usually best received among strangers. "'Why, Trumbull himself is pretty sure of five hundred. That you may depend. I shouldn't wonder if my brother promised him,' said Solomon, musing aloud with his sisters the evening before the funeral. "'Dear, dear,' said poor sister Martha, whose imagination of hundreds had been habitually narrowed to the amount of her unpaid rent. But in the morning all the ordinary currents of conjecture were disturbed by the presence of a strange mourner who had plashed among them as if from the moon. This was the stranger described by Mrs. Cadwallader as frog-faced, a man perhaps about two or three and thirty, whose prominent eyes, thin-lipped, downward curved mouth, and hair sleekly brushed away from a forehead that sank suddenly above the ridge of the eyebrows, certainly gave his face a batrachian unchangeableness of expression. Here, clearly, was a new legatee, else why was he bidden as a mourner? Here were new possibilities, raising a new uncertainty, which almost checked remark in the morning coaches. We are all humiliated by the sudden discovery of a fact which has existed very comfortably, and perhaps been staring at us in private, while we have been making up our world entirely without it. No one had seen this questionable stranger before except Mary Garth, and she knew nothing more of him than that he had twice been to Stone Court when Mr. Featherstone was downstairs, and had sat alone with him for several hours. She had found an opportunity of mentioning this to her father, and perhaps Caleb's were the only eyes, except the lawyer's, which examined the stranger with more of inquiry than of disgust or suspicion. Caleb Garth, having little expectation and less cupidity, was interested in the verification of his own guesses, and the calmness with which he half-smilingly rubbed his chin, and shot intelligent glances much as if he were valuing a tree, made a fine contrast with the alarm or scorn visible in other faces when the unknown mourner, whose name was understood to be Rig, entered the wainscoted parlour and took his seat near the door to make part of the audience when the will should be read. Just then Mr. Solomon and Mr. Jonah were gone upstairs with the lawyer to search for the will, and Mrs. Wall, seeing two vacant seats between herself and Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, had the spirit to move next to that great authority, who was handling his watch-seals, and trimming his outlines with a determination not to show anything so compromising to a man of ability as wonder or surprise. "'I suppose you know everything about what my poor brother's done, Mr. Trumbull,' said Mrs. Wall, in the lowest of her woolly tones, while she turned her crape-shadowed bonnet towards Mr. Trumbull's ear. "'My good lady, whatever was told me was told in confidence,' said the auctioneer putting his hand up to screen that secret. "'Them who've made sure of their good luck may be disappointed yet,' Mrs. Wall continued, finding some relief in this communication. "'Hopes are often delusive,' said Mr. Trumbull, still in confidence. "'Ah,' said Mrs. Wall, looking across at the Vincies, then moving back to the side of her sister Martha. "'It's wonderful how close poor Peter was,' she said in the same undertones. "'We none of us know what he might have had on his mind. 
I only hope and trust he wasn't a worse liver than we think of, Martha. Poor Mrs. Cranch was bulky, and, breathing asthmatically, had the additional motive for making her remarks unexceptional and giving them a general bearing, that even her whispers were loud and liable to sudden bursts like those of a deranged barrel organ. "'I never was covetous, Jane,' she replied. "'But I have six children, and have buried three, and I didn't marry into money. The eldest that sits there is but nineteen, and so I leave you to guess. And stock always short, and land most awkward? But if ever I've begged and prayed, it's been to God above, though where there's one brother and bachelor, and the other childless after twice marrying, anybody might think—' Meanwhile, Mr. Vincy had glanced at the passive face of Mr. Rigg, and taken out his snuff-box and tapped it, but had put it again unopened as an indulgence which, however clarifying to the judgment, was unsuited to the occasion. "'I shouldn't wonder if Featherstone had better feelings than any one of us gave him credit for,' he observed in the ear of his wife. "'This funeral shows a thought about everybody.' It looks well when a man wants to be followed by his friends, and if they are humble, not to be ashamed of them. I should be all the better pleased if he'd left lots of small legacies. They may be uncommonly useful to fellows in a small way. Everything is as handsome as could be, crepe and silk and everything, said Mrs. Vincy, contentedly. But I am sorry to say that Fred was under some difficulty in repressing a laugh, which would have been more unsuitable than his father's snuff-box. Fred had overheard Mr. Jonah suggesting something about a love-child, and with this thought in his mind, the stranger's face, which happened to be opposite him, affected him too ludicrously. Mary Garth, discerning his distress in the twitchings of his mouth and his recourse to a cough, came cleverly to his rescue by asking him to change seats with her so that he got into a shadowy corner. Fred was feeling as good-naturedly as possible towards everybody, including Rig, and having some relenting towards all these people who were less lucky than he was aware of himself being, he would not for the world have behaved amiss. Still, it was particularly easy to laugh. But the entrance of the lawyer and the two brothers drew everyone's attention. The lawyer was Mr. Standish, and he had come to Stone Court this morning believing that he knew thoroughly well who would be pleased, and who disappointed before the day was over. The will he expected to read was the last of the three which he had drawn up for Mr. Featherstone. Mr. Standish was not a man who varied his manners. He behaved with the same deep-voiced, off-hand civility to everybody, as if he saw no difference in them, and talked chiefly of the hay-crop which would be very fine, by God, of the last bulletins concerning the king, and the Duke of Clarence, who was a sailor every inch of him, and just the man to rule over an island like Britain. Old Featherstone had often reflected, as he sat looking at the fire, that Standish would be surprised some day. It is true that if he had done as he liked at the last, and burnt up the will drawn up by another lawyer, he would not have secured that minor end. Still, he had had his pleasure in ruminating on it. And certainly Mr. Standish was surprised, but not at all sorry. On the contrary, he rather enjoyed the zest of a little curiosity in his own mind, which the discovery of a second will added to the prospective amazement on the part of the Featherstone family. As to the sentiments of Solomon and Jonah, they were held in utter suspense. It seemed to them that the old will would have a certain validity, and that there might be such an interlacement of poor Peter's former and latter intentions as to create endless lawing before anybody came by their own, an inconvenience which would have at least the advantage of going all round. Hence the brothers showed a thoroughly neutral gravity as they re-entered with Mr. Standish, but Solomon took out his white handkerchief again with a sense that in any case there would be affecting passages, and crying at funerals, however dry, was customarily served up in lawn. 
Perhaps the person who felt the most throbbing excitement at this moment was Mary Garth, in the consciousness that it was she who had virtually determined the production of this second will, which might have momentous effects on the lot of some persons present. No soul except herself knew what had passed on that final night. "'The will I hold in my hand,' said Mr. Standish, who, seated at the table in the middle of the room, took his time about everything, including the coughs with which he showed a disposition to clear his voice, was drawn up by myself, and executed by our deceased friend on the ninth of August, 1825. But I find that there is a subsequent instrument hitherto unknown to me, bearing date the 20th of July, 1826, hardly a year later than the previous one. And there is farther, I see. Mr. Standish was cautiously travelling over the document with his spectacles. A codicil to this latter will, bearing date March 1st, 1828. Dear, dear, said Sister Martha, not meaning to be audible, but driven to some articulation under this pressure of dates. I shall begin by reading the earlier will, continued Mr. Standish, since such as appears by his not having destroyed the document, was the intention of the deceased. The preamble was felt to be rather long, and several besides Solomon shook their heads pathetically, looking on the ground. All eyes avoided meeting other eyes, and were chiefly fixed either on the spots on the tablecloth or on Mr. Standish's bald head, excepting Mary Garth's. When all the rest were trying to look nowhere in particular, it was safe for her to look at them, and at the sound of the first give and bequeath she could see all complexions changing subtly, as if some faint vibration were passing through them, save that of Mr. Rigg. He sat in unaltered calm, and, in fact, the company, preoccupied with more important problems, and with the complication of listening to bequests which might or might not be revoked, had ceased to think of him. Fred blushed, and Mr. Vincy found it impossible to do without his snuff-box in his hand, though he kept it closed. The small bequests came first, and even the recollection that there was another will, and that poor Peter might have thought better of it, could not quell the rising disgust and indignation. One likes to be done well by in every tense, past, present, and future and here was Peter capable five years ago of leaving only two hundred apiece to his own brothers and sisters, and only a hundred apiece to his own nephews and nieces. The Garths were not mentioned, but Mrs. Vincy and Rosamond were each to have a hundred. Mr. Trumbull was to have the gold-headed cane and fifty pounds. The other second cousins and the cousins present were each to have the like handsome sum, which, as the Saturnine cousin observed, was a sort of legacy that left a man nowhere, and there was much more of such offensive dribbling in favor of persons not present, problematical, and, it was to be feared, low connections. Altogether, reckoning hastily, there were about three thousand disposed of. Where then had Peter meant the rest of the money to go, and where the land, and what was revoked and what was not revoked, and was the revocation for better or for worse? All emotion must be conditional, and might turn out to be the wrong thing. The men were strong enough to bear up and keep quiet under this confused suspense, some letting their lower lip fall, others pursing it up according to the habit of their muscles. But Jane and Martha sank under the rush of questions and began to cry, poor Mrs. Cranch being half-moved with the consolation of getting any hundreds at all without working for them, and half aware that her share was scanty, whereas Mrs. Wall's mind was entirely flooded with the sense of being an own sister and getting little, while somebody else was to have much. The general expectation now was that the much would fall to Fred Vincy, but the Vincys themselves were surprised when ten thousand pounds in specified investments were declared to be bequeathed to him. Was the land coming too? Fred bit his lips. It was difficult to help smiling, 
and Mrs. Vincy felt herself the happiest of women, possible revocation shrinking out of sight in this dazzling vision. There was still a residue of personal property as well as the land, but the whole was left to one person, and that person was— oh, possibilities, oh, expectations founded on the favor of close old gentlemen, oh, endless vocatives that would still leave expression slipping helpless from the measurement of mortal folly. That residuary legatee was Joshua Rigg, who was also sole executor, and who was to take thenceforth the name of Featherstone. There was a rustling which seemed like a shudder running round the room. Everyone stared afresh at Mr. Rigg, who, apparently, experienced no surprise. "'A most singular testamentary disposition,' exclaimed Mr. Trumbull, preferring for once that he should be considered ignorant in the past. "'But there is a second will. There is a further document. We have not yet heard the final wishes of the deceased.' Mary Garth was feeling that what they had yet to hear were not the final wishes. The second will revoked everything except the legacies to the low persons before mentioned, some alterations in these being the occasion of the codicil, and the bequest of all the land lying in Lowick Parish with all the stock and household furniture to Joshua Rigg. The residue of the property was to be devoted to the erection and endowment of almshouses for old men, to be called Featherstone's Almshouses, and to be built on a piece of land near Middlemarch, already bought for the purpose by the testator, he wishing, so the document declared, to please God Almighty. Nobody present had a farthing, but Mr. Trumbull had the gold-headed cane. It took some time for the company to recover the power of expression. Mary dared not look at Fred. Mr. Vincy was the first to speak, after using his snuff-box energetically, and he spoke with loud indignation. "'The most unaccountable will I ever heard. I should say he was not in his right mind when he made it. I should say this last will was void,' added Mr. Vincy, feeling that this expression put the thing in the true light. "'Eh, Standish?' "'Our deceased friend always knew what he was about, I think,' said Mr. Standish. "'Everything is quite regular.' Here is a letter from Clemens of Brassing tied with the will. He drew it up. A very respectable solicitor. I never noticed any alienation of mind, any aberration of intellect in the late Mr. Featherstone, said Borthrop Trumbull, but I call this will eccentric. I was always willingly of service to the old soul, and he intimated pretty plainly a sense of obligation which would show itself in his will. The gold-headed cane is farcical, considered as an acknowledgment to me, but happily I am above mercenary considerations. "'There's nothing very surprising in the matter that I can see,' said Caleb Garth. "'Anybody might have had more reason for wondering if the will had been what you might expect from an open-minded, straightforward man. For my part, I wish there was no such thing as a will.' "'Oh, that's a strange sentiment to come from a Christian man by God,' said the lawyer. "'I should like to know how you will back that up, Garth.' "'Oh,' said Caleb, leaning forward, adjusting his fingertips with nicety, and looking meditatively on the ground. It always seemed to him that words were the hardest part of business. But here Mr. Jonah Featherstone made himself heard. "'Well, he always was a fine hypocrite, was my brother Peter.' but this will cuts out everything. If I'd known, a wagon and six horses shouldn't have drawn me from brassing. I'll put a white hat and a drab coat on to-morrow. Dear, dear, wept Mrs. Crench, and we've been at the expense of travelling, and that poor lad sitting idle here so long. It's the first time I ever heard my brother Peter was so wishful to please God Almighty. But if I was to be struck helpless— I must say it's hard. I can think no other. It'll do him no good where he's gone, that's my belief, said Solomon, with a bitterness which was remarkably genuine, though his tone could not help being sly. Peter was a bad liver, and almshouses won't cover it when he's had the impudence to show it at the last. And all the while he has got his own lawful family, 
half-brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces, and has sat in church with them whenever he thought well to come, said Mrs. Wall, and might have left his property so respectable to them that's never been used to extravagance or unsteadiness in no manner of way, and not so poor but what they could have saved every penny and made more of it. And me, the trouble I've been at, times and times, to come here and be sisterly, and him with things on his mind all the while that might make anybody's flesh creep. But if the Almighty's allowed it, he means to punish him for it. Brother Solomon, I shall be going, if you'll drive me. I've no desire to put my foot on the premises again, said Solomon. I've got land of my own and property of my own to will away. It's a poor tale of how luck goes in the world, said Jonah. It never answers to have a bit of spirit in you. You'd better be a dog in the manger. But those above ground might learn a lesson. One fool's will is enough in a family. There's more ways than one of being a fool, said Solomon. I shan't leave my money to be poured down the sink, and I shan't leave it to foundlings from Africa. I like featherstones that were brewed such, and not turned featherstones with stick in the name on them. Solomon addressed these remarks in a loud aside to Mrs. Wall as he rose to accompany her. Brother Jonah felt himself capable of much more stinging wit than this, but he reflected that there was no use in offending the new proprietor of Stone Court until you were certain that he was quite without intentions of hospitality towards witty men whose name he was about to bear. Mr. Joshua Rigg, in fact, appeared to trouble himself little about any innuendos, but showed a notable change of manner, walking coolly up to Mr. Standish and putting business questions with much coolness. He had a high, chirping voice and a vile accent. Fred, whom he no longer moved to laughter, thought him the lowest monster he had ever seen. But Fred was feeling rather sick. The Middlemarch mercer waited for an opportunity of engaging Mr. Rigg in conversation. There was no knowing how many pairs of legs the new proprietor might require hose for, and profits were more to be relied on than legacies. Also, the mercer, as a second cousin, was dispassionate enough to feel curiosity. Mr. Vincy, after his one outburst, had remained proudly silent, though too much preoccupied with unpleasant feelings to think of moving, till he observed that his wife had gone to Fred's side and was crying silently while she held her darling's hand. He rose immediately, and, turning his back on the company, while he said to her in an undertone, "'Don't give way, Lucy. Don't make a fool of yourself, my dear, before these people,' he added in his usual loud voice, "'Go and order the phaeton, Fred. I have no time to waste.' Mary Garth had before this been getting ready to go home with her father. She met Fred in the hall, and now for the first time had the courage to look at him. He had that withered sort of paleness which will sometimes come on young faces, and his hand was very cold when she shook it. Mary, too, was agitated. She was conscious that, fatally, without will of her own, she had perhaps made a great difference to Fred's lot. Goodbye, she said with affectionate sadness. Be brave, Fred. I do believe you are better without the money. What was the good of it to Mr. Featherstone? That's all very fine, said Fred pettishly. What is a fellow to do? I must go into the church now. He knew that this would vex Mary. Very well, then she must tell him what else he could do. And I thought I should be able to pay your father at once and make everything right and you have not even a hundred pounds left you. What shall you do now, Mary? Take another situation, of course, as soon as I can get one. My father has enough to keep the rest without me. Good-bye. In a very short time Stone Court was cleared of well-brewed featherstones and other long-accustomed visitors. Another stranger had been brought to settle in the neighborhood of Middlemarch, but in the case of Mr. Rigg Featherstone, there was more discontent with immediate visible consequences than speculation as to the effect which his presence might have in the future. No soul was prophetic enough to have any foreboding as to what might appear on the trial of Joshua Rigg. 
and here I am naturally led to reflect on the means of elevating a low subject. Historical parallels are remarkably efficient in this way. The chief objection to them is that the diligent narrator may lack space, or, what is often the same thing, may not be able to think of them with any degree of particularity, though he may have a philosophical confidence that if known they would be illustrative. It seems an easier and shorter way to dignity to observe that, since there never was a true story which could not be told in parables, where you might put a monkey for a margrave, and vice versa, whatever has been or is to be narrated by me about low people may be ennobled by being considered a parable, so that if any bad habits and ugly consequences are brought into view, the reader may have the relief of regarding them as not more than figuratively ungenteel, and may feel himself virtually in company with persons of some style. Thus, while I tell the truth about Lubies, my reader's imagination need not be entirely excluded from an occupation with lords, and the petty sums which any bankrupt of high standing would be sorry to retire upon may be lifted to the level of high commercial transactions by the inexpensive addition of proportional ciphers. As to any provincial history in which the agents are all of high moral rank, that must be of a date long posterior to the first reform bill, and Peter Featherstone, you perceive, was dead and buried some months before Lord Grey came into office. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 "'Tis strange to see the humors of these men, these great aspiring spirits that should be wise, for being the nature of great spirits to love, to be where they may be most eminent, they, rating of themselves so far above us in conceit, with whom they do frequent, imagine how we wonder and esteem all that they do or say, which makes them strive to make our admiration more extreme, which they suppose they cannot lest they give notice of their extreme and highest thoughts. Daniel, Tragedy of Philotus Mr. Vincy went home from the reading of the will with his point of view considerably changed in relation to many subjects. He was an open-minded man, but given to indirect modes of expressing himself. When he was disappointed in a market for his silk braids, he swore at the groom. When his brother-in-law Bulstrode had vexed him, he made cutting remarks on Methodism, and it was now apparent that he regarded Fred's idleness with a sudden increase of severity by his throwing an embroidered cap out of the smoking-room on to the hall floor. "'Well, sir,' he observed, when that young gentleman was moving off to bed, "'I hope you've made up your mind now to go up next term and pass your examination. I've taken my resolution, so I advise you to lose no time in taking yours.' Fred made no answer. He was too utterly depressed. Twenty-four hours ago he had thought that, instead of needing to know what he should do, he should by this time know that he needed to do nothing, that he should hunt in pink, have a first-rate hunter, ride to cover on a fine hack, and be generally respected for doing so. Moreover, that he should be able at once to pay Mr. Garth, and that Mary could no longer have any reason for not marrying him. And all this was to have come without study or other inconvenience, purely by the favor of Providence in the shape of an old gentleman's caprice. But now, at the end of the twenty-four hours, all those firm expectations were upset. It was rather hard lines that, while he was smarting under this disappointment, he should be treated as if he could have helped it. But he went away silently, and his mother pleaded for him. "'Don't be hard on the boy, Vincy. He'll turn out well yet, though that wicked man has deceived him. I feel as sure as I sit here, Fred will turn out well. Else why was he brought back from the brink of the grave? And I call it a robbery. It was like giving him the land to promise it. And what is promising, if making everybody believe is not promising?' and you see he did leave him ten thousand pounds, and then took it away again. 
took it away again, said Mr. Vincy pettishly. I tell you the lad's an unlucky lad, Lucy, and you've always spoiled him. Well, Vincy, he was my first, and you made a fine fuss with him when he came. You were as proud as proud, said Mrs. Vincy, easily recovering her cheerful smile. Who knows what babies will turn to? I was fool enough, I dare say, said the husband, more mildly, however. But who has handsomer, better children than ours? Fred is far beyond other people's sons. You may hear it in his speech that he has kept college company. And Rosamond, where is there a girl like her? She might stand beside any lady in the land and only look the better for it. You see, Mr. Lydgate has kept the highest company and been everywhere, and he fell in love with her at once. Not but what I could have wished Rosamond had not engaged herself. She might have met somebody on a visit who would have been a far better match, I mean at her schoolfellow Miss Willoughby's. There are relations in that family quite as high as Mr. Lydgate's. "'Damn relations,' said Mr. Vincy. "'I've had enough of them.' I don't want a son-in-law who has got nothing but his relations to recommend him. Why, my dear, said Mrs. Vincy, you seemed as pleased as could be about it. It's true, I wasn't at home, but Rosamond told me you hadn't a word to say against the engagement. And she has begun to buy in the best linen in cambric for her underclothing. Not by my will, said Mr. Vincy. I shall have enough to do this year with an idle scamp of a son— without paying for wedding clothes. The times are as tight as can be. Everybody is being ruined, and I don't believe Lydgate has got a farthing. I shan't give my consent to their marrying. Let them wait, as their elders have done before them. Rosamond will take it hard, Vincy, and you know you never could bear to cross her. Yes, I could. The sooner the engagement's off, the better. I don't believe he'll ever make an income the way he goes on. He makes enemies, that's all I hear of his making. But he stands very high with Mr. Bulstrode, my dear. The marriage would please him, I should think. Please the deuce, said Mr. Vincy. Bulstrode won't pay for their keep. And if Lydgate thinks I'm going to give money for them to set up housekeeping, he's mistaken, that's all. I expect I shall have to put down my horses soon. You'd better tell Rosy what I say. This was a not infrequent procedure with Mr. Vincy, to be rash in jovial assent, and on becoming subsequently conscious that he had been rash, to employ others in making the offensive retractation. However, Mrs. Vincy, who never willingly opposed her husband, lost no time the next morning in letting Rosamond know what he had said. Rosamond, examining some muslin work, listened in silence, and at the end gave a certain turn of her graceful neck, of which only long experience could teach you that it meant perfect obstinacy. "'What do you say, my dear?' said her mother, with affectionate deference. "'Papa does not mean anything of the kind,' said Rosamond, quite calmly. "'He has always said that he wished me to marry the man I loved, and I shall marry Mr. Lydgate.' It is seven weeks now since Papa gave his consent, and I hope we shall have Mrs. Breton's house. Well, my dear, I shall leave you to manage your papa. You always do manage everybody. But if we ever do go and get to mask, Sadler's is the place, far better than Hopkins. Mrs. Breton's is very large, though. I should love you to have such a house, but it will take a great deal of furniture, carpeting and everything, besides plate and glass. "'And you hear, your papa says he will give no money. "'Do you think Mr. Lydgate expects it? "'You cannot imagine that I should ask him, Mamma. "'Of course he understands his own affairs. "'But he may have been looking for money, my dear, "'and we all thought of your having a pretty legacy as well as Fred. "'And now everything is so dreadful. "'There's no pleasure in thinking of anything, "'with that poor boy disappointed as he is.' That has nothing to do with my marriage, Mamma. Fred must leave off being idle. I am going upstairs to take this work to Miss Morgan. She does the open hemming very well. Mary Garth might do some work for me now, I should think. Her sewing is exquisite. It is the nicest thing I know about Mary. 
I should so like to have all my cambric frilling double-hemmed, and it takes a long time. Mrs. Vincy's belief that Rosamond could manage her papa was well-founded. Apart from his dinners and his coursing, Mr. Vincy, blustering as he was, had as little of his own way as if he had been a prime minister. The force of circumstances was easily too much for him, as it is for most pleasure-loving florid men, and the circumstance called Rosamond was particularly forcible by means of that mild persistence which, as we know, enables a white, soft, living substance to make its way in spite of opposing rock. Papa was not a rock. He had no other fixity than that fixity of alternating impulses sometimes called habit, and this was altogether unfavorable to his taking the only decisive line of conduct in relation to his daughter's engagement, namely, to inquire thoroughly into Lydgate's circumstances, declare his own inability to furnish money, and forbid alike either a speedy marriage or an engagement which must be too lengthy. That seems very simple and easy in the statement, but a disagreeable resolve formed in the chill hours of the morning had as many conditions against it as the early frost, and rarely persisted under the warming influences of the day. The indirect, though emphatic expression of opinion to which Mr. Vincy was prone, suffered much restraint in this case. Lydgate was a proud man, towards whom innuendos were obviously unsafe, and throwing his hat on the floor was out of the question. Mr. Vincy was a little in awe of him a little vain that he wanted to marry Rosamond, a little indisposed to raise a question of money in which his own position was not advantageous, a little afraid of being worsted in dialogue with a man better educated and more highly bred than himself, and a little afraid of doing what his daughter would not like. The part Mr. Vincy preferred playing was that of the generous host whom nobody criticizes. In the earlier half of the day there was business to hinder any formal communication of an adverse resolve. In the later there was dinner, wine, whist, and general satisfaction. And in the meanwhile the hours were each leaving their little deposit and gradually forming the final reason for inaction, namely that action was too late. The accepted lover spent most of his evenings in Lowick Gate, and a love-making not at all dependent on money advances from fathers-in-law or prospective income from a profession, went on flourishingly under Mr. Vincy's own eyes. Young love-making, that gossamer web, even the points it clings to, the things whence its subtle interlacings are swung, are scarcely perceptible. Momentary touches of fingertips, meetings of rays from blue and dark orbs, unfinished phrases, lightest changes of cheek and lip, faintest tremors. The web itself is made of spontaneous beliefs and indefinable joys, yearnings of one life towards another, visions of completeness, indefinite trust. And Lydgate fell to spinning that web from his inward self with wonderful rapidity, in spite of experience supposed to be finished off with the drama of lore, in spite, too, of medicine and biology, for the inspection of macerated muscle or of eyes presented in a dish, like Santa Lucia's, and other incidents of scientific inquiry, are observed to be less incompatible with poetic love than a native dullness or a lively addiction to the lowest prose. As for Rosamond, she was in the water-lily's expanding wonderment at its own fuller life, and she too was spinning industriously at the mutual web. All this went on in the corner of the drawing-room where the piano stood, and, subtle as it was, the light made it a sort of rainbow visible to many observers besides Mr. Fairbrother. The certainty that Miss Vincy and Mr. Lydgate were engaged became general in Middlemarch without the aid of formal announcement. Aunt Bulstrode was again stirred to anxiety, but this time she addressed herself to her brother, 
going to the warehouse expressly to avoid Mrs. Vincy's volatility. His replies were not satisfactory. "'Walter, you never mean to tell me that you have allowed all this to go on without inquiry into Mr. Lydgate's prospects,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, opening her eyes with wider gravity at her brother, who was in his peevish warehouse humor. "'Think of this girl brought up in luxury. In too worldly a way, I am sorry to say. What will she do on a small income?' "'Oh, confound it, Harriet! What can I do when men come into the town without any asking of mine? Did you shut up your house against Lydgate? Bulstrode has pushed him forward more than anybody. I never made any fuss about the young fellow. You should go and talk to your husband about it, not me.' "'Well, really, Walter, how can Mr. Bulstrode be to blame? I am sure he did not wish for the engagement.' "'Oh, if Bulstrode had not taken him by the hand—' I should never have invited him. But you called him in to attend on Fred, and I am sure that was a mercy, said Mrs. Bulstrode, losing her clue in the intricacies of the subject. I don't know about mercy, said Mr. Vincy testily. I know I am worried more than I like with my family. I was a good brother to you, Harriet, before you married Bulstrode, and I must say— he doesn't always show that friendly spirit towards your family that might have been expected of him. Mr. Vincy was very little like a Jesuit, but no accomplished Jesuit could have turned a question more adroitly. Harriet had to defend her husband instead of blaming her brother, and the conversation ended at a point as far from the beginning as some recent sparring between the brothers-in-law at a vestry meeting. Mrs. Bulstrode did not repeat her brother's complaints to her husband, but in the evening she spoke to him of Lydgate and Rosamond. He did not share her warm interest, however, and only spoke with resignation of the risks attendant on the beginning of medical practice and the desirability of prudence. "'I am sure we are bound to pray for that thoughtless girl, brought up as she has been,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, wishing to rouse her husband's feelings. "'Truly, my dear,' said Mr. Bulstrode, assentingly, "'those who are not of this world can do little else to arrest the errors of the obstinately worldly. That is what we must accustom ourselves to recognize with regard to your brother's family. I could have wished that Mr. Lydgate had not entered into such a union, but my relations with him are limited to that use of his gifts for God's purposes which is taught us by the divine government under each dispensation. Mrs. Bulstrode said no more, attributing some dissatisfaction which she felt to her own want of spirituality. She believed that her husband was one of those men whose memoirs should be written when they died. As to Lydgate himself having been accepted, he was prepared to accept all the consequences which he believed himself to foresee with perfect clearness. Of course he must be married in a year, perhaps even in half a year. This was not what he had intended, but other schemes would not be hindered. They would simply adjust themselves anew. Marriage, of course, must be prepared for in the usual way. A house must be taken instead of the rooms he at present occupied, and Lydgate, having heard Rosamond speak with admiration of old Mrs. Breton's house, situated in Lowick Gate, took notice when it fell vacant after the old lady's death, and immediately entered into treaty for it. He did this in an episodic way, very much as he gave orders to his tailor for every requisite of perfect dress, without any notion of being extravagant. On the contrary, he would have despised any ostentation of expense. His profession had familiarized him with all grades of poverty, and he cared much for those who suffered hardships, he would have behaved perfectly at a table where the sauce was served in a jug with the handle off, and he would have remembered nothing about a grand dinner except that a man was there who talked well. But it had never occurred to him that he should live in any other than what he would have called an ordinary way, with green glasses for hawk and excellent waiting at table. In warming himself at French social theories, he had brought away no smell of scorching. We may handle even extreme opinions with impunity while our furniture, 
our dinner-giving, and preference for our moral bearings in our own case link us indissolubly with the established order. And Lydgate's tendency was not towards extreme opinions. He would have liked no barefooted doctrines, being particular about his boots. He was no radical in relation to anything but medical reform and the prosecution of discovery. In the rest of practical life he walked by hereditary habit, half from that personal pride and unreflecting egoism which I have already called commonness, and half from that naivete which belonged to preoccupation with favorite ideas. Any inward debate Lydgate had as to the consequences of this engagement which had stolen upon him turned on the paucity of time rather than of money. Certainly, being in love— and being expected continually by someone who always turned out to be prettier than memory could represent her to be, did interfere with the diligent use of spare hours which might serve some plodding fellow of a German to make the great imminent discovery. This was really an argument for not deferring the marriage too long, as he implied to Mr. Fairbrother, one day that the vicar came to his room with some pond products, which he wanted to examine under a better microscope than his own, and, finding Lydgate's table full of apparatus and specimens in confusion, said sarcastically, "'Eros has degenerated. He began by introducing order and harmony, and now he brings back chaos.' "'Yes, at some stages,' said Lydgate, lifting his brows and smiling, while he began to arrange his microscope." but a better order will begin after. Soon, said the vicar. I hope so, really. This unsettled state of affairs uses up the time, and when one has notions in science, every moment is an opportunity. I feel sure that marriage must be the best thing for a man who wants to work steadily. He has everything at home, then. No teasing with personal speculations. He can get calmness and freedom." "'You are an enviable dog,' said the vicar, "'to have such a prospect. "'Rosamond, calmness and freedom, all to your share. "'Here I am with nothing but my pipe and pond animalcules. "'Now, are you ready?' "'Lydgate did not mention to the vicar "'another reason he had for wishing to shorten the period of courtship. "'It was rather irritating to him, "'even with the wine of love in his veins,' to be obliged to mingle so often with the family party at the Vincy's, and to enter so much into Middlemarch gossip, protracted good cheer, whist-playing, and general futility. He had to be deferential when Mr. Vincy decided questions with trenchant ignorance, especially as to those liquors which were the best inward pickle, preserving you from the effects of bad air. Mrs. Vincy's openness and simplicity were quite unstreaked with suspicion as to the subtle offence she might give to the taste of her intended son-in-law, and altogether Lydgate had to confess to himself that he was descending a little in relation to Rosamond's family. But that exquisite creature herself suffered in the same sort of way. It was at least one delightful thought that, in marrying her, he could give her a much-needed transplantation. "'Dear,' he said to her one evening, in his gentlest tone, as he sat down by her and looked closely at her face. But I must first say that he had found her alone in the drawing-room, where the great old-fashioned window, almost as large as the side of the room, was opened to the summer scents of the garden at the back of the house. Her father and mother were gone to a party, and the rest were all out with the butterflies. "'Dear, your eyelids are red.' "'Are they?' said Rosamond. "'I wonder why.' It was not in her nature to pour forth wishes or grievances. They only came forth gracefully on solicitation. "'As if you could hide it from me,' said Lydgate, laying his hand tenderly on both of hers. "'Don't I see a tiny drop on one of the lashes?' Things trouble you, and you don't tell me. That is unloving. Why should I tell you what you cannot alter? They are everyday things. Perhaps they have been a little worse lately. Family annoyances? Don't fear speaking. I guess them. 
Papa has been more irritable lately. Fred makes him angry, and this morning there was a fresh quarrel because Fred threatens to throw his whole education away and do something quite beneath him. And besides— Rosamond hesitated, and her cheeks were gathering a slight flush. Lydgate had never seen her in trouble since the morning of their engagement, and he had never felt so passionately towards her as this moment. He kissed the hesitating lips gently, as if to encourage them. "'I feel that papa is not quite pleased about our engagement,' Rosamond continued, almost in a whisper. "'And he said last night that he should certainly speak to you and say it must be given up.' "'Will you give it up?' said Lydgate, with quick energy, almost angrily. "'I never give up anything that I choose to do,' said Rosamond, recovering the calmness at the touching of this cord. "'God bless you,' said Lydgate, kissing her again. This constancy of purpose in the right place was adorable. He went on. "'It is too late now for your father to say that our engagement must be given up. You are of age, and I claim you as mine. If anything is done to make you unhappy, that is a reason for hastening our marriage. An unmistakable delight shone forth from the blue eyes that met his, and the radiance seemed to light up all his future with mild sunshine. Ideal happiness, of the kind known in the Arabian Nights, in which you are invited to step from the labor and discord of the street, into a paradise where everything is given to you and nothing claimed, seemed to be an affair of a few weeks' waiting, more or less. "'Why should we defer it?' he said, with ardent insistence. "'I've taken the house now. Everything else can soon be got ready, can it not? You will not mind about new clothes. Those can be bought afterwards.' "'What original notions you clever men have!' said Rosamond dimpling with more thorough laughter than usual at this humorous incongruity. This is the first time I ever heard of wedding clothes being bought after marriage. But you don't mean to say you would insist on my waiting months for the sake of clothes, said Lydgate, half thinking that Rosamond was tormenting him prettily, and half fearing that she really shrank from speedy marriage. Remember, we are looking forward to a better sort of happiness even than this, being continually together independent of others, and ordering our lives as we will. Come, dear, tell me how soon you can be altogether mine. There was a serious pleading in Lydgate's tone, as if he felt that she would be injuring him by any fantastic delays. Rosamond became serious, too, and slightly meditative. In fact, she was going through many intricacies of lace edging and hosiery and petticoat tucking, in order to give an answer that would be at least approximative. Six weeks would be ample. Say so, Rosamond, insisted Lydgate, releasing her hands to put his arm gently around her. One little hand immediately went to pat her hair, while she gave her neck a meditative turn, and then said seriously, There would be the house linen and the furniture to be prepared. Still, Mamma could see to those while we were away. Yes, to be sure. We must be away a week or so. Oh, more than that, said Rosamond earnestly. She was thinking of her evening dresses for the visit to Sir Godwin Lydgate's, which she had long been secretly hoping for as a delightful employment of at least one quarter of the honeymoon, even if she deferred her introduction to the uncle who was a doctor of divinity, also a pleasing though sober kind of rank, when sustained by blood. She looked at her lover with some wondering remonstrance as she spoke, and he readily understood that she might wish to lengthen the sweet time of double solitude. "'Whatever you wish, my darling, when the day is fixed. But let us take a decided course, and put an end to any discomfort you may be suffering. Six weeks. I am sure they would be ample.' "'I could certainly hasten the work,' said Rosamond. "'Will you then mention it to papa?' I think it would be better to write to him. She blushed and looked at him as the garden flowers look at us when we walk forth happily among them in the transcendent evening light. Is there not a soul beyond utterance, half-nymph, half-child, 
in those delicate petals which glow and breathe about the centers of deep color? He touched her ear and a little bit of neck under it with his lips, and they sat quite still for many minutes which flowed by them like a small gurgling brook with the kisses of the sun upon it. Rosamond thought that no one could be more in love than she was, and Lydgate thought that after all his wild mistakes and absurd credulity he had found perfect womanhood, felt as if already breathed upon by exquisite wedded affection such as would be bestowed by an accomplished creature who venerated his high musings and momentous labors, and who would never interfere with them, who would create order in the home and accounts with still magic, yet keep her fingers ready to touch the lute and transform life into romance at any moment, who was instructed to the true womanly limit and not a hair's breadth beyond, docile, therefore, and ready to carry out behests which came from that limit. It was plainer now than ever that his notion of remaining much longer a bachelor had been a mistake. Marriage would not be an obstruction, but a furtherance. And happening the next day to accompany a patient to Brassing, he saw a dinner service there which struck him as so exactly the right thing that he bought it at once. It saved time to do these things just when you thought of them, and Lydgate hated ugly crockery. The dinner service in question was expensive, but that might be in the nature of dinner services. Furnishing was necessarily expensive, but then it had to be done only once. "'It must be lovely,' said Mrs. Vincy, when Lydgate mentioned his purchase with some descriptive touches. "'Just what Rosy ought to have. I trust in heaven it won't be broken.' "'One must hire servants who will not break things,' said Lydgate." Certainly this was reasoning with an imperfect vision of sequences, but at that period there was no sort of reasoning which was not more or less sanctioned by men of science. Of course it was unnecessary to defer the mention of anything to Mamma, who did not readily take views that were not cheerful, and, being a happy wife herself, had hardly any feeling but pride in her daughter's marriage. But Rosamond had good reasons for suggesting to Lydgate that papa should be appealed to in writing. She prepared for the arrival of the letter by walking with her papa to the warehouse the next morning, and telling him on the way that Mr. Lydgate wished to be married soon. "'Nonsense, my dear,' said Mr. Vincy. "'What has he got to marry on? You'd much better give up the engagement. I've told you so pretty plainly before this. What have you had such an education for if you are to go and marry a poor man?' It's a cruel thing for a father to see. Mr. Lydgate is not poor, Papa. He bought Mr. Peacock's practice, which, they say, is worth eight or nine hundred a year. Stuff and nonsense! What's buying a practice? He might as well buy next year's swallows. It'll all slip through his fingers. On the contrary, Papa, he will increase the practice. See how he has been called in by the Chettams and Casabons. I hope he knows I shan't give anything, with this disappointment about Fred, and Parliament going to be dissolved, and machine-breaking everywhere, and an election coming on. Dear Papa, what can that have to do with my marriage? A pretty deal to do with it. We may all be ruined for what I know. The country's in that state. Some say it's the end of the world, and be hanged if I don't think it looks like it. Anyhow— it's not a time for me to be drawing money out of my business, and I should wish Lydgate to know that. I am sure he expects nothing, Papa, and he has such very high connections. He is sure to rise in one way or another. He's engaged in making scientific discoveries. Mr. Vincy was silent. I cannot give up my only prospect of happiness, Papa. Mr. Lydgate is a gentleman. I could never love any one who is not a perfect gentleman. He would not like me to go into a consumption, as Arabella Hawley did, and you know that I never change my mind. Again Papa was silent. Promise me, Papa, that you will consent to what we wish. We shall never give each other up, and you know that you have always objected to long courtships and late marriages. 
there was a little more urgency of this kind, till Mr. Vincy said, "'Well, well, child, he must write to me first before I can answer him,' and Rosamond was certain that she had gained her point. Mr. Vincy's answer consisted chiefly in a demand that Lydgate should insure his life, a demand immediately conceded. This was a delightfully reassuring idea supposing that Lydgate died, but in the meantime not a self-supporting idea. However, it seemed to make everything comfortable about Rosamond's marriage, and the necessary purchases went on with much spirit. Not without prudential considerations, however. A bride, who is going to visit at a baronet's, must have a few first-rate pocket-handkerchiefs, but beyond the absolutely necessary half-dozen, Rosamond contented herself without the very highest style of embroidery and Valenciennes. Lydgate, also, finding that his sum of eight hundred pounds had been considerably reduced since he had come to Middlemarch, restrained his inclination for some plate of an old pattern which was shown to him when he went into Kibble's establishment at Brassing to buy forks and spoons. He was too proud to act as if he presupposed that Mr. Vincy would advance money to provide furniture, and though, since it would not be necessary to pay for everything at once, some bills would be left standing over, he did not waste time in conjecturing how much his father-in-law would give in the form of dowry to make payment easy. He was not going to do anything extravagant, but the requisite things must be bought, and it would be bad economy to buy them of poor quality. All these matters were by the by. Lydgate foresaw that science and his profession were the objects he should alone pursue enthusiastically, but he could not imagine himself pursuing them in such a home as Wrench had, the doors all open, the oilcloth worn, the children in soiled pinafores, and lunch lingering in the form of bones, black-handled knives, and willow pattern. But Wrench had a wretched lymphatic wife who made a mummy of herself indoors in a large shawl, and he must have altogether begun with an ill-chosen domestic apparatus. Rosamond, however, was on her side much occupied with conjectures, though her quick imitative perception warned her against betraying them too crudely. "'I shall like so much to know your family,' she said one day, when the wedding journey was being discussed. "'We might perhaps take a direction that would allow us to see them as we returned. Which of your uncles do you like the best?' "'Oh, my uncle Godwin, I think. He is a good-natured old fellow.' "'You were constantly at his house in Qualingham when you were a boy, were you not? I should so like to see the old spot and everything that you were used to.' "'Does he know you are going to be married?' "'No,' said Lydgate, carelessly, turning in his chair and rubbing his hair up. "'Do send him word of it, you naughty, undutiful nephew. He will perhaps ask you to take me to Qualingham, and then you could show me about the grounds, and I could imagine you there when you were a boy. Remember, you see me in my home, just as it has been since I was a child. It is not fair that I should be so ignorant of yours.' but perhaps you would be a little ashamed of me. I forgot that. Lydgate smiled at her tenderly, and readily accepted the suggestion that the proud pleasure of showing so charming a bride was worth some trouble. And now he came to think of it, he would like to see the old spots with Rosamond. I will write to him then. But my cousins are bores. It seemed magnificent to Rosamond to be able to speak so slightingly of a baronet's family, and she felt much contentment in the prospect of being able to estimate them contemptuously on her own account. But Mamma was near spoiling all a day or two later by saying, "'I hope your uncle Sir Godwin will not look down on Rosy, Mr. Lydgate. I should think he would do something handsome.' A thousand or two can be nothing to a baronet. Mamma said Rosamond, blushing deeply, and Lydgate pitied her so much that he remained silent, and went to the other end of the room to examine a print curiously, as if he had been absent-minded. Mamma had a little filial lecture afterwards, 
and was docile as usual. But Rosamond reflected that if any of those high-bred cousins who were boors should be induced to visit Middlemarch, they would see many things in her own family which might shock them. Hence it seemed desirable that Lydgate should by and by get some first-rate position elsewhere than in Middlemarch, and this could hardly be difficult in the case of a man who had a titled uncle and could make discoveries. Lydgate, you perceive, had talked fervidly to Rosamond of his hopes as to the highest uses of his life, and had found it delightful to be listened to by a creature who would bring him the sweet furtherance of satisfying affection, beauty, repose, such help as our thoughts get from the summer sky and the flower-fringed meadows. Lydgate relied much on the psychological difference between what, for the sake of variety, I will call goose and gander, especially on the innate submissiveness of the goose, as beautifully corresponding to the strength of the gander. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Thrice happy she that is so well assured unto herself and settled so in heart, that neither will for better be allured, ne fears to worse with any chance to start, but like a steady ship doth strongly part the raging waves and keeps her course aright, ne aught for tempest doth from it depart, ne aught for fair weather's false delight. Such self-assurance need not fear the spite of grudging foes, ne favor seek of friends, but in the stay of her own steadfast might neither to one herself nor other bends. Most happy she that most assured doth rest, but he most happy who such one loves best. Spencer the doubt hinted by Mr. Vincy whether it were only the general election or the end of the world that was coming on, now that George the Fourth was dead, Parliament dissolved, Wellington and Peel generally depreciated, and the new king apologetic, was a feeble type of the uncertainties in provincial opinion at that time. With the glow-worm lights of country places, how could men see which were their own thoughts in the confusion of a Tory ministry passing liberal measures, of Tory nobles and electors being anxious to return liberals rather than friends of the recreant ministers, and of outcries for remedies which seemed to have a mysteriously remote bearing on private interest, and were made suspicious by the advocacy of disagreeable neighbors? Buyers of the Middlemarch newspapers found themselves in an anomalous position. During the agitation on the Catholic question, many had given up the Pioneer, which had a motto from Charles James Fox, and was in the van of progress, because it had taken Peel's side about the Papists, and had thus blotted its liberalism with the toleration of Jesuitry and Baal. But they were ill-satisfied with the trumpet, which, since its blasts against Rome, and in the general flaccidity of the public mind, nobody knowing who would support whom, had become feeble in its blowing. It was a time, according to a noticeable article in the Pioneer, when the crying needs of the country might well counteract a reluctance to public action on the part of men whose minds had from long experience acquired breadth as well as concentration, decision of judgment as well as tolerance, dispassionateness, as well as energy. In fact, all those qualities which in the melancholy experience of mankind have been the least disposed to share lodgings. Mr. Hackbutt, whose fluent speech was at that time floating more widely than usual, and leaving much uncertainty as to its ultimate channel, was heard to say in Mr. Hawley's office that the article in question emanated from Brooke of Tipton, and that Brooke had secretly bought the Pioneer some months ago. "'That means mischief, eh?' said Mr. Hawley. "'He's got the freak of being a popular man now, after dangling about like a stray tortoise. So much the worse for him. I've had my eye on him for some time. He shall be prettily pumped upon. He's a damn bad landlord. What business has an old county man to come currying favor with a low set of dark-blue freemen? As to his paper, 
I only hope he may do the writing himself. It would be worth our paying for. I understand he has got a very brilliant young fellow to edit it, who can write the highest style of leading article, quite equal to anything in the London papers, and he means to take very high ground on reform. Let Brooke reform his rent roll. He's a cursed old screw, and the buildings all over his estate are going to rack. I suppose this young fellow is some loose fish from London. His name is Ladislaw. He is said to be of foreign extraction. I know the sort, said Mr. Hawley. Some emissary. He'll begin with flourishing about the rights of man, and end with murdering a wench. That's the style. "'You must concede that there are abuses, Hawley,' said Mr. Hackbutt, foreseeing some political disagreement with his family lawyer. "'I myself should never favor immoderate views. In fact, I take my stand with Huskisson. But I cannot blind myself to the consideration that the non-representation of large towns—' "'Large towns be damned,' said Mr. Hawley, impatient of exposition. "'I know a little too much about Middlemarch elections.' Let em quash every pocket borrow tomorrow and bring in every mushroom town in the kingdom. They'll only increase the expense of getting into Parliament. I go upon facts. Mr. Hawley's disgust at the notion of the pioneer being edited by an emissary and of Brooke becoming actively political, as if a tortoise of desultory pursuits should protrude its small head ambitiously and become rampant, was hardly equal to the annoyance felt by some members of Mr. Brooke's own family. The result had oozed forth gradually, like the discovery that your neighbor has set up an unpleasant kind of manufacture which will be permanently under your nostrils without legal remedy. The pioneer had been secretly bought even before Will Ladislaw's arrival, the expected opportunity having offered itself in the readiness of the proprietor to part with a valuable property which did not pay and in the interval since Mr. Brooke had written his invitation, those germinal ideas of making his mind tell upon the world at large, which had been present in him from his younger years, but had hitherto lain in some obstruction, had been sprouting under cover. The development was much furthered by a delight in his guest which proved greater than even he had anticipated, for it seemed that Will was not only at home in all those artistic, and literary subjects which Mr. Brooke had gone into at one time, but that he was strikingly ready at seizing the points of the political situation, and dealing with them in that large spirit which, aided by adequate memory, lends itself to quotation and general effectiveness of treatment. "'He seems to me a kind of Shelley, you know,' Mr. Brooke took an opportunity of saying, for the gratification of Mr. Casaubon, I don't mean as to anything objectionable, laxities or atheism or anything of that kind, you know. Ladislaw's sentiments in every way, I am sure, are good. Indeed, we were talking a great deal together last night. But he has the same sort of enthusiasm for liberty, freedom, emancipation. A fine thing under guidance, under guidance, you know. I think I shall be able to put him on the right tack and I am the more pleased because he is a relation of yours, Casaubon. If the right tack implied anything more precise than the rest of Mr. Brooke's speech, Mr. Casaubon silently hoped that it referred to some occupation at a great distance from Lowick. He had disliked Will while he helped him, but he had begun to dislike him still more now that Will had declined his help. That is the way with us when we have any uneasy jealousy in our disposition. If our talents are chiefly of the burrowing kind, our honey-sipping cousin, whom we have grave reasons for objecting to, is likely to have a secret contempt for us, and any one who admires him passes an oblique criticism on ourselves. Having the scruples of rectitude in our souls, we are above the meanness of injuring him, Rather, we meet all his claims on us by active benefits, and the drawing of checks for him, being a superiority which he must recognize, gives our bitterness a milder infusion. Now Mr. Casaubon had been deprived of that superiority, as anything more than a remembrance, in a sudden, capricious manner. His antipathy to Will did not spring from the common jealousy 
of a winter-worn husband. It was something deeper, bred by his lifelong claims and discontents. But Dorothea, now that she was present, Dorothea, as a young wife who herself had shown an offensive capability of criticism, necessarily gave concentration to the uneasiness which had before been vague. Will Ladislaw, on his side, felt that his dislike was flourishing at the expense of his gratitude, and spent much inward discourse in justifying the dislike. Casabon hated him. He knew that very well. On his first entrance he could discern a bitterness in the mouth, and a venom in the glance, which would almost justify declaring war in spite of past benefits. He was much obliged to Casabon in the past, but really the act of marrying this wife was a set-off against the obligation. It was a question whether gratitude which refers to what is done for one's self ought not to give way to indignation at what is done against another. And Casabon had done a wrong to Dorothea in marrying her, a man was bound to know himself better than that, and if he chose to grow gray, crunching bones in a cavern, he had no business to be luring a girl into his companionship. "'It is the most horrible of virgin sacrifices,' said Will, and he painted to himself what were Dorothea's inward sorrows as if he had been riding a choric wail. But he would never lose sight of her. He would watch over her, if he gave up everything else in life, he would watch over her, and she should know that she had one slave in the world. Will had, to use Sir Thomas Brown's phrase, a passionate prodigality of statement both to himself and others. The simple truth was that nothing then invited him so strongly as the presence of Dorothea. Invitations of the formal kind had been wanting, however, for Will had never been asked to go to Lowick. Mr. Brooke, indeed, confident of doing everything agreeable which Casabon, poor fellow, was too much absorbed to think of, had arranged to bring Ladislaw to Lowick several times, not neglecting, meanwhile, to introduce him elsewhere on every opportunity as a young relative of Casabon's. And though Will had not seen Dorothea alone, their interviews had been enough to restore her former sense of young companionship with one who was cleverer than herself, yet seemed ready to be swayed by her. Poor Dorothea, before her marriage, had never found much room in other minds for what she cared most to say, and she had not, as we know, enjoyed her husband's superior instruction so much as she had expected. If she spoke with any keenness of interest to Mr. Casaubon, he heard her with an air of patience, as if she had given a quotation from the delectus familiar to him from his tender years, and sometimes mentioned curtly what ancient sects or personages had held similar ideas, as if there were too much of that sort in stock already. At other times he would inform her that she was mistaken, and reassert what her remark had questioned but Will Ladislaw always seemed to see more in what she said than she herself saw. Dorothea had little vanity, but she had the ardent woman's need to rule beneficently by making the joy of another soul. Hence the mere chance of seeing Will occasionally was like a lunette opened in the wall of her prison, giving her a glimpse of the sunny air, and this pleasure began to nullify her original alarm at what her husband might think about the introduction of Will as her uncle's guest. On this subject Mr. Casaubon had remained dumb. But Will wanted to talk with Dorothea alone, and was impatient of slow circumstance. However slight the terrestrial intercourse between Dante and Beatrice, or Petrarch and Laura, time changes the proportion of things and in later days it is preferable to have fewer sonnets and more conversation. Necessity excused stratagem, but stratagem was limited by the dread of offending Dorothea. He found out at last that he wanted to take a particular sketch at Lowick, and one morning when Mr. Brooke had to drive along the Lowick road on his way to the county town, Will asked to be set down with his sketch-book and camp-stool at Lowick, and, without announcing himself at the manor, 
settled himself to sketch in a position where he must see Dorothea if she came out to walk, and he knew that she usually walked an hour in the morning. But the stratagem was defeated by the weather. Clouds gathered with treacherous quickness, the rain came down, and Will was obliged to take shelter in the house. He intended, on the strength of relationship, to go into the drawing-room and wait there without being announced, and seeing his old acquaintance, the butler in the hall, he said, "'Don't mention that I am here, Pratt. I will wait till luncheon. I know Mr. Casaubon does not like to be disturbed when he is in the library.' "'Master is out, sir. There's only Mrs. Casaubon in the library. I'd better tell her you're here, sir,' said Pratt, a red-cheeked man given to lively converse with Tantrip, and often agreeing with her that it must be dull for Madame. "'Oh, very well. This confounded rain has hindered me from sketching,' said Will, feeling so happy that he affected indifference with delightful ease. In another minute he was in the library, and Dorothea was meeting him with her sweet, unconstrained smile. "'Mr. Casaubon has gone to the archdeacon's,' she said at once. "'I don't know whether he will be home again long before dinner. He was uncertain how long he should be. Did you want to say anything particular to him?' "'No, I came to sketch, but the rain drove me in, else I would not have disturbed you yet. I supposed that Mr. Casaubon was here, and I know he dislikes interruption at this hour.' "'I am indebted to the rain, then. I am so glad to see you.' Dorothea uttered these common words with the simple sincerity of an unhappy child visited at school. "'I really came for the chance of seeing you alone,' said Will mysteriously forced to be just as simple as she was. He could not stay to ask himself why not. I wanted to talk about things as we did in Rome. It always makes a difference when other people are present. Yes, said Dorothea, in her clear full tone of assent. Sit down. She seated herself on a dark ottoman with the brown books behind her, looking in her plain dress of some thin woolen white material, without a single ornament on her besides her wedding ring, as if she were under a vow to be different from all other women. And Will sat down opposite her at two yards' distance, the light falling on his bright curls and delicate but rather petulant profile, with its defiant curves of lip and chin. Each looked at each other as if they had been two flowers which had opened then and there. Dorothea for the moment forgot her husband's mysterious irritation against Will. It seemed fresh water at her thirsty lips to speak without fear to the one person whom she had found receptive, for in looking backward through sadness she exaggerated a past solace. "'I have often thought I should like to talk to you again,' she said immediately. "'It seems strange to me how many things I said to you.' "'I remember them all,' said Will." with the unspeakable content in his soul of feeling that he was in the presence of a creature worthy to be perfectly loved. I think his own feelings at that moment were perfect, for we mortals have our divine moments when love is satisfied in the completeness of the beloved object. "'I have tried to learn a great deal since we were in Rome,' said Dorothea. "'I can read Latin a little, and I am beginning to understand just a little Greek.' I can help Mr. Casaubon better now. I can find out references for him and save his eyes in many ways. But it is very difficult to be learned. It seems as if people were worn out on the way to great thoughts, and can never enjoy them because they are too tired. If a man has a capacity for great thoughts, he is likely to overtake them before he is decrepit, said Will, with irrepressible quickness but through certain sensibilities Dorothea was as quick as he, and seeing her face change, he added immediately, but it is quite true that the best minds have been sometimes overstrained in working out their ideas. You correct me, said Dorothea. I expressed myself ill. I should have said that those who have great thoughts get too much worn in working them out. I used to feel about that even when I was a little girl, and it always seemed to me that the use I should like to make of my life would be to help someone who did great works, so that his burden might be lighter. Dorothea was led on to this bit of autobiography without any sense of making a revelation. 
but she had never before said anything to Will which threw so strong a light on her marriage. He did not shrug his shoulders, and for want of that muscular outlet he thought the more irritably of beautiful lips kissing holy skulls and other emptinesses ecclesiastically enshrined. Also he had to take care that his speech should not betray that thought. But you may easily carry the help too far, he said, and get overwrought yourself. Are you not too much shut up? You already look paler. It would be better for Mr. Casbon to have a secretary. He could easily get a man who would do half his work for him. It would save him more effectually, and you need only help him in lighter ways. How can you think of that? said Dorothea, in a tone of earnest remonstrance. I should have no happiness if I did not help him in his work. What could I do? There's no good to be done in Lowick. The only thing I desire is to help him more. And he objects to a secretary. Please not to mention that again. Certainly not, now I know your feeling. But I have heard both Mr. Brooke and Sir James Chetham express the same wish. Yes, said Dorothea. But they don't understand. They want me to be a great deal on horseback, and have the garden altered and new conservatories to fill up my days. I thought you could understand that one's mind has other wants, she added rather impatiently. Besides, Mr. Casaubon cannot bear to hear of a secretary. My mistake is excusable, said Will. In old days I used to hear Mr. Casaubon speak as if he looked forward to having a secretary. Indeed, he held out the prospect of that office to me. But I turned out to be not good enough for it. Dorothea was trying to extract out of this an excuse for her husband's evident repulsion, as she said with a playful smile, "'You were not a steady worker enough.' "'No,' said Will, shaking his head backward, somewhat after the manner of a spirited horse. And then the old irritable demon prompting him to give another good pinch at the moth-wings of poor Mr. Casaubon's glory, he went on, and I have seen since that Mr. Casaubon does not like any one to overlook his work and know thoroughly what he is doing. He is too doubtful, too uncertain of himself. I may not be good for much, but he dislikes me because I disagree with him. Will was not without his intentions to be always generous, but our tongues are little triggers which have usually been pulled before general intentions can be brought to bear and it was too intolerable that Casaubon's dislike of him should not be fairly accounted for to Dorothea. Yet, when he had spoken, he was rather uneasy as to the effect on her. But Dorothea was strangely quiet, not immediately indignant, as she had been on a like occasion in Rome. And the cause lay deep. She was no longer struggling against the perception of facts, but adjusting herself to their clearest perception. And now when she looked steadily at her husband's failure, still more at his possible consciousness of failure, she seemed to be looking along the one track where duty became tenderness. Will's want of reticence might have been met with more severity, if he had not already been recommended to her mercy by her husband's dislike, which must seem hard to her till she saw better reason for it. She did not answer at once, but after looking down ruminatingly, she said, with some earnestness, Mr. Casaubon must have overcome his dislike of you so far as his actions were concerned, and that is admirable. Yes, he has shown a sense of justice in family matters. It was an abominable thing that my grandmother should have been disinherited because she made what they called a mess alliance, though there was nothing to be said against her husband except that he was a Polish refugee who gave lessons for his bread. "'I wish I knew all about her,' said Dorothea. "'I wonder how she bore the change from wealth to poverty. I wonder whether she was happy with her husband. Do you know much about them?' "'No, only that my grandfather was a patriot, a bright fellow, could speak many languages, musical, got his bread by teaching all sorts of things. They both died rather early.' and I never knew much of my father beyond what my mother told me, but he inherited the musical talents. I remember his slow walk and his long, thin hands. 
and one day remains with me when he was lying ill, and I was very hungry, and had only a little bit of bread. Oh, what a different life from mine, said Dorothea, with keen interest, clasping her hands on her lap. I have always had too much of everything. But tell me how it was. Mr. Casaubon could not have known about you then. No, but my father had made himself known to Mr. Casaubon, and that was my last hungry day. My father died soon after, and my mother and I were well taken care of. Mr. Casaubon always expressly recognized it as his duty to take care of us because of the harsh injustice which had been shown to his mother's sister. But now I am telling you what is not new to you. In his inmost soul, Will was conscious of wishing to tell Dorothea what was rather new even in his own construction of things, namely, that Mr. Casaubon had never done more than pay a debt towards him. Will was much too good a fellow to be easy under the sense of being ungrateful, and when gratitude has become a matter of reasoning, there are many ways of escaping from its bonds. No, answered Dorothea. Mr. Casaubon has always avoided dwelling on his own honorable actions. She did not feel that her husband's conduct was depreciated, but this notion of what justice had required in his relations with Will Ladislaw took strong hold on her mind. After a moment's pause, she added, "'He had never told me that he supported your mother. Is she still living?' "'No, she died by an accident, a fall, four years ago.' It is curious that my mother, too, ran away from her family, but not for the sake of her husband. She never would tell me anything about her family, except that she forsook them to get her own living, went on the stage, in fact. She was a dark-eyed creature with crisp ringlets and never seemed to be getting old. You see, I come of rebellious blood on both sides, Will ended, smiling brightly at Dorothea while she was still looking with serious intentness before her, like a child seeing a drama for the first time. But her face, too, broke into a smile as she said, "'That is your apology, I suppose, for having yourself been rather rebellious, I mean, to Mr. Casaubon's wishes. You must remember that you have not done what he thought best for you. And if he dislikes you, you were speaking of dislike a little while ago, but I should rather say, if he has shown any painful feelings towards you, you must consider how sensitive he has become from the wearing effect of study. Perhaps, she continued, getting into a pleading tone, my uncle has not told you how serious Mr. Casaubon's illness was. It would be very petty of us who are well and can bear things to think much of small offenses from those who carry a weight of trial. You teach me better, said Will. I will never grumble on that subject again. There was a gentleness in his tone which came from the unutterable contentment of perceiving, what Dorothea was hardly conscious of, that she was traveling into the remoteness of pure pity and loyalty towards her husband. Will was ready to adore her pity and loyalty if she would associate himself with her in manifesting them. I have really sometimes been a perverse fellow, he went on but I will never again, if I can help it, do or say what you would disapprove. That is very good of you, said Dorothea, with another open smile. I shall have a little kingdom, then, where I shall give laws. But you will soon go away out of my rule, I imagine. You will soon be tired of staying at the Grange. That is a point I wanted to mention to you, one of the reasons why I wished to speak to you alone. Mr. Brooke proposes that I should stay in this neighborhood. He has bought one of the Middlemarch newspapers, and he wishes me to conduct that, and also to help him in other ways. "'Would not that be a sacrifice of higher prospects for you?' said Dorothea. "'Perhaps. But I have always been blamed for thinking of prospects, and not settling to anything. And here is something offered to me. If you would not like me to accept it, I will give it up. Otherwise, I would rather stay in this part of the country than go away. I belong to nobody anywhere else. I should like you to stay very much, said Dorothea, at once, as simply and readily as she had spoken at Rome. There was not the shadow of a reason in her mind at the moment why she should not say so. 
then I will stay, said Ladislaw, shaking his head backward, rising and going towards the window, as if to see whether the rain had ceased. But the next moment Dorothea, according to a habit which was getting continually stronger, began to reflect that her husband felt differently from herself, and she colored deeply under the double embarrassment of having expressed what might be in opposition to her husband's feeling, and of having to suggest this opposition to Will. His face was not turned towards her, and this made it easier to say, "'But my opinion is of little consequence on such a subject. I think you should be guided by Mr. Casaubon. I spoke without thinking of anything else than my own feeling, which has nothing to do with the real question. But it now occurs to me, perhaps Mr. Casaubon might see that the proposal was not wise. Can you not wait now and mention it to him?' "'I can't wait to-day,' said Will, inwardly seared by the possibility that Mr. Casaubon would enter. "'The rain is quite over now. I told Mr. Brooke not to call for me. I would rather walk the five miles. I shall strike across Halsell Common and see the gleams on the wet grass. I like that.' He approached her to shake hands quite hurriedly, longing but not daring to say, "'Don't mention the subject to Mr. Casaubon.' "'No, he dared not, could not say it. "'To ask her to be less simple and direct "'would be like breathing on the crystal "'that you want to see the light through. "'And there was always the other great dread "'of himself becoming dimmed and forever ray-shorn in her eyes. "'I wish you could have stayed,' said Dorothea, "'with a touch of mournfulness, "'as she rose and put out her hand.' She also had her thought, which she did not like to express. Will certainly ought to lose no time in consulting Mr. Casaubon's wishes, but for her to urge this might seem an undue dictation. So they only said good-bye, and Will quitted the house, striking across the fields so as not to run any risk of encountering Mr. Casaubon's carriage, which, however, did not appear at the gate until four o'clock. That was an unpropitious hour for coming home. It was too early to gain the moral support under ennui of dressing his person for dinner, and too late to undress his mind of the day's frivolous ceremony and affairs, so as to be prepared for a good plunge into the serious business of study. On such occasions he usually threw into an easy-chair in the library and allowed Dorothea to read the London papers to him, closing his eyes the while. Today, however, he declined that relief, observing that he had already had too many public details urged upon him. But he spoke more cheerfully than usual when Dorothea asked about his fatigue, and added with that air of formal effort which never forsook him, even when he spoke without his waistcoat and cravat, "'I have had the gratification of meeting my former acquaintance, Dr. Spanning, today and of being praised by one who is himself a worthy recipient of praise. He spoke very handsomely of my late tractate on the Egyptian mysteries, using, in fact, terms which it would not become me to repeat. In uttering the last clause, Mr. Casaubon leaned over the elbow of his chair, and swayed his head up and down, apparently as a muscular outlet instead of that recapitulation which would not have been becoming. "'I am very glad you have had that pleasure,' said Dorothea, delighted to see her husband less weary than usual at this hour. "'Before you came I had been regretting that you happened to be out to-day.' "'Why so, my dear?' said Mr. Casaubon, throwing himself backward again. "'Because Mr. Ladislaw has been here, and he has mentioned a proposal of my uncle's which I should like to know your opinion of.' Her husband, she felt, was really concerned in this question." Even with her ignorance of the world, she had a vague impression that the position offered to Will was out of keeping with his family connections, and certainly Mr. Casbon had a claim to be consulted. He did not speak, but merely bowed. "'Dear uncle, you know, has many projects. It appears that he has bought one of the Middlemarch newspapers, and he has asked Mr. Ladislaw to stay in this neighborhood and conduct the paper for him, besides helping him in other ways.' Dorothea looked at her husband while she spoke, but he had at first blinked and finally closed his eyes, as if to say them, 
while his lips became more tense. "'What is your opinion?' she added rather timidly, after a slight pause. "'Did Mr. Ladislaw come on purpose to ask my opinion?' said Mr. Casaubon, opening his eyes narrowly with a knife-edged look at Dorothea. She was really uncomfortable on the point he inquired about, but she only became a little more serious, and her eyes did not swerve. No, she answered immediately. He did not say that he came to ask your opinion, but when he mentioned the proposal, he of course expected me to tell you of it. Mr. Casaubon was silent. I feared that you might feel some objection, but certainly a young man with so much talent might be very useful to my uncle, might help him to do good in a better way, and Mr. Ladislaw wishes to have some fixed occupation. He has been blamed, he says, for not seeking something of that kind, and he would like to stay in this neighborhood because no one cares for him elsewhere. Dorothea felt that this was a consideration to soften her husband. However, he did not speak, and she presently recurred to Dr. Spanning and the archdeacon's breakfast. But there was no longer sunshine on these subjects. The next morning, without Dorothea's knowledge, Mr. Casaubon dispatched the following letter, beginning, Dear Mr. Ladislaw. He had always before addressed him as Will. Mrs. Casaubon informs me that a proposal has been made to you, and, according to an inference by no means stretched, has on your part been in some degree entertained, which involves your residence in this neighborhood in a capacity which I am justified in saying touches my own position in such a way as renders it not only natural and warrantable in me, when that effect is viewed under the influence of legitimate feeling, but incumbent on me when the same effect is considered in the light of my responsibilities, to state at once that your acceptance of the proposal above indicated would be highly offensive to me. That I have some claim to the exercise of a veto here would not, I believe, be denied by any reasonable person cognizant of the relations between us, relations which, though thrown into the past by your recent procedure, are not thereby annulled in their character of determining antecedents. I will not here make reflections on any person's judgment. It is enough for me to point out to yourself that there are certain social fitnesses and proprieties which should hinder a somewhat near relative of mine from becoming anywise conspicuous in this vicinity in a status not only much beneath my own, but associated at best with the sialism of literary or political adventurers. At any rate, the contrary issue must exclude you from further reception at my house. Yours faithfully, Edward Casabon. Meanwhile, Dorothea's mind was innocently at work towards the further embitterment of her husband, dwelling with the sympathy that grew to agitation on what Will had told her about his parents and grandparents. Any private hours in her day were usually spent in her blue-green boudoir, and she had come to be very fond of its pallid quaintness. Nothing had been outwardly altered there, but while the summer had gradually advanced over the western fields beyond the avenue of elms, the bare room had gathered within it those memories of an inward life which filled the air as with a cloud of good or bad angels, the invisible yet active forms of our spiritual triumphs or our spiritual falls. She had been so used to struggle for and to find resolve in looking along the avenue towards the arch of western light that the vision itself had gained a communicating power. Even the pale stag seemed to have reminding glances, and to mean mutely, Yes, we know. And the group of delicately touched miniatures had made an audience as of beings no longer disturbed about their own earthly lot, but still humanly interested. Especially the mysterious Aunt Julia, about whom Dorothea had never found it easy to question her husband. And now, since her conversation with Will, many fresh images had gathered round that Aunt Julia, who was Will's grandmother, the presence of that delicate miniature, so like a living face that she knew, helping to concentrate her feelings. What a wrong! 
to cut off the girl from the family protection and inheritance only because she had chosen a man who was poor. Dorothea, early troubling her elders with questions about the facts around her, had wrought herself into some independent clearness as to the historical, political reasons why eldest sons had superior rights and why land should be entailed. Those reasons, impressing her with a certain awe, might be weightier than she knew, but here was a question of ties which left them uninfringed. Here was a daughter whose child, even according to the ordinary aping of aristocratic institutions by people who are no more aristocratic than retired grocers, and who have no more land to keep together than a lawn and a paddock, would have a prior claim. Was inheritance a question of liking, or of responsibility? All the energy of Dorothea's natures went on the side of responsibility, the fulfillment of claims founded on our own deeds, such as marriage and parentage. It was true, she said to herself, that Mr. Casaubon had a debt to the Ladislaws, that he had to pay back what the Ladislaws had been wronged of. And now she began to think of her husband's will, which had been made at the time of their marriage, leaving the bulk of his property to her, with proviso in case of her having children. That ought to be altered, and no time ought to be lost. This very question, which had just arisen about Will Ladislaw's occupation, was the occasion for placing things on a new, right footing. Her husband, she felt sure, according to all his previous conduct, would be ready to take the just view, if she proposed it. She, in whose interest an unfair concentration of the property had been urged, his sense of right had surmounted, and would continue to surmount, anything that might be called antipathy. She suspected that her uncle's scheme was disapproved by Mr. Casaubon, and this made it seem all the more opportune that a fresh understanding should be begun, so that instead of Will's starting penniless and accepting the first function that offered itself, he should find himself in possession of a rightful income which should be paid by her husband during his life, and by an immediate alteration of the will should be secured at his death. The vision of all this as what ought to be done seemed to Dorothea like a sudden letting in of daylight, waking her from her previous stupidity and incurious, self-absorbed ignorance about her husband's relation to others. Will Ladislaw had refused Mr. Casaubon's future aid on a ground that no longer appeared right to her, and Mr. Casaubon had never himself seen fully what was the claim upon him. But he will, said Dorothea, the great strength of his character lies here. And what are we doing with our money? We make no use of half of our income. My own money buys me nothing but an uneasy conscience. There was a peculiar fascination for Dorothea in this division of property intended for herself, and always regarded by her as excessive. She was blind, you see, to many things obvious to others, likely to tread in the wrong places, as Celia had warned her. Yet her blindness to whatever did not lie in her own pure purpose carried her safely by the side of precipices where vision would have been perilous with fear. The thoughts which had gathered vividness in the solitude of her boudoir occupied her incessantly through the day on which Mr. Casaubon had sent his letter to Will. Everything seemed hindrance to her till she could find an opportunity of opening her heart to her husband. To his preoccupied mind all subjects were to be approached gently and she had never since his illness lost from her consciousness the dread of agitating him. But when young ardor is set brooding over the conception of a prompt deed, the deed itself seems to start forth with independent life, mastering ideal obstacles. The day passed in a somber fashion, not unusual, though Mr. Casaubon was perhaps unusually silent. But there were hours of the night, which might be counted on as opportunities of conversation. For Dorothea, when aware of her husband's sleeplessness, had established a habit of rising, lighting a candle, and reading him to sleep again. And this night she was from the beginning sleepless, excited by resolves. 
He slept as usual for a few hours, but she had risen softly, and had sat in the darkness for nearly an hour, before he said, "'Dorothea, since you are up, will you light a candle?' "'Do you feel ill, dear?' was her first question, as she obeyed him. "'No, not at all, but I shall be obliged, since you are up, if you will read me a few pages of loath. "'May I talk to you a little instead?' said Dorothea. "'Certainly.' I have been thinking about money all day, that I have always had too much, and especially the prospect of too much. These, my dear Dorothea, are providential arrangements. But if one has too much in consequence of others being wronged, it seems to me that the divine voice which tells us to set that wrong right must be obeyed. What, my love, is the bearing of your remark? that you have been too liberal in arrangements for me, I mean, with regard to property, and that makes me unhappy. How so? I have none but comparatively distant connections. I have been led to think about your Aunt Julia, and how she was left in poverty only because she married a poor man, an act which was not disgraceful, since he was not unworthy. It was on that ground, I know, that you educated Mr. Ladislaw and provided for his mother. Dorothea waited a few moments for some answer that would help her onward. None came, and her next words seemed the more forcible to her, falling clear upon the dark silence. But surely we should regard his claim as a much greater one, even to the half of that property which I know that you have destined for me, and I think he ought at once to be provided for on that understanding— It is not right that he should be in dependence of poverty while we are rich, and if there is any objection to the proposal he mentioned, the giving him his true place and his true share would set aside any motive for his accepting it. "'Mr. Ladislaw has probably been speaking to you on this subject,' said Mr. Casaubon, with a certain biting quickness not habitual to him. "'Indeed, no,' said Dorothea earnestly. "'How can you imagine it?' since he has so lately declined everything from you. I fear you think too hardly of him, dear. He only told me a little about his parents and grandparents, and almost all in answer to my questions. You are so good, so just, you have done everything you thought to be right, but it seems to me clear that more than that is right, and I must speak about it, since I am the person who would get what is called benefit by that more not being done. There was a perceptible pause before Mr. Casaubon replied, not quickly as before, but with a still more biting emphasis. Dorothea, my love, this is not the first occasion, but it were well that it should be the last, on which you have assumed a judgment on subjects beyond your scope. Into the question how far conduct, especially in the matter of alliances, constitutes a forfeiture of family claims, I do not now enter. Suffice it that you are not here qualified to discriminate. What I now wish you to understand is that I accept no revision, still less dictation within that range of affairs which I have deliberated upon as distinctly and properly mine. It is not for you to interfere between me and Mr. Ladislaw, and still less to encourage communications from him to you which constitute a criticism on my procedure. Poor Dorothea, shrouded in the darkness, was in a tumult of conflicting emotions, alarm at the possible effect on himself of her husband's strongly manifested anger would have checked any expression of her own resentment even if she had been quite free from doubt and compunction under the consciousness that there might be some justice in his last insinuation. Hearing him breathe quickly after he had spoken, she sat listening, frightened, wretched, with a dumb inward cry for help to bear this nightmare of a life in which every energy was arrested by dread. But nothing else happened, except that they both remained a long while sleepless without speaking again. The next day, Mr. Casaubon received the following answer from Will Ladislaw. Dear Mr. Casaubon, I have given all due consideration to your letter of yesterday, 
but I am unable to take precisely your view of our mutual position. With the fullest acknowledgment of your generous conduct to me in the past, I must still maintain that an obligation of this kind cannot fairly fetter me as you appear to expect that it should. Granted that a benefactor's wishes may constitute a claim, there must always be a reservation as to the quality of those wishes. They may possibly clash with more imperative considerations, or a benefactor's veto might impose such a negation on a man's life that the consequent blank might be more cruel than the benefaction was generous. I am merely using strong illustrations. In the present case, I am unable to take your view of the bearing which my acceptance of occupation, not enriching certainly, but not dishonorable, will have on your own position, which seems to me too substantial to be affected in that shadowy manner. And, though I do not believe that any change in our relations will occur, certainly none has yet occurred, which can nullify the obligations imposed on me by the past, pardon me for not seeing that those obligations should restrain me from using the ordinary freedom of living where I choose, and maintaining myself by any lawful occupation I may choose. Regretting that there exists this difference between us as to a relation in which the conferring of benefits has been entirely on your side, I remain yours with persistent obligation, Will Ladislaw. Poor Mr. Casabon felt, and must not we, being impartial, feel with him a little, that no man had juster cause for disgust and suspicion than he. Young Ladislaw, he was sure, meant to defy and annoy him, meant to win Dorothea's confidence, and sow her mind with disrespect, and perhaps aversion, towards her husband. Some motive beneath the surface had been needed to account for Will's sudden change in rejecting Mr. Casbon's aid and quitting his travels, and this defiant determination to fix himself in the neighborhood by taking up something so much at variance with his former choice as Mr. Brooke's Middlemarch projects, revealed clearly enough that the undeclared motive had relation to Dorothea. Not for one moment did Mr. Casabon suspect Dorothea of any doubleness. He had no suspicions of her. But he had, what was little less uncomfortable, the positive knowledge that her tendency to form opinions about her husband's conduct was accompanied with a disposition to regard Will Ladislaw favorably and be influenced by what he said. His own proud reticence had prevented him from ever being undeceived in the supposition that Dorothea had originally asked her uncle to invite Will to his house. And now, on receiving Will's letter, Mr. Casabon had to consider his duty. He would never have been easy to call his action anything else than duty. But in this case, contending motives thrust him back into negations. Should he apply directly to Mr. Brooke, and demand of that troublesome gentleman to revoke his proposal? or should he consult Sir James Chetham, and get him to concur in remonstrance against a step which touched the whole family? In either case, Mr. Casbon was aware that failure was just as probable as success. It was impossible for him to mention Dorothea's name in the matter, and without some alarming urgency, Mr. Brooke was as likely as not, after meeting all representations with apparent assent, to wind up by saying, "'Never fear, Casabon. Depend on it. Young Ladislaw will do you credit. Depend upon it. I have put my finger on the right thing.' And Mr. Casabon shrank nervously from communicating on the subject with Sir James Chetham, between whom and himself there had never been any cordiality, and who would immediately think of Dorothea without any mention of her. Poor Mr. Casabon was distrustful of everybody's feelings towards him, especially as a husband. To let any one suppose that he was jealous would be to admit their suspected view of his disadvantages. To let them know that he did not find marriage particularly blissful would imply his conversion to their probably earlier disapproval. It would be as bad as letting carp and brazenose generally 
know how backward he was in organizing the matter for his key to all mythologies. All through his life Mr. Casaubon had been trying not to admit even to himself the inward sores of self-doubt and jealousy, and on the most delicate of all personal subjects the habit of proud suspicious reticence told doubly. Thus Mr. Casaubon remained proudly, bitterly silent. But he had forbidden Will to come to Lowick Manor, and he was mentally preparing other measures of frustration. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 C'est beaucoup que le jugement des hommes sur les actions humaines, tôt ou tard, il devient efficace. Guizot Sir James Chetham could not look with any satisfaction on Mr. Brooke's new courses, but it was easier to object than to hinder. Sir James accounted for his having come in alone one day to lunch with the Cadwalladers by saying, "'I can't talk to you as I want, before Celia. It might hurt her. Indeed, it would not be right.' "'I know what you mean. The pioneer at the Grange,' darted in Mrs. Cadwallader, almost before the last word was off her friend's tongue. "'It is frightful, this taking to buying whistles and blowing them in everybody's hearing, lying in bed all day and playing at dominoes like poor Lord Plessy would be more private and bearable.' "'I see they are beginning to attack our friend Brooke in the trumpet,' said the rector, lounging back and smiling easily, as he would have done if he had been attacked himself. There are tremendous sarcasms against a landlord not a hundred miles from Middlemarch who receives his own rents and makes no returns. I do wish Brooke would leave that off, said Sir James, with his little frown of annoyance. Is he really going to be put in nomination, though? said Mr. Cadwallader. I saw Fairbrother yesterday. He's Whiggish himself, hoists Brougham and useful knowledge. That's the worst I know of him and he says that Brooke is getting up a pretty strong party. Bulstrode, the banker, is his foremost man. But he thinks Brooke would come off badly at a nomination. Exactly, said Sir James, with earnestness. I have been inquiring into the thing, for I've never known anything about Middlemarch politics before, the county being my business. What Brooke trusts to is that they're going to turn out Oliver because he's a Peelite. But Holly tells me that if they send up a wig at all, it is sure to be Bagster, one of those candidates who comes from heaven knows where, but dead against ministers, and an experienced parliamentary man. Holly's rather rough. He forgot that he was speaking to me. He said that if Brooke wanted a pelting, he could get it cheaper than by going to the hustings. "'I warned you all of it,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, waving her hands outward. "'I said to Humphrey long ago, Mr. Brooke is going to make a splash in the mud, and now he has done it. "'Well, he might have taken it into his head to marry,' said the rector. "'That would have been a graver mess than a little flirtation with politics.' "'He may do that afterwards,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, "'when he has come out on the other side of the mud with an ague.' "'What I care for most is his own dignity,' said Sir James. "'Of course I care the more because of the family.' "'But he's getting on in life now, and I don't like to think of his exposing himself. "'They will be raking up everything against him.' "'I suppose it's no use trying any persuasion,' said the rector. "'There's such an odd mixture of obstinacy and changeableness in Brooke. "'Have you tried him on the subject?' "'Well, no,' said Sir James. "'I feel a delicacy in appearing to dictate.' but I have been talking to this young Ladislaw that Brooke is making a factotum of. Ladislaw seems clever enough for anything. I thought it as well to hear what he had to say, and he is against Brooke's standing this time. I think he'll turn him around. I think the nomination may be staved off. I know, said Mrs. Cadwallader, nodding. The independent member hasn't got his speeches well enough by heart. "'But this Ladislaw, there again is a vexatious business,' said Sir James. "'We have had him two or three times to dine at the hall—you've met him, by the by—as Brooke's guest at a relation of Casabon's, thinking he was only on a flying visit. And now I find he's in everybody's mouth in Middlemarch as the editor of the Pioneer. There are stories going about him as a quill-driving alien, a foreign emissary, and what not.' 
Casabon won't like that, said the rector. There is some foreign blood in Ladislaw, returned Sir James. I hope he won't go into extreme opinions and carry Brooke on. Oh, he's a dangerous young sprig, that Mr. Ladislaw, said Mrs. Cadwallader, with his opera songs and his ready tongue. A sort of Byronic hero, an amorous conspirator, it strikes me. And Thomas Aquinas is not fond of him. I could see that the day the picture was brought. I don't like to begin on the subject with Casabon, said Sir James. He has more right to interfere than I. But it's a disagreeable affair all around. What a character for anybody with decent connections to show himself in. One of those newspaper fellows. You only have to look at Keck, who manages the trumpet. I saw him the other day with Hawley. His writing is sound enough, I believe, but he's such a low fellow that I wished he had been on the wrong side. "'What can you expect with these peddling Middlemarch papers?' said the rector. "'I don't suppose you could get a high style of man anywhere to be writing up interests he doesn't really care about, and for pay that hardly keeps him in at elbows.' "'Exactly. That's what makes it so annoying that Brooke should have put a man who has a sort of connection with the family in a position of that kind.' For my part, I think Ladislaw is rather a fool for accepting. "'It's Aquinas's fault,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Why didn't he use his interest to get Ladislaw made an attaché or sent to India? That is how families get rid of troublesome sprigs.' "'There is no knowing to what lengths the mischief may go,' said Sir James anxiously. "'But if Casabon says nothing, what can I do?' "'Oh, my dear Sir James,' said the rector, don't let us make too much of all this. It is likely enough to end in mere smoke. After a month or two, Brooke and this master Ladislaw will get tired of each other. Ladislaw will take wing, Brooke will sell the pioneer, and everything will settle down again as usual. There is one good chance that he will not like to feel his money oozing away, said Mrs. Cadwallader. If I knew the items of election expenses, I could scare him. It's no use plying him with wide words like expenditure. I wouldn't talk of phlebotomy. I would empty a pot of leeches upon him. What we good, stingy people don't like is having our sixpences sucked away from us. And he will not like having things raked up against him, said Sir James. There is the management of his estate. They have begun upon that already. And it really is painful for me to see. It is a nuisance under one's very nose. I do think one is bound to do the best for one's land and tenants, especially in these hard times. Perhaps the trumpet may rouse him to make a change, and some good may come of it all, said the rector. I know I should be glad. I should hear less grumbling when my tithe is paid. I don't know what I should do if there were not a modus in Tipton. I want him to have a proper man to look after things. I want him to take on Garth again, said Sir James. He got rid of Garth twelve years ago, and everything has been going wrong since. I think of getting Garth to manage for me. He has made such a capital plan for my buildings, and Lovegood is hardly up to the mark. But Garth would not undertake the Tipton estate again unless Brooke left it entirely to him. In the right of it, too, said the rector. Garth is an independent fellow, an original, simple-minded fellow. One day, when he was doing some valuation for me, he told me point-blank that clergymen seldom understood anything about business and did mischief when they meddled, but he said it as quietly and respectfully as if he had been talking to me about sailors. He would make a different parish of Tipton if Brooke would let him manage. I wish, by the help of the trumpet, you could bring that round. If Dorothea had kept near her uncle, there would have been some chance, said Sir James. She might have got some power over him in time, and she was always uneasy about the estate. She had wonderfully good notions about such things. But now Casabon takes her up entirely. Celia complains a good deal. We can hardly get her to dine with us since he had that fit. Sir James ended with a look of pitying disgust, and Mrs. Cadwallader shrugged her shoulders as much as to say that she was not likely to see anything new in that direction. "'Poor Casabon,' the rector said. "'That was a nasty attack. "'I thought he looked shattered the other day at the archdeacon's.' "'In point of fact,' resumed Sir James, 
not choosing to dwell on fits. Brooke doesn't mean badly by his tenants or anyone else, but he's got that way of paring and clipping at expenses. Come, that's a blessing, said Mrs. Cadwallader. That helps him to find himself in a morning. He may not know his own opinions, but he does know his own pocket. I don't believe a man is in pocket by stinginess on his land. Oh, stinginess may be abused like other virtues. It will not do to keep one's own pigs lean, said Mrs. Cadwallader, who had risen to look out of the window. But talk of an independent politician, and he will appear. What, Brooke? said her husband. Yes. Now you ply him with the trumpet, Humphrey, and I will put the leeches on him. What will you do, Sir James? The fact is, I don't like to begin about it with Brooke, in our mutual position. The whole thing is so unpleasant. I do wish people would behave like gentlemen, said the good baronet, feeling that this was a simple and comprehensive program for social well-being. Here you all are, eh? said Mr. Brooke, shuffling round and shaking hands. I was going up to the hall by and by, Chetham, but it's pleasant to find everybody you know. Well, what do you think of things? Going on a little fast. It was true enough what Lafitte said. Since yesterday a century has passed away. They're in the next century, you know, on the other side of the water, going on faster than we are. Why, yes, said the rector, taking up the newspaper. Here is the trumpet accusing you of lagging behind. Did you see? Eh, no, said Mr. Brooke, dropping his gloves into his hat and hastily adjusting his eyeglass. But Mr. Cadwallader kept the paper in his hand, saying, with a smile in his eyes, Look here, all this is about a landlord not a hundred miles from Middlemarch who receives his own rents. They say he is the most retrogressive man in the county. I think you must have taught them that word in the Pioneer. Oh, that is Keck, an illiterate fellow, you know. Retrogressive now. Come, that's capital. He thinks it means destructive. They want to make me out a destructive, you know, said Mr. Brooke, with that cheerfulness which is usually sustained by an adversary's ignorance. I think he knows the meaning of the word. Here is a sharp stroke or two. If we had to describe a man who is retrogressive in the most evil sense of the word, we should say he is one who would dub himself a reformer in our Constitution, while every interest for which he is immediately responsible is going to decay. A philanthropist who cannot bear one rogue to be hanged, but does not mind five honest tenants being half-starved, a man who shrieks at corruption and keeps his farms at rack-rent, who roars himself red at rotten burrows and does not mind if every field on his farms has a rotten gate, a man very open-hearted to Leeds in Manchester, no doubt, he would give any number of representatives who will pay for their seats out of their own pockets. What he objects to giving is a little return on rent days to help a tenant to buy stock, or an outlay on repairs to keep the weather out at a tenant's barn door, or make his house look a little less like an Irish cottier's. But we all know the wag's definition of a philanthropist, a man whose charity increases directly as the square of the distance, and so on. All the rest is to show what sort of legislator a philanthropist is likely to make, ended the rector, throwing down the paper and clasping his hands at the back of his head, while he looked at Mr. Brooke with an air of amused neutrality. "'Come, that's rather good, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, taking up the paper and trying to bear the attack as easily as his neighbor did, but coloring and smiling rather nervously. "'That about roaring himself red at rotten burrows. I never made a speech about rotten burrows in my life. And as to roaring myself red and that kind of thing— these men never understand what is good satire. Satire, you know, should be true up to a certain point. I recollect they said that in the Edinburgh somewhere. It must be true up to a certain point. Well, that is really a hit about the gates, said Sir James, anxious to tread carefully. Dagley complained to me the other day that he hadn't got a decent gate on his farm. Garth has invented a new pattern of gate. I wish you would try it. One ought to use some of one's timber in that way. You go in for fancy farming, you know, Chetham, said Mr. Brooke, appearing to glance over the columns of the trumpet. That's your hobby, and you don't mind the expense. 
"'I thought the most expensive hobby in the world was standing for Parliament,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'They said the last unsuccessful candidate at Middlemarch, Giles, wasn't his name, spent ten thousand pounds and failed because he did not bribe enough. What a bitter reflection for a man!' "'Somebody was saying,' said the rector laughingly, "'that East Retford was nothing to Middlemarch for bribery.' "'Nothing of the kind,' said Mr. Brooke. "'The Tories bribe, you know. Hawley and his set bribe with treating, hot codlings, and that sort of thing. And they bring the voters drunk to the poll. But they are not going to have it their own way in the future, not in future, you know. Middlemarch is a little backward, I admit. The freemen are a little backward. But we shall educate them. We shall bring them on, you know. The best people there are on our side.' "'Holly says you have men on your side who will do you harm,' remarked Sir James. "'He says Bulstrode the banker will do you harm.' "'And if that got you pelted,' interposed Mrs. Cadwallader, "'half the rotten eggs would mean hatred of your committee man. "'Good heavens! Think what it must be to be pelted for wrong opinions. "'And I seem to remember a story of a man they pretended to chair "'and let him fall into a dust-heap on purpose.' "'Pelting is nothing to their finding holes in one's coat,' said the rector. "'I confess that's what I should be afraid of, if we parsons had to stand at the hustings for preferment. I should be afraid of their reckoning up all my fishing days. Upon my word, I think the truth is the hardest missile one can be pelted with.' "'The fact is,' said Sir James, "'if a man goes into public life, he must be prepared for the consequences.' He must make himself proof against calumny. "'My dear Chetham, that is all very fine, you know,' said Mr. Brooke. "'But how will you make yourself proof against calumny? You should read history, look at ostracism, persecution, martyrdom, and that kind of thing. They always happen to the best men, you know. But what is that in Horace? Fiat justitia, ruat, something or other?' Exactly, said Sir James, with a little more heat than usual. What I mean by being proof against calumny is being able to point to the fact as a contradiction. And it is not martyrdom to pay bills that one is run into one's self, said Mrs. Cadwallader. But it was Sir James' evident annoyance that most stirred Mr. Brooke. Well, you know, Chetham, he said, rising, taking up his hat and leaning on his stick. "'You and I have a different system. "'You are all for outlay with your farms. "'I don't want to make out that my system is good under all circumstances, "'under all circumstances, you know.' "'There ought to be a new valuation made from time to time,' said Sir James. "'Returns are very well occasionally, but I like a fair valuation. "'What do you say, Cadwallader?' "'I agree with you. "'If I were Brooke, I would choke the trumpet at once by getting Garth to make a new valuation of the farms and giving him carte blanche about gates and repairs. That's my view of the political situation, said the rector, broadening himself by sticking his thumbs in his armholes and laughing towards Mr. Brooke. That's a showy sort of thing to do, you know, said Mr. Brooke, but I should like you to tell me of another landlord who has distressed his tenants for arrears as little as I have. I let the old tenants stay on. I'm uncommonly easy, let me tell you, uncommonly easy. I have my own ideas, and I take my stand on them, you know. A man who does that is always charged with eccentricity, inconsistency, and that kind of thing. When I change my line of action, I shall follow my own ideas. After that, Mr. Brooke remembered that there was a packet which he had omitted to send off from the Grange, and he bade everybody hurriedly good-bye. "'I didn't want to take a liberty with Brooke,' said Sir James. "'I see he is nettled. But as to what he says about old tenants, in point of fact no new tenant would take the farms on the present terms.' "'I have a notion that he will be brought round in time,' said the rector. "'But you were pulling one way, Eleanor, and we were pulling another. You wanted to frighten him away from expense, and we want to frighten him into it. Better let him try to be popular and see that his character as a landlord stands in his way. I don't think it signifies two straws about the pioneer, or Ladislaw, or Brooks speechifying to the middle marchers. 
but it does signify about the parishioners in Tipton being comfortable. "'Excuse me, it is you two who are on the wrong tack,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'You should have proved to him that he loses money by bad management, and then we should all have pulled together. If you put him a horseback on politics, I warn you of the consequences. It was all very well to ride on sticks at home and call them ideas.' End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 As, if I have, you also do, Virtue attired in woman see, And dare love that, and say so too, And forget the he and she. And if this love, though placed so, From profane men you hide, Which will no faith on this bestow, Or if they do, deride, then you have done a braver thing than all the worthies did, and a braver thence will spring, which is to keep that hid. Dr. Dunn Sir James Chetham's mind was not fruitful in devices, but his growing anxiety to act on Brooke once brought close to his constant belief in Dorothea's capacity for influence became formative and issued a little plan namely, to plead Celia's indisposition as a reason for fetching Dorothea by herself to the hall, and to leave her at the Grange with the carriage on the way, after making her fully aware of the situation concerning the management of the estate. In this way it happened that one day near four o'clock, when Mr. Brooke and Ladislaw were seated in the library, the door opened and Mrs. Casaubon was announced. Will, the moment before, had been low in the depths of boredom, and obliged to help Mr. Brooke in arranging documents about hanging sheep-stealers, was exemplifying the power our minds have of riding several horses at once by inwardly arranging measures towards getting a lodging for himself in Middlemarch, and cutting short his constant residence at the Grange, while there flitted through all these steadier images a tickling vision of a sheep-stealing epic written with Homeric particularity. When Mrs. Casaubon was announced, he started up as from an electric shock, and felt a tingling at his finger-ends. Any one observing him would have seen a change in his complexion, in the adjustment of his facial muscles, in the vividness of his glance, which might have made them imagine that every molecule in his body had passed the message of a magic touch. And so it had, for effective magic is transcendent nature, and who shall measure the subtlety of those touches which convey the quality of soul as well as body, and make a man's passion for one woman differ from his passion for another as joy in the morning light over valley and river and white mountain tops differs from joy among Chinese lanterns and glass panels. Will, too, was made of very impressible stuff. The bow of a violin drawn near him cleverly would at one stroke change the aspect of the world for him, and his point of view shifted as easily as his mood. Dorothea's entrance was the freshness of morning. "'Well, my dear, this is pleasant now,' said Mr. Brooke, meeting and kissing her. You have left Casaubon with his books, I suppose. That's right. We must not have you get too learned for a woman, you know. There is no fear of that, uncle, said Dorothea, turning to Will and shaking hands with open cheerfulness, while she made no other form of greeting, but went on answering her uncle. I am very slow. When I want to be busy with books, I am often playing truant among my thoughts. I find it is not so easy to be learned as to plan cottages. She seated herself beside her uncle opposite to Will, and was evidently preoccupied with something that made her almost unmindful of him. He was ridiculously disappointed, as if he had imagined that her coming had anything to do with him. "'Why, yes, my dear, it was quite your hobby to draw plans. But it was good to break that off a little. Hobbies are apt to run away with us, you know. It doesn't do to be run away with. We must keep the reins.' I have never let myself be run away with. I always pulled up. That is what I tell Ladislaw. He and I are alike, you know. He likes to go into everything. We are working at capital punishment. 
"'We shall do a great deal together, Ladislaw and I.' "'Yes,' said Dorothea, with characteristic directness. "'Sir James has been telling me that he is in hope of seeing a great change made soon in your management of the estate, that you are thinking of having the farms valued and repairs made, and the cottages improved, so that Tipton may look quite another place.' "'Oh, how happy!' she went on, clasping her hands with a return to that more childlike, impetuous manner, which had been subdued since her marriage. "'If I were at home still, I should take to writing again, that I might go about with you and see all that. And you are going to engage Mr. Garth, who praised my cottages, Sir James says.' "'Chetham is a little hasty, my dear,' said Mr. Brooke, colouring slightly. "'A little hasty, you know.' I never said I should do anything of the kind. I never said that I should not do it, you know. He only feels confident that you will do it, said Dorothea, in a voice as clear and unhesitating as that of a young chorister chanting a credo. Because you mean to enter Parliament as a member who cares for the improvement of the people, and one of the first things to be made better is the state of the land and the laborers. Think of Kit Downs, uncle, who lives with his wife and seven children in a house with one sitting-room and one bedroom hardly larger than this table. And those poor Dagleys, in their tumble-down farmhouse, where they live in the back kitchen and leave the other rooms to the rats. That is one reason why I did not like the pictures here, dear uncle, which you think me stupid about. I used to come from the village with all that dirt and coarse ugliness like a pain within me and the simpering pictures in the drawing-room seemed to me like a wicked attempt to find delight in what is false, while we don't mind how hard the truth is for our neighbors outside our walls. I think we have no right to come forward and urge wider changes for good until we have tried to alter the evils which lie under our own hands. Dorothea had gathered emotion as she went on, and had forgotten everything except the relief of pouring forth her feelings unchecked, an experience once habitual with her, but hardly ever present since her marriage, which had been a perpetual struggle of energy with fear. For the moment, Will's admiration was accompanied with a chilling sense of remoteness. A man is seldom ashamed of feeling that he cannot love a woman so well when he sees a certain greatness in her nature having intended greatness for men. But nature has sometimes made sad oversights in carrying out her intention, as in the case of good Mr. Brooke, whose masculine consciousness was at this moment in rather a stammering condition under the eloquence of his niece. He could not immediately find any other mode of expressing himself than that of rising, fixing his eyeglass, and fingering the papers before him. At last he said, "'There is something in what you say, my dear, something in what you say, but not everything, eh, Ladislaw? You and I don't like our pictures and statues being found fault with. Young ladies are a little ardent, you know, a little one-sided, my dear. Fine art, poetry, that kind of thing, elevates a nation. Emily Mores, you understand a little Latin now, but—' "'Eh, what?' These interrogatives were addressed to the footman, who had come in to say that the keeper had found one of Dagley's boys, with a leveret in his hand, just killed. "'I'll come, I'll come. I shall let him off easily, you know,' said Mr. Brooke aside to Dorothea, shuffling away very cheerfully. "'I hope you feel how right this change is that I—that Sir James wishes for,' said Dorothea to Will— as soon as her uncle was gone. "'I do, now I have heard you speak about it. I shall not forget what you have said. But can you think of something else at this moment? I may not have another opportunity of speaking to you about what has occurred,' said Will, rising with a movement of impatience, and holding the back of his chair with both hands. "'Pray tell me what it is,' said Dorothea, anxiously, also rising and going to the open window, where Monk was looking in, panting and wagging his tail. She leaned her back against the window-frame and laid her hand on the dog's head, for though, as we know, she was not fond of pets that must be held in the hands or trodden on, 
she was always attentive to the feelings of dogs, and very polite if she had to decline their advances. Will followed her only with his eyes, and said, I presume you know that Mr. Casaubon has forbidden me to go to his house. No, I did not, said Dorothea, after a moment's pause. She was evidently much moved. I am very, very sorry, she added mournfully. She was thinking of what Will had no knowledge of, the conversation between her and her husband in the darkness, and she was anew smitten with hopelessness that she could influence Mr. Casaubon's action. But the marked expression of her sorrow convinced Will that it was not all given to him personally, and that Dorothea had not been visited by the idea that Mr. Casaubon's dislike and jealousy of him turned upon herself. He felt an odd mixture of delight and vexation, of delight that he could dwell and be cherished in her thought as in a pure home, without suspicion and without stint, of vexation because he was of too little account with her, was not formidable enough, was treated with an unhesitating benevolence which did not flatter him. But his dread of any change in Dorothea was stronger than his discontent, and he began to speak again in a tone of mere explanation. Mr. Casaubon's reason is, his displeasure at my taking a position here which he considers unsuited to my rank as his cousin. I have told him that I cannot give way on this point. It is a little too hard on me to expect that my course in life is to be hampered by prejudices which I think ridiculous. Obligation may be stretched till it is no better than a brand of slavery stamped on us when we were too young to know its meaning. I would not have accepted the position if I had not meant to make it useful and honorable. I am not bound to regard family dignity in any other light. Dorothea felt wretched. She thought her husband altogether in the wrong, on more grounds than Will had mentioned. "'It is better for us not to speak on the subject,' she said, with a tremulousness not common in her voice, "'since you and Mr. Casaubon disagree. You intend to remain?' She was looking out on the lawn with melancholy meditation. "'Yes, but I shall hardly ever see you now,' said Will, in a tone of almost boyish complaint. No, said Dorothea, turning her eyes full upon him, hardly ever. But I shall hear of you. I shall know what you are doing for my uncle. I shall hardly know anything about you, said Will. No one will tell me anything. Oh, my life is very simple, said Dorothea, her lips curling with an exquisite smile, which irradiated her melancholy. I am always at Lowick. "'That is a dreadful imprisonment,' said Will, impetuously. "'No, don't think like that,' said Dorothea. "'I have no longings.' He did not speak, but she replied to some change in his expression. "'I mean, for myself. Except that I should not like to have so much more than my share without doing anything for others. But I have a belief of my own, and it comforts me.' "'What is that?' said Will, rather jealous of the belief." that by desiring what is perfectly good, even when we don't quite know what it is and cannot do what we would, we are part of the divine power against evil, widening the skirts of light and making the struggle with darkness narrower. That is a beautiful mysticism. It is a... Please do not call it by any name, said Dorothea, putting out her hands entreatingly. You will say it is Persian or something else geographical. It is my life. I have found it out, and cannot part with it. I have always been finding out my religion since I was a little girl. I used to pray so much. Now I hardly ever pray. I try not to have desires merely for myself, because they may not be good for others, and I have too much already. I only told you that you might know well how my days go at Lowick. God bless you for telling me, said Will ardently and rather wondering at himself. They were looking at each other like two fond children who were talking confidentially of birds. "'What is your religion?' said Dorothea. "'I mean, not what you know about religion, but the belief that helps you most.' "'To love what is good and beautiful when I see it,' said Will. "'But I am a rebel. 
I don't feel bound, as you do, to submit to what I don't like. But if you like what is good, that comes to the same thing, said Dorothea, smiling. Now you are subtle, said Will. Yes, Mr. Casbon often says I am too subtle. I don't feel as if I were subtle, said Dorothea, playfully. But how long my uncle is! I must go and look for him. I must really go on to the hall. Celia's expecting me. Will offered to tell Mr. Brooke, who presently came and said that he would step into the carriage and go with Dorothea as far as Dagley's, to speak about the small delinquent who had been caught with the leveret. Dorothea renewed the subject of the estate as they drove along, but Mr. Brooke, not being taken unawares, got the talk under his own control. "'Chetham, now,' he replied, "'he finds fault with me, my dear, but I should not preserve my game if it were not for Chetham, and he can't say that that expense is for the sake of the tenants, you know. It's a little against my feeling. Poaching, now, if you come to look into it, I have often thought of getting up the subject. Not long ago Flavel, the Methodist preacher, was brought up for knocking down a hare that came across his path when he and his wife were walking out together. He was pretty quick, and knocked it on the neck. That was very brutal, I think, said Dorothea. Well, now, it seemed rather black to me, I confess, in a Methodist preacher, you know. And Johnson said, You may judge what a hypocrite he is. And upon my word, I thought Flavel looked very little like the highest style of man, as somebody calls the Christian. Young, the poet Young, I think. You know Young? Well, now, Flavel, in his shabby black gaiters, pleading that he thought the Lord had sent him and his wife a good dinner, and he had a right to knock it down, though not a mighty hunter before the Lord, as Nimrod was, I assure you it was rather comic. Fielding would have made something of it, or Scott now. Scott might have worked it up. But really, when I came to think of it, I couldn't help liking that the fellow should have a bit of hair to say grace over. It's all a matter of prejudice. Prejudice with the law on its side, you know, about the stick and the gaiters and so on. However, it doesn't do to reason about things, and law is law. But I got Johnson to be quiet, and I hushed the matter up. I doubt whether Chetham would not have been more severe. And yet he comes down on me as if I were the hardest man in the county. But here we are at Dagley's. Mr. Brooke got down at a farmyard gate, and Dorothea drove on. It is wonderful how much uglier things will look when we only suspect that we are blamed for them. Even our own persons in the glass are apt to change their aspect for us after we have heard some frank remark on their less admirable points, and on the other hand it is astonishing how pleasantly conscience takes our encroachments on those who never complain or have nobody to complain for them. Dagley's homestead never before looked so dismal to Mr. Brooke as it did to-day, with his mind thus sore about the fault-finding of the trumpet, echoed by Sir James. It is true that an observer, under that softening influence of the fine arts which makes other people's hardships picturesque, might have been delighted with this homestead called Freeman's End. The old house had dormer windows in the dark red roof, Two of the chimneys were choked with ivy, the large porch was blocked up with bundles of sticks, and half the windows were closed with gray, worm-eaten shutters about which the jasmine boughs grew in wild luxuriance. The moldering garden wall with hollyhocks peeping over it was a perfect study of highly mingled, subdued color, and there was an aged goat, kept doubtless on interesting superstitious grounds, lying against the open back kitchen door. The mossy thatch of the cowshed, the broken gray barn doors, the pauper laborers in ragged breeches who had nearly finished unloading a wagon of corn into the barn ready for early thrashing, the scanty dairy of cows being tethered for milking and leaving one half of the shed in brown emptiness, the very pigs and white ducks seeming to wander about the uneven neglected yard as if in low spirits from feeding on a too meagre quality of rinsings. All these objects, under the quiet light of a sky marbled with high clouds, would have made a sort of picture which we all have paused over as a charming bit. 
touching other sensibilities than those which are stirred by the depression of the agricultural interest, with the sad lack of farming capital, as seen constantly in the newspapers of that time. But these troublesome associations were just now strongly present to Mr. Brook, and spoiled the scene for him. Mr. Dagley himself made a figure in the landscape, carrying a pitchfork and wearing his milking hat, a very old beaver flattened in front. His coat and breeches were the best he had, and he would not have been wearing them on this weekday occasion if he had not been to market and returned later than usual, having given himself the rare treat of dining at the public table of the Blue Bull. How he came to fall into this extravagance would perhaps be a matter of wonderment to himself on the morrow, but before dinner something in the state of the country, a slight pause in the harvest before the far dips were cut, the stories about the new king and the numerous handbills on the walls had seemed to warrant a little recklessness. It was a maxim about Middlemarch, and regarded as self-evident, that good meat should have good drink which last Dagley interpreted as plenty of table ale well followed up by rum and water. These liquors have so far truth in them that they were not false enough to make poor Dagley seem merry. They only made his discontent less tongue-tied than usual. He had also taken too much in the shape of muddy political talk, a stimulant dangerously disturbing to his farming conservatism, which consisted in holding that whatever is, is bad, and any change is likely to be worse. He was flushed, and his eyes had a decidedly quarrelsome stare as he stood grasping his pitchfork, while the landlord approached with his easy shuffling walk, one hand in his trouser pocket, and the other swinging round a thin walking stick. "'Dagley, my good fellow,' began Mr. Brook, conscious that he was going to be very friendly about the boy." "'Oh, I am a good feller, am I? Thank ye, sir, thank ye,' said Dagley, with a loud snarling irony which made Fag the sheepdog stir from his seat and prick his ears. But seeing Monk enter the yard after some outside loitering, Fag seated himself again in an attitude of observation. "'I'm glad to hear I'm a good feller.' Mr. Brooke reflected that it was market-day, and that his worthy tenant had probably been dining— but saw no reason why he should not go on, since he could take the precaution of repeating what he had to say to Mrs. Dagley. "'Your little lad Jacob has been caught killing a lever at Dagley. I have told Johnson to lock him up in the empty stable for an hour or two, just to frighten him, you know. But he will be brought home by and by, before night. You'll just look after him, will you, and give him a reprimand, you know?' "'No, I won't. I'll be dead if I'll lither my boy to please you or anybody else.' not a few as twenty landlords instead of one, and that a bad un. Dagley's words were loud enough to summon his wife to the back kitchen door, the only entrance ever used, and one always open except in bad weather, and Mr. Brooke saying soothingly, "'Well, well, I'll speak to your wife. I didn't mean beating, you know,' turned to walk to the house. But Dagley, only the more inclined to have his say with the gentleman who walked away from him, followed at once, with Fag slouching at his heels, and sullenly evading some small and probably charitable advances on the part of Monk. "'How do you do, Mrs. Dagley?' said Mr. Brook, making some haste. "'I came to tell you about your boy. I don't want you to give him the stick, you know.' He was careful to speak quite plainly this time. Overworked Mrs. Dagley, a thin, worn woman, from whose life pleasure had so entirely vanished that she had not even Sunday clothes which could give her satisfaction in preparing for church, had already had a misunderstanding with her husband since he had come home, and was in low spirits, expecting the worst. But her husband was beforehand in answering, "'No, nor he won't have the stick, whether you want it or no,' pursued Dagley, throwing out his voice, as if he wanted it to hit hard. "'You've got no call to come and talk about sticks of these premises.' as you won't give a stick toward mending. Go to Middlemarch to ax for your character. You'd far better hold your tongue, Dagley, said the wife, and not kick your own trough over. When a man as is father of a family has been and spent money at market and made himself the worse for liquor, he's done enough mischief for one day. But I should like to know what my boy's done, sir. 
"'Never do you mind what he's done,' said Dagley, more fiercely. "'It's my business to speak and not yourn. "'And I will speak, too. "'I have my say, supper or no. "'And what I say is, as I've lived upon your ground "'from my father and grandfather afore me, "'and have dropped our money into it, "'and me and my children might lie and rot on the ground "'for top-dressing, as we can't find the money to buy, "'if the king wasn't to put a stop.' "'My good fellow, you're drunk, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, confidentially, but not judiciously. "'Another day, another day,' he added, turning as if to go. But Dagley immediately fronted him, and Fag at his heels growled low, as his master's voice grew louder and more insulting, while Monk also drew close in silent, dignified watch. The laborers on the wagon were pausing to listen, and it seemed wiser to be quite passive than to attempt a ridiculous flight pursued by a bawling man. "'I'm no more drunk nor are you, nor so much,' said Dagley. "'I can carry my liquor, and I know what I mean, and I mean as the king'll put a stop to it, for them say it as knows it, as there's to be a reform, and them landlords as never done the right thing by their tenants will be treated in that way as they'll have to scuttle off and there's them in Middlemarch knows what the reform is, and as knows who'll have to scuttle. Says they, I know who your landlord is, and says I, I hope you're the better for knowing him, I aren't. Says they, he's a close-fisted un. Aye, aye, says I. He's a man for the reform, says they. That's what they says. And I made out what the reform were, and it were to send you and your likes a scuttling, and with pretty strong-smelling things, too. "'And you may do as you like now, for I'm none afeard on you. "'And you'd better let my boy alone, and look to your sin, "'for the reform has got upon your back. "'That's what I've got to say,' concluded Mr. Dagley, "'striking his fork into the ground with a firmness "'which proved inconvenient as he tried to draw it up again. "'At this last action, Monk began to bark loudly, "'and it was a moment for Mr. Brooke to escape.' He walked out of the yard as quickly as he could, in some amazement at the novelty of his situation. He had never been insulted on his own land before, and had been inclined to regard himself as a general favorite. We are all apt to do so, when we think of our own amiability more than of what other people are likely to want of us. When he had quarreled with Caleb Garth twelve years before, he had thought that the tenants would be pleased at the landlord's taking everything into his own hands. Some who follow the narrative of his experience may wonder at the midnight darkness of Mr. Dagley, but nothing was easier in those times than for a hereditary farmer of his grade to be ignorant, in spite somehow of having a rector in the twin parish who was a gentleman to the backbone, a curate nearer at hand who preached more learnedly than the rector, a landlord who had gone into everything, especially fine art and social improvement, and all the lights of Middlemarch only three miles off. As to the facility which mortals escape knowledge, try an average acquaintance in the intellectual blaze of London, and consider what that eligible person for a dinner-party would have been if he had learned scant skill in summing from the parish clerk of Tipton, and read a chapter in the Bible with immense difficulty, because such names as Isaiah or Apollos remained unmanageable after twice spelling. Poor Dagley read a few verses sometimes on a Sunday evening, and the world was at least not darker to him than it had been before. Some things he knew thoroughly, namely, the slovenly habits of farming, and the awkwardness of weather, stock, and crops at Freeman's End, so called apparently by way of sarcasm, to imply that a man was free to quit if he chose, but there was no earthly beyond open to him. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 Wise in his daily work was he, to fruits of diligence, and not to faiths or polity, he plied his utmost sense. These perfect in their little parts, whose work is all their prize, without them how could laws or arts or towered cities rise? In watching effects, if only of an electric battery, it is often necessary to change our place and examine a particular mixture or group at some distance from the point where the movement we are interested in was set up. 
The group I am moving towards is at Caleb Garth's breakfast table, in the large parlor where the maps and desk were, father, mother, and five of the children. Mary was just now at home waiting for a situation, while Christy, the boy next to her, was getting cheap learning and cheap fare in Scotland, having to his father's disappointment taken to books instead of that sacred calling business. The letters had come, nine costly letters, for which the postman had been paid three and twopence, and Mr. Garth was forgetting his tea and toast while he read his letters and laid them open one above the other, sometimes swaying his head slowly, sometimes screwing up his mouth in inward debate, but not forgetting to cut off a large red seal unbroken, which Letty snatched up like an eager terrier. The talk among the rest went on unrestrainedly, for nothing disturbed Caleb's absorption except shaking the table when he was writing. Two letters of the nine had been for Mary. After reading them, she had passed them to her mother, and sat playing with her teaspoon absently, till with a sudden recollection she returned to her sewing, which she had kept on her lap during breakfast. "'Oh, don't sew, Mary,' said Ben, pulling her arm down. "'Make me a peacock with this bread-crumb.' He had been kneading a small mass for the purpose. "'No, no mischief,' said Mary good-humouredly, while she pricked his hand lightly with her needle. "'Try and mould it yourself. You have seen me do it often enough. I must get this sewing done.' It is for Rosamond Vincy she's to be married next week, and she can't be married without this handkerchief, Mary ended merrily, amused with the last notion. Why can't she marry? said Letty, seriously interested in this mystery, and pushing her head so close to her sister that Mary now turned the threatening needle towards Letty's nose. Because this is one of a dozen, and without it there would only be eleven, said Mary, with a grave air of explanation so that Letty sank back with a sense of knowledge. "'Have you made up your mind, my dear?' said Mrs. Garth, laying the letters down. "'I shall go to the school at York,' said Mary. "'I am less unfit to teach in a school than in a family. I like to teach classes best. And you see, I must teach. There is nothing else to be done.' "'Teaching seems to me the most delightful work in the world,' said Mrs. Garth, with a touch of rebuke in her tone. I could understand your objection to it if you had not knowledge enough, Mary, or if you disliked children. I suppose we never quite understand why another dislikes what we like, mother, said Mary, rather curtly. I am not fond of a schoolroom. I like the outside world better. It is a very inconvenient fault of mine. It must be very stupid to be always in a girl's school, said Alfred. Such a set of nincompoops, like Mrs. Ballard's pupils, walking two and two. "'And they have no games worth playing at,' said Jim. "'They can neither throw nor leap. I don't wonder at Mary's not liking it.' "'What is it that Mary doesn't like, eh?' said the father, looking over his spectacles and pausing before he opened his next letter. "'Being among a lot of nincompoop girls,' said Alfred. "'Is it the situation you had heard of, Mary?' said Caleb gently looking at his daughter. "'Yes, father, the school at York. I have determined to take it. It is quite the best. Thirty-five pounds a year, and extra pay for teaching the smallest strummers at the piano.' "'Poor child! I wish she could stay at home with us, Susan,' said Caleb, looking plaintively at his wife. "'Mary would not be happy without doing her duty,' said Mrs. Garth, magisterially, conscious of having done her own. "'It wouldn't make me happy to do such a nasty duty as that,' said Alfred, at which Mary and her father laughed silently. But Mrs. Garth said gravely, "'Do find a fitter word than nasty, my dear Alfred, for everything that you think disagreeable. And I suppose that Mary could help you go to Mr. Hamner's with the money she gets?' "'That seems to me a great shame. But she's an old brick,' said Alfred, rising from his chair." and pulling Mary's head backward to kiss her. Mary colored and laughed, but could not conceal that the tears were coming. Caleb, looking on over his spectacles, with the angles of his eyebrows falling, had an expression of mingled delight and sorrow as he returned to the opening of his letter. And even Mrs. Garth, her lips curling with a calm contentment, 
allowed that inappropriate language to pass without correction, although Ben immediately took it up and sang, She's an old brick, old brick, old brick, to a cantering measure, which he beat out with his fist on Mary's arm. But Mrs. Garth's eyes were now drawn towards her husband, who was already deep in the letter he was reading. His face had an expression of grave surprise, which alarmed her a little, but he did not like to be questioned while he was reading, and she remained anxiously watching till she saw him suddenly shaken by a little joyous laugh as he turned back to the beginning of the letter, and, looking at her above his spectacles, said, in a low tone, "'What do you think, Susan?' She went and stood behind him, putting her hand on his shoulder while they read the letter together. It was from Sir James Chetham, offering to Mr. Garth the management of the family estates at Freshet and elsewhere, and adding that Sir James had been requested by Mr. Brooke of Tipton to ascertain whether Mr. Garth would be disposed at the same time to resume the agency of the Tipton property. The baronet added, in very obliging words, that he himself was particularly desirous of seeing the Freshet and Tipton estates under the same management, and he hoped to be able to show that the double agency might be held on terms agreeable to Mr. Garth, whom he would be glad to see at the hall at twelve o'clock on the following day. "'He writes handsomely, doesn't he, Susan?' said Caleb, turning his eyes upward to his wife, who raised her hand from his shoulder to his ear, while she rested her chin on his head. "'Brooke didn't like to ask me himself, I can see,' he continued, laughing silently. "'Here is an honour to your father, children,' said Mrs. Garth, looking round at the five pairs of eyes, all fixed on the parents. "'He is asked to take a post again by those who dismissed him long ago. "'That shows that he did his work well, so that they feel the want of him.' "'Like Cincinnatus! Hooray!' said Ben, riding on his chair, with a pleasant confidence that discipline was relaxed. "'Will they come to fetch him, mother?' said Letty, thinking of the mayor and corporation in their robes. Mrs. Garth patted Letty's head and smiled, but seeing that her husband was gathering up his letters and likely soon to be out of reach in that sanctuary business, she pressed his shoulder and said emphatically, "'Now, mind you ask fair pay, Caleb.' "'Oh, yes,' said Caleb, in a deep voice of assent, as if it would be unreasonable to suppose anything else of him. It'll come to between four and five hundred, the two together. Then, with a little start of remembrance, he said, Mary, write and give up that school. Stay and help your mother. I'm as pleased as Punch now that I've thought of that. No manner could have been less like that of Punch triumphant than Caleb's, but his talents did not lie in finding phrases, though he was very particular about his letter-writing, and regarded his wife as a treasury of correct language. There was almost an uproar among the children now, and Mary held up the cambric embroidery towards her mother entreatingly, that it might be put out of reach while the boys dragged her into a dance. Mrs. Garth, in placid joy, began to put the cups and plates together, while Caleb, pushing his chair from the table, as if he were going to move to the desk, still sat holding his letters in his hand, and looking on the ground meditatively, stretching out the fingers of his left hand, according to a mute language of his own. At last he said, "'It's a thousand pities Christy didn't take to business, Susan. I shall want help by and by. And Alfred must go off to the engineering. I've made up my mind to that.' He fell into a meditation and finger rhetoric again for a little while, and then continued, "'I shall make Brooke have new agreements with the tenants, and I shall draw up a rotation of crops.' and I'll lay a wager we can get fine bricks out of the clay at Bott's Corner. I must look into that. It would cheapen the repairs. It's a fine bit of work, Susan. A man without a family would be glad to do it for nothing. Mind you don't, though, said his wife, lifting up her finger. No, no, but it's a fine thing to come to a man when he's seen into the nature of business, to have the chance of getting a bit of the country into good fettle, as they say and putting men into the right way with their farming, and getting a bit of good contriving and solid building done, that those who are living and those who will come after will be the better for. I'd sooner have it than a fortune. I hold it the most honorable work that is. 
Here Caleb laid down his letters, thrust his fingers between the buttons of his waistcoat, and sat upright, but presently proceeded with some awe in his voice, and moving his head slowly aside. It's a great gift of God, Susan. That it is, Caleb, said his wife, with answering fervor, and it will be a blessing to your children to have had a father who did such work, a father whose good work remains, though his name may be forgotten. She could not say anything more to him then about the pay. In the evening, when Caleb, rather tired with his day's work, was seated in silence with his pocket-book open on his knee, while Mrs. Garth and Mary were at their sewing, and Letty in a corner was whispering a dialogue with her doll, Mr. Fairbrother came up the orchard walk, dividing the bright August lights and shadows with the tufted grass and the apple-tree boughs. We know that he was fond of his parishioners, the Garths, and he thought Mary worth mentioning to Lydgate. He used to the full the clergyman's privilege of disregarding the Middlemarch discrimination of ranks, and always told his mother that Mrs. Garth was more of a lady than any matron in the town. Still, you see, he spent his evening at the Vincy's, where the matron, though less of a lady, presided over a well-lit drawing-room and whist. In those days human intercourse was not determined solely by respect. But the vicar did heartily respect the Garths, and a visit from him was no surprise to that family. Nevertheless, he accounted for it even while he was shaking hands by saying, "'I come as an envoy, Mrs. Garth. I have something to say to you and Garth on behalf of Fred Vincy. The fact is, poor fellow, he continued, as he seated himself and looked round with his bright glance at the three who were listening to him, he has taken me into his confidence. Mary's heart beat rather quickly. She wondered how far Fred's confidence had gone. We haven't seen the lad for months, said Caleb. I couldn't think what was become of him. He has been away on a visit, said the vicar, because home was a little too hot for him, and Lydgate told his mother that the poor fellow must not begin to study yet. But yesterday he came and poured himself out to me. I am very glad he did, because I have seen him grow up from a youngster of fourteen, and I am so much at home in the house that the children are like nephews and nieces to me. But it is a difficult case to advise upon. However, he has asked me to come and tell you that he is going away, and that he is so miserable about his debt to you and his inability to pay that he can't bear to come himself even to bid you good-bye. "'Tell him it doesn't signify a farthing,' said Caleb, waving his hand. "'We've had the pinch and have got over it. And now I'm going to be as rich as a Jew.' "'Which means,' said Mrs. Garth, smiling at the vicar, that we are going to have enough to bring up the boys well, and to keep Mary at home. What is the treasure trove? said Mr. Fairbrother. I'm going to be agent for two estates, Freshet and Tipton, and perhaps for a pretty little bit of land in Lowick besides. It's all the same family connection, and employment spreads like water if it's once set going. It makes me very happy, Mr. Fairbrother. Here Caleb threw back his head a little, and spread his arms on the elbows of his chair that I've got an opportunity again with the letting of the land, and carrying out a notion or two with improvements. It's a most uncommonly cramping thing, as I've often told Susan, to sit on horseback and look over the hedges at the wrong thing, and not to be able to put your hand to it to make it right. What people do who go into politics I can't think. It drives me almost mad to see mismanagement over only a few hundred acres." It was seldom that Caleb volunteered so long a speech, but his happiness had the effect of mountain air. His eyes were bright, and the words came without effort. "'I congratulate you heartily, Garth,' said the vicar. "'This is the best sort of news I could have to carry to Fred Vincy, for he dwelt a good deal on the injury he had done you in causing you to part with money, robbing you of it, he said, which you wanted for other purposes.' I wish Fred were not such an idle dog. He has some very good points, and his father is a little hard upon him. "'Where is he going?' said Mrs. Garth, rather coldly. "'He means to try again for his degree, and he is going up to study before term. I have advised him to do that. 
I don't urge him to enter the church, on the contrary. But if he will go and work so as to pass, that will be some guarantee that he has energy and a will, and he is quite at sea, he doesn't know what else to do. So far he will please his father, and I have promised in the meantime to try and reconcile Vincy to his son's adopting some other line of life. Fred says frankly he is not fit for a clergyman, and I would do anything I could to hinder a man from the fatal step of choosing the wrong profession. He quoted to me what you said, Miss Garth. Do you remember it? Mr. Fairbrother used to say Mary instead of Miss Garth, but it was part of his delicacy to treat her with the more deference, because, according to Mrs. Vincy's phrase, she worked for her bread. Mary felt uncomfortable, but, determined to take the matter lightly, answered at once, I have said so many impertinent things to Fred, we are such old playfellows. You said, according to him, that he would be one of those ridiculous clergymen who helped to make the whole clergy ridiculous. Really, that was so cutting that I felt a little cut myself. Caleb laughed. She gets her tongue from you, Susan, he said with some enjoyment. Not its flippancy, father, said Mary, quickly, fearing that her mother would be displeased. It is rather too bad of Fred to repeat my flippant speeches to Mr. Fairbrother. It was certainly a hasty speech, my dear, said Mrs. Garth, with whom speaking evil of dignities was a high misdemeanor. We should not value our vicar the less, because there was a ridiculous curate in the next parish. There's something in what she says, though, said Caleb, not disposed to have Mary's sharpness undervalued. A bad workman of any sort makes his fellows mistrusted. Things hang together, he added, looking on the floor, and moving his feet uneasily with a sense that words were scantier than thoughts. Clearly, said the vicar, amused, by being contemptible we set men's minds to the tune of contempt. I certainly agree with Miss Garth's view of the matter, whether I am condemned by it or not. But as to Fred Vincy, it is only fair he should be excused a little. Old Featherstone's delusive behavior did help to spoil him. There was something quite diabolical in not leaving him a farthing after all. But Fred has the good taste not to dwell on that. And what he cares most about is having offended you, Mrs. Garth. He supposes you will never think well of him again. I have been disappointed in Fred, said Mrs. Garth with decision. But I shall be ready to think well of him again when he gives me good reason to do so. At this point, Mary went out of the room, taking Letty with her. "'Oh, we must forgive young people when they're sorry,' said Caleb, watching Mary close the door. "'And as you say, Mr. Fairbrother, there was the very devil in that old man. Now Mary's gone out, I must tell you a thing. It's only known to Susan and me, and you'll not tell it again. The old scoundrel wanted Mary to burn one of the wills the very night he died, when she was sitting up with him by herself.' and he offered her a sum of money that he had in the box by him if she would do it. But Mary, you understand, could do no such thing, would not be handling his iron chest, and so on. Now, you see, the will he wanted burnt was this last, so that if Mary had done what he wanted, Fred Vincy would have had ten thousand pounds. The old man did turn to him at the last. That touches poor Mary close. She couldn't help it. She was in the right to do what she did, but she feels, as she says, much as if she had knocked down somebody's property and broken it against her will, when she was rightfully defending herself. I feel with her, somehow, and if I could make any amends to the poor lad, instead of bearing him a grudge for the harm he did us, I should be glad to do it. Now, what is your opinion, sir? Susan doesn't agree with me. She says— "'Tell what you say, Susan.' "'Mary could not have acted otherwise, "'even if she had known what would be the effect on Fred,' "'said Mrs. Garth, pausing from her work "'and looking at Mr. Fairbrother. "'And she was quite ignorant of it. "'It seems to me a loss which falls on another "'because we have done right "'is not to lie upon our conscience.' "'The vicar did not answer immediately, "'and Caleb said, "'It's the feeling.' 
The child feels in that way, and I feel with her. You don't mean your horse to tread on a dog when you're backing out of the way, but it goes through you when it's done. I'm sure Mrs. Garth would agree with you there, said Mr. Fairbrother, who for some reason seemed more inclined to ruminate than to speak. One could hardly say that the feeling you mention about Fred is wrong, or rather mistaken, though no man ought to make a claim on such feeling. Well, well, said Caleb, it's a secret. You will not tell Fred. Certainly not. But I shall carry the other good news, that you can afford the loss he caused you. Mr. Fairbrother left the house soon after, and seeing Mary in the orchard with Letty, went to say good-bye to her. They made a pretty picture in the western light which brought out the brightness of the apples on the old scant-leaved boughs, Mary in her lavender gingham and black ribbons holding a basket, while Letty in her well-worn nankin picked up the fallen apples. If you want to know more particularly how Mary looked, ten to one you will see a face like hers in the crowded street to-morrow, if you are there on the watch. She will not be among those daughters of Zion who are haughty, and walked with stretched-out necks and wanton eyes, mincing as they go. Let all those pass, and fix your eyes on some small, plump, brownish person, of firm but quiet carriage, who looks about her, but does not suppose that anybody is looking at her. If she has a broad face and a square brow, well-marked eyebrows and curly dark hair, a certain expression of amusement in her glance, which her mouth keeps the secret of, and, for the rest, features entirely insignificant, take that ordinary but not disagreeable person for a portrait of Mary Garth. If you made her smile, she would show you perfect little teeth. If you made her angry, she would not raise her voice, but would probably say one of the bitterest things you have ever tasted the flavor of. If you did her a kindness, she would never forget it. Mary admired the keen-faced, handsome little vicar in his well-brushed, threadbare clothes more than any man she had had the opportunity of knowing. She had never heard him say a foolish thing, though she knew that he did unwise ones, and perhaps foolish sayings were more objectionable to her than any of Mr. Fairbrother's unwise doings. At least, it was remarkable that the actual imperfections of the vicar's clerical character never seemed to call forth the same scorn and dislike which she showed beforehand for the predicted imperfections of the clerical character sustained by Fred Vincy. These irregularities of judgment, I imagine, are found even in riper minds than Mary Garth's. Our impartiality is kept for abstract merit and demerit, which none of us ever saw. Will any one guess towards which of those widely different men Mary had the peculiar woman's tenderness, the one she was most inclined to be severe on, or the contrary? "'Have you any message for your old playfellow, Miss Garth?' said the vicar, as he took a fragrant apple from the basket which she held towards him, and put it in his pocket. "'Something to soften down that harsh judgment. I am going straight to see him.' No, said Mary, shaking her head and smiling. If I were to say that he would not be ridiculous as a clergyman, I must say that he would be something worse than ridiculous. But I am very glad to hear that he is going away to work. On the other hand, I am very glad to hear that you are not going away to work. My mother, I am sure, will be all the happier if you will come to see her at the vicarage, you know she is fond of having young people to talk to, and she has a great deal to tell about old times. You will really be doing a kindness. I should like it very much if I may, said Mary. Everything seems too happy for me all at once. I thought it would always be part of my life to long for home, and losing that grievance makes me feel rather empty. I suppose it served instead to fill up my sense of mind. May I go with you, Mary? whispered Letty a most inconvenient child who listened to everything. But she was made exultant by having her chin pinched and her cheek kissed by Mr. Fairbrother, an incident which she narrated to her mother and father. As the vicar walked to Lowick, 
anyone watching him closely might have seen him twice shrug his shoulders. I think that the rare Englishmen who have this gesture are never of the heavy type, for fear of any lumbering instance to the contrary, I will say, hardly ever. They have usually a fine temperament and much tolerance towards the smaller errors of men, themselves inclusive. The vicar was holding an inward dialogue in which he told himself that there was probably something more between Fred and Mary Garth than the regard of old playfellows, and replied with a question whether that bit of womanhood were not a great deal too choice for that crude young gentleman. The rejoinder to this was the first shrug. Then he laughed at himself for being likely to have felt jealous, as if he had been a man able to marry, which, added he, it is as clear as any balance sheet that I am not. Whereupon followed the second shrug. What could two men, so different from each other, see in this brown patch, as Mary called herself? It was certainly not her plainness that attracted them, and let all plain young ladies be warned against the dangerous encouragement given them by society to confide in their want of beauty. A human being in this aged nation of ours is a very wonderful whole, the slow creation of long interchanging influences, and charm is a result of two such wholes, the one loving and the one loved. When Mr. and Mrs. Garth were sitting alone, Caleb said, "'Susan, guess what I'm thinking of.' "'The rotation of crops,' said Mrs. Garth, smiling at him above her knitting. "'Or else, the back doors of the Tipton cottages.' "'No,' said Caleb gravely. "'I am thinking that I could do a great turn for Fred Vincy. "'Christie's gone. Alfred will be gone soon. "'And it will be five years before Jim is ready to take business.' I shall want help, and Fred might come in and learn the nature of things and act under me, and it might be the making of him into a useful man if he gives up being a parson. What do you think? I think there is hardly anything honest that his family would object to more, said Mrs. Garth decidedly. What care I about their objecting, said Caleb, with a sturdiness which he was apt to show when he had an opinion. The lad is of age and must get his bread. He has sense enough and quickness enough. He likes being on the land, and it's my belief that he could learn business well if he gave his mind to it. But would he? His father and mother wanted him to be a fine gentleman, and I think he has the same sort of feeling himself. They all think us beneath them. And if the proposal came from you, I am sure Mrs. Vincy would say that we wanted Fred for Mary." "'Life is a poor tale, if it is to be settled by nonsense of that sort,' said Caleb, with disgust. "'Yes, but there is a certain pride which is proper, Caleb. I call it improper pride to let fools' notions hinder you from doing a good action. There's no sort of work,' said Caleb, with fervor, putting out his hand and moving it up and down to mark his emphasis, "'that could ever be done well if you minded what fools say.' You must have it inside you that your plan is right, and that plan you must follow. I will not oppose any plan you have set your mind on, Caleb, said Mrs. Garth, who was a firm woman, but knew that there were some points on which her mild husband was yet firmer. Still, it seems to be fixed that Fred is to go back to college. Will it not be better to wait and see what he will choose to do after that? It is not easy to keep people against their will, and you are not yet quite sure enough of your own position, or what you will want. Well, it may be better to wait a bit. But as to my getting plenty of work for two, I'm pretty sure of that. I've always had my hands full with scattered things, and there's always something fresh turning up. Why, only yesterday. Bless me, I don't think I told you. It was rather odd that two men should have been at me on different sides to do the same bit of valuing. And who do you think they were? said Caleb, taking a pinch of snuff and holding it up between his fingers, as if it were part of his exposition. He was fond of a pinch when it occurred to him, but he usually forgot that this indulgence was at his command. 
His wife held down her knitting and looked attentive. Why, that Rig, or Rig Featherstone, was one. But Bulstrode was before him, so I'm going to do it for Bulstrode. Whether it's mortgage or purchase they're going for, I can't tell yet. Can that man be going to sell the land just left him, which he has taken the name for? said Mrs. Garth. Deuce knows, said Caleb, who never referred the knowledge of discreditable doings to any higher power than the deuce. But Bulstrode has been long wanting to get a handsome bit of land under his fingers. That I know. And it's a difficult matter to get in this part of the country. Caleb scattered his snuff carefully instead of taking it, and then added, The ins and outs of things are curious. Here is the land they've been all along expecting for Fred, which it seems the old man never meant to leave him a foot of, but left it to this side-slip of a son that he kept in the dark, and thought of his sticking there, and vexing everybody as well as he could have vexed him himself if he could have kept alive. I say, it would be curious if it got into Bulstrode's hands after all. The old man hated him, and never would bank with him. "'What reason could the miserable creature have for hating a man whom he had nothing to do with?' said Mrs. Garth. "'Pooh! Where's the use of asking such fellows reasons?' "'The soul of man,' said Caleb, with the deep tone and grave shake of the head which always came when he used this phrase, "'the soul of man, when it gets fairly rotten, will bear you all sorts of poisonous toadstools.' and no eye can see whence came the seed thereof. It was one of Caleb's quaintnesses that in his difficulty of finding speech for his thought he caught, as it were, snatches of diction which he associated with various points of view or states of mind, and whenever he had a feeling of awe he was haunted by a sense of biblical phraseology, though he could hardly have given a strict quotation. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 By swaggering could I never thrive, For the rain it raineth every day, Twelfth night. The transactions referred to by Caleb Garth as having gone forward between Mr. Bulstrode and Mr. Joshua Rigg Featherstone concerning the land attached to Stone Court had occasioned the interchange of a letter or two between these personages. Who shall tell what may be the effect of writing? If it happens to have been cut in stone, though it lie face downmost for ages on a forsaken beach, or rest quietly under the drums and tramplings of many conquests, it may end by letting us into the secret of usurpations and other scandals gossiped about long empires ago, this world being apparently a huge whispering gallery. Such conditions are often minutely represented in our petty lifetimes. As the stone which has been kicked by generations of clowns may come by curious little links of effect under the eyes of a scholar, through whose labors it may at last fix the date of invasions and unlock religions, so a bit of ink and paper, which has long been an innocent wrapping or stop-gap, may at last be laid open under one pair of eyes which may have knowledge enough to turn it into the opening of a catastrophe. To Uriel watching the progress of planetary history from the sun, the one result would be just as much of a coincidence as the other. Having made this rather lofty comparison, I am less uneasy in calling attention to the existence of low people by whose interference however little we may like it, the course of the world is very much determined. It would be well, certainly, if we could help to reduce their number, and something might perhaps be done by not lightly giving occasion to their existence. Socially speaking, Joshua Rigg would have been generally pronounced a superfluity. But those who, like Peter Featherstone, never had a copy of themselves demanded, are the very last to wait for such a request either in prose or verse. The copy in this case bore more of outside resemblance to the mother, in whose sex frog features, accompanied with fresh-colored cheeks and a well-rounded figure, 
are compatible with much charm for a certain order of admirers. The result is sometimes a frog-faced male, desirable, surely, to no order of intelligent beings, especially when he is suddenly brought into evidence to frustrate other people's expectations, the very lowest aspect in which a social superfluity can present himself. But Mr. Rig Featherstone's low characteristics were all of the sober, water-drinking kind. From the earliest to the latest hour of the day, he was always as sleek, neat, and cool as the frog he resembled, and old Peter had secretly chuckled over an offshoot almost more calculating and far more imperturbable than himself. I will add that his fingernails were scrupulously attended to, and that he meant to marry a well-educated young lady, as yet unspecified, whose person was good, and whose connections, in a solid middle-class way, were undeniable. Thus his nails and modesty were comparable to those of most gentlemen, though his ambition had been educated only by the opportunities of a clerk and accountant in the smaller commercial houses of a seaport. He thought the rural Featherstones very simple, absurd people, and they in their turn regarded his bringing up in a seaport town as an exaggeration of the monstrosity that their brother Peter, and still more Peter's property, should have had such belongings. The garden and gravel approach, as seen from the two windows of the wainscoted parlor at Stone Court, were never in better trim than now, when Mr. Rigg Featherstone stood, with his hands behind him, looking out on these grounds as their master. But it seemed doubtful whether he looked out for the sake of contemplation, or of turning his back to a person who stood in the middle of the room, with his legs considerably apart and his hands in his trouser pockets, a person in all respects a contrast to the sleek and cool Rigg. He was a man obviously on the way towards sixty, very florid and hairy, with much gray in his bushy whiskers and thick curly hair, a stoutish body which showed to disadvantage the somewhat worn joinings of his clothes, and the air of a swaggerer who would aim at being noticeable even at a show of fireworks, regarding his own remarks on any other person's performance as likely to be more interesting than the performance itself. His name was John Raffles, and he sometimes wrote jocosely W.A.G. after his signature, observing when he did so that he was once taught by Leonard Lamb of Finsbury, who wrote B.A. after his name, and that he, Raffles, originated the witticism of calling that celebrated principal Ba Lamb. Such were the appearance and mental flavor of Mr. Raffles, both of which seemed to have a stale odor of travelers' rooms in the commercial hotels of that period. "'Come now, Josh,' he was saying in a full, rumbling tone. "'Look at it in this light. Here is your poor mother going into the veil of years, and you could afford something handsome now to make her comfortable.' "'Not while you live.' "'Nothing would make her comfortable while you live,' returned Rigg, in his high, cool voice. "'What I give her, you'll take.' "'You bear me a grudge, Josh, that I know. But come now, as between man and man, without humbug. A little capital might enable me to make a first-rate thing of the shop. The tobacco trade is growing. I should cut my own nose off in not doing the best I could at it. I should stick to it like a flea to a fleece for my own sake. I should always be on the spot, and nothing would make your poor mother so happy. I've pretty well done with my wild oats, turned fifty-five. I want to settle down in my chimney corner, and if I once buckled to the tobacco trade, I could bring an amount of brains and experience to bear on it that would not be found elsewhere in a hurry. I don't want to be bothering you one time after another, but to get things once for all into the right channel. Consider that, Josh, as between man and man, with your poor mother to be made easy for her life. I was always fond of the old woman, by Jove. "'Have you done?' said Mr. Rigg, quietly, without looking away from the window. 
"'Yes, I've done,' said Raffles, taking hold of his hat which stood before him on the table, and giving it a sort of oratorical push. "'Then just listen to me. The more you say anything, the less I shall believe it. The more you want me to do a thing, the more reason I shall have for never doing it. Do you think I mean to forget your kicking me when I was a lad, and eating all the best victual away from me and my mother? Do you think I forget you're always coming home to sell and pocket everything, and going off again leaving us in the lurch? I should be glad to see you whipped at the cart-tail. My mother was a fool to you. She'd no right to give me a father-in-law, and she's been punished for it. She shall have her weekly allowance paid and no more, and that shall be stopped if you dare to come on to these premises again, or come into this country after me again. The next time you show yourself inside the gates here, you shall be driven off with the dogs and the wagoner's whip. As Rig pronounced the last words, he turned round and looked at Raffles with his prominent frozen eyes. The contrast was as striking as it could have been eighteen years before, when Rig was a most unengaging, kickable boy, and Raffles was the rather thick-set Adonis of bar-rooms and back-parlors but the advantage now was on the side of Rigg, and auditors of this conversation might probably have expected that Raffles would retire with an air of a defeated dog. Not at all. He made a grimace which was habitual with him whenever he was out in a game, then subsided into a laugh and drew a brandy flask from his pocket. "'Come, Josh,' he said in a cajoling tone. "'Give us a spoonful of brandy.' and a sovereign to pay the way back, and I'll go. Honor bright, I'll go like a bullet by Jove. Mind, said Rigg, drawing out a bunch of keys, if I ever see you again, I shan't speak to you. I don't own you any more than if I saw a crow. And if you want to own me, you'll get nothing by it but a character for being what you are, a spiteful, brassy, bullying rogue. "'That's a pity now, Josh,' said Raffles, affecting to scratch his head and wrinkle his brows upward as if he were nonplussed. "'I'm very fond of you, by Jove I am. There's nothing I like better than plaguing you. You're so like your mother, and I must do without it. But the brandy and the sovereign's a bargain.' He jerked forward the flask, and Rig went to a fine old oaken bureau with his keys but Raffles had reminded himself by his movement with the flask that it had become dangerously loose from its leather covering, and catching sight of a folded paper which had fallen within the fender, he took it up and shoved it under the leather so as to make the glass firm. By that time Rig came forward with a brandy bottle, filled the flask, and handed Raffles a sovereign, neither looking at him nor speaking to him. After locking up the bureau again, he walked to the window and gazed out as impassibly as he had done at the beginning of the interview, while Raffles took a small allowance from the flask, screwed it up, and deposited it in his side pocket with provoking slowness, making a grimace at his stepson's back. "'Farewell, Josh, and if forever,' said Raffles, turning back his head as he opened the door. Rig saw him leave the grounds and enter the lane. The gray day had turned into a light drizzling rain, which freshened the hedgerows and the grassy borders of the by-roads, and hastened the laborers who were loading the last shocks of corn. Raffles, walking with the uneasy gait of a town loiterer, obliged to do a bit of country journeying on foot, looked as incongruous amid this moist rural quiet and industry, as if he had been a baboon escaped from a menagerie. But there were none to stare at him, except the long weaned calves, and none to show dislike of his appearance except the little water rats which rustled away at his approach. He was fortunate enough when he got on to the high road to be overtaken by the stagecoach which carried him to Brassing, and there he took the new-made railway, observing to his fellow passengers that he considered it pretty well seasoned now it had done for Huskisson. Mr. Raffles on most occasions kept up the sense of having been educated at an academy, 
and being able, if he chose, to pass well everywhere. Indeed, there was not one of his fellow men whom he did not feel himself in a position to ridicule and torment, confident of the entertainment which he thus gave to all the rest of the company. He played this part now with as much spirit as if his journey had been entirely successful, resorting at frequent intervals to his flask. The paper with which he had wedged it was a letter signed Nicholas Bulstrode, but Raffles was not likely to disturb it from its present useful position. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 How much methinks I could despise this man, were I not bound in charity against it. Shakespeare, Henry the Eighth. One of the professional calls made by Lydgate soon after his return from his wedding journey was to Lowick Manor, in consequence of a letter which had requested him to fix a time for his visit. Mr. Casaubon had never put any question concerning the nature of his illness to Lydgate, nor had he even to Dorothea betrayed any anxiety as to how far it might be likely to cut short his labors or his life. On this point, as on all others, he shrank from pity and if the suspicion of being pitied for anything in his lot surmised or known in spite of himself was embittering, the idea of calling forth a show of compassion by frankly admitting an alarm or a sorrow was necessarily intolerable to him. Every proud mind knows something of this experience, and perhaps it is only to be overcome by a sense of fellowship deep enough to make all efforts at isolation seem mean and petty instead of exalting. But Mr. Casaubon was now brooding over something through which the question of his health and life haunted his silence with a more harassing importunity even than through the autumnal unripeness of his authorship. It is true that this last might be called his central ambition, but there are some kinds of authorship in which by far the largest result is the uneasy susceptibility accumulated in the consciousness of the author. One knows of the river by a few streaks amid a long-gathered deposit of uncomfortable mud. That was the way with Mr. Casaubon's hard intellectual labors. Their most characteristic result was not the key to all mythologies, but a morbid consciousness that others did not give him the place which he had not demonstrably merited, a perpetual suspicious conjecture that the views entertained of him were not to his advantage, a melancholy absence of passion in his efforts at achievement, and a passionate resistance to the confession that he had achieved nothing. Thus his intellectual ambition, which seemed to others to have absorbed and dried him, was really no security against wounds, least of all against those which came from Dorothea. And he had now become to frame possibilities for the future which were somehow more embittering to him than anything his mind had dwelt on before. Against certain facts he was helpless. Against Will Ladislaw's existence, his defiant stay in the neighborhood of Lowick, and his flippant state of mind with regard to the possessors of authentic, well-stamped erudition, against Dorothea's nature, always taking on some new shape of ardent activity, and even in submission and silence covering fervid reasons which it was an irritation to think of, against certain notions and likings which had taken possession of her mind in relation to subjects that he could not possibly discuss with her. There was no denying that Dorothea was as virtuous and lovely a young lady as he could have obtained for a wife, but a young lady turned out to be something more troublesome than he had conceived. She nursed him, she read to him, she anticipated his wants, and was solicitous about his feelings. But there had entered into the husband's mind the certainty that she judged him, and that her wifely devotedness was like a penitential expiation of unbelieving thoughts, was accompanied with a power of comparison by which himself and his doings were seen too luminously as a part of things in general. His discontent passed vapor-like through all her gentle loving manifestations, 
and clung to that inappreciative world which she had only brought nearer to him. Poor Mr. Casabon! This suffering was the harder to bear because it seemed like a betrayal. The young creature who had worshipped him with perfect trust had quickly turned into the critical wife, and early instances of criticism and resentment had made an impression which no tenderness and submission afterwards could remove. To his suspicious interpretation, Dorothea's silence now was a suppressed rebellion. A remark from her which he had not in any way anticipated was an assertion of conscious superiority. Her gentle answers had an irritating cautiousness in them, and when she acquiesced it was a self-approved effort of forbearance. The tenacity with which he strove to hide this inward drama made it the more vivid for him, as we hear with the more keenness what we wish others not to hear. Instead of wondering at this result of misery in Mr. Casabon, I think it quite ordinary. Will not a tiny speck very close to our vision blot out the glory of the world, and leave only a margin by which we see the blot? I know no speck so troublesome as self. And who, if Mr. Casabon had chosen to expound his discontents, his suspicions that he was not any longer adored without criticism, could have denied that they were founded on good reasons. On the contrary, there was a strong reason to be added, which he had not himself taken explicitly into account, namely, that he was not unmixedly adorable. He suspected this, however, as he suspected other things, without confessing it, and, like the rest of us, felt how soothing it would have been to have a companion who would never find it out. This sore susceptibility in relation to Dorothea was thoroughly prepared before Will Ladislaw had returned to Lowick, and what had occurred since then had brought Mr. Casabon's power of suspicious construction into exasperated activity. To all the facts which he knew, he added imaginary facts, both present and future, which became more real to him than those, because they called up a stronger dislike a more predominating bitterness. Suspicion and jealousy of Will Ladislaw's intentions, suspicion and jealousy of Dorothea's impressions, were constantly at their weaving work. It would be quite unjust to him to suppose that he could have entered into any coarse misinterpretation of Dorothea, his own habits of mind and conduct, quite as much as the open elevation of her nature, saved him from any such mistake. What he was jealous of was her opinion, the sway that might be given to her ardent mind in its judgments, and the future possibilities to which these might lead her. As to Will, though until his last defiant letter he had nothing definite which he could choose formally to allege against him, he felt himself warranted in believing that he was capable of any design which could fascinate a rebellious temper and an undisciplined impulsiveness. He was quite sure that Dorothea was the cause of Will's return from Rome, and his determination to settle in the neighborhood, and he was penetrating enough to imagine that Dorothea had innocently encouraged this course. It was as clear as possible that she was ready to be attached to Will, and to be pliant to his suggestions. They had never had a tete-a-tete -tete without her bringing away from it some new troublesome impression, and the last interview that Mr. Casabon was aware of, Dorothea, on returning from Freshet Hall, had for the first time been silent about having seen Will, had led to a scene which roused an angrier feeling against them both than he had ever known before. Dorothea's outpouring of her notions about money, in the darkness of the night, had done nothing but bring a mixture of more odious foreboding into her husband's mind. And there was the shock lately given to his health, always sadly present with him. He was certainly much revived, he had recovered all his usual power of work, the illness might have been mere fatigue, and there might be still twenty years of achievement before him, which would justify the thirty years of preparation. That prospect was made the sweeter by a flavor of vengeance against the hasty sneers of Carp and Company, 
for even when Mr. Casaubon was carrying his taper among the tombs of the past, those modern figures came athwart the dim light and interrupted his diligent exploration. To convince Carp of his mistake, so that he would have to eat his own words with a good deal of indigestion, would be an agreeable accident of triumphant authorship, which the prospect of living to future ages on earth and to all eternity in heaven could not exclude from contemplation, since, thus, the prevision of his own unending bliss could not nullify the bitter savours of irritated jealousy and vindictiveness, it is the less surprising that the probability of a transient earthly bliss for other persons, when he himself should have entered into glory, had not a potently sweetening effect. If the truth should be that some undermining disease was at work within him, there might be a large opportunity for some people to be the happier when he was gone. And if one of those people should be Will Ladislaw, Mr. Casaubon objected so strongly that it seemed as if the annoyance would make part of his disembodied existence. This is a very bare, and therefore a very incomplete, way of putting the case. The human soul moves in many channels, and Mr. Casaubon, we know, had a sense of rectitude and an honorable pride in satisfying the requirements of honor, which compelled him to find other reasons for his conduct than those of jealousy and vindictiveness. The way in which Mr. Casaubon put the case was this. In marrying Dorothea Brooke, I had to care for her well-being in case of my death but well-being is not to be secured by ample, independent possession of property. On the contrary, occasions might arise in which such possession might expose her to the more danger. She is ready prey to any man who knows how to play adroitly either on her affectionate ardor or her quixotic enthusiasm, and a man stands by with that very intention in his mind a man with no other principle than transient caprice, and who has a personal animosity towards me. I am sure of it, an animosity which is fed by the consciousness of his ingratitude, and which he has constantly vented in ridicule of which I am as well assured as if I had heard it. Even if I live, I shall not be without uneasiness as to what he may attempt through indirect influence." This man has gained Dorothea's ear. He has fascinated her attention. He has evidently tried to impress her mind with the notion that he has claims beyond anything I have done for him. If I die, and he is waiting here on the watch for that, he will persuade her to marry him. That would be calamity for her and success for him. She would not think it calamity. He would make her believe anything. She has a tendency to immoderate attachment which she inwardly reproaches me for not responding to, and already her mind is occupied with his fortunes. He thinks of an easy conquest and of entering into my nest. That I will hinder. Such a marriage would be fatal to Dorothea. Has he ever persisted in anything except from contradiction? In knowledge he has always tried to be showy at small cost. In religion he could be, as long as it suited him, the facile echo of Dorothea's vagaries. When was sciolism ever disassociated from laxity? I utterly distrust his morals, and it is my duty to hinder to the utmost the fulfillments of his designs. The arrangements made by Mr. Casaubon on his marriage left strong measures open to him, but in ruminating on them his mind inevitably dwelt so much on the probabilities of his own life that the longing to get the nearest possible calculation had at last overcome his proud reticence, and had determined him to ask Lydgate's opinion as to the nature of his illness. He had mentioned to Dorothea that Lydgate was coming by appointment at half-past three, and, in answer to her anxious question, whether he had felt ill, replied, No, I merely wish to have his opinion concerning some habitual symptoms. You need not see him, my dear. I shall give orders that he may be sent to me in the yew-tree walk, 
where I shall be taking my usual exercise. When Lydgate entered the yew-tree walk, he saw Mr. Casaubon slowly receding with his hands behind him, according to his habit, and his head bent forward. It was a lovely afternoon. The leaves from the lofty limes were falling silently across the sombre evergreens, while the lights and shadows slept side by side. There was no sound but the cawing of the rooks, which to the accustomed ear is a lullaby, or that last solemn lullaby, a dirge. Lydgate, conscious of an energetic frame in its prime, felt some compassion when the figure which he was likely soon to overtake turned round, and in advancing towards him showed more markedly than ever the signs of premature age, the student's bent shoulders, the emaciated limbs, and the melancholy lines of the mouth. Poor fellow, he thought, some men with his years are like lions. One can tell nothing of their age except that they are full grown. Mr. Lydgate, said Mr. Casaubon, with his invariably polite air, I am exceedingly obliged to you for your punctuality. We will, if you please, carry on our conversation in walking to and fro. I hope your wish to see me is not due to the return of unpleasant symptoms, said Lydgate, filling up a pause. Not immediately, no. In order to account for that wish, I must mention, what it were otherwise needless to refer to, that my life, on all collateral accounts insignificant, derives a possible importance from the incompleteness of labors which have extended through all its best years. In short, I have long had on hand a work which I would fain leave behind me in such a state, at least, that it might be committed to the press by others. Were I assured that this is the utmost I can reasonably expect, that assurance would be a useful circumscription of my attempts, and a guide in both the positive and negative determination of my course. Here Mr. Casaubon paused, removed one hand from his back, and thrust it between the buttons of his single-breasted coat. To a mind largely instructed in the human destiny, hardly anything could be more interesting than the inward conflict implied in his formal, measured address, delivered with the usual sing-song and motion of the head. Nay, are there many situations more sublimely tragic than the struggle of the soul with the demand to renounce a work which has been all the significance of its life, a significance which is to vanish as the waters which come and go where no man has need of them? But there was nothing to strike others as sublime about Mr. Casaubon, and Lydgate, who had some contempt at hand for feudal scholarship, felt a little amusement mingling with his pity. He was at present too ill-acquainted with disaster to enter into the pathos of a lot where everything is below the level of tragedy except the passionate egoism of the sufferer. "'Do you refer to the possible hindrances from want of health?' he said, wishing to help forward Mr. Casaubon's purpose, which seemed to be clogged by some hesitation. "'I do.' You have not implied to me that the symptoms which, I am bound to testify, you watched with scrupulous care, were those of a fatal disease. But were it so, Mr. Lydgate, I should desire to know the truth without reservation, and I appeal to you for an exact statement of your conclusions. I request it as a friendly service. If you can tell me that my life is not threatened by anything else than ordinary casualties, I shall rejoice, on grounds which I have already indicated. If not, knowledge of the truth is even more important to me. Then I can no longer hesitate as to my course, said Lydgate. But the first thing I must impress on you is that my conclusions are doubly uncertain, uncertain not only because of my fallibility, but because diseases of the heart are eminently difficult to found predictions on. In any case, one can hardly increase appreciably the tremendous uncertainty of life. Mr. Casaubon winced perceptibly, but bowed. I believe that you are suffering from what is called fatty degeneration of the heart, 
a disease which was first divined and explored by Lenneck, the man who gave us the stethoscope, not so very many years ago. A good deal of experience, a more lengthened observation, is wanting on the subject. But after what you have said, it is my duty to tell you that death from this disease is often sudden. At the same time, no such result can be predicted. Your condition may be consistent with a tolerably comfortable life for another fifteen years, or even more. I could add no information to this beyond anatomical or medical details, which would leave expectation at precisely the same point. Lydgate's instinct was fine enough to tell him that plain speech, quite free from ostentatious caution, would be felt by Mr. Casaubon as a tribute of respect. "'I thank you, Mr. Lydgate,' said Mr. Casaubon, after a moment's pause. "'One thing more I have still to ask. Did you communicate what you have now told me to Mrs. Casaubon?' "'Partly. I mean, as to the possible issues.' Lydgate was going to explain why he had told Dorothea, but Mr. Casaubon, with an unmistakable desire to end the conversation, waved his hand slightly and said again, I thank you, proceeding to remark on the rare beauty of the day. Lydgate, certain that his patient wished to be alone, soon left him, and the black figure with hands behind and head bent forward continued to pace the walk where the dark yew-trees gave him a mute companionship in melancholy, and the little shadows of bird or leaf that fleeted across the aisles of sunlight stole along in silence as in the presence of a sorrow. Here was a man who now for the first time found himself looking into the eyes of death, who was passing through one of those rare moments of experience when we feel the truth of a commonplace, which is as different from what we call knowing it, as the vision of waters upon the earth is different from the delirious vision of the water which cannot be had to cool the burning tongue. When the commonplace, we must all die, transforms itself suddenly into the acute consciousness, I must die, and soon. Then death grapples us, and his fingers are cruel. Afterwards, he may come to fold us in his arms as our mother did, and our last moment of dim earthly discerning may be like the first. To Mr. Casaubon now, it was as if he suddenly found himself on the dark river brink and heard the plash of the oncoming oar, not discerning the forms but expecting the summons. In such an hour the mind does not change its lifelong bias, but carries it onward in imagination to the other side of death, gazing backward, perhaps with the divine calm of beneficence, perhaps with the petty anxieties of self-assertion. What was Mr. Casaubon's bias, his acts will give us a clue to. He held himself to be, with some private scholarly reservations, a believing Christian, as to estimates of the present and hopes of the future. But what we strive to gratify, though we may call it a distant hope, is an immediate desire. The future estate for which men drudge up city alleys exists already in their imagination and love. And Mr. Casaubon's immediate desire was not for divine communion and light divested of earthly conditions. His passionate longings, poor man, clung low and mist-like in very shady places. Dorothea had been aware when Lydgate had ridden away, and she had stepped into the garden with the impulse to go at once to her husband but she hesitated, fearing to offend him by obtruding herself, for her ardor, continually repulsed, served with her intense memory to heighten her dread, as thwarted energy subsides into a shudder, and she wandered slowly round the nearer clumps of trees until she saw him advancing. Then she went towards him, and might have represented a heaven-sent angel coming with a promise that the short hours remaining should yet be filled with that faithful love which clings the closer to a comprehended grief. His glance in reply to hers was so chill that she felt her timidity increased, yet she turned and passed her hand through his arm. Mr. Casaubon kept his hands behind him, 
and allowed her pliant arm to cling with difficulty against his rigid arm. There was something horrible to Dorothea in the sensation which this unresponsive hardness inflicted on her. That is a strong word, but not too strong. It is in these acts called trivialities that the seeds of joy are forever wasted, until men and women look round with haggard faces at the devastation their own waste has made, and say, The earth bears no harvest of sweetness, calling their denial knowledge. You may ask why, in the name of manliness, Mr. Casabon should have behaved in that way. Consider that his was a mind which shrank from pity. Have you ever watched in such a mind the effect of a suspicion that what is pressing it as a grief may be really a source of contentment, either actual or future, to the being who already offends by pitying? Besides, he knew little of Dorothea's sensations, and had not reflected that on such an occasion as the present they were comparable in strength to his own sensibilities about Carp's criticisms. Dorothea did not withdraw her arm, but she could not venture to speak. Mr. Casaubon did not say, I wish to be alone, but he directed his steps in silence towards the house, and as they entered by the glass door on this eastern side, Dorothea withdrew her arm and lingered on the matting, that she might leave her husband quite free. He entered the library and shut himself in, alone with his sorrow. She went up to her boudoir. The open bow window let in the serene glory of the afternoon lying in the avenue, where the lime trees cast long shadows. But Dorothea knew nothing of the scene. She threw herself on a chair, not heeding that she was in the dazzling sun rays. If there were discomfort in that, how could she tell that it was not part of her inward misery? She was in the reaction of a rebellious anger stronger than any she had felt since her marriage. Instead of tears, there came words. What have I done? What am I? That he should treat me so. He never knows what is in my mind. He never cares. What is the use of anything I do? He wishes he had never married me. She began to hear herself, and was checked into stillness. Like one who has lost his way and is weary, she sat and saw, as in one glance, all the paths of her young hope which she should never find again. And just as clearly in the miserable light she saw her own and her husband's solitude, how they walked apart, so that she was obliged to survey him. If he had drawn her towards him, she would never have surveyed him, never have said, Is he worth living for? But would have felt him simply a part of her own life. Now she said bitterly, it is his fault, not mine. In the jar of her whole being, pity was overthrown. Was it her fault that she had believed in him, and believed in his worthiness? And what exactly was he? She was able enough to estimate him, she who waited on his glances with trembling, and shut her best soul in prison, paying it only hidden visits, that she might be petty enough to please him. In such a crisis as this, some women begin to hate. The sun was low when Dorothea was thinking that she would not go down again, but would send a message to her husband, saying that she was not well and preferred remaining upstairs. She had never deliberately allowed her resentment to govern her in this way before, but she believed now that she could not see him again without telling him the truth about her feeling and she must wait till she could do it without interruption. He might wonder and be hurt at her message. It was good that he should wonder and be hurt. Her anger said, as anger is apt to say, that God was with her, that all heaven, though it were crowded with spirits watching them, must be on her side. She had determined to ring her bell when there came a rap at the door. Mr. Casaubon had sent to say that he would have his dinner in the library. He wished to be quite alone this evening, being much occupied. "'I shall not dine, then, Tantrip.' "'Oh, madam, let me bring you a little something. No, I am not well. Get everything ready in my dressing-room, but pray do not disturb me again.' 
Dorothea sat almost motionless in her meditative struggle while the evening slowly deepened into night. But the struggle changed continually, as that of a man who begins with the movement towards striking and ends with conquering his desire to strike. The energy that would animate a crime is not more than is wanted to inspire a resolved submission when the noble habit of the soul reasserts itself. That thought with which Dorothea had gone out to meet her husband, her conviction that he had been asking about the possible arrest of all his work, and that the answer must have wrung his heart, could not be long without rising beside the image of him, like a shadowy monitor looking at her anger with sad remonstrance. It cost her a litany of pictured sorrows and of silent cries that she might be the mercy for those sorrows. But the resolved submission did come, and when the house was still, and she knew that it was near the time when Mr. Casaubon habitually went to rest, she opened her door gently and stood outside in the darkness, waiting for his coming upstairs with a light in his hand. If he did not come soon, she thought that she would go down and even risk incurring another pang. She would never again expect anything else. But she did hear the library door open and slowly the light advanced up the staircase without noise from the footsteps on the carpet. When her husband stood opposite to her, she saw that his face was more haggard. He started slightly on seeing her, and she looked up at him beseechingly, without speaking. "'Dorothea,' he said, with a gentle surprise in his tone, "'were you waiting for me?' "'Yes, I did not like to disturb you.' "'Come, my dear, come.' You are young, and need not to extend your life by watching. When the kind, quiet, melancholy of that speech fell on Dorothea's ears, she felt something like the thankfulness that might well up in us if we had narrowly escaped hurting a lamed creature. She put her hand into her husband's, and they went along the broad corridor together. End of chapter 42 Chapter 43 the dead hand this figure hath high price twas wrought with love ages ago in finest ivory not modish in it pure and noble lines of generous womanhood that fits all time that too is costly wear majolica of deft design to please a lordly eye the smile you see is perfect wonderful as mere faience a table ornament to suit the richest mounting. Dorothea seldom left home without her husband, but she did occasionally drive into Middlemarch alone on little errands of shopping or charity such as occur to every lady of any wealth when she lives within three miles of a town. Two days after that scene in the yew-tree walk, she determined to use such an opportunity in order, if possible, to see Lydgate, and learn from him whether her husband had really felt any depressing change of symptoms which he was concealing from her, and whether he had insisted on knowing the utmost about himself. She felt almost guilty in asking for knowledge about him from another, but the dread of being without it, the dread of that ignorance which would make her unjust or hard, overcame every scruple. That there had been some crisis in her husband's mind she was certain, he had the very next day begun a new method of arranging his notes, and had associated her quite newly in carrying out his plan. Poor Dorothea needed to lay up stores of patience. It was about four o'clock when she drove to Lydgate's house in Lowick Gate, wishing, in her immediate doubt of finding him at home, that she had written beforehand, and he was not at home. "'Is Mrs. Lydgate at home?' said Dorothea who had never, that she knew of, seen Rosamond, but now remembered the fact of the marriage. Yes, Mrs. Lydgate was at home. "'I will go in and speak to her, if she will allow me. Will you ask her if she can see me, see Mrs. Casaubon, for a few minutes?' When the servant had gone to deliver that message, Dorothea could hear sounds of music through an open window, a few notes from a man's voice, and then a piano bursting into roulades but the roulades broke off suddenly, and then the servant came back saying that Mrs. Lydgate would be happy to see Mrs. Casaubon. 
When the drawing-room door opened and Dorothea entered, there was a sort of contrast not infrequent in country life, when the habits of the different ranks were less blent than now. Let those who know tell us exactly what stuff it was that Dorothea wore in those days of mild autumn. That thin, white woolen stuff, soft to the touch and soft to the eye. It always seemed to have been lately washed, and to smell of the sweet hedges. It was always in the shape of a pelisse, with sleeves hanging all out of the fashion. Yet if she had entered before a still audience, as Imogene or Cato's daughter, the dress might have seemed right enough. The grace and dignity were in her limbs and neck, and about her simply parted hair and candid eyes, the large round poke which was then in the fate of women seemed no more odd as a head-dress than the gold trencher we call a halo. By the present audience of two persons, no dramatic heroine could have been expected with more interest than Mrs. Casaubon. To Rosamond she was one of those county divinities not mixing with Middlemarch mortality, whose slightest marks of manner or appearance were worthy of her study. Moreover, Rosamond was not without satisfaction that Mrs. Casaubon should have an opportunity of studying her. What is the use of being exquisite if you are not seen by the best judges? And, since Rosamond had received the highest compliments at Sir Godwin Lydgate's, she felt quite confident of the impression she must make on people of good birth. Dorothea put out her hand with her usual simple kindness, and looked admiringly at Lydgate's lovely bride, aware that there was a gentleman standing at a distance, but seeing him merely as a coated figure at a wide angle. The gentleman was too much occupied with the presence of the one woman to reflect on the contrast between the two, a contrast that would certainly have been striking to a calm observer. They were both tall, and their eyes were on a level, but imagine Rosamond's infantine blondness and wondrous crown of hair plates, with her pale blue dress of a fit and fashion so perfect that no dressmaker could look at it without emotion. A large embroidered collar, which it was to be hoped all beholders would know the price of, her small hands duly set off with rings, and that controlled self-consciousness of manner which is the expensive substitute for simplicity. "'Thank you very much for allowing me to interrupt you,' said Dorothea immediately. "'I'm anxious to see Mr. Lydgate, if possible, before I go home, and I hope that you might possibly tell me where I could find him, or even allow me to wait for him if you expect him soon.' "'He's at the new hospital,' said Rosamond. "'I'm not sure how soon he will come home, but I can send for him.' "'Will you let me go and fetch him?' said Will Ladislaw, coming forward. He had already taken up his hat before Dorothea entered. She colored with surprise, but put out her hand with a smile of unmistakable pleasure, saying, "'I did not know it was you. I had no thought of seeing you here.' "'May I go to the hospital and tell Mr. Lydgate that you wish to see him?' said Will. "'It would be quicker to send the carriage for him,' said Dorothea, "'if you will be kind enough to give the message to the coachman.' Will was moving to the door when Dorothea— whose mind had flashed in an instant over many connected memories, turned quickly and said, "'I will go myself, thank you. I wish to lose no time before getting home again. I will drive to the hospital and see Mr. Lydgate there. Pray excuse me, Mrs. Lydgate. I am very much obliged to you.' Her mind was evidently arrested by some sudden thought, and she left the room hardly conscious of what was immediately around her hardly conscious that Will opened the door for her and offered her his arm to lead her to the carriage. She took the arm, but said nothing. Will was feeling rather vexed and miserable, and found nothing to say on his side. He handed her into the carriage in silence, and they said good-bye, and Dorothea drove away. In the five minutes' drive to the hospital she had time for some reflections that were quite new to her. Her decision to go— and her preoccupation in leaving the room, had come from the sudden sense that there would be a sort of deception in her voluntarily allowing any further intercourse between herself and Will, which she was unable to mention to her husband, and already her errand in seeking Lydgate was a matter of concealment. 
That was all that had been explicitly in her mind, but she had been urged also by a vague discomfort. Now that she was alone in her drive, she heard the notes of the man's voice and the accompanying piano, which she had not noted much at the time, returning on in her inward sense, and she found herself thinking with some wonder that Will Ladislaw was passing his time with Mrs. Lydgate in her husband's absence. And then she could not help remembering that he had passed some time with her under like circumstances, so why should there be any unfitness in the fact? But Will was Mr. Casaubon's relative, and one towards whom she was bound to show kindness. Still, there had been signs which perhaps she ought to have understood as implying that Mr. Casaubon did not like his cousin's visits during his own absence. "'Perhaps I have been mistaken in many things,' said poor Dorothea to herself, while the tears came rolling and she had to dry them quickly. She felt confusedly unhappy, and the image of Will, which had been so clear to her before, was mysteriously spoiled. But the carriage stopped at the gate of the hospital. She was soon walking around the grass plots with Lydgate, and her feelings recovered the strong bent which made her seek for this interview. Will Ladislaw, meanwhile, was mortified, and knew the reason of it clearly enough. His chances of meeting Dorothea were rare, and here for the first time there had come a chance which had him set at a disadvantage. It was not only, as it had been hitherto, that she was not supremely occupied with him, but that she had seen him under circumstances in which he might appear not to be supremely occupied with her. He felt thrust to a new distance from her, amongst the circles of middlemarchers who made no part of her life. But that was not his fault. Of course, since he had taken his lodgings in the town, he had been making as many acquaintances as he could, his position requiring that he should know everybody and everything. Lydgate was really better worth knowing than anyone else in the neighborhood, and he happened to have a wife who was musical and altogether worth calling upon. Here was the whole history of the situation in which Diana had descended too unexpectedly on her worshipper. It was mortifying. Will was conscious that he should not have been at Middlemarch but for Dorothea, and yet his position there was threatening to divide him from her with those barriers of habitual sentiment which are more fatal to the persistence of mutual interest than all the distance between Rome and Britain. Prejudices about rank and status were easy enough to defy in the form of a tyrannical letter from Mr. Casaubon, but prejudices like odorous bodies have a double existence, both solid and subtle, solid as the pyramids, subtle as the twentieth echo of an echo, or as the memory of hyacinths which once scented the darkness. And Will was of a temperament to feel keenly the presence of subtleties. A man of clumsier perceptions would not have felt, as he did, that for the first time some sense of unfitness in perfect freedom with him had sprung up in Dorothea's mind, and that their silence, as he conducted her to the carriage, had had a chill in it. Perhaps Casaubon, in his hatred and jealousy, had been insisting to Dorothea that Will had slid below her socially. Confound Casaubon! Will re-entered the drawing-room, took up his hat, and looking irritated as he advanced towards Mrs. Lydgate, who had seated herself at her work-table, said, "'It is always fatal to have music or poetry interrupted. May I come another day and just finish about the rendering of Lunghi dal caro bene? I shall be happy to be taught, said Rosamond, but I am sure you admit that the interruption was a very beautiful one. I quite envy your acquaintance with Mrs. Casaubon. Is she very clever? She looks as if she were. Really, I never thought about it, said Will, sulkily. That is just the answer Tertius gave me when I first asked him if she were handsome. What is it that you gentlemen are thinking of when you are with Mrs. Casaubon? Herself, said Will not indisposed to provoke the charming Mrs. Lydgate. When one sees a perfect woman, one never thinks of her attributes. One is conscious of her presence. 
"'I shall be jealous when Tertius goes to Lowick,' said Rosamond, dimpling, and speaking with an airy lightness. "'He will come back and think nothing of me.' "'That does not seem to have been the effect on Lydgate hitherto. Mrs. Casaubon is too unlike other women for them to be compared with her. "'You are a devout worshipper, I perceive. You often see her, I suppose?' No, said Will, almost pettishly. Worship is usually a matter of theory rather than of practice. But I am practicing it to excess just at this moment. I must really tear myself away. Pray come again some evening. Mr. Lydgate will like to hear the music, and I cannot enjoy it so well without him. When her husband was at home again, Rosamond said, standing in front of him, and holding his coat-collar with both her hands. Mr. Ladislaw was here singing with me when Mrs. Casaubon came in. He seemed vexed. Do you think he disliked her seeing him at our house? Surely your position is more than equal to his, whatever may be his relation to the Casaubons. No, no, it must be something else if he were really vexed. Ladislaw is a sort of gypsy. He thinks nothing of leather and prunella. Music apart, he is not always very agreeable. Do you like him? Yes, I think he is a good fellow, rather miscellaneous and bric-a-brac, but likable. Do you know, I think he adores Mrs. Casaubon. Poor devil, said Lydgate, smiling and pinching his wife's ears. Rosamond felt herself beginning to know a great deal of the world, especially in discovering what, when she was in her unmarried girlhood, had been inconceivable to her, except as a dim tragedy in bygone costumes, that women, even after marriage, might make conquests and enslave men. At that time young ladies in the country, even when educated at Mrs. Lemon's, read little French literature later than Racine, and public prints had not cast their present magnificent illumination over the scandals of life. Still vanity, with a woman's whole mind and day to work in, can construct abundantly on slight hints, especially on such a hint as the possibility of indefinite conquests. How delightful to make captives from the throne of marriage with a husband as a crown prince by your side, himself in fact a subject, while the captives look up forever hopeless, losing their rest probably, and if their appetite too, so much the better. But Rosamond's romance turned at present chiefly on her crown prince, and it was enough to enjoy his assured subjection. When he said, Poor devil, she asked with playful curiosity, Why so? Why, what can a man do when he takes to adoring one of your mermaids? He only neglects his work and runs up bills. I am sure you do not neglect your work. You are always at the hospital, or seeing poor patients, or thinking about some doctor's quarrel, and then at home you always want to pore over your microscope and files. Confess you like those things better than me. Haven't you ambition enough to wish that your husband should be something better than a Middlemarch doctor? said Lydgate, letting his hands fall on to his wife's shoulders and looking at her with affectionate gravity. I shall make you learn my favorite bit from an old poet. Why should our pride make such a stir to be, and be forgot? What good is like to this? To do worthy the writing, and to write, worthy the reading, and the world's delight. What I want, Rosie, is to do worthy the writing, and to write out myself what I have done. A man must work to do that, my pet. Of course. I wish you to make discoveries. No one could more wish you to attain a high position in some better place than Middlemarch. You cannot say that I have ever tried to hinder you from working. But we cannot live like hermits. You are not discontented with me, Tertius? No, dear, no. I am too entirely contented. But what did Mrs. Casaubon want to say to you? merely to ask about her husband's health. But I think she's going to be splendid to our new hospital. I think she will give us two hundred a year. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 I would not creep along the coast, 
but steer out in mid-sea by guidance of the stars. When Dorothea, walking round the laurel-planted plots of the new hospital with Lydgate, had learned from him that there were no signs of change in Mr. Casaubon's bodily condition, beyond the mental sign of anxiety to know the truth about his illness, she was silent for a few moments, wondering whether she had said or done anything to rouse this new anxiety. Lydgate, not willing to let slip an opportunity of furthering a favorite purpose, ventured to say, "'I don't know whether your or Mr. Casaubon's attention has been drawn to the needs of our new hospital. Circumstances have made it seem rather egotistic in me to urge the subject, but that is not my fault. It is because there is a fight being made against it by the other medical men. I think you are generally interested in such things.' for I remember that when I first had the pleasure of seeing you at Tipton Grange before your marriage, you were asking me some questions about the way in which the health of the poor was affected by their miserable housing. "'Yes, indeed,' said Dorothea, brightening. "'I shall be quite grateful to you if you will tell me how I can help to make things a little better. Everything of that sort has slipped away from me since I have been married. I mean,' she said, after a moment's hesitation, that the people in our village are tolerably comfortable, and my mind has been too much taken up for me to inquire further. But here, in such a place as Middlemarch, there must be a great deal to be done. "'There is everything to be done,' said Lydgate, with abrupt energy. "'And this hospital is a capital piece of work, due entirely to Mr. Bulstrode's exertions, and in a great degree to his money. But one man can't do everything in a scheme of this sort.' Of course he looked forward to help, and now there's a mean, petty feud set up against the thing in the town, by certain persons who want to make it a failure. "'What can be their reasons?' said Dorothea, with naive surprise. "'Chiefly Mr. Bulstrode's unpopularity, to begin with. Half the town would almost take trouble for the sake of thwarting him. In this stupid world most people never consider that a thing is good to be done unless it is done by their own set. I had no connection with Bulstrode before I came here. I look at him quite impartially, and I see that he has some notions, that he has set things on foot, which I can turn to good public purpose. If a fair number of the better educated men went to work with the belief that their observations might contribute to the reform of medical doctrine and practice, we should soon see a change for the better." That's my point of view. I hold that, by refusing to work with Mr. Bulstrode, I should be turning my back on an opportunity of making my profession more generally serviceable. I quite agree with you, said Dorothea, at once fascinated by the situation sketched in Lydgate's words. But what is there against Mr. Bulstrode? I know that my uncle is friendly with him. People don't like his religious tone, said Lydgate, breaking off there. "'That is all the stronger reason for despising such an opposition,' said Dorothea, looking at the affairs of Middlemarch by the light of the great persecutions. "'To put the matter quite fairly, they have other objections to him. He is masterful and rather unsociable, and he is concerned with trade, which has complaints of its own that I know nothing about. But what has that to do with the question whether it would not be a fine thing to establish here a more valuable hospital than any they have in the county. The immediate motive to the opposition, however, is the fact that Bulstrode has put the medical direction into my hands. Of course I am glad of that. It gives me an opportunity of doing some good work, and I am aware that I have to justify his choice of me. But the consequence is that the whole profession in Middlemarch has set themselves tooth and nail against the hospital, and not only refuse to cooperate themselves, but try to blacken the whole affair and hinder subscriptions. "'How very petty!' exclaimed Dorothea indignantly. "'I suppose one must expect to fight one's way. There is hardly anything to be done without it. And the ignorance of people about here is stupendous. I don't lay claim to anything else than having used some opportunities which have not come within everybody's reach.' but there is no stifling the offense of being young, and a newcomer, and happening to know something more than the old inhabitants. Still, if I believe that I can set going a better method of treatment, 
if I believe that I can pursue certain observations and inquiries which may be a lasting benefit to medical practice, I should be a base truckler if I allowed any consideration of personal comfort to hinder me. And the course is all the clearer from there being no salary in question to put my persistence in an equivocal light. "'I'm glad you have told me this, Mr. Lydgate,' said Dorothea cordially. "'I feel sure I can help a little. I have some money, and don't know what to do with it. That is often an uncomfortable thought to me.' I am sure I can spare two hundred a year for a grand purpose like this. How happy you must be to know things that you feel sure will do great good. I wish I could awake with that knowledge every morning. There seems to be so much trouble taken that one can hardly see the good of. There was a melancholy cadence in Dorothea's voice as she spoke these last words, but she presently added, more cheerfully, Pray come to Lowick and tell us more of this. I will mention the subject to Mr. Casaubon. I must hasten home now. She did mention it that evening, and said that she should like to subscribe two hundred a year. She had seven hundred a year as the equivalent of her own fortune, settled on her at her marriage. Mr. Casaubon made no objection beyond a passing remark that the sum might be disproportionate in relation to other good objects, but when Dorothea in her ignorance resisted that suggestion, he acquiesced. He did not care himself about spending money, and was not reluctant to give it. If he ever felt keenly any question of money, it was through the medium of another passion than the love of material property. Dorothea told him that she had seen Lydgate, and recited the gist of her conversation with him about the hospital. Mr. Casaubon did not question her further, but he felt sure that she had wished to know what had passed between Lydgate and himself. She knows that I know, said the ever restless voice within, but that increase of tacit knowledge only thrust further off any confidence between them. He distrusted her affection, and what loneliness is more lonely than distrust? End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 It is the humor of many heads to extol the day of their forefathers, and declaim against the wickedness of times present, which, notwithstanding, they cannot handsomely do, without the borrowed help and satire of the times past, condemning the vices of their own times by the expressions of vices in times which they commend, which cannot but argue the community of vice in both. Horace, therefore, Juvenal, and Perseus were no prophets, although their lines did seem to indigitate and point at our times. Sir Thomas Brown, Pseudodoxia Epidemica That opposition to the new fever hospital which Lydgate had sketched to Dorothea was, like other oppositions, to be viewed in many different lights. He regarded it as a mixture of jealousy and dunderheaded prejudice. Mr. Bulstrode saw in it not only medical jealousy, but a determination to thwart himself, prompted mainly by a hatred of that vital religion of which he had striven to be an effectual lay representative, a hatred which certainly found pretexts apart from religion, such as were only too easy to find in the entanglements of human action. These might be called the ministerial views. But oppositions have the illimitable range of objections at command, which need never stop short at the boundary of knowledge, but can draw forever on the vasts of ignorance. What the opposition in Middlemarch said about the new hospital and its administration had certainly a great deal of echo in it, for heaven has taken care that everybody shall not be an originator. But there were differences which represented every social shade between the polished moderation of Dr. Minchin and the trenchant assertion of Mrs. Dollop the landlady of the tankard in Slaughter Lane. Mrs. Dollop became more and more convinced by her own asseveration that Dr. Lydgate meant to let the people die in the hospital, if not to poison them, for the sake of cutting them up without saying by your leave or with your leave, for it was a known fact that he wanted to cut up Mrs. Goby, as respectable a woman as any in Parley Street, who had money and trust before her marriage, a poor tale for a doctor, 
who, if he was good for anything, should know what was the matter with you before you died, and not want to pry into your inside after you were gone. If that was not reason, Mrs. Dollop wished to know what was. But there was a prevalent feeling in her audience that her opinion was a bulwark, and that if it were overthrown there would be no limits to the cutting up of bodies, as had been well seen in Burke and Hare with their pitch plasters, such a hanging business as that was not wanted in Middlemarch. And let it not be supposed that opinion at the tankard in Slaughter Lane was unimportant to the medical profession. That old authentic public house, the original tankard, known by the name of Dollops, was the resort of a great benefit club, which had some months before put to the vote whether its long-standing medical man, Dr. Gambit, should not be cashiered in favor of this Dr. Lydgate, who was capable of performing the most astonishing cures, and rescuing people altogether given up by other practitioners. But the balance had been turned against Lydgate by two members, who for some private reasons held that this power of resuscitating persons as good as dead was an equivocal recommendation, and might interfere with providential favors. In the course of the year, however, there had been a change in the public sentiment, of which the unanimity at Dollops was an index. A good deal more than a year ago, before anything was known of Lydgate's skill, the judgments on it had naturally been divided, depending on a sense of likelihood, situated perhaps in the pit of the stomach or in the pineal gland, and differing in its verdicts, but not the less valuable as a guide in the total deficit of evidence. Patients who had chronic diseases, or whose lives had long been worn threadbare, like old Featherstone's, had been at once inclined to try him. Also, many who did not like paying their doctor's bills thought agreeably of opening an account with a new doctor, and sending for him without stint if the children's temper wanted a dose, occasions when the old practitioners were often crusty, and all persons thus inclined to employ Lydgate held it likely that he was clever. Some considered that he might do more than others where there was a liver. At least there would be no harm in getting a few bottles of stuff from him, since, if these proved useless, it would be still possible to return to the purifying pills, which kept you alive if they did not remove the yellowness. But these were people of minor importance. Good Middlemarch families were, of course, not going to change their doctor without reason shown, and everybody who had employed Mr. Peacock did not feel obliged to accept a new man merely in the character of his successor, objecting that he was not likely to be equal to Peacock. But Lydgate had not been long in town before there were particulars enough reported of him to breed much more specific expectations and to intensify differences into partisanship some of the particulars being of that impressive order of which the significance is entirely hidden, like a statistical amount without a standard of comparison, but with a note of exclamation at the end. The cubic feet of oxygen yearly swallowed by a full-grown man. What a shudder they might have created in some Middlemarch circles. Oxygen! Nobody knows what that may be. Is it any wonder the cholera has got to Danzig? and yet there are people who say quarantine is no good. One of the facts quickly rumored was that Lydgate did not dispense drugs. This was offensive, both to the physicians whose exclusive distinction seemed infringed on, and to the surgeon apothecaries with whom he ranged himself, and only a little while before they might have counted on having the law on their side against a man who, without calling himself a London-maid M.D., dared to ask to pay, except as a charge on drugs. But Lydgate had not been experienced enough to foresee that his new course would be even more offensive to the laity, and to Mr. Momsey, an important grocer in the top market, who, though not one of his patients, questioned him in an affable manner on the subject. He was injudicious enough to give a hasty popular explanation of his reasons, pointing out to Mr. Momsey that it must lower the character of practitioners to be a constant injury to the public, if their only mode of getting paid for their work was by their making out long bills for drafts, boluses, and mixtures. 
It is in that way that hard-working medical men may come to be almost as mischievous as quacks, said Lydgate, rather thoughtlessly. To get their own bread, they must overdose the king's leeches, and that's a bad sort of treason, Mr. Momsey. Undermines the Constitution in a fatal way. Mr. Momsey was not only an overseer. It was about a question of outdoor pay that he was having an interview with Lydgate. He was also asthmatic, and had an increasing family. Thus, from a medical point of view, as well as from his own, he was an important man. Indeed, an exceptional grocer, whose hair was arranged in a flame-like pyramid, and whose retail deference was of the cordial, encouraging kind, jocosely complimentary, and with a certain considerate abstinence from letting out the full force of his mind. It was Mr. Momsey's friendly jocoseness in questioning him which had set the tone of Lydgate's reply. But let the wise be warned against too great readiness at explanation. It multiplies the sources of mistake, lengthening the sum for reckoners sure to go wrong. Lydgate smiled as he ended his speech, putting his foot into the stirrup, and Mr. Momsey laughed more than he would have done if he had known who the king's leeches were, giving his, "'Good morning, sir, good morning, sir,' with the air of one who saw everything clearly enough. But, in truth, his views were perturbed. For years he had been paying bills with strictly made items, so that for every half-crown and eighteen pence he was certain something measurable had been delivered. He had done this with satisfaction, including it among his responsibilities as a husband and father, and regarding a longer bill than usual as a dignity worth mentioning. Moreover, in addition to the massive benefit of drugs to self and family, he had enjoyed the pleasure of forming an acute judgment as to their immediate effects, so as to give an intelligent statement for the guidance of Mr. Gambit, a practitioner just a little lower in status than Wrench or Toller and especially esteemed as an accoucheur, of whose ability Mr. Momsey had the poorest opinion on all other points. But in doctoring, he was wont to say in an undertone, he placed Gambit above any of them. Here were deeper reasons than the superficial talk of a new man, which appeared still flimsier in the drawing-room over the shop, when they were recited to Mrs. Momsey, a woman accustomed to be made much of as a fertile mother, generally under attendance more or less frequent from Mr. Gambit, and occasionally having attacks which required Dr. Minchin. "'Does this Mr. Lydgate mean to say there is no use in taking medicine?' said Mrs. Momsey, who was slightly given to drawling. "'I should like him to tell me how I could bear up at a fair time if I didn't take strengthening medicine for a month beforehand. Think of what I have to provide for calling customers, my dear. Here Mrs. Momsey turned to an intimate female friend who sat by. A large veal pie, a stuffed fillet, a round of beef, ham, tongue, etc., etc. But what keeps me up best is the pink mixture, not the brown. I wonder, Mr. Momsey, with your experience, you could have patience to listen. I should have told him at once that I knew a little better than that. No, 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 said Mr. Momsey. I was not going to tell him my opinion. Hear everything and judge for yourself is my motto. But he didn't know who he was talking to. I was not to be turned on his finger. People often pretend to tell me things when they might as well say, Momsey, you're a fool but I smile at it. I humor everybody's weak place. If physic had done harm to self and family, I should have found it out by this time. The next day Mr. Gambit was told that Lydgate went about saying physic was of no use. Indeed, said he, lifting his eyebrows with cautious surprise. He was a stout husky man with a large ring on his fourth finger. How will he cure his patience, then? "'That's what I say,' returned Mrs. Momsey, who habitually gave weight to her speech by loading her pronouns. "'Does he suppose that they will pay him only to come and sit with them and go away again?' Mrs. Momsey had had a great deal of sitting from Mr. Gambit, 
including very full accounts of his own habits of body and other affairs, but of course he knew there was no innuendo in her remark, since his spare time and personal narrative had never been charged for. So he replied humorously, "'Well, Lydgate is a good-looking young fellow, you know.' "'Not one that I would employ,' said Mrs. Momsey. "'Others may do as they please.' Hence Mr. Gambit could go away from the chief grocers without fear of rivalry, but not without a sense that Lydgate was one of those hypocrites who try to discredit others by advertising their own honesty, and that it might be worth some people's while to show him up. Mr. Gambit, however, had a satisfactory practice, much pervaded by the smells of retail trading, which suggested the reduction of cash payments to a balance and he did not think it worth his while to show Lydgate up until he knew how. He had not, indeed, great resources of education, and had had to work his own way against a good deal of professional contempt, but he made none the worse accoucheur for calling the breathing apparatus longs. Other medical men felt themselves more capable. Mr. Toller shared the highest practice in the town, and belonged to an old Middlemarch family. There were tallers in the law and everything else above the line of retail trade. Unlike our irascible friend Wrench, he had the easiest way in the world of taking things which might be supposed to annoy him, being a well-bred, quietly facetious man, who kept a good house, was very fond of a little sporting when he could get it, very friendly with Mr. Hawley, and hostile to Mr. Bulstrode. It may seem odd that, with such pleasant habits, he should have been given to the heroic treatment, bleeding and blistering and starving his patients, with a dispassionate disregard to his personal example. But the incongruity favored the opinion of his ability among his patients, who commonly observed that Mr. Toller had lazy manners, but his treatment was as active as you could desire. No man, said they, carried more seriousness into his profession. He was a little slow in coming, but when he came, he did something. He was a great favorite in his own circle, and whatever he implied to any one's disadvantage told doubly from his careless, ironical tone. He naturally got tired of smiling and saying, ah, when he was told that Mr. Peacock's successor did not mean to dispense medicines, and Mr. Hackbutt one day mentioning it over the wine at a dinner party, Mr. Toller said laughingly, "'Dibbets will get rid of his stale drugs, then. I'm fond of little Dibbets. I'm glad he's in luck.' "'I see your meaning, Toller,' said Mr. Hackbutt, "'and I am entirely of your opinion. I shall take an opportunity of expressing myself to that effect. A medical man should be responsible for the quality of drugs consumed by his patients. That is the rationale of the system of charging which has hitherto obtained.' and nothing is more offensive than this ostentation of reform, where there is no real amelioration. "'Ostentation, Hackbutt?' said Mr. Toller ironically. "'I don't see that. A man can't very well be ostentatious of what nobody believes in. There's no reform in the matter. The question is whether the profit on the drugs is paid to the medical man by the druggist or by the patient, and whether there shall be extra pay under the name of attendance.' "'Ah, to be sure, one of your damned new versions of the old humbug,' said Mr. Hawley, passing the decanter to Mr. Wrench. Mr. Wrench, generally abstemious, often drank wine rather freely at a party, getting the more irritable in consequence. "'As to humbug, Hawley,' he said, "'that's a word easy to fling about. But what I contend against is the way medical men are fouling their own nest.' and setting up a cry about the country as if a general practitioner who dispenses drugs couldn't be a gentleman. I throw back the imputation with scorn. I say, the most ungentlemanly trick a man can be guilty of is to come among the members of his profession with innovations which are a libel on their time-honored procedure. That is my opinion, and I am ready to maintain it against anyone who contradicts me. Mr. Wrench's voice had become exceedingly sharp. Uh, "'I can't oblige you there, Wrench,' said Mr. Hawley, thrusting his hands into his trouser pockets. "'My dear fellow,' said Mr. Toller, striking in pacifically and looking at Mr. Wrench, 
The physicians have their toes trodden on more than we have. If you come to dignity, it is a question for Minchin and Sprague. Does medical jurisprudence provide nothing against these infringements? said Mr. Hackbutt, with a disinterested desire to offer his lights. How does the law stand, eh, Holly? Nothing to be done there, said Mr. Holly. I looked into it for Sprague. You'd only break your nose against a damn judge's decision. Pooh, no need of the law, said Mr. Toller. So far as practice is concerned, the attempt is an absurdity. No patient will like it. Certainly not peacocks, who have been used to depletion. Pass the wine. Mr. Toller's prediction was partly verified. If Mr. and Mrs. Momsey, who had no idea of employing Lydgate, were made uneasy by his supposed declaration against drugs, it was inevitable that those who called him in should watch a little anxiously to see whether he did use all the means he might use in the case. Even good Mr. Powderell, who, in his constant charity of interpretation, was inclined to esteem Lydgate the more for what seemed a conscientious pursuit of a better plan, had his mind disturbed with doubts during his wife's attack of erysipelas, and could not abstain from mentioning to Lydgate that Mr. Peacock, on a similar occasion, had administered a series of boluses which were not otherwise definable than their remarkable effect in bringing Mrs. Powderell round before Michaelmas from an illness which had begun in a remarkably hot August. At last, indeed, in the conflict between his desire not to hurt Lydgate and his anxiety that no means should be lacking, he induced his wife privately to take Widgeon's purifying pills, an esteemed Middlemarch medicine, which arrested every disease at the fountain, by setting to work at once upon the blood. This cooperative measure was not to be mentioned to Lydgate, and Mr. Powderell himself had no certain reliance on it, only hoping that it might be attended with a blessing. But in this doubtful stage of Lydgate's introduction, he was helped by what we mortals rashly call good fortune. I suppose no doctor ever came newly to a place without making cures that surprised somebody, cures which may be called fortune's testimonials, and deserve as much credit as the written or printed kind. Various patients got well while Lydgate was attending them, some even of dangerous illnesses, and it was remarked that the new doctor with his new ways had at least the merit of bringing people back from the brink of death. The trash talked on such occasions was the more vexatious to Lydgate, because it gave precisely the sort of prestige which an incompetent and unscrupulous man would desire, and was sure to be imputed to him by the simmering dislike of the other medical men as an encouragement on his own part of ignorant puffing. But even his proud outspokenness was checked by the discernment that it was as useless to fight against the interpretations of ignorance as to whip the fog and good fortune insisted on using those interpretations. Mrs. Larcher, having just become charitably concerned about alarming symptoms in her charwoman, when Dr. Minchin called, asked him to see her then and there, and to give her a certificate for the infirmary, whereupon, after examination, he wrote a statement of the case as one of tumor, and recommended the bearer Nancy Nash as an outpatient. Nancy, calling at home on her way to the infirmary, allowed the staymaker and his wife, in whose attic she lodged, to read Dr. Minchin's paper, and by this means became a subject of compassionate conversation in the neighboring shops of Churchyard Lane as being afflicted with a tumor at first declared to be as large and hard as a duck's egg, but later in the day to be about the size of your fist. Most hearers agreed that it would have to be cut out, but one had known of oil and another of squichineal as adequate to soften and reduce any lump in the body when taken enough of into the inside, the oil by gradually soupling, the squichineal by eating away. Meanwhile, when Nancy presented herself at the infirmary, it happened to be one of Lydgate's days there. After questioning and examining her, Lydgate said to the house surgeon in an undertone, It's not tumor, it's cramp. He ordered her a blister and some steel mixture, and told her to go home and rest, giving her at the same time a note to Mrs. Larcher, who, she said, was her best employer, to testify that she was in need of good food. 
But by and by, Nancy, in her attic, became portentously worse, the supposed tumor having indeed given way to the blister, but only wandered to another region with angrier pain. The staymaker's wife went to fetch Lydgate, and he continued for a fortnight to attend Nancy in her own home, until under his treatment she got quite well and went to work again. But the case continued to be described as one of tumor in Churchyard Lane and other streets, nay, by Mrs. Larcher also, for when Lydgate's remarkable cure was mentioned to Dr. Minchin, he naturally did not like to say, the case was not one of tumor, and I was mistaken in describing it as such, but answered, Indeed, ah, I saw it was a surgical case, not of a fatal kind. He had been inwardly annoyed, however, when he had asked at the infirmary about the woman he had recommended two days before, to hear from the house-surgeon, a youngster who was not sorry to vex mention with impunity, exactly what had occurred. He privately pronounced that it was indecent in a general practitioner to contradict a physician's diagnosis in that open manner, and afterwards agreed with Wrench that Lydgate was disagreeably inattentive to etiquette. Lydgate did not make the affair a ground for valuing himself, or, very particularly, despising Minchin, such rectification of misjudgments often happening among men of equal qualifications. But report took up this amazing case of tumor, not clearly distinguished from cancer, and considered the more awful for being of the wandering sort, till much prejudice against Lydgate's methods as to drugs was overcome by the proof of his marvelous skill in the speedy restoration of Nancy Nash after she had been rolling and rolling in agonies from the presence of a tumor both hard and obstinate, but nevertheless compelled to yield. How could Lydgate help himself? It is offensive to tell a lady when she is expressing her amazement at your skill that she is altogether mistaken and rather foolish in her amazement, and to have entered into the nature of diseases would only have added to his breaches of medical propriety. Thus he had to wince under a promise of success given by that ignorant praise which misses every valid quality. In the case of a more conspicuous patient, Mr. Borthrop Trumbull, Lydgate was conscious of having shown himself something better than an everyday doctor, though here too it was an equivocal advantage that he won. The eloquent auctioneer was seized with pneumonia, and having been a patient of Mr. Peacock's, sent for Lydgate, whom he had expressed his intention to patronize. Mr. Trumbull was a robust man, a good subject for trying the expectant theory upon, watching the course of an interesting disease when left as much as possible to itself, so that the stages might be noted for future guidance, and from the air with which he described his sensations, Lydgate surmised that he would like to be taken into his medical man's confidence, and be represented as a partner in his own cure. The auctioneer heard, without much surprise, that his was a constitution which, always with due watching, might be left to itself, so as to offer a beautiful example of a disease with all its phases seen in clear delineation, and that he probably had the rare strength of mind voluntarily to become the test of a rational procedure, and thus make the disorder of his pulmonary functions a general benefit to society. Mr. Trumbull acquiesced at once, and entered strongly into the view that an illness of his was no ordinary occasion for medical science. "'Never fear, sir. You are not speaking to one who is altogether ignorant of the vis medicatrix,' said he, with his usual superiority of expression, made rather pathetic by difficulty of breathing. And he went without shrinking through his abstinence from drugs, much sustained by application of the thermometer which implied the importance of his temperature, by the sense that he furnished objects for the microscope, and by learning many new words which seemed suited to the dignity of his secretions. For Lydgate was acute enough to indulge him with a little technical talk. It may be imagined that Mr. Trumbull rose from his couch with a disposition to speak of an illness in which he had manifested the strength of his mind as well as constitution, and he was not backward in awarding credit to the medical man 
who discerned the quality of patient he had to deal with. The auctioneer was not an ungenerous man, and liked to give others their due, feeling that he could afford it. He had caught the words expectant method, and rang chimes on this and other learned phrases to accompany the assurance that Lydgate knew a thing or two more than the rest of the doctors, was far better versed in the secrets of his profession than the majority of his compeers. This had happened before the affair of Fred Vincy's illness had given to Mr. Wrench's enmity towards Lydgate more definite personal ground. The newcomer already threatened to be a nuisance in the shape of rivalry, and was certainly a nuisance in the shape of practical criticism, or reflections on his hard-driven elders, who had had something else to do than to busy themselves with untried notions. His practice had spread in one or two quarters, and from the first the report of his high family had led to his being pretty generally invited, so that the other medical men had to meet him at dinner in the best houses, and having to meet a man whom you dislike is not observed always to end in mutual attachment. There was hardly ever so much unanimity among them as in the opinion that Lydgate was an arrogant young fellow, and yet ready for the sake of ultimately predominating to show a crawling subservience to Bulstrode. That Mr. Fairbrother, whose name was a chief flag of the anti-Bulstrode party, always defended Lydgate and made a friend of him, was referred to Fairbrother's unaccountable way of fighting on both sides. Here was plenty of preparation for the outburst of professional disgust at the announcement of the laws Mr. Bulstrode was laying down for the direction of the new hospital, which were the more exasperating because there was no present possibility of interfering with his will and pleasure, everybody except Lord Medlicote having refused help towards the building, on the ground that they preferred giving to the old infirmary. Mr. Bulstrode met all the expenses, and had ceased to be sorry that he was purchasing the right to carry out his notions of improvement without hindrance from prejudiced coadjutors, but he had had to spend large sums, and the building had lingered. Caleb Garth had undertaken it, had failed during its progress, and before the interior fittings were begun, had retired from the management of the business, and when referring to the hospital, he often said that, however Bulstrode might ring if you tried him, he liked good solid carpentry and masonry, and had a notion both of drains and chimneys. In fact, the hospital had become an object of intense interest to Bulstrode, and he would willingly have continued to spare a large yearly sum that he might rule it dictatorially without any board. But he had another favorite object, which also required money for its accomplishment. He wished to buy some land in the neighborhood of Middlemarch, and therefore he wished to get considerable contributions towards maintaining the hospital. Meanwhile, he framed his plan of management. The hospital was to be reserved for fever in all its forms, Lydgate was to be chief medical superintendent, that he might have free authority to pursue all comparative investigations which his studies, particularly in Paris, had shown him the importance of, the other medical visitors having a consultative influence, but no power to contravene Lydgate's ultimate decisions. And the general management was to be lodged exclusively in the hands of five directors associated with Mr. Bulstrode, who were to have votes in the ratio of their contributions, the board itself filling up any vacancy in its numbers, and no mob of small contributors being admitted to a share of government. There was an immediate refusal on the part of every medical man in the town to become a visitor at the fever hospital. "'Very well,' said Lydgate to Mr. Bulstrode. "'We have a capital house-surgeon and dispenser, a clear-headed, neat-handed fellow.' We'll get Webb from Crabsley, as good a country practitioner as any of them, to come over twice a week, and in case of any exceptional operation, Prothero will come from Brassing. I must work the harder, that's all, and I have given up my post at the infirmary. The plan will flourish in spite of them, and then they'll be glad to come in. Things can't last as they are. There must be all sorts of reform soon, and then young fellows may be glad to come and study here. Lydgate was in high spirits. 
"'I shall not flinch. You may depend upon it, Mr. Lydgate,' said Mr. Bulstrode. "'While I see you carrying out high intentions with vigor, you shall have my unfailing support. And I have humble confidence that the blessing which has hitherto attended my efforts against the spirit of evil in this town will not be withdrawn. Suitable directors to assist me, I have no doubt of securing. Mr. Brooke of Tipton has already given me his concurrence, and a pledge to contribute yearly. He has not specified the sum, probably not a great one, but he will be a useful member of the board. A useful member was perhaps to be defined as one who would originate nothing, and always vote with Mr. Bulstrode. The medical aversion to Lydgate was hardly disguised now. Neither Dr. Sprague nor Dr. Minchin said that he disliked Lydgate's knowledge, or his disposition to improve treatment. What they disliked was his arrogance, which nobody felt to be altogether deniable. They implied that he was insolent, pretentious, and given to that reckless innovation for the sake of noise and show, which was the essence of the charlatan. The word charlatan, once thrown on the air, could not be let drop. In those days the world was agitated about the wondrous doings of Mr. St. John Long, nobleman and gentleman, attesting his extraction of a fluid like mercury from the temples of a patient. Mr. Toller remarked one day, smilingly, to Mrs. Taft, that Bulstrode had found a man to suit him in Lydgate. A charlatan in religion is sure to like other sorts of charlatans. "'Yes, indeed, I can imagine,' said Mrs. Taft, keeping the number of thirty stitches carefully in her mind all the while. "'There are so many of that sort. I remember Mr. Cheshire, with his irons, trying to make people straight when the Almighty had made them crooked.' "'No, no,' said Mr. Toller. "'Cheshire was all right, all fair and above board. But there's St. John Long. That's the kind of fellow we call a charlatan.' advertising cures in ways nobody knows anything about, a fellow who wants to make a noise by pretending to go deeper than other people. The other day he was pretending to tap a man's brain and get quicksilver out of it. "'Good gracious! What dreadful trifling with people's constitutions!' said Mrs. Taft. After this it came to be held in various quarters that Lydgate played even with respectable constitutions for his own purposes— and how much more likely that in his flighty experimenting he should have made sixes and sevens of hospital patients. Especially it was to be expected, as the landlady of the tankard had said, that he would recklessly cut up their dead bodies. For Lydgate, having attended Mrs. Goby, who died apparently of a heart disease not very clearly expressed in the symptoms, too daringly asked leave of her relatives to open the body, and thus gave an offence quickly spreading beyond Parley Street, where that lady had long resided on an income such as made this association of her body with the victims of Burke and Hare a flagrant insult to her memory. Affairs were in this stage when Lydgate opened the subject of the hospital to Dorothea. We see that he was bearing enmity and silly misconception with much spirit, aware that they were partly created by his good share of success. "'They will not drive me away,' he said, talking confidentially in Mr. Fairbrother's study. "'I have got a good opportunity here, for the ends I care most about, and I am pretty sure to get income enough for our wants. By and by I shall go on as quietly as possible. I have no seductions now away from home and work, and I am more and more convinced that it will be possible to demonstrate the homogeneous origin of all the tissues. Raspail and others are on the same track, and I have been losing time. "'I have no power of prophecy there,' said Mr. Fairbrother, who had been puffing at his pipe thoughtfully while Lydgate talked. "'But as to the hostility in the town, you'll weather it if you are prudent.' "'How am I to be prudent?' said Lydgate. I just do what comes before me to do. I can't help people's ignorance and spite any more than Vesalius could. It isn't possible to square one's conduct to silly conclusions which nobody can foresee. Quite true. I didn't mean that. I meant only two things. One is, 
keep yourself as separable from Bulstrode as you can. Of course, you can go on doing good work of your own by his help, but don't get tied. Perhaps it seems like personal feeling in me to say so, and there's a good deal of that I own. But personal feeling is not always in the wrong if you boil it down to the impressions which make it simply an opinion." Bulstrode is nothing to me, said Lydgate carelessly, except on public grounds. As to getting very closely united to him, I am not fond enough of him for that. But what was the other thing you meant, said Lydgate, who was nursing his leg as comfortably as possible, and feeling in no great need of advice? Why, this. Take care, experto credi. Take care not to get hampered about money matters. I know, by a word you let fall one day, that you don't like my playing at cards so much for money. You are right enough there. But try and keep clear of wanting small sums that you haven't got. I am perhaps talking rather superfluously, but a man likes to assume superiority over himself by holding up his bad example and sermonizing on it. Lydgate took Mr. Fairbrother's hints very cordially, though he would hardly have borne them from another man. He could not help remembering that he had lately made some debts, but these had seemed inevitable, and he had no intention now to do more than keep house in a simple way. The furniture for which he owed would not want renewing, nor even the stock of wine for a long while. Many thoughts cheered him at that time, and justly. A man conscious of enthusiasm for worthy aims is sustained under petty hostilities by the memory of great workers who had to fight their way not without wounds, and who hover in his mind as patron saints, invisibly helping. At home, that same evening when he had been chatting with Mr. Fairbrother, he had his long legs stretched on the sofa, his head thrown back, and his hands clasped behind it according to his favorite ruminating attitude, while Rosamond sat at the piano and played one tune after another, of which her husband only knew, like the emotional elephant he was, that they fell in with his mood as if they had been melodious sea-breezes. There was something very fine in Lydgate's look just then, and any one might have been encouraged to bet on his achievement. In his dark eyes and on his mouth and brow there was that placidity which comes from the fullness of contemplative thought, the mind not searching but beholding, and the glance seeming to be filled with what is behind it. Presently Rosamond left the piano and seated herself on a chair close to the sofa and opposite her husband's face. "'Is that enough music for you, my lord?' she said, folding her hands before her and putting on a little air of meekness. "'Yes, dear, if you are tired,' said Lydgate, gently, turning his eyes and resting them on her but not otherwise moving. Rosamond's presence at that moment was perhaps no more than a spoonful brought to the lake, and her woman's instinct in this matter was not dull. "'What is absorbing you?' she said, leaning forward and bringing her face nearer to his. He moved his hands and placed them gently behind her shoulders. "'I am thinking of a great fellow who was about as old as I am three hundred years ago, and had already begun a new era in anatomy. "'I can't guess,' said Rosamond, shaking her head. "'We used to play at guessing historical characters at Mrs. Lemon's, but not anatomists. "'I'll tell you. His name was Vesalius, and the only way he could get to know anatomy as he did was by going to snatch bodies at night from graveyards and places of execution.' "'Oh,' said Rosamond, with a look of disgust on her pretty face. I'm very glad you are not Vesalius. I should have thought he might find some less horrible way than that. No, he couldn't, said Lydgate, going on too earnestly to take much notice of her answer. He could only get a complete skeleton by snatching the whitened bones of a criminal from the gallows and burying them, and fetching them away by bits secretly in the dead of night. I hope he is not one of your great heroes, said Rosamond, half playfully, half anxiously else I shall have you getting up in the night to go to St. Peter's churchyard. You know how angry you told me the people were about Mrs. Goby. You have enemies enough already. 
So had Vesalius, Rosy. No wonder the medical fogies in Middlemarch are jealous, when some of the greatest doctors living were fierce upon Vesalius, because they had believed in Galen, and he showed that Galen was wrong. They called him a liar and a poisonous monster. But the facts of the human frame were on his side, and so he got the better of them. And what happened to him afterwards? said Rosamond, with some interest. Oh, he had a good deal of fighting to the last, and they did exasperate him enough at one time to make him burn a good deal of his work. Then he got shipwrecked, just as he was coming from Jerusalem to take the great chair at Padua. He died rather miserably. There was a moment's pause before Rosamond said, "'Do you know, Tertius, I often wish you had not been a medical man.' "'Nay, Rosy, don't say that,' said Lydgate, drawing her closer to him. "'That is like saying you wish you had married another man.' "'Not at all. You are clever enough for anything.' You might have easily been something else, and your cousins at Qualingham all think that you have sunk below them in your choice of profession. The cousins at Qualingham may go to the devil, said Lydgate with scorn. It was like their impudence if they said anything of the sort to you. Still, said Rosamond, I do not think it is a nice profession, dear. We know that she had much quiet perseverance in her opinion. "'It is the grandest profession in the world, Rosamond,' said Lydgate gravely, "'and to say that you love me without loving the medical man in me "'is the same sort of thing as to say that you like eating a peach "'but don't like its flavor. "'Don't say that again, dear. It pains me.' "'Very well, Dr. Graveface,' said Rosy, dimpling. "'I will declare in future that I dote on skeletons and body-snatchers "'and bits of things in files and quarrels with everybody that end in your dying miserably. No, not so bad as that, said Lydgate, giving up remonstrance and petting her resignedly. End of chapter 45 Chapter 46 Pues no podemos saber aquello que queremos, queramos aquello que podremos. Since we cannot get what we like, let us like what we can get. Spanish Proverb while Lydgate, safely married and with the hospital under his command, felt himself struggling for medical reform against Middlemarch, Middlemarch was becoming more and more conscious of the national struggle for another kind of reform. By the time that Lord John Russell's measure was being debated in the House of Commons, there was a new political animation in Middlemarch, a new definition of parties which might show a decided change of balance if a new election came. And there were some who already predicted this event, declaring that a reform bill would never be carried by the actual Parliament. This was what Will Ladislaw dwelt on to Mr. Brooke as a reason for congratulation that he had not yet tried his strength at the hustings. "'Things will grow and ripen as if it were a comet year,' said Will. "'The public temper will soon get to a cometary heat, now the question of reform has set in.' There is likely to be another election before long, and by that time Middlemarch will have got more ideas into its head. What we have to work at now is the pioneer and political meetings. "'Quite right, Ladislaw. We shall make a new thing of opinion here,' said Mr. Brooke. "'Only I want to keep myself independent about reform, you know. I don't want to go too far. I want to take up Wilberforce's and Romilly's line, you know, and work at Negro emancipation, criminal law, that kind of thing.' but of course I should support Gray. "'If you go in for the principle of reform, you must be prepared to take what the situation offers,' said Will. "'If everybody pulled for his own bid against everybody else, the whole question would go to tatters.' "'Yes, yes, I agree with you. I quite take that point of view. I should put it in that light. I should support Gray, you know, but I don't want to change the balance of the Constitution, and I don't think Gray would.' "'But that is what the country wants,' said Will. "'Else there would be no meaning in political unions "'or any other movement that knows what it's about. "'It wants to have a House of Commons "'which is not weighted with nominees of the landed class, "'but with representatives of the other interests. "'And as to contending for a reform short of that, "'it is like asking for a bit of an avalanche "'which has already begun to thunder.' "'That is fine, Ladislaw. 
That is the way to put it. Write that down now. We must begin to get documents about the feeling of the country, as well as the machine-breaking and general distress. As to documents, said Will, a two-inch card will hold plenty. A few rows of figures are enough to deduce misery from, and a few more will show the rate at which the political determination of the people is growing. Good. Draw that out a little more at length, Ladislaw. That is an idea now. Write it out in the Pioneer. Put the figures and deduce the misery, you know, and put the other figures and deduce, and so on. You have a way of putting things. Burke, now. When I think of Burke, I can't help wishing somebody had a pocket borough to give you, Ladislaw. You'd never get elected, you know. And we shall always want talent in the house. Reform as we will, we shall always want talent. That avalanche and the thunder, now, was really a little like Burke. I want that sort of thing. Not ideas, you know, but a way of putting them. Pocket burrows would be a fine thing, said Ladislaw, if they were always in the right pocket, and there were always a Burke at hand. Will was not displeased with that complimentary comparison, even from Mr. Brooke, for it is a little too trying to human flesh to be conscious of expressing one's self better than others, and never to have it noticed and in the general dearth of admiration for the right thing, even a chance bray of applause falling exactly in time is rather fortifying. Will felt that his literary refinements were usually beyond the limits of Middlemarch perception. Nevertheless, he was beginning thoroughly to like the work of which, when he began, he had said to himself rather languidly, "'Why not?' and he studied the political situation with as ardent an interest as he had ever given to poetic meters or medievalism. It is undeniable that but for the desire to be where Dorothea was, and perhaps the want of knowing what else to do, Will would not at this time have been meditating on the needs of the English people, or criticizing English statesmanship. He would probably have been rambling in Italy, sketching plans for several dramas, trying prose and finding it too jejun, trying verse and finding it too artificial, beginning to copy bits from old pictures, leaving off because they were no good, and observing that, after all, self-culture was the principal point, while in politics he would have been sympathizing warmly with liberty and progress in general. Our sense of duty must often wait for some work which shall take the place of dilettanteism and make us feel that the quality of our action is not a matter of indifference. Ladislaw had now accepted his bit of work, though it was not that indeterminate loftiest thing which he had once dreamed of as alone worthy of continuous effort. His nature warmed easily in the presence of subjects which were visibly mixed with life and action, and the easily stirred rebellion in him helped the glow of public spirit. In spite of Mr. Casabon and the banishment from Lowick, he was rather happy, getting a great deal of fresh knowledge in a vivid way and for practical purposes, and making the pioneer celebrated as far as brassing, never mind the smallness of the area, the writing was not the worse than much that reaches the four corners of the earth. Mr. Brooke was occasionally irritating, but Will's impatience was relieved by the division of his time between visits to the Grange and retreats to his Middlemarch lodgings, which gave variety to his life. "'Shift the pegs a little,' he said to himself, "'and Mr. Brooke might be in the cabinet while I was under secretary. That is the common order of things. The little waves make the large ones, and are of the same pattern. I am better here than in the sort of life Mr. Casabon would have trained me for, where the doing would all be laid down by a precedent too rigid for me to react upon.' I don't care for prestige or high pay. As Lydgate had said of him, he was a sort of gypsy, rather enjoying the sense of belonging to no class. He had a feeling of romance in his position, and a pleasant consciousness of creating a little surprise wherever he went. That sort of enjoyment had been disturbed when he had felt some new distance between himself and Dorothea in their accidental meeting at Lydgate's and his irritation had gone out towards Mr. Casabon, who had declared beforehand that Will would lose caste. I never had any caste, he would have said, if that prophecy had been uttered to him, 
and the quick blood would have come and gone like breath in his transparent skin. But it is one thing to like defiance, and another thing to like its consequences. Meanwhile, the town opinion about the new editor of the Pioneer was tending to confirm Mr. Casaubon's view. Will's relationship in that distinguished quarter did not, like Lydgate's high connections, serve as an advantageous introduction. If it was rumored that young Ladislaw was Mr. Casaubon's nephew or cousin, it was also rumored that Mr. Casaubon would have nothing to do with him. "'Brooke has taken him up,' said Mr. Hawley, "'because that is what no man in his senses would have expected. Casbon has devilish good reasons, you may be sure, for turning the cold shoulder on a young fellow whose bringing up he paid for. Just like Brooke, one of those fellows who would praise a cat to sell a horse.' And some oddities of Will's, more or less poetical, appeared to support Mr. Keck, the editor of The Trumpet, in asserting that Ladislaw, if the truth were known, was not only a Polish emissary, but crack-brained, which accounted for the preternatural quickness and glibness of his speech when he got on to a platform, as he did whenever he had an opportunity, speaking with a facility which cast reflections on solid Englishmen generally. It was disgusting to Keck to see a strip of a fellow with light curls round his head, get up and speechify by the hour against institutions which had existed when he was in his cradle. And in a leading article of the trumpet, Keck characterized Ladislaw's speech at a reform meeting as the violence of an energumen, a miserable effort to shroud in the brilliancy of fireworks, the daring of irresponsible statements, and the poverty of a knowledge which was of the cheapest and most recent description. "'That was a rattling article yesterday, Keck,' said Dr. Sprague, with sarcastic intentions. "'But what is an anergumen?' "'Oh, a term that came up in the French Revolution,' said Keck. This dangerous aspect of Ladislaw was strangely contrasted with other habits, which became matter of remark. He had a fondness, half-artistic, half-affectionate, for little children— the smaller they were on tolerably active legs, and the funnier their clothing, the better Will liked to surprise and please them. We know that in Rome he was given to ramble about among the poor people, and the taste did not quit him in Middlemarch. He had somehow picked up a troop of droll children, little hatless boys, with their galligaskins much worn and scant shirting to hang out, little girls who tossed their hair out of their eyes to look at him, and guardian brothers at the mature age of seven. This troop he had led out on gypsy excursions to Halsell Wood at nutting time, and since the cold weather had set in, he had taken them on a clear day to gather sticks for a bonfire in the hollow of a hillside, where he drew out a small feast of gingerbread for them, and improvised a punch-and-judy drama with some private homemade puppets. Here was one oddity. Another was that in houses where he got friendly he was given to stretch himself at full length on the rug while he talked, and was apt to be discovered in this attitude by occasional callers for whom such an irregularity was likely to confirm the notions of his dangerously mixed blood and general laxity. But Will's articles and speeches naturally recommended him in families which the new strictness of party division had marked off on the side of reform. He was invited to Mr. Bulstrode's, but here he could not lie down on the rug, and Mrs. Bulstrode felt that his mode of talking about Catholic countries, as if there were any truce with the Antichrist, illustrated the usual tendency to unsoundness in intellectual men. At Mr. Fairbrother's, however, whom the irony of events had brought on the same side with Bulstrode in the national movement, Will became a favorite with the ladies— especially with little Miss Noble, whom it was one of his oddities to escort when he met her in the street with her little basket, giving her his arm in the eyes of the town, and insisting on going with her to pay some call, where she distributed her small filchings from her own share of sweet things. But the house where he visited oftenest, and lay most on the rug, was Lydgate's. The two men were not at all alike, but they agreed none the worse. Lydgate was abrupt, but not irritable, 
taking little notice of megrims in healthy people, and Ladislaw did not usually throw away his susceptibilities on those who took no notice of them. With Rosamond, on the other hand, he pouted and was wayward, nay, often uncomplimentary, much to her inward surprise. Nevertheless, he was gradually becoming necessary to her entertainment by his companionship in her music, his varied talk, and his freedom from the grave preoccupation which, with all her husband's tenderness and indulgence, often made his manners unsatisfactory to her, and confirmed her dislike of the medical profession. Lydgate, inclined to be sarcastic on the superstitious faith of the people in the efficacy of the bill, while nobody cared about the low state of pathology, sometimes assailed Will with troublesome questions. One evening in March, Rosamond, in her cherry-colored dress, with swan's down trimming about the throat, sat at the tea-table. Lydgate, lately come in tired from his outdoor work, was seated sideways on an easy chair by the fire, with one leg over the elbow, his brow looking a little troubled as his eyes rambled over the columns of the pioneer, while Rosamond, having noticed that he was perturbed, avoided looking at him, and inwardly thanked heaven that she herself had not a moody disposition. Will Ladislaw was stretched on the rug, contemplating the curtain-pole abstractedly, and humming the low notes of, When first I saw thy face, while the house spaniel, also stretched out with small choice of room, looked from between his paws at the usurper of the rug with silent but strong objection. Rosamond, bringing Lydgate his cup of tea, he threw down the paper and said to Will, who had started up and gone to the table, "'It's no use your puffing brook as a reforming landlord, Ladislaw. They only pick the more holes in his coat in the trumpet.' "'No matter. Those who read the Pioneer don't read the trumpet,' said Will, swallowing his tea and walking about. "'Do you suppose the public reads with a view to its own conversion? We should have a witch's brewing with a vengeance then.' Mingle, 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 you that mingle may, and nobody would know which side he was going to take. Fairbrother says he doesn't believe Brooke would get elected if the opportunity came. The very men who profess to be for him would bring another member out of the bag at the right moment. There's no harm in trying. It's good to have resident members. Why, said Lydgate, who was much given to use that inconvenient word in a curt tone. "'They represent the local stupidity better,' said Will, laughing and shaking his curls. "'And they are kept on their best behavior in the neighborhood. "'Brooke is not a bad fellow, but he has done some good things on his estate "'that he never would have done but for this parliamentary bite.' "'He's not fitted to be a public man,' said Lydgate, with contemptuous decision. "'He would disappoint everybody who counted on him. "'I can see that at the hospital.' only there Bulstrode holds the reins and drives him. "'That depends on how you fix your standard of public men,' said Will. "'He's good enough for the occasion. When the people have made up their mind as they are making it up now, they don't want a man, they only want a vote.' "'That is the way with you political writers, Ladislaw, crying up a measure as if it were a universal cure, and crying up men who are a part of the very disease that wants curing. "'Why not? Men may help to cure themselves off the face of the land without knowing it,' said Will, who could find reasons impromptu, when he had not thought of a question beforehand. "'That's no excuse for encouraging the superstitious exaggeration of hopes about this particular measure, helping the cry to swallow it whole, and to send up voting popinjays who are good for nothing but to carry it. You go against rottenness, and there is nothing more thoroughly rotten than making people believe that society can be cured by a political hocus-pocus. That's very fine, my dear fellow, but your cure must begin somewhere, and put it that a thousand things which debase a population can never be reformed without this particular reform to begin with. Look what Stanley said the other day, that the House had been tinkering long enough at the small questions of bribery, inquiring whether this or that voter has had a guinea when everybody knows that the seats have been sold wholesale. 
Wait for wisdom and conscience in public agents? Fiddlestick! The only conscience we can trust to is the massive sense of wrong in a class, and the best wisdom that will work is the wisdom of balancing claims. That's my text. Which side is injured? I support the man who supports their claims, not the virtuous upholder of the wrong. That general talk about a particular case is mere question-begging, Ladislaw. When I say I go in for the dose that cures, it doesn't follow that I go in for opium in a given case of gout. I am not baking the question we are upon, whether we are to try for nothing till we find immaculate men to work with. Should you go on that plan? If there were one man who would carry you a medical reform, and another who would oppose it, should you inquire which had the better motives or even the better brains? Oh, of course, said Lydgate, seeing himself checkmated by a move which he had often used himself. If one did not work with such men as are at hand, things must come to a deadlock. Suppose the worst opinion in the town about Bulstrode were a true one. That would not make it less true that he has the sense and the resolution to do what I think ought to be done in the matters I know and care most about. But that is the only ground on which I go with him, Lydgate added rather proudly, bearing in mind Mr. Fairbrother's remarks. He is nothing to me otherwise. I would not cry him up on any personal ground. I would keep clear of that. Do you mean that I cry up Brooke on any personal ground? said Will Ladislaw, nettled and turning sharp round. For the first time he felt offended with Lydgate, not the less so, perhaps, because he would have declined any close inquiry into the growth of his relation to Mr. Brooke. "'Not at all,' said Lydgate. "'I was simply explaining my own action. I meant that a man may work for a special end with others whose motives and general course are equivocal, if he is quite sure of his personal independence, and that he is not working for his private interest, either place or money.' "'Then why don't you extend your liberality to others?' said Will, still nettled. "'My personal independence is as important to me as yours is to you. "'You have no more reason to imagine that I have personal expectations from Brooke "'than I have to imagine that you have personal expectations from Bulstrode. "'Motives are points of honor, I suppose. Nobody can prove them. "'But as to money and place in the world,' Will ended, tossing back his head, I think it is pretty clear that I am not determined by considerations of that sort. "'You quite mistake me, Ladislaw,' said Lydgate, surprised. He had been preoccupied with his own vindication, and had been blind to what Ladislaw might infer on his own account. I beg your pardon for unintentionally annoying you. In fact, I should rather attribute to you a romantic disregard of your own worldly interests. On the political question— I referred simply to intellectual bias. "'How very unpleasant you both are this evening,' said Rosamond. "'I cannot conceive why money should have been referred to. Politics and medicine are sufficiently disagreeable to quarrel upon. You can both of you go on quarrelling with all the world and with each other on those two topics.' Rosamond looked mildly neutral as she said this, rising to ring the bell, and then crossing to her work-table. "'Poor Rosie,' said Lydgate, putting out his hand to her as she was passing him. "'Disputation is not amusing to cherubs. Have some music. Ask Ladislaw to sing with you.' When Will was gone, Rosamond said to her husband, "'What put you out of temper this evening, Tertius?' "'Me? It was Ladislaw who was out of temper. He is like a bit of tinder.' "'But, I mean, before that. Something had vexed you before you came in. You looked cross.' and that made you begin to dispute with Mr. Ladislaw. You hurt me very much when you look so, Tertius. Do I? Then I am a brute, said Lydgate, caressing her penitently. What vexed you? Oh, outdoor things, business. It was really a letter insisting on the payment of a bill for furniture. But Rosamond was expecting to have a baby, and Lydgate wished to save her from any perturbation. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 Was never true love loved in vain? For truest love is highest gain. No art can make it. It must spring where elements are fostering. So in heaven's spot and hour, 
springs the little native flower, downward root and upward eye, shapen by the earth and sky. It happened to be on a Saturday evening that Will Ladislaw had that little discussion with Lydgate. Its effect, when he went to his own rooms, was to make him sit up half the night, thinking over again, under a new irritation, all that he had before thought of his having settled in Middlemarch and harnessed himself with Mr. Brooke. Hesitations before he had taken the step had since turned into susceptibility to every hint that he would have been wiser not to take it and hence came his heat towards Lydgate, a heat which still kept him restless. Was he not making a fool of himself, and at a time when he was more than ever conscious of being something better than a fool? And for what end? Well, for no definite end. True, he had dreamy visions of possibilities. There is no human being who, having both passions and thoughts, does not think in consequence of his passions— does not find images rising in his mind which soothe the passion with hope or sting it with dread. But this, which happens to us all, happens to some with a wide difference, and Will was not one of those whose wit keeps the roadway. He had his bypaths, where the little joys of his own choosing, such as gentlemen cantering in the high road might have thought rather idiotic, the way in which he made a sort of happiness for himself out of his feeling for Dorothea was an example of this. It may seem strange, but it is the fact, that the ordinary vulgar vision of which Mr. Casaubon suspected him, namely that Dorothea might become a widow, and that the interest he had established in her mind might turn into acceptance of him as a husband, had no tempting, arresting power over him. He did not live in the scenery of such an event, and follow it out, as we all do with that imagined otherwise, which is our practical heaven. It was not only that he was unwilling to entertain thoughts which could be accused of baseness, and was already uneasy in the sense that he had to justify himself from the charge of ingratitude, the latent consciousness of many other barriers between himself and Dorothea besides the existence of her husband had helped to turn away his imagination from speculating on what might befall Mr. Casaubon. And there were yet other reasons. Will, we know, could not bear the thought of any flaw appearing in his crystal. He was at once exasperated and delighted by the calm freedom with which Dorothea looked at him and spoke to him. And there was something so exquisite in thinking of her just as she was, that he could not long for a change which must somehow change her. Do we not shun the street version of a fine melody, or shrink from the news that the rarity, some bit of chiseling or engraving perhaps, which we have dwelt on even with exultation in the trouble it has cost us to snatch glimpses of it, is not really an uncommon thing, and may be obtained as an everyday possession? Our good depends on the quality and breadth of our emotion, and to Will, a creature who cared little for what are called the solid things of life, and greatly for its subtler influences, to have within him such a feeling as he had towards Dorothea was like the inheritance of a fortune. What others might have called futility of his passion made an additional delight for his imagination. He was conscious of a generous movement and of verifying in his own experience that higher love poetry which had charmed his fancy. Dorothea, he said to himself, was forever enthroned in his soul. No other woman could sit higher than her footstool, and if he could have written out in immortal syllables the effect she wrought within him, he might have boasted, after the example of old Drayton, that queens hereafter might be glad to live upon the alms of her superfluous praise. But this result was questionable. And what else could he do for Dorothea? What was his devotion worth to her? It was impossible to tell. He would not go out of her reach. He saw no creature among her friends to whom he could believe that she spoke with the same simple confidence as to him. She had once said that she would like him to stay, and stay he would, 
whatever fire-breathing dragons might hiss around her. This had always been the conclusion of Will's hesitations. But he was not without contradictoriness and rebellion even towards his own resolve. He had often got irritated, as he was on this particular night, by some outside demonstration that his public exertions with Mr. Brooke as a chief could not seem as heroic as he would like them to be, and this was always associated with the other ground of irritation, that, notwithstanding his sacrifice of dignity for Dorothea's sake, he could hardly ever see her. Whereupon, not being able to contradict these unpleasant facts, he contradicted his own strongest bias and said, I am a fool. Nevertheless, since the inward debate necessarily turned on Dorothea, he ended, as he had done before, only by getting a livelier sense of what her presence would be to him, and suddenly reflecting that the morrow would be Sunday, he determined to go to Lowick Church and see her. He slept upon that idea, but when he was dressing in the rational morning light, objection said, It will be a virtual defiance of Mr. Casaubon's prohibition to visit Lowick, and Dorothea will be displeased. Nonsense, argued inclination. It would be too monstrous for him to hinder me from going out to a pretty country church on a spring morning, and Dorothea will be glad. It will be clear to Mr. Casaubon that you have come either to annoy him or to see Dorothea. It is not true that I go to annoy him, and why should I not go to see Dorothea? Is he to have everything to himself and be always comfortable? Let him smart a little, as other people are obliged to do. I have always liked the quaintness of the church and congregation. Besides, I know the Tuckers. I shall go into their pew. Having silenced objection by force of unreason, Will walked to Lowick as if he had been on the way to Paradise, crossing Halsell Common and skirting the wood, where the sunlight fell broadly under the budding boughs, bringing out the beauties of moss and lichen, and fresh green growths piercing the brown. Everything seemed to know that it was Sunday, and to approve of his going to Lowick Church. Will easily felt happy when nothing crossed his humor, and by this time the thought of vexing Mr. Casaubon had become rather amusing to him, making his face break into its merry smile, pleasant to see as the breaking of sunshine on the water, though the occasion was not exemplary. But most of us are apt to settle within ourselves that the man who blocks our way is odious, and not to mind causing him a little of the disgust which his personality excites in ourselves. Will went along with a small book under his arm and a hand in each side pocket, never reading but chanting a little, as he made scenes of what would happen in church and coming out. He was experimenting in tunes to suit some words of his own, sometimes trying a ready-made melody, sometimes improvising. The words were not exactly a hymn, but they certainly fitted his Sunday experience. O oh me, O oh me, what frugal cheer my love doth feed upon! A touch, a ray, that is not here, a shadow that is gone. A dream of breath that might be near, an inly echoed tone, the thought that one may think me dear, the place where one was known. The tremor of a banished fear, an ill that was not done. O oh, me, O oh, me, what frugal cheer my love doth feed upon. Sometimes, when he took off his hat, shaking his head backward, and showing his delicate throat as he sang, he looked like an incarnation of the spring whose spirit filled the air, a bright creature, abundant in uncertain promises. The bells were still ringing when he got to Lowick, and he went into the curate's pew before any one else arrived, but he was still left alone in it when the congregation had assembled. The curate's pew was opposite the rector's at the entrance of the small chancel, and Will had time to fear that Dorothea might not come while he looked round at the group of rural faces which made the congregation from year to year within the whitewashed walls and dark old pews hardly with more change than we see in the boughs of a tree which breaks here and there with age, 
but yet has young shoots. Mr. Riggs's frog face was something alien and unaccountable, but notwithstanding this shock to the order of things, there were still the walls and the rural stock of the powderels in their pews side by side. Brother Samuel's cheek had the same purple round as ever, and the three generations of decent cottagers came as of old with a sense of duty to their betters generally, the smaller children regarding Mr. Casabon, who wore the black gown and mounted to the highest box, as probably the chief of all betters, and the one most awful if offended. Even in 1831 Lowick was at peace, not more agitated by reform than by the solemn tenor of the Sunday sermon. The congregation had been used to seeing Will at church in former days, and no one took much note of him except the choir, who expected him to make a figure in the singing. Dorothea did at last appear on this quaint background, walking up the short aisle in her white beaver bonnet and grey cloak, the same she had worn in the Vatican. Her face being, from her entrance, towards the chancel, even her short-sighted eyes soon discerned Will, but there was no outward show of her feeling except a slight paleness and a grave bow as she passed him. To his own surprise, Will felt suddenly uncomfortable, and dared not look at her after they had bowed to each other. Two minutes later, when Mr. Casabon came out of the vestry, and, entering the pew, seated himself in the face of Dorothea, Will felt his paralysis more complete. He could look nowhere except at the choir in the little gallery over the vestry door. Dorothea was perhaps pained, and he had made a wretched blunder. It was no longer amusing to vex Mr. Casabon, who had the advantage probably of watching him, and seeing that he dared not turn his head. Why had he not imagined this beforehand? But he could not expect that he should sit in that square pew alone, unrelieved by any Tuckers, who had apparently departed from Lowick altogether, for a new clergyman was in the desk. Still he called himself stupid now, for not foreseeing that it would be impossible for him to look towards Dorothea, nay, that she might feel his coming an impertinence. There was no delivering himself from his cage, however, and Will found his places, and looked at his book as if he had been a schoolmistress, feeling that the morning service had never been so immeasurably long before, that he was utterly ridiculous, out of temper, and miserable. This was what a man got by worshipping the sight of a woman. The clerk observed with surprise that Mr. Ladislaw did not join in the tune of Hanover, and reflected that he might have a cold. Mr. Casabon did not preach that morning, and there was no change in Will's situation until the blessing had been pronounced and every one rose. It was the fashion at Lowick for the betters to go out first. With a sudden determination to break the spell that was upon him, Will looked straight at Mr. Casabon. But that gentleman's eyes were on the button of the pew door, which he opened, allowing Dorothea to pass, and following her immediately without raising his eyelids. Will's glance had caught Dorothea's as she turned out of the pew, and again she bowed, but this time with a look of agitation, as if she were repressing tears. Will walked out after them, but they went on towards the little gate leading out of the churchyard into the shrubbery, never looking round. It was impossible for him to follow them, and he could only walk back, sadly, at midday, along the same road which he had trodden hopefully in the morning. The lights were all changed for him, both without and within. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 Surely the golden hours are turning gray, and dance no more, and vainly strive to run. I see their white locks streaming in the wind, each face is haggard as it looks at me, slow turning in the constant clasping round, storm-driven. Dorothea's distress when she was leaving the church came chiefly from the perception that Mr. Casabon was determined not to speak to his cousin, and that Will's presence at church had served to mark more strongly the alienation between them. Will's coming seemed to her quite excusable, Nay, she thought it an amiable movement in him towards a reconciliation 
which she herself had been constantly wishing for. He had probably imagined, as she had, that if Mr. Casaubon and he could meet easily, they would shake hands and friendly intercourse might return. But now Dorothea felt quite robbed of that hope. Will was banished further than ever, for Mr. Casaubon must have been newly embittered by this thrusting upon him of a presence which he refused to recognize. He had not been very well that morning, suffering from some difficulty in breathing, and had not preached in consequence. She was not surprised, therefore, that he was nearly silent at luncheon, still less that he made no allusion to Will Ladislaw. For her own part, she felt that she could never again introduce that subject. They usually spent apart the hours between luncheon and dinner on a Sunday, Mr. Casaubon in the library, dozing chiefly, and Dorothea in her boudoir, where she was wont to occupy herself with some of her favorite books. There was a little heap of them on the table in the bow-window, of various sorts, from Herodotus, which she was learning to read with Mr. Casaubon, to her old companion Pascal, and Keeble's Christian Year but to-day opened one after another, and could read none of them. Everything seemed dreary, the portents before the birth of Cyrus, Jewish antiquities, oh dear, devout epigrams, the sacred chime of favorite hymns, all alike were as flat as tunes beaten on wood. Even the spring flowers and the grass had a dull shiver in them under the afternoon clouds that hid the sun fitfully. Even the sustaining thoughts which had become habits seemed to have in them the weariness of long future days in which she would still live with them for her sole companions. It was another, or rather a fuller sort of companionship that poor Dorothea was hungering for, and the hunger had grown from the perpetual effort demanded by her married life. She was always trying to be what her husband wished, and never able to repose on his delight in what she was. The thing that she liked, that she spontaneously cared to have, seemed to be always excluded from her life, for it was only granted and not shared by her husband it might as well have been denied. About Will Ladislaw there had been a difference between them from the first, and it had ended, since Mr. Casaubon had so severely repulsed Dorothea's strong feeling about his claims on the family property, by her being convinced that she was in the right and her husband in the wrong, but that she was helpless. This afternoon the helplessness was more wretchedly benumbing than ever. She longed for objects who could be dear to her, and to whom she could be dear. She longed for work which would be directly beneficent like the sunshine and the rain, and now it appeared that she was to live more and more in a virtual tomb, where there was the apparatus of a ghastly labor producing what would never see the light. Today she had stood at the door of the tomb, and seen Will Ladislaw receding into the distant world of warm activity and fellowship, turning his face towards her as he went. Books were of no use. Thinking was of no use. It was Sunday, and she could not have the carriage to go to Celia, who had lately had a baby. There was no refuge now from spiritual emptiness and discontent, and Dorothea had to bear her bad mood, as she would have borne a headache. After dinner, at the hour when she usually began to read aloud, Mr. Casaubon proposed that they should go into the library, where, he said, he had ordered a fire and lights. He seemed to have revived and to be thinking intently. In the library, Dorothea observed that he had newly arranged a row of his notebooks on a table, and now he took up and put into her hand a well-known volume, which was a table of contents to all the others. "'You will oblige me, my dear,' he said, seating himself, "'if, instead of other reading this evening, you will go through this aloud, pencil in hand, and at each point where I say, Mark, will make a cross with your pencil.' This is the first step in a sifting process which I have long had in view, and as we go on I shall be able to indicate to you certain principles of selection whereby you will, I trust, have an intelligent participation in my purpose. This proposal was only one more sign, added to many since his memorable interview with Lydgate, that Mr. Casaubon's original reluctance to let Dorothea work with him had given place to the contrary disposition, 
namely, to demand much interest and labor from her. After she had read and marked for two hours, he said, "'We will take the volume upstairs, and the pencil, if you please, and, in case of reading in the night, we can pursue this task. It is not wearisome to you, I trust, Dorothea?' "'I always prefer reading what you like best to hear,' said Dorothea, who told the simple truth, for what she dreaded was to exert herself in reading or anything else which left him as joyless as ever. It was a proof of the force with which certain characteristics in Dorothea impressed those around her, that her husband, with all his jealousy and suspicion, had gathered implicit trust in the integrity of her promises, and her power of devoting herself to her idea of the right and best. Of late he had begun to feel that these qualities were a peculiar possession for himself, and he wanted to engross them. The reading in the night did come. Dorothea, in her young weariness, had slept soon and fast. She was awakened by a sense of light, which seemed to her at first like a sudden vision of sunset after she had climbed a steep hill. She opened her eyes and saw her husband wrapped in his warm gown, seating himself in the armchair near the fireplace where the embers were still glowing. He had lit two candles, expecting that Dorothea would awake but not liking to rouse her by more direct means. "'Are you ill, Edward?' she said, rising immediately. "'I felt some uneasiness in a reclining posture. I will sit here for a time.' She threw wood on the fire, wrapped herself up, and said, "'You would like me to read to you?' "'You would oblige me greatly by doing so, Dorothea,' said Mr. Casaubon, with a shade more meekness than usual in his polite manner. "'I am wakeful.' My mind is remarkably lucid. I fear that the excitement may be too great for you, said Dorothea, remembering Lydgate's cautions. No, I am not conscious of undue excitement. Thought is easy. Dorothea dared not insist, and she read for an hour or more on the same plan as she had done in the evening, but getting over the pages with more quickness. Mr. Casaubon's mind was more alert, and he seemed to anticipate what was coming after a very slight verbal indication, saying, "'That will do. Mark that,' or, "'Pass on to the next head. I omit the second excursus on Crete.' Dorothea was amazed to think of the bird-like speed with which his mind was surveying the ground where it had been creeping for years. At last he said, "'Close the book now, my dear. We will resume our work to-morrow.' I have deferred it too long, and would gladly see it completed. But you observe that the principle on which my selection is made is to give adequate and not disproportionate illustration to each of the theses enumerated in my introduction, as at present sketched. You have perceived that distinctly, Dorothea? Y yes, said Dorothea, rather tremulously. She felt sick at heart. "'And now I think that I can take some repose,' said Mr. Casaubon. He laid down again, and begged her to put out the lights. When she had lain down too, and there was a darkness only broken by a dull glow on the hearth, he said, "'Before I sleep, I have a request to make, Dorothea.' "'What is it?' said Dorothea, with dread in her mind. "'It is that you will let me know, deliberately, whether, in case of my death, you will carry out my wishes, whether you will avoid doing what I should deprecate, and apply yourself to do what I should desire. Dorothea was not taken by surprise. Many incidents had been leading her to the conjecture of some intention on her husband's part which might make a new yoke for her. She did not answer immediately. "'You refuse?' said Mr. Casaubon, with more edge in his tone. "'No, I do not yet refuse,' said Dorothea, in a clear voice, the need of freedom asserting itself within her. "'But it is too solemn. I think it is not right, to make a promise when I am ignorant what it will bind me to. Whatever affection prompted, I would do without promising.' "'But you would use your own judgment. I ask you to obey mine. You refuse.' "'No, dear, no,' said Dorothea, beseechingly crushed by opposing fears. But may I wait and reflect a little while? I desire with my whole soul to do what will comfort you, 
but I cannot give any pledge suddenly, still less a pledge to do I know not what. You cannot then confide in the nature of my wishes. Grant me till to-morrow, said Dorothea beseechingly. Till to-morrow, then, said Mr. Casaubon. Soon she could hear that he was sleeping, but there was no more sleep for her. While she constrained herself to lie still, lest she should disturb him, her mind was carrying on a conflict in which imagination ranged its forces first on one side and then on the other. She had no presentiment that the power which her husband wished to establish over her future action had relation to anything else than his work. But it was clear enough to her that he would expect her to devote herself to sifting those mixed heaps of material which were to be the doubtful illustration of principles still more doubtful. The poor child had become altogether unbelieving as to the trustworthiness of that key which had made the ambition and the labor of her husband's life. It was not wonderful that, in spite of her small instruction, her judgment in this manner was truer than his, for she looked with unbiased comparison and healthy sense at probabilities on which he had risked all his egoism. And now she pictured to herself the days and months and years which she must spend in sorting what might be called shattered mummies, and fragments of a tradition which was itself a mosaic wrought from crushed ruins, sorting them as a food for a theory which was already withered in the birth like an elfin child. Doubtless a vigorous error vigorously pursued has kept the embryos of truth a-breathing, the quest of gold being at the same time a questioning of substances, the body of chemistry is prepared for its soul, and Lavoisier is born. But Mr. Casaubon's theory of the elements, which made the seed of all tradition, was not likely to bruise itself unawares against discoveries. It floated among flexible conjectures no more solid than those etymologies which seemed strong because of likeness in sound, until it was shown that likeness in sound made them impossible. It was a method of interpretation which was not tested by the necessity of forming anything which had sharper collisions than an elaborate notion of Gog and Magog. It was as free from interruption as a plan for threading the stars together. And Dorothea had so often had to check her weariness and impatience over this questionable riddle-guessing, as it revealed itself to her instead of the fellowship in high knowledge which was to make life worthier. She could understand well enough now why her husband had come to cling to her, as possibly the only hope left that his labors would ever take a shape in which they could be given to the world. At first it had seemed that he wished to keep even her aloof from any close knowledge of what he was doing, but gradually the terrible stringency of human need, the prospect of a too speedy death, and here Dorothea's pity turned from her own future to her husband's past, nay, to his present hard struggle with a lot which had grown out of that past, the lonely labor, the ambition breathing hardly under the pressure of self-distrust, the goal receding, and the heavier limbs, and now at last the sword visibly trembling above him. And had she not wished to marry him, that she might help him in his life's labor? But she had thought the work was to be something greater, which she could serve in devoutly for its own sake. Was it right even to soothe his grief? Would it be possible, even if she promised, to work as in a treadmill fruitlessly? And yet could she deny him? Could she say, I refuse to content this pining hunger? It would be refusing to do for him dead what she was almost sure to do for him living. If he lived as Lydgate had said he might, for fifteen years or more, her life would certainly be spent in helping him and obeying him. Still, there was a deep difference between that devotion to the living and the indefinite promise of devotion to the dead. While he lived, he could claim nothing that she would not still be free to remonstrate against, and to even refuse. But the thought passed through her mind more than once, though she could not believe in it. Might he not mean to demand something more from her than she had been able to imagine? 
since he wanted her pledge to carry out his wishes without telling her exactly what they were? No, his heart was bound up in his work only. That was the end for which his failing life was to be eked out by hers. And now, if she were to say, No, if you die, I will put no finger to your work, it seemed as if she would be crushing that bruised heart. For four hours Dorothea lay in this conflict, till she felt ill and bewildered, unable to resolve, praying mutely. Helpless as a child which has sobbed and sought too long, she fell into a late morning sleep, and when she waked Mr. Casaubon was already up. Tantrip told her that he had read prayers, breakfasted, and was in the library. "'I never saw you look so pale, madam,' said Tantrip, a solid-figured woman who had been with the sisters at Lausanne. "'Was I ever high-colored, Tantrip?' said Dorothea, smiling faintly. "'Well, not to say high-colored, but with a bloom like a chiny rose. But always smelling those leather books, what can be expected? Do rest a little this morning, madam. Let me say you are ill and not able to go into that close library.' "'Oh, no, no, let me make haste,' said Dorothea. "'Mr. Casbon wants me particularly.' When she went down she felt sure that she should promise to fulfill his wishes, but that would be later in the day, not yet. As Dorothea entered the library, Mr. Casbon turned round from the table where he had been placing some books, and said, "'I was waiting for your appearance, my dear. I had hoped to set to work at once this morning.' but I find myself under some indisposition, probably from too much excitement yesterday. I am going now to take a turn in the shrubbery, since the air is milder. I am glad to hear that, said Dorothea. Your mind, I feared, was too active last night. I would fain have set it at rest on the point I last spoke of, Dorothea. You can now, I hope, give me an answer. May I come out to you in the garden presently, said Dorothea, winning a little breathing space in that way. "'I shall be in the yew-tree walk for the next half-hour,' said Mr. Casaubon, and then he left her. Dorothea, feeling very weary, rang and asked Tantrip to bring her some wraps. She had been sitting still for a few minutes, but not in any renewal of the former conflict. She simply felt that she was going to say yes to her own doom. She was too weak, too full of dread at the thought of inflicting a keen-edged blow on her husband, to do anything but submit completely. She sat still and let Tantrip put on her bonnet and shawl, a passivity which was unusual with her, for she liked to wait on herself. "'God bless you, madam,' said Tantrip, with an irrepressible movement of love towards the beautiful, gentle creature for whom she felt unable to do anything more now that she had finished tying the bonnet. This was too much for Dorothea's highly strung feeling, and she burst into tears, sobbing against Tantrip's arm. But soon she checked herself, dried her eyes, and went out at the glass door into the shrubbery. "'I wish every book in that library was built into a catacomb for your master,' said Tantrip to Pratt, the butler, finding him in the breakfast-room. She had been at Rome, and visited the antiquities, as we know, and she always declined to call Mr. Casaubon anything but your master when speaking to the other servants. Pratt laughed. He liked his master very well, but he liked Tantrip better. When Dorothea was out on the gravel walks, she lingered among the nearer clumps of trees, hesitating, as she had done once before, though from a different cause. Then she had feared lest her effort at fellowship should be unwelcome. Now she dreaded going to the spot where she foresaw that she must bind herself to a fellowship from which she shrank. Neither law nor the world's opinion compelled her to this, only her husband's nature and her own compassion, only the ideal and not the real yoke of marriage. She saw clearly enough the whole situation, yet was fettered. She would not smite the stricken soul that entreated hers. If that were weakness— Dorothea was weak. But the half-hour was passing, and she must not delay longer. When she entered the yew-tree walk, she could not see her husband, but the walk had bends, and she went, expecting to catch sight of his figure wrapped in a blue cloak, 
which, with a warm velvet cap, was his outer garment on chill days for the garden. It occurred to her that he might be resting in the summer-house, towards which the path diverged a little. Turning the angle, she could see him seated on the bench, close to a stone table. His arms were resting on the table, and his brow was bowed down on them, the blue cloak being dragged forward and screening his face on each side. He exhausted himself last night, Dorothea said to herself, thinking at first that he was asleep, and that the summer-house was too damp a place to rest in. But then she remembered that of late she had seen him take that attitude when she was reading to him, as if he found it easier than any other, and that he would sometimes speak, as well as listen, with his face down in that way. She went into the summer-house and said, "'I am come, Edward, I am ready.' He took no notice, and she thought that he must be fast asleep. She laid her hand on his shoulder and repeated, "'I am ready.' Still he was motionless, and with a sudden confused fear she leaned down to him, took off his velvet cap, and leaned her cheek close to his head, crying in a distressed tone, "'Wake, dear, wake, listen to me. I am come to answer.' but Dorothea never gave her answer. Later in the day, Lydgate was seated by her bedside, and she was talking deliriously, thinking aloud, and recalling what had gone through her mind the night before. She knew him and called him by his name, but he appeared to think it right that she should explain everything to him, and again and again begged him to explain everything to her husband. "'Tell him I shall go to him soon,' I am ready to promise, only thinking about it was so dreadful it has made me ill. Not very ill. I shall soon be better. Go and tell him. But the silence in her husband's ear was never more to be broken. End of chapter 48 Chapter 49 A task too strong for wizard spells this squire had brought about. Tis easy dropping stones and wells, but who shall get them out? I wish to God we could hinder Dorothea from knowing this, said Sir James Chetham, with a little frown on his brow and an expression of intense disgust about his mouth. He was standing on the hearth rug in the library at Lowick Grange and speaking to Mr. Brooke. It was the day after Mr. Casaubon had been buried and Dorothea was not yet able to leave her room. "'That would be difficult, you know, Chetham, as she is an executrix, and she likes to go into these things, property, land, that kind of thing. She has her notions, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, sticking his eyeglasses on nervously and exploring the edges of a folded paper which he held in his hand. "'And she would like to act, depend upon it, as an executrix Dorothea would want to act.' "'And she was twenty-one last December, you know. I can hinder nothing.' Sir James looked at the carpet for a minute in silence, and then, lifting his eyes, suddenly fixed them on Mr. Brooke, saying, "'I will tell you what we can do. Until Dorothy is well, all business must be kept from her, and as soon as she is able to be moved she must come to us. Being with Celia and the baby will be the best thing in the world for her, and will pass away the time.' and meanwhile you must get rid of Ladislaw. You must send him out of the country. Here Sir James' look of disgust returned in all its intensity. Mr. Brooke put his hands behind him, walked to the window, and straightened his back with a little shake before he replied, "'That is easily said, Chetham, easily said, you know.' "'My dear sir,' persisted Sir James, restraining his indignation within respectful forms, it was you who brought him here, and you who keep him here. I mean by the occupation you give him. Yes, but I can't dismiss him in an instant without assigning reasons, my dear Chetham. Ladislaw has been invaluable, most satisfactory. I consider that I have done this part of the country a service by bringing him, by bringing him, you know. Mr. Brooke ended with a nod, turning round to give it. It's a pity this part of the country didn't do without him, that's all I have to say about it. At any rate, as Dorothea's brother-in-law, I feel warranted in objecting strongly to his being kept here by any action on the part of her friends. 
You admit, I hope, that I have a right to speak about what concerns the dignity of my wife's sister. Sir James was getting warm. Of course, my dear Chetham, of course. But you and I have different ideas. Different. Not about this action of Casabon's, I should hope, interrupted Sir James. I say that he has most unfairly compromised Dorothea. I say that there was never a meaner, more ungentlemanly act of this, a codicil of this sort to a will which he made at the time of his marriage with the knowledge and reliance of her family, a positive insult to Dorothea. Well, you know, Casabon was a little twisted about Ladislaw. Ladislaw has told me the reason. Dislike of the bent he took, you know. Ladislaw didn't think much of Casabon's notions, Toth and Dagon, that sort of thing, and I fancy that Casabon didn't like the independent position Ladislaw had taken up. I saw the letters between them, you know. Poor Casabon was a little buried in books. He didn't know the world. It's all very well for Ladislaw to put that color on it, said Sir James. But I believe Casabon was only jealous of him on Dorothea's account, and the world will suppose that she gave him some reason, and that is what makes it so abominable, coupling her name with this young fellow's. "'My dear Chetham, it won't lead to anything, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, seating himself and sticking on his eyeglass again. "'It's all of a piece with Casabon's oddity. This paper, now, synoptical tabulation and so on, for the use of Mrs. Casabon. It was locked up in the desk with the will. I suppose he meant Dorothea to publish his researches, eh? And she'll do it, you know. She has gone into his studies uncommonly. My dear sir, said Sir James impatiently, that is neither here nor there. The question is whether you don't see with me the propriety of sending young Ladislaw away. Well, no, not the urgency of the thing. By and by, perhaps, it may come round. As to gossip, you know, sending him away won't hinder gossip. People say what they like to say, not what they have chapter and verse for, said Mr. Brooke, becoming acute about the truths that lay on the side of his own wishes. I might get rid of Ladislaw up to a certain point, take away the pioneer from him, and that sort of thing. But I couldn't send him out of the country if he didn't choose to go. Didn't choose, you know. Mr. Brooke, persisting as quietly as if he were only discussing the nature of last year's weather, and nodding at the end with his usual amenity, was an exasperating form of obstinacy. "'Good God!' said Sir James, with as much passion as he ever showed. "'Let us get him a post. Let us spend money on him. If he could go in the suite of some colonial governor, Grampus might take him.' and I could write to Folk about it. But Ladislaw won't be shipped off like a head of cattle, my dear fellow. Ladislaw has his ideas. It's my opinion that if he were to part from me to-morrow, you'd only hear the more of him in the country. With his talent for speaking and drawing up documents, there are few men who could come up to him as an agitator. An agitator, you know. Agitator, said Sir James, with bitter emphasis feeling that the syllables of this word properly repeated were a sufficient exposure of its hatefulness. But be reasonable, Chudham, Dorothea now. As you say, she had better go to Celia as soon as possible. She can stay under your roof, and in the meantime things may come round quietly. Don't let us be firing off our guns in a hurry, you know. Standish will keep our counsel, and the news will be old before it's known. Twenty things may happen to carry off Ladislaw without my doing anything, you know. Then am I to conclude that you decline to do anything? Decline, Chetham? No, I didn't say decline, but I really don't see what I could do. Ladislaw is a gentleman. I am glad to hear it, said Sir James, his irritation making him forget himself a little. I am sure Casabon was not. Well... It would have been worse if he had made the codicil to hinder her from marrying again at all, you know. I don't know that, said Sir James. It would have been less indelicate. 
"'One of poor Casabon's freaks. "'That attack upset his brain a little. "'It all goes for nothing. "'She doesn't want to marry Ladislaw. "'But this codicil is framed so as to make everybody believe that she did. "'I don't believe anything of the sort about Dorothea,' said Sir James, "'then frowningly. "'But I suspect Ladislaw. "'I tell you frankly, I suspect Ladislaw.' "'I couldn't take any immediate action on that ground, Chetham. "'In fact, if it were possible to pack him off, "'send him to Norfolk Island, that sort of thing, "'it would look all the worse for Dorothea to those who knew about it. "'It would seem as if we distrusted her, distrusted her, you know.' "'That Mr. Brooke had hit on an undeniable argument "'did not tend to soothe Sir James. "'He put out his hand to reach his hat, implying that he did not mean to contend further, and said, still with some heat, "'Well, I can only say that I think Dorothea was sacrificed once, because her friends were too careless. I shall do what I can, as her brother, to protect her now.' "'You can't do better than to get her to fresh it as soon as possible, Chetham. I approve that plan altogether,' said Mr. Brooke, well pleased that he had won the argument." It would have been highly inconvenient to him to part with Ladislaw at that time, when a dissolution might happen any day, and electors were to be convinced of the course by which the interests of the country would be best served. Mr. Brooke sincerely believed that this end could be secured by his own return to Parliament. He offered the forces of his mind honestly to the nation. End of chapter 49 Chapter 50 this lawler here will pressle in us somewhat. Nay, by my father's soul, that he shall not, said the shipman. Here shall he not preach. We shall no gospel glose in here ne teach. We leaven all in the great God, quod he. He wolden so in some difficulty. Canterbury Tales Dorothea had been safe at Freshet Hall nearly a week before she had asked any dangerous questions. Every morning now she sat with Celia in the prettiest of upstairs sitting-rooms, opening into a small conservatory, Celia all in white and lavender like a bunch of mixed violets, watching the remarkable acts of the baby, which were so dubious to her inexperienced mind, that all conversation was interrupted by appeals for their interpretation made to the oracular nurse. Dorothea sat by in her widow's dress, with an expression which rather provoked Celia, as being much too sad, for not only was baby quite well, but really, when a husband had been so dull and troublesome while he lived, and besides that had, well, well, Sir James, of course, had told Celia everything, with a strong representation how important it was that Dorothea should not know it sooner than it was inevitable." But Mr. Brooke had been right in predicting that Dorothea would not long remain passive where action had been assigned to her. She knew the purport of her husband's will made at the time of their marriage, and her mind, as soon as she was clearly conscious of her position, was silently occupied with what she ought to do as the owner of Lowick Manor, with the patronage of the living attached to it. One morning, when her uncle paid his usual visit, though with an unusual alacrity in his manner, which he accounted for by saying that it was now pretty certain Parliament would be dissolved forthwith, Dorothea said, "'Uncle, it is right now that I should consider who is to have the living at Lowick. After Mr. Tucker had been provided for, I never heard my husband say that he had any clergyman in his mind as a successor to himself.' I think I ought to have the keys now and go to Lowick and examine all my husband's papers. There may be something that would throw light on his wishes. No hurry, my dear, said Mr. Brooke quietly. By and by, you know, you can go if you like. But I cast my eyes over things in the desks and drawers. There was nothing, nothing but deep subjects, you know, besides the will. Everything can be done by and by. As to the living— I have had an application for interest already. I should say rather good. Mr. Tyke has been strongly recommended to me. I had something to do with getting him an appointment before. 
an apostolic man, I believe, the sort of thing that would suit you, my dear. I should like to have fuller knowledge about him, uncle, and judge for myself, if Mr. Casaubon has not left any expression of his wishes. He has perhaps made some addition to his will. There may be some instructions for me, said Dorothea, who had all the while had this conjecture in her mind with relation to her husband's work. "'Nothing about the rectory, my dear, nothing,' said Mr. Brooke, rising to go away and putting out his hand to his nieces. "'Nor about his researches, you know. Nothing in the will.' Dorothea's lip quivered. "'Come, you must not think of these things yet, my dear. By and by, you know.' "'I am quite well now, uncle. I wish to exert myself.' "'Well, well, we shall see. But I must run away now. I have no end of work now. It's a crisis, a political crisis, you know. And here is Celia and her little man. You are an aunt, you know, now, and I am a sort of grandfather,' said Mr. Brooke, with placid hurry, anxious to get away and tell Chetham that it would not be his, Mr. Brooke's, fault, if Dorothea insisted on looking into everything.' Dorothea sank back in her chair when her uncle had left the room, and cast her eyes down meditatively on her crossed hands. "'Look, Dodo, look at him. Did you ever see anything like that?' said Celia, in her comfortable staccato. "'What, Kitty?' said Dorothea, lifting her eyes rather absently. "'What? Why, his upper lip. See how he is drawing it down, as if he meant to make a face? Isn't it wonderful? He may have his little thoughts.' I wish nurse were here. Do look at him. A large tear, which had been for some time gathering, rolled down Dorothea's cheek as she looked up and tried to smile. Don't be sad, Dodo. Kiss baby. What are you brooding over so? I am sure you did everything, and a great deal too much. You should be happy now. I wonder if Sir James would drive me to Lowick. I want to look over everything, to see if there were any words written for me. You are not to go till Mr. Lydgate says you may go, and he has not said so yet. Here you are, nurse. Take baby and walk up and down the gallery. Besides, you have got a wrong notion in your head as usual, Dodo. I can see that. It vexes me. Where am I wrong, Kitty? said Dorothea, quite meekly. She was almost ready now to think Celia wiser than herself, and was really wondering with some fear what her wrong notion was. Celia felt her advantage, and was determined to use it. None of them knew Dodo as well as she did, or knew how to manage her. Since Celia's baby was born, she had a new sense of her mental solidity and calm wisdom. It seemed clear that, where there was a baby, things were right enough, and that error, in general, was a mere lack of that central poising force. "'I can see what you are thinking of as well as can be, Dodo,' said Celia. "'You are wanting to find out if there is anything uncomfortable for you to do now, only because Mr. Casaubon wished it, as if you had not been uncomfortable enough before. And he doesn't deserve it, and you will find that out. He has behaved very badly. James is as angry with him as can be.' and I had better tell you to prepare you. Celia, said Dorothea entreatingly, you distress me. Tell me at once what you mean. It glanced through her mind that Mr. Casaubon had left the property away from her, which would not be so very distressing. Why, he has made a codicil to his will to say the property was all to go away from you if you married, I mean. That is of no consequence, said Dorothea, breaking in impetuously. But if you married Mr. Ladislaw, not anybody else, Celia went on with persevering quietude. Of course, that is of no consequence in one way. You never would marry Mr. Ladislaw, but that only makes it worse of Mr. Casaubon. The blood rushed to Dorothea's face and neck painfully, but Celia was administering what she thought a sobering dose of fact. It was taking up notions that had done Dodo's health so much harm. So she went on in her neutral tone, as if she had been remarking on baby's robes. James says so. 
He says it is abominable, and not like a gentleman, and there never was a better judge than James. It is as if Mr. Casaubon wanted to make people believe that you would wish to marry Mr. Ladislaw, which is ridiculous. Only James says it was to hinder Mr. Ladislaw from wanting to marry you for your money, just as if he ever would think of making you an offer. Mrs. Cadwallader said you might as well marry an Italian with white mice. But I must just go and look at baby, Celia added, without the least change of tone, throwing a light shawl over her and tripping away. Dorothea by this time had turned cold again, and now threw herself back helplessly in her chair. She might have compared her experience at that moment to the vague, alarmed consciousness that her life was taking on a new form, that she was undergoing a metamorphosis in which memory would not adjust itself to the stirring of new organs. Everything was changing its aspect, her husband's conduct, her own duteous feeling towards him, every struggle between them, and yet more, her whole relation to Will Ladislaw. Her world was in a state of convulsive change. The only thing she could say distinctly to herself was that she must wait and think anew. One change terrified her as if it had been a sin. It was a violent shock of repulsion from her departed husband, who had had hidden thoughts, perhaps perverting everything she said and did. Then again she was conscious of another change which also made her tremulous. It was a sudden, strange yearning of heart towards Will Ladislaw. It had never before entered her mind that he could, under any circumstances, be her lover. Conceive the effect of the sudden revelation that another had thought of him in that light, that perhaps he himself had been conscious of such a possibility, and this with the hurrying, crowding vision of unfitting conditions and questions not soon to be solved. It seemed a long while she did not know how long, before she heard Celia saying, "'That will do, nurse. He will be quiet on my lap now. You can go to lunch and let Garrett stay in the next room.' "'What I think, Dodo,' Celia went on, observing nothing more than that Dorothea was leaning back in her chair, and likely to be passive, is that Mr. Casaubon was spiteful. I never did like him, and James never did.' I think the corners of his mouth were dreadfully spiteful. And now he has behaved in this way, I am sure religion does not require you to make yourself uncomfortable about him. If he has been taken away, that is a mercy, and you ought to be grateful. We should not grieve, should we, baby? said Celia confidentially to that unconscious center and poise of the world, who had the most remarkable fists all complete even to the nails and hair enough, really, when you took his cap off, to make—you didn't know what. In short, he was Buddha in a Western form. At this crisis Lydgate was announced, and one of the first things he said was, "'I fear you are not so well as you were, Mrs. Casaubon. Have you been agitated? Allow me to feel your pulse.' Dorothea's hand was of a marble coldness. "'She wants to go to Lowick to look over the papers,' said Celia. She ought not, ought she? Lydgate did not speak for a few moments. Then he said, looking at Dorothea, I hardly know. In my opinion, Mrs. Casaubon should do what would give her the most repose of mind. That repose will not always come from being forbidden to act. Thank you, said Dorothea, exerting herself. I am sure that is wise. There are so many things which I ought to attend to. Why should I sit here idle? Then, with an effort to recall subjects not connected with her agitation, she added abruptly, You know everyone in Middlemarch, I think, Mr. Lydgate. I shall ask you to tell me a great deal. I have serious things to do now. I have a living to give away. You know Mr. Tyke and all the— But Dorothea's effort was too much for her. She broke off and burst into sobs. Lydgate made her drink a dose of sal volatile. "'Let Mrs. Casaubon do as she likes,' he said to Sir James, whom he asked to see before quitting the house. 
She wants perfect freedom, I think, more than any other prescription. His attendance on Dorothea while her brain was excited had enabled him to form some true conclusions concerning the trials of her life. He felt sure that she had been suffering from the strain and conflict of self-repression, and that she was likely now to feel herself only in another sort of pinfold than that from which she had been released. Lydgate's advice was all the easier for Sir James to follow when he found that Celia had already told Dorothy the unpleasant fact about the will. There was no help for it now, no reason for any further delay in the execution of necessary business, and the next day Sir James complied at once with her request that he would drive her to Lowick. "'I have no wish to stay there at present,' said Dorothea. "'I could hardly bear it. I am much happier at Freshet with Celia.' I shall be able to think better about what should be done at Lowick by looking at it from a distance, and I should like to be at the Grange a little while with my uncle, and go about in all the old walks and among the people in the village. Not yet, I think. Your uncle is having political company, and you are better out of the way of such doings, said Sir James, who at that moment thought of the Grange chiefly as a haunt of young Ladislaus but no word passed between him and Dorothea about the objectionable part of the will. Indeed, both of them felt that the mention of it between them would be impossible. Sir James was shy, even with men, about disagreeable subjects, and the one thing that Dorothea would have chosen to say, if she had spoken on the matter at all, was forbidden to her at present because it seemed to be a further exposure of her husband's injustice. Yet she did wish that Sir James could know what had passed between her and her husband about Will Ladislaw's moral claim on the property. It would then, she thought, be apparent to him, as it was to her, that her husband's strange, indelicate proviso had been chiefly urged by his bitter resistance to that idea of claim and not merely by personal feelings more difficult to talk about. Also, it must be admitted, Dorothea wished that this could be known for Will's sake, since her friends seemed to think of him as simply an object of Mr. Casaubon's charity. Why should he be compared with an Italian carrying white mice? That word quoted from Mrs. Cadwallader seemed like a mocking travesty wrought in the dark by an impish finger. At Lowick, Dorothea searched desk and drawer, searched all her husband's places of deposit for private writing, but found no paper addressed especially to her, except that synoptical tabulation, which was probably only the beginning of many intended directions for her guidance. In carrying out this bequest of labor to Dorothea, as in all else, Mr. Casaubon had been slow and hesitating, oppressed in the plan of transmitting his work, as he had been in executing it, by the sense of moving heavily in a dim and clogging medium, distrust of Dorothea's competence to arrange what he had prepared was subdued only by distrust of any other redactor. But he had come at last to create a trust for himself out of Dorothea's nature, she could do what she resolved to do, and he willingly imagined her toiling under the fetters of a promise to erect a tomb with his name upon it. Not that Mr. Casbon called the future volumes a tomb, he called them the key to all mythologies. But the months gained on him and left his plans belated. He had only had time to ask for that promise by which he sought to keep his cold grasp on Dorothea's life. The grasp had slipped away. Bound by a pledge given from the depths of her pity, she would have been capable of undertaking a toil which her judgment whispered was vain for all uses except that consecration of faithfulness which is a supreme use. But now her judgment, instead of being controlled by duteous devotion, was made active by the embittering discovery that in her past union there had lurked the hidden alienation of secrecy and suspicion. The living, suffering man was no longer before her to awaken her pity. There remained only the retrospect of painful subjection 
to a husband whose thoughts had been lower than she had believed, whose exorbitant claims for himself had even blinded his scrupulous care for his own character, and made him defeat his own pride by shocking men of ordinary honor. As for the property which was the sign of that broken tie, she would have been glad to be free from it and have nothing more than her original fortune which had been settled on her, if there had not been duties attached to ownership which she ought not to flinch from. About this property many troublous questions insisted on rising. Had she not been right in thinking that the half of it ought to go to Will Ladislaw? But was it not impossible now for her to do that act of justice? Mr. Casaubon had taken a cruelly effective means of hindering her. Even with indignation against him in her heart, any act that seemed a triumphant eluding of his purpose revolted her. After collecting papers of business which she wished to examine, she locked up again the desks and drawers, all empty of personal words for her, empty of any sign that in her husband's lonely brooding his heart had gone out to her in excuse or explanation, and she went back to Freshet with the sense that around his last hard demand and his last injurious assertion of his power the silence was unbroken. Dorothea tried now to turn her thoughts towards immediate duties, and one of these was of a kind which others were determined to remind her of. Lydgate's ear had caught eagerly her mention of the living, and as soon as he could he reopened the subject, seeing here a possibility of making amends for the casting vote he had once given with an ill-satisfied conscience. "'Instead of telling you anything about Mr. Tyke,' he said, I should like to speak of another man, Mr. Fairbrother, the vicar of St. Botolph's. His living is a poor one, and gives him a stinted provision for himself and his family. His mother, aunt, and sister all live with him, and depend upon him. I believe he has never married because of them. I never heard such good preaching as his, such plain, easy eloquence, he would have done to preach at St. Paul's Cross after old Latimer. His talk is just as good about all subjects, original, simple, clear. I think him a remarkable fellow. He ought to have done more than he has done. Why has he not done more, said Dorothea, interested now in all who had slipped below their own intention? That's a hard question, said Lydgate. I find myself that it's uncommonly difficult to make the right thing work. There are so many strings pulling at once. Fairbrother often hints that he has got into the wrong profession. He wants a wider range than that of a poor clergyman, and I suppose he has no interest to help him on. He is very fond of natural history and various scientific matters, and he is hampered in reconciling these tastes with his position." He has no money to spare, hardly enough to use, and that has led him into card-playing. Middlemarch is a great place for whist. He does play for money, and he wins a good deal. Of course, that takes him into company a little beneath him, and makes him slack about some things. And yet, with all that, looking at him as a whole, I think he is one of the most blameless men I ever knew. He has neither venom nor doubleness in him, and those often go with a more correct outside. "'I wonder whether he suffers in his conscience because of that habit,' said Dorothea. "'I wonder whether he wishes he could leave it off.' "'I have no doubt he would leave it off if he were transplanted into plenty. He would be glad of the time for other things.' "'My uncle says that Mr. Tyke is spoken of as an apostolic man,' said Dorothea meditatively. She was wishing it were possible to restore the times of primitive zeal, and yet thinking of Mr. Fairbrother with a strong desire to rescue him from his chance-gotten money. "'I don't pretend to say that Fairbrother is apostolic,' said Lydgate. "'His position is not quite like that of the apostles. He is only a parson among parishioners whose lives he has to try and make better. Practically I find that what is called being apostolic now is an impatience of everything in which the parson doesn't cut the principal figure. 
I see something of that in Mr. Tyke at the hospital. A good deal of his doctrine is a sort of pinching hard to make people uncomfortably aware of him. Besides, an apostolic man at Lowick, he ought to think, as St. Francis did, that it is needful to preach to the birds. True, said Dorothea. It is hard to imagine what sort of notions our farmers and laborers get from their teaching. I have been looking into a volume of sermons by Mr. Tyke. Such sermons would be of no use at Lowick. I mean about imputed righteousness and the prophecies in the apocalypse. I have always been thinking of the different ways in which Christianity is taught, and whenever I find one way that makes it a wider blessing than any other, I cling to that as the truest. I mean that which takes in the most good of all kinds, and brings in the most people as sharers in it. It is surely better to pardon too much than to condemn too much. But I should like to see Mr. Fairbrother and hear him preach. Do, said Lydgate. I trust to the effect of that. He is very much beloved, but he has enemies too. There are always people who can't forgive an able man for differing from them. And that money-winning business is really a blot. You don't, of course, see many Middlemarch people, but Mr. Ladislaw, who is constantly seeing Mr. Brook, is a great friend of Mr. Fairbrother's old ladies, and would be glad to sing the vicar's praises. One of the old ladies, Miss Noble, the aunt, is a wonderfully quaint picture of self-forgetful goodness, and Ladislaw gallants her about sometimes. I met them one day in a back street. You know Ladislaw's look a sort of daftness in coat and waistcoat, and this little old maid reaching up to his arm. They look like a couple dropped out of a romantic comedy. But the best evidence about Fairbrother is to see him and hear him. Happily, Dorothea was in her private sitting-room when this conversation occurred, and there was no one present to make Lydgate's innocent introduction of Ladislaw painful to her. As was usual with him in matters of personal gossip, Lydgate had quite forgotten Rosamond's remark that she thought Will adored Mrs. Casaubon. At that moment he was only caring for what would recommend the Fairbrother family, and he had purposely given emphasis to the worst that could be said about the vicar in order to forestall objections. In the weeks since Mr. Casaubon's death he had hardly seen Ladislaw, and he had heard no rumor to warn him that Mr. Brooke's confidential secretary was a dangerous subject with Mrs. Casaubon. When he was gone, his picture of Ladislaw lingered in her mind, and disputed the ground with that question of the Lowick living. What was Will Ladislaw thinking about her? Would he hear of that fact which made her cheeks burn as they never used to do? And how would he feel when he heard it? But she could see as well as possible how he smiled down at the little old maid. An Italian with white mice. On the contrary, he was a creature who entered into everyone's feelings, and could take the pressure of their thought instead of urging his own with an iron resistance. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Party is nature, too, and you shall see, by force of logic, how they both agree. The many in the one, the one in many, all is not some, nor some the same as any. Genus holds species, both are great or small, one genus highest, one not high at all. Each species has its differentia, too. This is not that, and he was never you, though this and that are eyes, and you and he are like as one to one, three and three. No gossip about Mr. Casaubon's will had yet reached Ladislaw. The air seemed to be filled with the dissolution of Parliament and the coming election, as the old wakes and fairs were filled with the rival clatter of itinerant shows, and more private noises were taken little notice of. The famous dry election was at hand, in which the depths of public feeling might be measured by the low flood-mark of drink. Will Ladislaw was one of the busiest at this time, and though Dorothea's widowhood was continually in his thought, he was so far from wishing to be spoken to on the subject 
that when Lydgate sought him out to tell him what had passed about the Lowick living, he answered rather waspishly, "'Why should you bring me into the matter? I never see Mrs. Casaubon, and am not likely to see her, since she is at Freshet. I never go there. It is Tory ground, where I and the pioneer are no more welcome than a poacher and his gun.' The fact was that Will had been made the more susceptible by observing that Mr. Brooke, instead of wishing him, as before, to come to the Grange oftener than was quite agreeable to himself, seemed now to contrive that he should go there as little as possible. This was a shuffling concession of Mr. Brooke's to Sir James Chetham's indignant remonstrance, and Will, awake to the slightest hint in this direction, concluded that he was to be kept away from the Grange on Dorothea's account. Her friends, then, regarded him with some suspicion. Their fears were quite superfluous. They were very much mistaken if they imagined that he would put himself forward as a needy adventurer trying to win the favor of a rich woman. Until now Will had never fully seen the chasm between himself and Dorothea. Until now that he was come to the brink of it, and saw her on the other side. He began, not without some inward rage, to think of going away from the neighborhood. It would be impossible for him to show any further interest in Dorothea without subjecting himself to disagreeable imputations, perhaps even in her mind, which others might try to poison. "'We are forever divided,' said Will. "'I might as well be at Rome. She would be no farther from me.' But what we call our despair is often only the painful eagerness of unfed hope. There were plenty of reasons why he should not go, public reasons why he should not quit his post at this crisis, leaving Mr. Brooke in the lurch when he needed coaching for the election, and when there was so much canvassing, direct and indirect, to be carried on. Will could not like to leave his own chessmen in the heat of a game, and any candidate on the right side, even if his brain and marrow had been as soft as was consistent with a gentlemanly bearing, might help to turn a majority. To coach Mr. Brooke and keep him steadily to the idea that he must pledge himself to vote for the actual reform bill, instead of insisting on his independence and power of pulling up in time, was not an easy task. Mr. Fairbrother's prophecy of a fourth candidate in the bag had not yet been fulfilled, neither the Parliamentary Candidate Society nor any other power on the watch to secure a reforming majority, seeing a worthy notice for interference while there was a second reforming candidate like Mr. Brooke, who might be returned at his own expense, and the fight lay entirely between Pinkerton and the old Tory member, Bagster, the new Whig member returned at the last election, and Brooke, the future independent member, who was to fetter himself for this occasion only. Mr. Hawley and his party would bend all their forces to the return of Pinkerton, and Mr. Brooke's success must depend either on plumpers, which would leave Bagster in the rear, or on the new minting of Tory votes into reforming votes. The latter means, of course, would be preferable. This prospect of converting votes was a dangerous distraction to Mr. Brooke, his impression that waverers were likely to be allured by wavering statements, and also the liability of his mind to stick afresh at opposing arguments as they turned up in his memory, gave Will Ladislaw much trouble. "'You know, there are tactics in these things,' said Mr. Brooke, "'meeting people half-way, tempering your ideas, saying, "'Well, now, there's something in that,' and so on. I agree with you that this is a peculiar occasion. The country with a will of its own, political unions, that sort of thing. But we sometimes cut with rather too sharp a knife, Ladislaw. These ten-pound householders now, why ten? Draw the line somewhere, yes, but why just to ten? That's a difficult question now if you go into it. Of course it is, said Will, impatiently. But if you are to wait till we get a logical bill— you must put yourself forward as a revolutionist, and then Middlemarch would not elect you, I fancy. As for trimming, this is not a time for trimming. Mr. Brooke always ended by agreeing with Ladislaw, who still appeared to him a sort of Burke with a leaven of Shelley, 
but after an interval the wisdom of his own methods reasserted itself, and he was again drawn into using them with much hopefulness. At this stage of affairs he was in excellent spirits, which even supported him under large advances of money, for his powers of convincing and persuading had not yet been tested by anything more difficult than a chairman's speech introducing other orators, or a dialogue with a Middlemarch voter, from which he came away with a sense that he was a tactician by nature, and that it was a pity he had not gone earlier into this kind of thing. He was a little conscious of defeat, however, with Mr. Momsey, a chief representative in Middlemarch of that great social power, the retail trader, and naturally one of the most doubtful voters in the borough, willing for his own part to supply an equal quality of teas and sugars to reformer and anti-reformer, as well as to agree impartially with both, and feeling like the Burgesses of old that this necessity of electing members was a great burden to a town, for even if there were no danger in holding out hopes to all parties beforehand, there would be the painful necessity at last of disappointing respectable people whose names were on his books. He was accustomed to receive large orders from Mr. Brook of Tipton, but then there were many of Pinkerton's committee whose opinions had a great weight of grocery on their side. Mr. Momsey, thinking that Mr. Brook, as not too clever in his intellects, was the more likely to forgive a grocer who gave a hostile vote under pressure, had become confidential in his back parlor. "'As to reform, sir, put it in a family light,' he said, rattling the small silver in his pocket and smiling affably. "'Will it support Mrs. Momsey and enable her to bring up six children when I am no more?' I put the question fictiously, knowing what must be the answer. Very well, sir. I ask you what, as a husband and father, I am to do when gentlemen come to me and say, Do as you like, Momsey, but if you vote against us, I shall get my groceries elsewhere. When I sugar my liquor, I like to feel that I am benefiting the country by maintaining tradesmen of the right color. Those very words have been spoken to me, sir, in the very chair where you are now sitting. I don't mean by your honorable self, Mr. Brooke. No, 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 that's narrow, you know. Until my butler complains to me of your goods, Mr. Momsey, said Mr. Brooke soothingly, until I hear that you send bad sugars, spices, that sort of thing, I shall never order him to go elsewhere. Sir, I am your humble servant and greatly obliged, said Mr. Momsey feeling that politics were clearing up a little. There would be some pleasure in voting for a gentleman who speaks in that honorable manner. Well, you know, Mr. Momsey, you would find it the right thing to put yourself on our side. This reform will touch everybody by and by, a thoroughly popular measure, a sort of A, B, C, you know, that must come first before the rest can follow. I quite agree with you that you've got to look at the thing in a family light, but public spirit now. We're all one family, you know. It's all one cupboard. Such a thing as a vote now, why, it may help to make men's fortunes at the Cape. There's no knowing what may be the effect of a vote, Mr. Brooke ended, with a sense of being a little out at sea, though finding it still enjoyable. But Mr. Momsey answered in a tone of decisive check. I beg your pardon, sir, but I can't afford that. When I give a vote, I must know what I am doing. I must look to what will be the effects on my till and ledger, speaking respectfully. Prices, I'll admit, are what nobody can know the merits of, and the sudden falls after you've brought in currents, which are goods that will not keep, I've never myself seen into the ins and outs there, which is a rebuke to human pride. But as to one family, there's debtor and creditor, I hope, they're not going to reform that away, else I should vote for things staying as they are. Few men have less need to cry for change than I have, personally speaking, that is, for self and family. I am not one of those who have nothing to lose. I mean as to respectability both in parish and private business, and no ways in respect of your honorable self and custom, which you was good enough to say you would not withdraw from me, vote or no vote, while the article sent in was satisfactory. 
After this conversation Mr. Momsey went up and boasted to his wife that he had been rather too many for Brook of Tipton, and that he didn't mind so much now about going to the pole. Mr. Brook on this occasion abstained from boasting of his tactics to Ladislaw, who for his part was glad enough to persuade himself that he had no concern with any canvassing except the purely argumentative sort, and that he worked no meaner engine than knowledge. Mr. Brook necessarily had his agents, who understood the nature of the Middlemarch voter and the means of enlisting his ignorance on the side of the bill, which were remarkably similar to the means of enlisting it on the side against the bill. Will stopped his ears. Occasionally Parliament, like the rest of our lives, even to our eating and apparel, could hardly go on if our imaginations were too active about processes. There were plenty of dirty-handed men in the world to do dirty business, and Will protested to himself that his share in bringing Mr. Brooke through would be quite innocent. But whether he should succeed in that mode of contributing to the majority on the right side was very doubtful to him. He had written out various speeches and memoranda for speeches, but he had begun to perceive that Mr. Brooke's mind, if it had the burden of remembering any train of thought, would let it drop, run away in search of it, and not easily come back again. To collect documents is one mode of serving your country, and to remember the contents of a document is another. No, the only way in which Mr. Brooke could be coerced into thinking of the right arguments at the right time was to be well plied with them till they took up all the room in his brain. But here there was the difficulty of finding room, so many things having been taken beforehand. Mr. Brooke himself observed that his ideas stood rather in his way when he was speaking. However, Ladislaw's coaching was forthwith to be put to the test, for before the day of nomination Mr. Brooke was to explain himself to the worthy electors of Middlemarch from the balcony of the White Hart, which looked out advantageously at an angle of the market-place, commanding a large area in front, and two converging streets. It was a fine May morning, and everything seemed hopeful. There was some prospect of an understanding between Bagster's committee and Brooks, to which Mr. Bulstrode, Mr. Standish as a liberal lawyer, and such manufacturers as Mr. Plymdale and Mr. Vincey, gave a solidity which almost counterbalanced Mr. Hawley and his associates, who sat for Pinkerton at the Green Dragon. Mr. Brooke, conscious of having weakened the blasts of the trumpet against him by his reforms as a landlord in the last half-year, and hearing himself cheered a little as he drove into the town, felt his heart tolerably light under his buff-colored waistcoat. But with regard to critical occasions, it often happens that all moments seem comfortably remote until the last. "'This looks well, eh?' said Mr. Brooke, as the crowd gathered. I shall have a good audience at any rate. I like this now, this kind of public made up of one's own neighbors, you know. The weavers and tanners of Middlemarch, unlike Mr. Momsey, had never thought of Mr. Brooke as a neighbor, and were not more attached to him than if he had been sent in a box from London. But they listened without much disturbance to the speaker who introduced the candidate, one of them, a political personage from Brassing, who came to tell Middlemarch its duty, spoke so fully that it was alarming to think what the candidate could find to say after him. Meanwhile the crowd became denser, and as the political personage neared to the end of his speech, Mr. Brooke felt a remarkable change in his sensations while he still handled his eyeglass, trifled with documents before him, and exchanged remarks with his committee as a man to whom the moment of summons was indifferent. "'I'll take another glass of sherry, Ladislaw,' he said with an easy air to Will, who was close behind him, and presently handed him the supposed fortifier. It was ill-chosen, for Mr. Brooke was an abstemious man, and to drink a second glass of sherry quickly, at no great interval from the first, was a surprise to his system, which tended to scatter his energies instead of collecting them. "'Pray pity him.' 
so many English gentlemen make themselves miserable by speechifying on entirely private grounds, whereas Mr. Brooke wished to serve his country by standing for Parliament, which indeed may also be done on private grounds, but being once undertaken does absolutely demand some speechifying. It was not about the beginning of his speech that Mr. Brooke was at all anxious. This, he felt sure, would be all right. He should have it quite pat, cut out as neatly as a set of couplets from Pope. Embarking would be easy, but the vision of open sea that might come after was alarming. "'And questions now,' hinted the demon just waking up in his stomach. "'Somebody may put questions about the schedules.' Ladislaw, he continued aloud, just hand me the memorandum of the schedules. When Mr. Burke presented himself on the balcony, the cheers were quite loud enough to counterbalance the yells, groans, brayings, and other expressions of adverse theory, which were so moderate that Mr. Standish, decidedly an old bird, observed in the ear next to him, This looks dangerous, by God. Holly has got some deeper plan than this. Still, the cheers were exhilarating, and no candidate could look more amiable than Mr. Brooke, with the memorandum in his breast pocket, his left hand on the rail of the balcony, and his right trifling with his eyeglass. The striking points in his appearance were his buff waistcoat, short-clipped blonde hair, and neutral physiognomy. He began with some confidence. "'Gentlemen, electors of Middlemarch,' This was so much the right thing that a little pause after it seemed natural. "'I'm uncommonly glad to be here. I was never so proud and happy in my life. Never so happy, you know.' This was a bold figure of speech, but not exactly the right thing, for, unhappily, the pat opening had slipped away. Even couplets from Pope may be but fallings from us, vanishings, when fear clutches us, and a glass of sherry is hurrying like smoke among our ideas. Ladislaw, who stood at the window behind the speaker, thought, It's all up now. The only chance is that, since the best thing won't always do, floundering may answer for once. Mr. Brooke, meanwhile, having lost other clues, fell back on himself and his qualifications always an appropriate, graceful subject for a candidate. "'I am a close neighbor of yours, my good friends. You've known me on the bench a good while. I've always done a good deal into public questions, machinery, now, and machine-breaking. You're many of you concerned with machinery, and I've been going into that lately. It won't do, you know, breaking machines. Everything must go on. Trade, manufactures, commerce, interchange of staples, that kind of thing. Since Adam Smith, that must go on. We must look all over the globe. Observation with intensive view. Must look everywhere, from China to Peru, as somebody says, Johnson, I think, the rambler, you know. This is what I have done up to a certain point. Not as far as Peru, but I've not always stayed at home. I saw it wouldn't do. I've been in the Levant, where some of your Middlemarch goods go, and then again in the Baltic, the Baltic now. Plying among his recollections in this way, Mr. Brooke might have got along easily to himself, and would have come back from the remotest seas without trouble, but a diabolical procedure had been set up by the enemy. At one and the same moment there had risen above the shoulders of the crowd, nearly opposite Mr. Brooke, and within ten yards of him, the effigy of himself, buff-colored waistcoat, eyeglass, and neutral physiognomy, painted on rag, and there had arisen, apparently in the air, like the note of the cuckoo, a parrot-like, punch-voiced echo of his words. Everybody looked up at the open windows in the houses, at the opposite angles of the converging streets, but they were either blank or filled by laughing listeners. The most innocent echo has an impish mockery in it when it follows a gravely persistent speaker, and this echo was not at all innocent. If it did not follow with the precision of a natural echo, it had a wicked choice of the words it overtook. By the time it said, 
the Baltic, now. The laugh which had been running through the audience became a general shout, and but for the sobering effects of party, and that great public cause which the entanglement of things had identified with Brooke of Tipton, the laugh might have caught his committee. Mr. Bulstrode asked, reprehensively, what the new police was doing, but a voice could not be well collared, and an attack on the effigy of the candidate would have been too equivocal, since Hawley probably meant it to be pelted. Mr. Brooke himself was not in a position to be quickly conscious of anything, except a general slipping away of ideas within himself. He had even a little singing in the ears, and he was the only person who had not yet taken distinct account of the echo, or discerned the image of himself. Few things hold the perceptions more thoroughly captive than anxiety about what we have got to say. Mr. Brooke heard the laughter, but he had expected some Tory efforts at disturbance, and he was at this moment additionally excited by the tickling, stinging sense that his lost exordium was coming back to fetch him from the Baltic. "'That reminds me,' he went on, thrusting a hand into his side-pocket with an easy air, "'if I wanted a precedent, you know, but we never want a precedent for the right thing. But there is Chatham now. I can't say I should have supported Chatham, or Pitt, the younger Pitt. He was not a man of ideas. We want ideas, you know.' "'Blast your ideas! We want the bill!' said a loud, rough voice from the crowd below. Immediately the invisible Punch, who had hitherto followed Mr. Brooke, repeated, "'Blast your ideas! We want the bill!' The laugh was louder than ever, and for the first time Mr. Brooke, being himself silent, heard distinctly the mocking echo. But it seemed to ridicule his interrupter, and in that light was encouraging. So he replied with amenity, "'There is something in what you say, my good friend, and what do we meet for but to speak our minds? Freedom of opinion, freedom of the press, liberty, that kind of thing. The bill, now, you shall have the bill.' Here Mr. Brooke paused a moment to fix on his eyeglass and take the paper from his breast-pocket, with a sense of being practical and coming to particulars. The invisible punch followed. "'You shall have the bill, Mr. Brooke, per electioneering contest, and a seat outside Parliament as delivered, five thousand pounds, seven shillings, and fourpence.' Mr. Brooke, amid the roars of laughter, turned red, let his eyeglass fall, and looked about him confusedly, saw the image of himself, which had come nearer. The next moment he saw it dolorously bespattered with eggs. His spirit rose a little, and his voice, too. Buffoonery, tricks, ridicule the test of truth. All that is very well. Here an unpleasant egg broke on Mr. Brooke's shoulder, as the echo said, All that is very well. Then came a hail of eggs, chiefly aimed at the image, but occasionally hitting the original as if by chance. There was a stream of new men pushing among the crowd, Whistles, yells, bellowings, and fifes made all the greater hubbub because there was shouting and struggling to put them down. No voice would have had wing enough to rise above the uproar, and Mr. Brooke, disagreeably anointed, stood his ground no longer. The frustration would have been less exasperating if it had been less gamesome and boyish. A serious assault of which the newspaper reporter can aver that it endangered the learned gentleman's ribs, or can respectfully bear witness to the soles of that gentleman's boots having been visible above the railing, or perhaps more consolations attached to it. Mr. Brooke re-entered the committee room, saying, as carelessly as he could, "'This is a little too bad, you know. I should have got the ear of the people by and by, but they didn't give me time.' I should have gone into the bill by and by, you know, he added, glancing at Ladislaw. However, things will come all right at the nomination. But it was not resolved unanimously that things would come right. On the contrary, the committee looked rather grim, and the political personage from Brassing was writing busily, as if he were brewing new devices. 
"'It was Bowyer who did it,' said Mr. Standish, evasively. "'I know it as well as if he had been advertised. "'He's uncommonly good at ventriloquism, "'and he did it uncommonly well, by God. "'Holly has been having him to dinner lately. "'There's a fund of talent in Bowyer.' "'Well, you know, you never mentioned him to me, Standish, else I would have invited him to dine,' said poor Mr. Brooke, who had gone through a great deal of inviting for the good of his country. "'There's not a more paltry fellow in Middlemarch than Bowyer,' said Ladislaw indignantly, "'but it seems as if the paltry fellows were always to turn the scale.' Will was thoroughly out of temper with himself as well as with his principal and he went to shut himself in his rooms with a half-formed resolve to throw up the pioneer and Mr. Brooke together. Why should he stay? If the impassable gulf between himself and Dorothea were ever to be filled up, it must rather be by his going away and getting into a thoroughly different position than by staying here and slipping into deserved contempt as an understrapper of Brooke's. Then came the young dream of wonders that he might do, in five years, for example, political writing, political speaking, would get a higher value now public life was going to be wider and more national, and they might give him such distinction that he would not seem to be asking Dorothea to step down to him. Five years, if he could only be sure that she cared for him more than for others, if he could only make her aware that he stood aloof until he could tell his love without lowering himself. Then he could go away easily, and begin a career which at five-and-twenty seemed probable enough in the inward order of things, where talent brings fame, and fame everything else which is delightful. He could speak, and he could write. He could master any subject if he chose, and he meant always to take the side of reason and justice, on which he would carry all his ardor. Why should he not one day be lifted above the shoulders of the crowd, and feel that he had won that eminence well. Without doubt he would leave Middlemarch, go to town, and make himself fit for celebrity by eating his dinners. But not immediately. Not until some kind of sign had passed between him and Dorothea. He could not be satisfied until she knew why, even if he were the man she would choose to marry, he would not marry her. Hence he must keep his post and bear with Mr. Brooke a little longer. But he soon had reason to suspect that Mr. Brooke had anticipated him in the wish to break up their connection. Deputations without and voices within had concurred in inducing that philanthropist to take a stronger measure than usual for the good of mankind, namely, to withdraw in favor of another candidate, to whom he left the advantages of his canvassing machinery. He himself called this a strong measure, but observed that his health was less capable of sustaining excitement than he had imagined. "'I have felt uneasy about the chest. It won't do to carry that too far,' he said to Ladislaw in explaining the affair. "'I must pull up. Poor Casabon was a warning, you know. I've made some heavy advances, but I've dug a channel.' It's rather coarse work, this electioneering, eh, Ladislaw? Dare say you are tired of it. However, we have dug a channel with the pioneer, put things in a track, and so on. A more ordinary man than you might carry it on now, more ordinary, you know. Do you wish me to give it up? said Will, the quick color coming in his face as he rose from the writing table, and took a turn of three steps with his hands in his pockets. I am ready to do so whenever you wish it. As to wishing, my dear Ladislaw, I have the highest opinion of your powers, you know. But about the pioneer, I have been consulting a little with some of the men on our side, and they are inclined to take it into their hands, indemnify me to a certain extent, carry it on, in fact. And, under the circumstances, you might like to give it up, might find a better field. These people might not take that high view of you which I have always taken, as an alter ego, a right hand, though I always looked forward to your doing something else. I think of having a run into France, but I'll write you any letters, you know, to Althorpe and people of that kind. I've met Althorpe. I am exceedingly obliged to you, said Ladislaw proudly. 
since you are going to part with the pioneer i need not trouble you about the steps i shall take i may choose to continue here for the present after mr brooke had left him will said to himself the rest of the family have been urging him to get rid of me and he doesn't care now about my going i shall stay as long as i like i shall go of my own movements and not because they are afraid of me End of chapter fifty one chapter fifty two his heart the lowliest duties on itself did lay wordsworth on that june evening when mr farebrother knew that he was to have the lowick living there was joy in the old-fashioned parlor and even the portraits of the great lawyers seemed to look on with satisfaction his mother left her tea and toast untouched but sat with her usual pretty primness only showing her emotion by that flush in the cheeks and brightness in the eyes which give an old woman a touching momentary identity with her far-off youthful self, and saying decisively, "'The greatest comfort, Camden, is that you have deserved it. "'When a man gets a good birth, mother, half the deserving must come after,' said the son, brimful of pleasure, and not trying to conceal it. The gladness in his face was of that active kind which seems to have energy enough not only to flash outwardly, but to light up busy vision within." one seemed to see thoughts as well as delight in his glances. "'Now, aunt,' he went on, rubbing his hands and looking at Miss Noble, who was making tender little beaver-like noises, "'there shall be sugar-candy always on the table for you to steal and give to the children, and you shall have a great many new stockings to make presents of, and you shall darn your own more than ever.' Miss Noble nodded at her nephew with a subdued, half-frightened laugh, conscious of having already dropped an additional lump of sugar into her basket on the strength of the new preferment. "'As for you, Winnie,' the vicar went on, "'I shall make no difficulty about your marrying any Lowick bachelor, Mr. Solomon Featherstone, for example, as soon as I find you are in love with him. Miss Winifred, who had been looking at her brother all the while and crying heartily, which was her way of rejoicing, smiled through her tears and said, "'You must set me the example, Cam. You must marry now.' "'With all my heart. But who is in love with me? I am a seedy old fellow,' said the vicar, rising, pushing his chair away and looking down at himself. "'What do you say, mother?' "'You are a handsome man, Camden.' "'though not so fine a figure of a man as your father,' said the old lady. "'I wish you would marry Miss Garth, brother,' said Miss Winifred. "'She would make us so lively at Lowick.' "'Very fine. "'You talk as if young women were tied up to be chosen, like poultry at market, "'as if I only had to ask and everybody would have me,' said the vicar, "'not caring to specify. "'We don't want everybody,' said Miss Winifred. "'But you would like Miss Garth, mother, shouldn't you?' "'My son's choice shall be mine,' said Mrs. Fairbrother, with majestic discretion. "'And a wife would be most welcome, Camden. "'You will want your whist at home when we go to Lowick, "'and Henrietta Noble never was a whist player.' Mrs. Fairbrother always called her tiny old sister by that magnificent name. "'I shall do without whist now, mother.' "'Why so, Camden?' "'In my time whist was thought an undeniable amusement for a good churchman,' said Mrs. Fairbrother, innocent of the meaning that whist had for her son, and speaking rather sharply, as at some dangerous countenancing of new doctrine. "'I shall be too busy for whist. I shall have two parishes,' said the vicar, preferring not to discuss the virtues of that game. He had already said to Dorothea, I don't feel bound to give up St. Botolph's. It is protest enough against the pluralism they want to reform if I give somebody else most of the money. The stronger thing is not to give up power, but to use it well. I have thought of that, said Dorothea. So far as self is concerned, I think it would be easier to give up power and money than to keep them. It seems very unfitting that I should have this patronage, Yet I felt that I ought not to let it be used by someone else instead of me. 
"'It is I who am bound to act so that you will not regret your power,' said Mr. Fairbrother. His was one of the natures in which conscience gets the more active when the yoke of life ceases to gall them. He made no display of humility on the subject, but in his heart he felt rather ashamed that his conduct had shown latches, which others who did not get benefices were free from. "'I used often to wish I had been something else than a clergyman,' he said to Lydgate. "'But perhaps it will be better to try and make as good a clergyman out of myself as I can. That is the well-beneficed point of view, you perceive, from which difficulties are much simplified,' he ended, smiling. The vicar did feel then as if his shares of duties would be easy. But duty has a trick of behaving unexpectedly, something like a heavy friend whom we have amiably asked to visit us, and who breaks his leg within our gates. Hardly a week later, duty presented itself in his study under the disguise of Fred Vincy, now returned from Omnibus College with his bachelor's degree. "'I'm ashamed to trouble you, Mr. Fairbrother,' said Fred whose fair open face was propitiating, but you are the only friend I can consult. I told you everything once before, and you were so good that I can't help coming to see you again. Sit down, Fred. I'm ready to hear and do anything I can, said the vicar, who was busy packing some small objects for removal, and went on with his work. I wanted to tell you, Fred hesitated an instant, and then went on plungingly, I might go into the church now, and really, look where I may, I can't see anything else to do. I don't like it, but I know it's uncommonly hard on my father to say so, after he has spent a good deal of money in educating me for it. Fred paused again an instant, and then repeated, And I can't see anything else to do. I did talk to your father about it, Fred, but I made little way with him. He said it was too late. "'But you have got over one bridge now. "'What are your other difficulties?' "'Merely that I don't like it. "'I don't like divinity and preaching "'and feeling obliged to look serious. "'I like riding across country "'and doing as other men do. "'I don't mean that I want to be a bad fellow in any way, "'but I've no taste for the sort of thing "'people expect of a clergyman. "'And yet what else am I to do? "'My father can't spare me any capital, "'else I might go into farming.' and he has no room for me in his trade. And, of course, I can't begin to study for law or physic now when my father wants me to earn something. It's all very well to say I'm wrong to go into the church, but those who say so might as well tell me to go into the backwoods. Fred's voice had taken a tone of grumbling remonstrance, and Mr. Fairbrother might have been inclined to smile if his mind had not been too busy in imagining more than Fred told him. "'Have you any difficulties about doctrines, about the articles?' he said, trying hard to think of the question simply for Fred's sake. "'No, I suppose the articles are right. I'm not prepared with any arguments to disprove them, and much better, cleverer fellows than I am go in for them entirely. I think it would be rather ridiculous in me to urge scruples of that sort as if I were a judge,' said Fred, quite simply." I suppose, then, it has occurred to you that you might be a fair parish priest without being much of a divine? Of course, if I am obliged to be a clergyman, I shall try and do my duty, though I mayn't like it. Do you think anybody ought to blame me? For going into the church under the circumstances? That depends on your conscience, Fred, how far you have counted the cost, and seen what your position will require of you. I can only tell you about myself that I have always been too lax, and have been uneasy in consequence. But there is another hindrance, said Fred, coloring. I did not tell you before, though perhaps I may have said things that made you guess it. There is somebody I am very fond of. I have loved her ever since we were children. Miss Garth, I suppose, said the vicar, examining some labels very closely. Yes, I shouldn't mind anything if she would have me, and I know I could be a good fellow then. And you think she returns the feeling? She never will say so, and a good while ago she made me promise not to speak to her about it again. And she has set her mind especially against my being a clergyman, I know that. 
but I can't give her up. I do think she cares about me. I saw Mrs. Garth last night, and she said that Mary was staying at Lowick Rectory with Miss Fairbrother. Yes, she is very kindly helping my sister. Do you wish to go there? No, I want to ask a great favor of you. I am ashamed to bother you in this way, but Mary might listen to what you said, if you mentioned the subject to her. I mean about my going into the church. That is a rather delicate task, my dear Fred. I shall have to presuppose your attachment to her, and to enter on the subject as you wish me to do, will be asking her to tell me whether she returns it. That is what I want her to tell you, said Fred bluntly. I don't know what to do unless I can get at her feeling. You mean that you would be guided by that as to your going into the church? If Mary said she would never have me, I might as well go wrong in one way as another. That is nonsense, Fred. Men outlive their love, but they don't outlive the consequences of their recklessness. Not my sort of love. I have never been without loving Mary. If I had to give her up, it would be like beginning to live on wooden legs. Will she not be hurt at my intrusion? No, I feel sure she will not. She respects you more than any one, and she would not put you off with fun as she does me. Of course I could not have told any one else, or asked any one else to speak to her but you. There is no one else who would be such a friend to both of us. Fred paused a moment, and then said, rather complainingly, "'And she ought to acknowledge that I have worked in order to pass. She ought to believe that I would exert myself for her sake.' There was a moment's silence before Mr. Fairbrother laid down his work, and putting out his hand to Fred, said, "'Very well, my boy. I will do what you wish.' That very day Mr. Fairbrother went to Lowick Parsonage on the nag which he had just set up. "'Decidedly, I am an old stock,' he thought. "'The young growths are pushing me aside.' He found Mary in the garden, gathering roses and sprinkling the petals on a sheet. The sun was low, and tall trees sent their shadows across the grassy walks where Mary was moving, without bonnet or parasol. She did not observe Mr. Fairbrother's approach along the grass, and had just stooped down to lecture a small black-and-tan terrier, which would persist in walking on the sheet and smelling the rose-leaves as Mary sprinkled them. She took his forepaws in one hand, and lifted up the forefinger of the other, while the dog wrinkled his brows and looked embarrassed. "'Fly, fly, I am ashamed of you,' Mary was saying in a grave contralto. "'This is not becoming in a sensible dog. Anybody would think you were a silly young gentleman.' "'You are unmerciful to young gentlemen, Miss Garth,' said the vicar, within two yards of her. Mary started up and blushed. "'It always answers to reason with fly,' she said laughingly. "'But not with young gentlemen?' "'Oh, with some, I suppose, since some of them turn into excellent men. "'I am glad of that admission, because I want at this very moment to interest you in a young gentleman.' "'Not a silly one, I hope,' said Mary.' beginning to pluck the roses again, and feeling her heart beat uncomfortably. No, though perhaps wisdom is not his strong point, but rather affection and sincerity. However, wisdom lies more in those two qualities than people are apt to imagine. I hope you know by those marks what young gentleman I mean. Yes, I think I do, said Mary, bravely, her face getting more serious, and her hands cold. It must be Fred Vincy. He has asked me to consult you about his going into the church. I hope you will not think that I consented to take a liberty in promising to do so. On the contrary, Mr. Fairbrother, said Mary, giving up the roses and folding her arms, but unable to look up. Whenever you have anything to say to me, I feel honored. But before I enter on that question— let me just touch a point on which your father took me into confidence. By the way, it was that very evening on which I once before fulfilled a mission from Fred, after he had gone to college. Mr. Garth told me what happened on the night of Featherstone's death, how you refused to burn the will, and he said that you had some heart-prickings on that subject, because you had been the innocent means of hindering Fred from getting his ten thousand pounds. I have kept that in mind, 
and I have heard something that may relieve you on that score, may show you that no sin-offering is demanded from you there. Mr. Fairbrother paused a moment and looked at Mary. He meant to give Fred his full advantage, but it would be well, he thought, to clear her mind of any superstitions, such as women sometimes follow when they do a man the wrong of marrying him as an act of atonement. Mary's cheeks had begun to burn a little, and she was mute. I mean that your action made no real difference to Fred's lot. I find that the first will would not have been legally good after the burning of the last. It would not have stood if it had been disputed, and you may be sure it would have been disputed. So, on that score, you may feel your mind free. Thank you, Mr. Fairbrother, said Mary earnestly. I am grateful to you for remembering my feelings. Well, now I may go on. Fred, you know, has taken his degree. He has worked his way so far, and now the question is, what is he to do? That question is so difficult that he is inclined to follow his father's wishes and enter the church, though you know better than I do that he was quite set against that formerly. I have questioned him on the subject, and I confess I see no insuperable objection to his being a clergyman as things go. He says that he could turn his mind to doing his best in that vocation, on one condition. If that condition were fulfilled, I would do my utmost in helping Fred on. After a time, not of course at first, he might be with me as my curate, and he would have so much to do that his stipend would be nearly what I used to get as a vicar. But I repeat that there is a condition without which all this good cannot come to pass. He has opened his heart to me, Miss Garth, and asked me to plead for him. The condition lies entirely in your feeling. Mary looked so much moved that he said after a moment, Let us walk a little. And when they were walking, he added, To speak quite plainly, Fred will not take any course which would lessen the chance that you would consent to be his wife. But with that prospect, he will try his best at anything you approve. I cannot possibly say that I will ever be his wife, Mr. Fairbrother, but I certainly never will be his wife if he becomes a clergyman. What you say is most generous and kind. I don't mean for a moment to correct your judgment. It is only that I have my girlish mocking way of looking at things, said Mary, with a returning sparkle of playfulness in her answer, which only made its modesty more charming. He wishes me to report exactly what you think, said Mr. Fairbrother. I could not love a man who is ridiculous, said Mary, not choosing to go deeper. Fred has sense and knowledge enough to make him respectable, if he likes, in some good worldly business, but I can never imagine him preaching and exhorting and pronouncing blessings and praying by the sick without feeling as if I were looking at a caricature. His being a clergyman would be only for gentility's sake, and I think there is nothing more contemptible than such imbecile gentility. I used to think that of Mr. Krauss, with his empty face and neat umbrella and mincing little speeches. What right have such men to represent Christianity, as if it were an institution for getting up idiots genteely, as if— Mary checked herself. She had been carried along as if she had been speaking to Fred instead of Mr. Fairbrother. Young women are severe. They don't feel the stress of action as men do, though perhaps I ought to make you an exception here. But you don't put Fred Vincy on so low a level as that. No, indeed, he has plenty of sense, but I think he would not show it as a clergyman. He would be a piece of professional affectation. Then the answer is quite decided. As a clergyman, he could have no hope. Mary shook her head. But if he braved all the difficulties of getting his bread in some other way, will you give him the support of hope? May he count on winning you? I think Fred ought not need telling again what I have already said to him, Mary answered, with a slight resentment in her manner. I mean that he ought not to put such questions until he has done something worthy instead of saying that he could do it. Mr. Fairbrother was silent for a minute or more, 
and then, as they turned and paused under the shadow of a maple at the end of a grassy walk, said, I understand that you resist any attempt to fetter you, but either your feeling for Fred Vincy excludes your entertaining another attachment, or it does not. Either he may count on your remaining single until he shall have earned your hand, or he may in any case be disappointed. Pardon me, Mary, you know I used to catechize you under that name, but when the state of a woman's affections touches the happiness of another life, of more lives than one, I think it would be the nobler course for her to be perfectly direct and open. Mary, in her turn, was silent, wondering not at Mr. Fairbrother's manner, but at his tone, which had a grave restrained emotion in it. When the strange idea flashed across her that his words had a reference to himself, she was incredulous, and ashamed of entertaining it. She had never thought that any man could love her except Fred, who had espoused her with the umbrella ring when she wore socks and little strapped shoes, still less that she could be of any importance to Mr. Fairbrother, the cleverest man in her narrow circle. She had only time to feel that all this was hazy and perhaps illusory, but one thing was clear and determined, her answer. Since you think it my duty, Mr. Fairbrother, I will tell you that I have too strong a feeling for Fred to give him up for any one else. I should never be quite happy if I thought he was unhappy for the loss of me. It has taken such deep root in me, my gratitude to him for always loving me best, and minding so much if I hurt myself from the time when we were very little. I cannot imagine any new feeling coming to make that weaker. I should like better than anything to see him worthy of everyone's respect. But please tell him I will not promise to marry him till then. I should shame and grieve my father and mother. He is free to choose someone else. Then I have fulfilled my commission thoroughly, said Mr. Fairbrother, putting out his hand to Mary, and I shall ride back to Middlemarch forthwith. With this prospect before him, we shall get Fred into the right niche somehow, and I hope I shall live to join your hands. God bless you. Oh, please stay and let me give you some tea, said Mary, her eyes filled with tears, for something indefinable, something like the resolute suppression of a pain in Mr. Fairbrother's manner, made her feel suddenly miserable, as she had once felt when she saw her father's hands trembling in a moment of trouble. "'No, my dear, no, I must get back.' In three minutes the vicar was on horseback again, having gone magnanimously through a duty much harder than the renunciation of whist, or even than the writing of penitential meditations. End of chapter 52 Chapter 53 It is but a shallow haste which concludeth insincerity from what outsiders call inconsistency putting a dead mechanism of ifs and therefores for the living myriad of hidden suckers whereby the belief and the conduct are wrought into mutual sustainment. Mr. Bulstrode, when he was hoping to acquire a new interest in Lowick, had naturally had an especial wish that the new clergyman should be one whom he thoroughly approved, and he believed it to be a chastisement and admonition directed to his own shortcomings and those of the nation at large, that just about the time when he came in possession of the deeds which made him the proprietor of Stone Court, Mr. Fairbrother read himself into the quaint little church and preached his first sermon to the congregation of farmers, laborers, and village artisans. It was not that Mr. Bulstrode intended to frequent Lowick Church or to reside at Stone Court for a good while to come. He had bought the excellent farm and fine homestead simply as a retreat which he might gradually enlarge as to the land and beautify as to the dwelling, until it should be conducive to the divine glory that he should enter on it as a residence, partially withdrawing from his present exertions in the administration of business, and throwing more conspicuously on the side of gospel truth the weight of local landed proprietorship, which providence might increase by unforeseen occasions of purchase. A strong leading in this direction seemed to have been given in the surprising facility of getting Stone Court, 
when every one had expected that Mr. Rig Featherstone would have clung to it as the Garden of Eden. That was what poor old Peter himself had expected, having often, in imagination, looked up through the sods above him, and, unobstructed by perspective, seen his frog-faced legatee enjoying the fine old place to the perpetual surprise and disappointment of other survivors. But how little we know what would make paradise for our neighbors. We judge from our own desires, and our neighbors themselves are not always open enough to even throw out a hint of theirs. The cool and judicious Joshua Rigg had not allowed his parent to perceive that Stone Court was anything less than the chief good in his estimation, and he had certainly wished to call it his own. But as Warren Hastings looked at gold and thought of buying Dalesford, so Joshua Rigg looked at Stone Court and thought of buying gold. He had a very distinct and intense vision of his chief good, the vigorous greed which he had inherited having taken a special form by dint of circumstance, and his chief good was to be a money-changer. From his earliest employment as an errand-boy in a seaport, he had looked through the windows of the money-changers, as other boys looked through the windows of the pastry-cooks. The fascination had wrought itself gradually into a deep, special passion. He meant, when he had property, to do many things, one of them being to marry a genteel young person, but these were all accidents and joys that imagination could dispense with. The one joy after which his soul thirsted was to have a money-changer's shop on a much-frequented quay, to have locks all round him of which he held the keys, and to look sublimely cool as he handled the breeding-coins of all nations, while helpless cupidity looked at him enviously from the other side of an iron lattice. The strength of that passion had been a power enabling him to master all the knowledge necessary to gratify it, and when others were thinking that he had settled at Stone Court for life, Joshua himself was thinking that the moment now was not far off when he should settle on the North Quay with the best appointments in safes and locks. Enough. We are concerned with looking at Joshua Riggs' sale of his land from Mr. Bulstrode's point of view and he interpreted it as a cheering dispensation conveying perhaps a sanction to a purpose which he had for some time entertained without external encouragement. He interpreted it thus, but not too confidently, offering up his thanksgiving in guarded phraseology. His doubts did not arise from the possible relations of the event to Joshua Rigg's destiny, which belonged to the unmapped regions not taken under the providential government, except perhaps in an imperfect colonial way, but they arose from reflecting that this dispensation, too, might be a chastisement for himself, as Mr. Fairbrother's induction to the living clearly was. This was not what Mr. Bulstrode said to any man for the sake of deceiving him. It was what he said to himself. It was as genuinely his mode of explaining events as any theory of yours may be, if you happen to disagree with him for the egoism which enters into our theories does not affect their sincerity. Rather, the more our egoism is satisfied, the more robust is our belief. However, whether for sanction or for chastisement, Mr. Bulstrode, hardly fifteen months after the death of Peter Featherstone, had become the proprietor of Stone Court, and what Peter would say, if he were worthy to know, had become an inexhaustible and consolatory subject of conversation to his disappointed relatives. The tables were now turned on that dear brother departed, and to contemplate the frustration of his cunning, by the superior cunning of things in general, was a cud of delight to Solomon. Mrs. Wall had a melancholy triumph in the proof that it did not answer to make false featherstones and cut off the genuine, and Sister Martha, receiving the news in the chalky flats, said, "'Dear, dear!' then the Almighty could have been none so pleased with the almshouses after all. Affectionate Mrs. Bulstrode was particularly glad of the advantage which her husband's wealth was likely to get from the purchase of Stone Court. Few days passed without his riding thither and looking over some part of the farm with the bailiff, and the evenings were delicious in that quiet spot 
when the new hayricks lately set up were sending forth odors to mingle with the breath of the rich old garden. One evening, while the sun was still above the horizon and burning in golden lamps among the great walnut boughs, Mr. Bulstrode was pausing on horseback outside the front gate waiting for Caleb Garth, who had met him by appointment to give an opinion on a question of stable drainage, and was now advising the bailiff in the rickyard. Mr. Bulstrode was conscious of being in a good spiritual frame, and more than usually serene, under the influence of his innocent recreation. He was doctrinally convinced that there was a total absence of merit in himself, but that doctrinal conviction may be held without pain, when the sense of demerit does not take a distinct shape in memory, and revive the tingling of shame, or the pang of remorse. Nay, it may be held with intense satisfaction when the depth of our sinning is but a measure for the depth of forgiveness, and a clenching proof that we are peculiar instruments of the divine intention. The memory has as many moods as the temper, and shifts its scenery like a diorama. At this moment Mr. Bulstrode felt as if the sunshine were all one with that of far-off evenings when he was a very young man and used to go out preaching beyond Highbury. He would willingly have had that service of exhortation in prospect now. The texts were there still, and so was his own facility in expounding them. His brief reverie was interrupted by the return of Caleb Garth, who also was on horseback, and was just shaking his bridle before starting, when he exclaimed, "'Bless my heart! What's this fellow in black coming along the lane? He's like one of those men one sees about after the races. Mr. Bulstrode turned his horse and looked along the lane, but made no reply. The comer was our slight acquaintance, Mr. Raffles, whose appearance presented no other change than such as was due to a suit of black and a crepe hat band. He was within three yards of the horsemen now, and they could see the flash of recognition in his face as he whirled his stick upward, looking all the while at Mr. Bulstrode, and at last exclaiming, "'By Jove, Nick, it's you! I couldn't be mistaken, though the five-and-twenty years have played old bogey with us both. How are ye? You didn't expect to see me here. Come, shake us by the hand.' To say that Mr. Raffles' manner was rather excited would be only one mode of saying that it was evening. Caleb Garth could see that there was a moment of struggle and hesitation in Mr. Bulstrode, but it ended in his putting out his hand coldly to Raffles and saying, "'I did not indeed expect to see you in this remote country place.' "'Well, it belongs to a stepson of mine,' said Raffles, adjusting himself in a swaggering attitude. "'I came to see him here before. I'm not so surprised at seeing you, old fellow, because I picked up a letter.' what you may call a providential thing. It's uncommonly fortunate I met you, though, for I don't care about seeing my stepson. He's not affectionate, and his poor mother's gone now. To tell the truth, I came out of love to you, Nick. I came to get your address for—look here. Raffles drew a crumpled paper from his pocket. Almost any other man than Caleb Garth might have been tempted to linger on the spot for the sake of hearing all he could about a man whose acquaintance with Bulstrode seemed to imply passages in the banker's life so unlike anything that was known of him in Middlemarch that they must have the nature of a secret to pique curiosity. But Caleb was peculiar. Certain human tendencies which are commonly strong were almost absent from his mind, and one of these was curiosity about personal affairs, especially if there was anything discreditable to be found out concerning another man, Caleb preferred not to know it, and if he had to tell anybody under him that his evil doings were discovered, he was more embarrassed than the culprit. He now spurred his horse, and, saying, "'I wish you a good evening, Mr. Bulstrode. I must be getting home,' set off at a trot. "'You didn't put your full address to this letter,' Raffles continued. "'That was not like the first-rate man of business you used to be. The shrubs, they may be anywhere.' You live near at hand, eh? Have cut the London concern altogether, perhaps turned country squire. Have a rural mansion to invite me to. 
"'Lord, how many years it is ago! The old lady must have been dead a pretty long while, gone to glory without the pain of knowing how poor her daughter was, eh? But, by Jove, you're very pale and pasty, Nick. Come, if you're going home, I'll walk by your side.' Mr. Bulstrode's usual paleness had, in fact, taken an almost deathly hue. Five minutes before, the expanse of his life had been submerged in its evening sunshine, which shone backward to its remembered morning. Sin seemed to be a question of doctrine and inward penitence, humiliation an exercise of the closet, the bearing of his deeds a matter of private vision adjusted solely by spiritual relations and conceptions of the divine purposes. And now, as if by some hideous magic, this loud red figure had risen before him in unmanageable solidity, an incorporate past which had not entered into his imagination of chastisements. But Mr. Bulstrode's thought was busy, and he was not a man to act or speak rashly. "'I was going home,' he said, "'but I can defer my ride a little. "'And you can, if you please, rest here.' "'Thank you,' said Raffles, making a grimace. "'I don't care now about seeing my stepson. "'I'd rather go home with you.' "'Your stepson, if Mr. Rig Featherstone was he, is here no longer. "'I am master here now.' "'Raffles opened wide eyes and gave a long whistle of surprise before he said, "'Well, then, I've no objection. "'I've had enough walking from the coach-road.' I never was much of a walker, or rider, either. What I like is a smart vehicle and a spirited cob. I was always a little heavy in the saddle. "'What a pleasant surprise it must be to you to see me, old fellow,' he continued, as they turned towards the house. "'You don't say so, but you never took your luck heartily. You were always thinking of improving the occasion. You'd such a gift for improving your luck.' Mr. Raffles seemed greatly to enjoy his own wit, and swung his leg in a swaggering manner which was rather too much for his companion's judicious patience. "'If I remember rightly,' Mr. Bulstrode observed, with chill anger, "'our acquaintance many years ago had not the sort of intimacy which you are now assuming, Mr. Raffles. Any services you desire of me will be the more readily rendered if you will avoid a tone of familiarity which did not lie in our former intercourse, and can hardly be warranted by more than twenty years of separation. "'You don't like being called Nick? Why, I always called you Nick in my heart, and though lost to sight, to memory dear. By Jove, my feelings have ripened for you like fine old cognac. I hope you've got some in the house now.' "'Josh filled my flask well the last time.' Mr. Bulstrode had not yet fully learned that even the desire for cognac was not stronger in Raffles than the desire to torment, and that a hint of annoyance always served him as a fresh cue. But it was clear that further objection was useless, and Mr. Bulstrode, in giving orders to the housekeeper for the accommodation of the guest, had a resolute air of quietude. There was the comfort of thinking that this housekeeper had been in the service of Rigg also, and might accept the idea that Mr. Bulstrode entertained Raffles merely as a friend of her former master. When there was food and drink spread before his visitor in the wainscoted parlor, and no witness in the room, Mr. Bulstrode said, "'Your habits and mine are so different, Mr. Raffles, that we can hardly enjoy each other's society.' The wisest plan for us both will therefore be to part as soon as possible. Since you say that you wished to meet me, you probably considered that you had some business to transact with me, but under the circumstances I will invite you to remain here for the night, and I will myself ride over here early tomorrow morning, before breakfast, in fact, when I can receive any communication you have to make to me. "'With all my heart,' said Raffles. This is a comfortable place, a little dull for a continuance, but I can put up with it for a night, with this good liquor and the prospect of seeing you again in the morning. You're a much better host than my stepson was, but Josh owed me a bit of a grudge for marrying his mother, 
and between you and me there was never anything but kindness. Mr. Bulstrode, hoping that the peculiar mixture of joviality and sneering in Raffles' manner was a good deal the effect of drink, had determined to wait till he was quite sober before he spent more words upon him. But he rode home with a terribly lucid vision of the difficulty there would be in arranging any result that could be permanently counted on with this man. It was inevitable that he should wish to get rid of John Raffles, though his reappearance could not be regarded as lying outside the divine plan. The spirit of evil might have sent him to threaten Mr. Bulstrow's subversion as an instrument of good, but the threat must have been permitted, and was a chastisement of a new kind. It was an hour of anguish for him, very different from the hours in which his struggle had been securely private, and which had ended with a sense that his secret misdeeds were pardoned and his services accepted. Those misdeeds, even when committed, had they not been half sanctified by the singleness of his desire to devote himself and all he possessed to the furtherance of the divine scheme? And was he, after all, to become a mere stone of stumbling and a rock of offense? For who would understand the work within him? Who would not, when there was the pretext of casting disgrace upon him, confound his whole life and the truths he had espoused in one heap of obloquy? In his closest meditations the lifelong habit of Mr. Bulstrode's mind clad his most egoistic terrors in doctrinal references to superhuman ends. But even while we are talking and meditating about the Earth's orbit and the solar system, what we feel and adjust our movements to is the stable Earth and the changing day. And now, within all the automatic succession of theoretic phrases, distinct and inmost as the shiver and the ache of oncoming fever when we are discussing abstract pain, was the forecast of disgrace in the presence of his neighbors and of his own wife. For the pain, as well as the public estimate of disgrace, depends on the amount of previous profession. To men who only aim at escaping felony, nothing short of the prisoner's dock is disgrace but Mr. Bulstrode had aimed at being an eminent Christian. It was not more than half-past seven in the morning when he again reached Stone Court. The fine old place never looked more like a delightful home than at that moment. The great white lilies were in flower. The nasturtiums, their pretty leaves all silvered with dew, were running away over the low stone wall. The very noises all around had a heart of peace within them but everything was spoiled for the owner as he walked on the gravel in front and awaited the descent of Mr. Raffles, with whom he was condemned to breakfast. It was not long before they were seated together in the wainscoted parlor over their tea and toast, which was much as Raffles cared to take at that early hour. The difference between his morning and evening self was not so great as his companion had imagined that it might be. The delight in tormenting was perhaps even the stronger, because his spirits were rather less highly pitched. Certainly his manners seemed more disagreeable by the morning light. "'As I have little time to spare, Mr. Raffles,' said the banker, who could hardly do more than sip his tea and break his toast without eating it, "'I shall be obliged if you will mention at once the ground on which you wish to meet with me. I presume that you have a home elsewhere and will be glad to return to it.' "'Why, if a man has got any heart, doesn't he want to see an old friend, Nick? I must call you Nick. We always did call you young Nick when we knew you meant to marry the old widow. Some said you had a handsome family likeness to old Nick, but that was your mother's fault, calling you Nicholas. Aren't you glad to see me again? I expected an invite to stay with you at some pretty place.' My own establishment is broken up, now my wife's dead. I've no particular attachment to any spot. I would as soon settle hereabout as anywhere. May I ask why you returned from America? I considered that the strong wish you expressed to go there, when an adequate sum was furnished, was tantamount to an engagement that you would remain there for life. 
never knew that a wish to go to a place was the same thing as a wish to stay. But I did stay a matter of ten years. It didn't suit me to stay any longer. And I'm not going again, Nick. Here Mr. Raffles winked slowly as he looked at Mr. Bulstrode. Do you wish to be settled in any business? What is your calling now? Thank you. My calling is to enjoy myself as much as I can. I don't care about working any more. If I did anything, it would be a little traveling in the tobacco line, or something of that sort, which takes a man into agreeable company, but not without an independence to fall back upon. That's what I want. I'm not so strong as I was, Nick, though I've got more color than you. I want an independence. That could be supplied to you, if you would engage to keep at a distance, said Mr. Bulstrode, perhaps with a little too much eagerness in his undertone. That must be as it suits my convenience, said Raffles coolly. I see no reason why I shouldn't make a few acquaintances hereabout. I'm not ashamed of myself as company for anybody. I dropped my portmanteau at the turnpike when I got down, change of linen, genuine, honor bright, more than fronts and wristbands, and with this suit of mourning, straps and everything, I should do you credit among the knobs here. Mr. Raffles had pushed away his chair and looked down at himself, particularly at his straps. His chief intention was to annoy Bulstrode, but he really thought that his appearance now would produce a good effect, and that he was not only handsome and witty, but clad in a morning style which implied solid connections. "'If you intend to rely on me in any way, Mr. Raffles,' said Bulstrode, after a moment's pause, "'you will expect to meet my wishes.' "'Ah, oh, to be sure,' said Raffles, with a mocking cordiality. "'Didn't I always do it? Lord, you made a pretty thing out of me, and I got but little. I've often thought since—' I might have done better by telling the old woman that I'd found her daughter and her grandchild. It would have suited my feelings better. I've got a soft place in my heart. But you've buried the old lady by this time, I suppose. It's all one to her now. And you've got your fortune out of that profitable business which had such a blessing on it. You've taken to being a knob, buying land, being a country bashaw. Still in the dissenting line, eh? Still godly? Or taken to the church as more genteel? This time Mr. Raffles' slow wink and slight protrusion of his tongue was worse than a nightmare, because it held the certitude that it was not a nightmare, but a waking misery. Mr. Bulstrode felt a shuddering nausea and did not speak but was considering diligently whether he should not leave Raffles to do as he would, and simply defy him as a slanderer. The man would soon show himself disreputable enough to make people disbelieve him, but not when he tells any ugly-looking truth about you, said discerning consciousness. And, again, it seemed no wrong to keep Raffles at a distance. But Mr. Bulstrode shrank from the direct falsehood of denying true statements. It was one thing to look back on forgiven sins, nay, to explain questionable conformity to lax customs, and another to enter deliberately on the necessity of falsehood. But, since Bulstrode did not speak, Raffles ran on, by way of using time to the utmost. "'I've not had such fine luck as you, by Jove. Things went confoundedly with me in New York. Those Yankees are cool hands.' and a man of gentlemanly feelings has no chance with them. I married when I came back, a nice woman in the tobacco trade, very fond of me. But the trade was restricted, as we say. She had been settled there a good many years by a friend, but there was a son too much in the case. Josh and I never hit it off. However, I made the most of the position, and I've always taken my glass in good company. It's been all on the square with me. I'm as open as the day. You won't take it ill of me that I didn't look you up before. I've got a complaint that makes me a little dilatory. 
I thought you were trading and praying away in London still, and didn't find you there. But you see I was sent to you, Nick, perhaps for a blessing to both of us. Mr. Raffles ended with a jocose snuffle. No man felt his intellect more superior to religious cant, and if the cunning which calculates on the meanest feelings in men could be called intellect, he had his share, for under the blurting, rallying tone with which he spoke to Bulstrode, there was an evident selection of statements, as if they had been so many moves at chess. Meanwhile, Bulstrode had determined on his move, and he said, with gathered resolution, "'You will do well to reflect, Mr. Raffles, that it is possible for a man to overreach himself in the effort to secure undue advantage. Although I am not in any way bound to you, I am willing to supply you with a regular annuity, in quarterly payments, so long as you fulfill a promise to remain at a distance from this neighborhood. It is in your power to choose. If you insist on remaining here, even for a short time, you will get nothing from me. I shall decline to know you. Ha! ha! said Raffles, with an affected explosion. That reminds me of a droll dog of a thief who declined to know the constable. Your allusions are lost on me, sir, said Bulstrode, with white heat. The law has no hold on me either through your agency or any other. You can't understand a joke, my good fellow. I only meant that I should never decline to know you. But let us be serious. Your quarterly payment won't quite suit me. I like my freedom. Here Raffles rose and stalked once or twice up and down the room, swinging his leg and assuming an air of masterly meditation. At last he stopped opposite Bulstrode and said, I'll tell you what. Give us a couple hundreds. Come, that's modest, and I'll go away. Honor bright. Pick up my portmanteau and go away. But I shall not give up my liberty for a dirty annuity. I shall come and go where I like. Perhaps it may suit me to stay away and correspond with a friend. Perhaps not. Have you the money with you? No, I have one hundred, said Bulstrode feeling the immediate riddance too great a relief to be rejected on the ground of future uncertainties. I will forward you the other, if you will mention an address. No, I'll wait here till you bring it, said Raffles. I'll take a stroll and have a snack, and you'll be back by that time. Mr. Bulstrode's sickly body, shattered by the agitations he had gone through since the last evening, made him feel abjectly in the power of this loud, invulnerable man. At that moment he snatched at a temporary repose to be won on any terms. He was rising to do what Raffles suggested, when the latter said, lifting up his finger as if with a sudden recollection, "'I did have another look after Sarah again, though I didn't tell you. I'd a tender conscience about that pretty young woman. I didn't find her, but I found out her husband's name, and I made a note of it. But hang it, I lost my pocket-book. However, if I heard it, I should know it again. I've got my faculties as if I was in my prime, but names wear out by Jove. Sometimes I'm no better than a confounded tax-paper before the names are filled in. However, if I hear of her and her family, you shall know, Nick. You'd like to do something for her, now she's your stepdaughter. Doubtless, said Mr. Bulstrode, with the usual steady look of his light gray eyes, though that might reduce my power of assisting you. As he walked out of the room, Raffles winked slowly at his back, and then turned towards the window to watch the banker riding away, virtually at his command. His lips first curled with a smile, and then opened with a short triumphant laugh. "'But what the deuce was the name?' he presently said, half aloud, scratching his head, and wrinkling his brows horizontally. He had not really cared or thought about this point of forgetfulness until it occurred to him in his invention of annoyances for Bulstrode. "'It began with an L. It was almost all L's, I fancy,' he went on, with a sense that he was getting hold of the slippery name. But the hold was too slight, 
and he soon got tired of this mental chase. For few men were more impatient of private occupation, or more in need of making themselves continually heard than Mr. Raffles. He preferred using his time in pleasant conversation with the bailiff and the housekeeper, from whom he gathered as much as he wanted to know about Mr. Bulstrode's position in Middlemarch. After all, however, there was a dull space of time which needed relieving with bread and cheese and ale, and when he was seated alone with these resources in the wainscoted parlour, he suddenly slapped his knee and exclaimed, Ladislaw! That action of memory which he had tried to set going, and had abandoned in despair, had suddenly completed itself without conscious effort, a common experience, agreeable as a completed sneeze, even if the name remembered is of no value. Raffles immediately took out his pocket-book and wrote down the name, not because he expected to use it, but merely for the sake of not being at a loss if he ever did happen to want it. He was not going to tell Bulstrode, there was no actual good in telling, and to a mind like that of Mr. Raffles there is always probable good in a secret. He was satisfied with his present success, and by three o'clock that day he had taken up his portmanteau at the turnpike and mounted the coach, relieving Mr. Bulstrode's eyes of an ugly black spot on the landscape at Stone Court, but not relieving him of the dread that the black spot might reappear and become inseparable even from the vision of his hearth. End of chapter 53 Chapter 54 The Widow and the Wife Chapter 54 Negli occhi porta la mia donna amore perché si va gentile io che la mira. Ove la passa, ognom ver le si gira, e qui saluta fa tremar lo core. Sì che, passando il viso, tutto smore, ed ogni suo difetto allor sospira. Fugon dinanzi a lei superbia e dira, aiutatemi, donne, a farle onore, ogni dolcezza, ogni pensiero umile. Nasser nel core a chi parlar la sente, onde beato chi prima la vide quel che la par quando un poco sorride. Non si può dicer, né tener a mente, si è nuovo miracolo gentile. Dante, la vita nuova. By that delightful morning, when the hayricks at Stone Court were scenting the air quite impartially, as if Mr. Raffles had been a guest worthy of finest incense, Dorothea had again taken up her abode at Lowick Manor. After three months, Freshet had become rather oppressive, to sit like a model for St. Catherine, looking rapturously at Celia's baby, would not do for many hours in the day, and to remain in that momentous babe's presence with persistent disregard was a course that could not have been tolerated in a childless sister. Dorothea would have been capable of carrying a baby joyfully for a mile, if there had been need, and of loving it the more tenderly for that labor, but to an aunt who does not recognize her infant nephew as Buddha, and has nothing to do for him but to admire, his behavior is apt to appear monotonous, and the interest of watching him exhaustible. This possibility was quite hidden from Celia, who felt that Dorothea's childless widowhood fell in quite prettily with the birth of little Arthur. Baby was named after Mr. Brooke. Dodo is just the creature not to mind about having anything of her own, children or anything, said Celia to her husband, and if she had had a baby, it never could have been such a dear as Arthur, could it, James? Not if it had been like Casabon, said Sir James, conscious of some indirectness in his answer, and of holding a strictly private opinion as to the perfections of his firstborn. No, just imagine, really it was a mercy, said Celia, and I think it is very nice for Dodo to be a widow. She can be just as fond of our baby as if it were her own, and she can have as many notions of her own as she likes. "'It is a pity she was not a queen,' said the devout Sir James. "'But what should we have been, then? We must have been something else,' said Celia, objecting to so laborious a flight of imagination. "'I like her better as she is.' Hence, when she found that Dorothea was making arrangements for her final departure to Lowick, Celia raised her eyebrows with disappointment, and in her quiet, unemphatic way shot a needle-arrow of sarcasm. "'What will you do at Lowick, Dodo? 
You say yourself there is nothing to be done there. Everybody is so clean and well off, it makes you quite melancholy. And here you have been so happy, going all about Tipton, with Mr. Garth into the worst backyards. And now Uncle is abroad, you and Mr. Garth can have it all your own way. And I am sure James does everything you tell him. I shall often come here, and I shall see how Baby grows all the better, said Dorothea. But you will never see him washed, said Celia, and that is quite the best part of the day. She was almost pouting. It did seem to her very hard in Dodo to go away from the baby when she might stay. "'Dear Kitty, I will come and stay all night on purpose,' said Dorothea. "'But I want to be alone now, and in my own home. I wish to know the Fairbrothers better, and to talk to Mr. Fairbrother about what there is to be done in Middlemarch.' Dorothea's native strength of will was no longer all converted into resolute submission. She had a great yearning to be at Lowick, and was simply determined to go, not feeling bound to tell all her reasons. But every one around her disapproved. Sir James was much pained, and offered that they should all migrate to Cheltenham for a few months with the sacred ark, otherwise called a cradle. At that period a man could hardly know what to propose if Cheltenham were rejected. The dowager lady Chetham, just returning from a visit to her daughter in town, wished, at least, that Mrs. Vigo should be written to, and invited to accept the office of companion to Mrs. Casabon. It was not credible that Dorothea, as a young widow, would think of living alone in the house at Lowick. Mrs. Vigo had been a reader and secretary to royal personages, and in point of knowledge and sentiments even Dorothea could have nothing to object to her. Mrs. Cadwallader said privately, "'You will certainly go mad in that house alone, my dear. You will see visions. We have all got to exert ourselves a little to keep sane, and call things by the same names as other people call them by. To be sure, for younger sons and women who have no money, it is a sort of provision to go mad. They are taken care of, then. But you must not run into that.' I dare say you are a little bored here with our good dowager, but think what a bore you might become yourself to your fellow creatures if you were always playing tragedy queen and taking things sublimely. Sitting alone in that library at Lowick, you may fancy yourself ruling the weather. You must get a few people round you who wouldn't believe you if you told them. That is a good lowering medicine." "'I never called everything by the same name that all people about me did,' said Dorothea stoutly. "'But I suppose you have found out your mistake, my dear,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'And that is a proof of sanity.' Dorothea was aware of the sting, but it did not hurt her. "'No,' she said, "'I still think that the greater part of the world is mistaken about many things. Surely one may be sane, and yet think so.' since the greater part of the world has often come round from its opinion. Mrs. Cadwallader said no more on that point to Dorothea, but to her husband she remarked, "'It will be well for her to marry again as soon as it is proper, if one could get her among the right people. Of course the Chettams would not wish it. But I see clearly a husband is the best thing to keep her in order. If we were not so poor I would invite Lord Triton. He will be Marquis some day, and there is no denying that she would make a good marchioness. She looks handsomer than ever in her mourning. My dear Eleanor, do let the poor woman alone. Such contrivances are of no use, said the easy rector. No use? How are matches made, except by bringing men and women together? And it is a shame that her uncle should have run away and shut up the grange just now. There ought to be plenty of eligible matches invited to Freshet and the Grange. Lord Triton is precisely the man, full of plans for making the people happy in a soft-headed sort of way. That would just suit Mrs. Casaubon. Let Mrs. Casaubon choose for herself, Eleanor. That is the nonsense you wise men talk. How can she choose if she has no variety to choose from? A woman's choice usually means taking the only man she can get. Mark my words, Humphrey, if her friends don't exert themselves, there will be a worse business than the Casabon business yet. For heaven's sake, don't touch on that topic, Eleanor. It is a very sore point with Sir James. 
he would be deeply offended if you entered on it to him unnecessarily. "'I have never entered on it,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, opening her hands. "'Celia told me all about the will at the beginning, without any asking of mine.' "'Yes, yes, but they want the thing hushed up, and I understand that the young fellow is going out of the neighborhood.' Mrs. Cadwallader said nothing, but gave her husband three significant nods, with a very sarcastic expression in her dark eyes. Dorothea quietly persisted in spite of remonstrance and persuasion. So, by the end of June, the shutters were all opened at Lowick Manor, and the morning gazed calmly into the library, shining on the rows of notebooks as it shines on the weary waste planted with huge stones, the mute memorial of a forgotten faith, and the evening laden with roses entering silently into the blue-green boudoir where Dorothea chose oftenest to sit. At first she walked into every room, questioning the eighteen months of her married life, and carrying on her thoughts as if they were a speech to be heard by her husband. Then she lingered in the library, and could not be at rest till she had carefully ranged all the notebooks as she imagined that he would wish to see them, in orderly sequence. The pity which had been the restraining, compelling motive in her life with him still clung about his image, even while she remonstrated with him in indignant thought, and told him that he was unjust. One little act of hers may perhaps be smiled at as superstitious. The synoptical tabulation for the use of Mrs. Casabon she carefully enclosed and sealed, writing within the envelope, I could not use it. Do you not see now that I could not submit my soul to yours by working hopelessly at what I have no belief in? Dorothea. Then she deposited the paper in her own desk. That silent colloquy was perhaps only the more earnest, because underneath and through it all there was always the deep longing which had really determined her to come to Lowick. The longing was to see Will Ladislaw. She did not know any good that could come of their meeting. She was helpless. Her hands had been tied from making up to him for any unfairness in his lot but her soul thirsted to see him. How could it be otherwise? If a princess in the days of enchantment had seen a four-footed creature from among those which live in herds come to her once, and again with a human gaze which rested upon her with choice and beseeching, what would she think of in her journeying? What would she look for when the herds passed her? Surely for the gaze which had found her, and which she would know again." Life would be no better than candlelight tinsel and daylight rubbish if our spirits were not touched by what has been, to issues of longing and constancy. It was true that Dorothea wanted to know the fair brothers better, and especially to talk to the new rector, but also true that, remembering what Lydgate had told her about Will Ladislaw and little Miss Noble, she counted on Will's coming to Lowick to see the fair brother family. The very first Sunday, before she entered the church, she saw him as she had seen him the last time she was there, alone in the clergyman's pew, but when she entered, his figure was gone. In the weekdays when she went to see the ladies at the rectory, she listened in vain for some word that they might let fall about Will, but it seemed to her that Mrs. Fairbrother talked of everyone else in the neighborhood and out of it. Probably some of Mr. Fairbrother's Middlemarch hearers may follow him to Lowick sometimes. Do you not think so? said Dorothea, rather despising herself for having a secret motive in asking the question. If they are wise, they will, Mrs. Casaubon, said the old lady. I see that you set a right value on my son's preaching. His grandfather on my side was an excellent clergyman, but his father was in the law most exemplary and honest nevertheless, which is a reason for our never being rich. They say fortune is a woman and capricious, but sometimes she is a good woman and gives to those who merit, which has been the case with you, Mrs. Casaubon, who have given a living to my son. Mrs. Fairbrother recurred to her knitting with a dignified satisfaction in her neat little effort at oratory, but this was not what Dorothea wanted to hear. Poor thing! 
She did not even know whether Will Ladislaw was still at Middlemarch, and there was no one whom she dared to ask, unless it were Lydgate. But just now she could not see Lydgate without sending for him, or going to seek him. Perhaps Will Ladislaw, having heard of that strange ban against him left by Mr. Casaubon, had felt it better that he and she should not meet again, and perhaps she was wrong to wish for a meeting that others might find many good reasons against. Still, I do wish it, came at the end of those wise reflections, as naturally as a sob after holding the breath. And the meeting did happen, but in a formal way quite unexpected by her. One morning, about eleven, Dorothea was seated in her boudoir with a map of the land attached to the manor and other papers before her, which were to help her in making an exact statement for herself of her income and affairs. She had not yet applied herself to the work, but was seated with her hands folded on her lap, looking out along the avenue of limes to the distant fields. Every leaf was at rest in the sunshine. The familiar scene was changeless, and seemed to represent the prospect of her life, full of motiveless ease, motiveless, if her own energy could not seek out reasons for ardent action. The widow's cap of those times made an oval frame for the face, and had a crown standing up. The dress was an experiment in the utmost laying on of crape, but this heavy solemnity of clothing made her face look all the younger, with its recovered bloom and the sweet inquiring candor of her eyes. Her reverie was broken by Tantrip, who came to say that Mr. Ladislaw was below, and begged permission to see Madam if it were not too early. "'I will see him,' said Dorothea, rising immediately. "'Let him be shown into the drawing-room.' The drawing-room was the most neutral room in the house to her, the one least associated with the trials of her married life. The damask matched the woodwork, which was all white and gold. There were two tall mirrors and tables with nothing on them. In brief, it was a room where you had no reason for sitting in one place rather than in another. It was below the boudoir, and had also a bow-window looking out on the avenue. But when Pratt showed Will Ladislaw into the window it was open, and a winged visitor, buzzing in and out now and then, without minding the furniture, made the room look less formal and uninhabited. "'Glad to see you here again, sir,' said Pratt, lingering to adjust a blind. "'I am only come to say good-bye, Pratt,' said Will, who wished even the butler to know that he was too proud to hang about Mrs. Casaubon, now she was a rich widow. "'Very sorry to hear it, sir,' said Pratt, retiring. Of course, as a servant who was to be told nothing— she knew the fact of which Ladislaw was still ignorant, and had drawn his inferences, indeed had not differed from his betrothed tantrip when she said, "'Your master was as jealous as a fiend, and no reason. Madam would look higher than Mr. Ladislaw, else I don't know her. Mrs. Cadwallader's maid says there's a lord coming who is to marry her when the morning's over.' There were not many moments for Will to walk about with his hat in his hand before Dorothea entered. The meeting was very different from that first meeting in Rome, when Will had been embarrassed and Dorothea calm. This time he felt miserable but determined, while she was in a state of agitation which could not be hidden. Just outside the door she had felt that this longed-for meeting was after all too difficult and when she saw Will advancing towards her, the deep blush which was rare in her came on with painful suddenness. Neither of them knew how it was, but neither of them spoke. She gave her hand for a moment, and then they went to sit down near the window, she on one settee and he on another opposite. Will was peculiarly uneasy. It seemed to him not like Dorothea that the mere fact of her being a widow should cause such a change in her manner of receiving him, and he knew of no other condition which could have affected their previous relation to each other, except that, as his imagination at once told him, her friends might have been poisoning her mind with their suspicions of him. "'I hope I have not presumed too much in calling,' said Will. 
I could not bear to leave the neighborhood and begin a new life without seeing you to say good-bye. Presumed? Surely not. I should have thought it unkind if you had not wished to see me, said Dorothea, her habit of speaking with perfect genuineness asserting itself through all her uncertainty and agitation. Are you going away immediately? Very soon, I think. I intend to go to town and eat my dinners as a barrister, since, they say, that is the preparation for all public business. There will be a great deal of political work to be done by and by, and I mean to try and do some of it. Other men have managed to win an honorable position for themselves without family or money. And that will make it all the more honorable, said Dorothea ardently. Besides, you have so many talents— I have heard from my uncle how well you speak in public, so that every one is sorry when you leave off, and how clearly you can explain things. And you care that justice should be done to every one. I am so glad. When we were in Rome, I thought you only cared for poetry and art, and the things that adorn life for us who are well off. But now I know you think about the rest of the world. While she was speaking, Dorothea had lost her personal embarrassment, and had become like her former self. She looked at Will with a direct glance, full of delighted confidence. "'You approve of my going away for years, then, and never coming here again till I have made myself of some mark in the world?' said Will, trying hard to reconcile the utmost pride with the utmost effort to get an expression of strong feeling from Dorothea. She was not aware how long it was before she answered. She had turned her head, and was looking out of the window on the rose-bushes, which seemed to have in them the summers of all the years when Will would be away. This was not judicious behavior. But Dorothea never thought of studying her manners. She thought only of bowing to a sad necessity which divided her from Will. Those first words of his about intentions had seemed to make everything clear to her, he knew, she supposed, all about Mr. Casaubon's final conduct in relation to him, and it had come to him with the same sort of shock as to herself. He had never felt more than friendship for her, had never had anything in his mind to justify what she felt to be her husband's outrage on the feelings of both, and that friendship he still felt. Something which may be called an inward silent sob had gone on in Dorothea before she said with a pure voice, just trembling in the last words, as if only from its liquid flexibility, "'Yes, it must be right for you to do as you say. I shall be very happy when I hear that you have made your value felt. But you must have patience. It will perhaps be a long while.' Will never quite knew how it was that he saved himself from falling down at her feet when the long while came forth with its gentle tremor. He used to say that the horrible hue and surface of her crepe dress was most likely the sufficient controlling force. He sat still, however, and only said, I shall never hear from you, and you will forget all about me. No, said Dorothea. I shall never forget you. I have never forgotten any one whom I once knew. My life has never been crowded, and it seems not likely to be so. And I have a great deal of space for memory at Lowick, haven't I? She smiled. Good God! Will burst out passionately, rising, with his hat still in his hand, and walking away to a marble table, where he suddenly turned and leaned his back against it. The blood had mounted to his face and neck, and he looked almost angry. It had seemed to him as if they were like two creatures slowly turning to marble in each other's presence, while their hearts were conscious and their eyes were yearning. But there was no help for it. It should never be true of him that in this meeting to which he had come, with bitter resolution, he had ended by a confession which might be interpreted into asking for her fortune. Moreover, it was actually true that he was fearful of the effect which such confessions might have on Dorothea herself. She looked at him from that distance in some trouble, imagining that there might have been an offense in her words. 
but all the while there was a current of thought in her about his probable want of money, and the impossibility of her helping him. If her uncle had been at home, something might have been done through him. It was this preoccupation with the hardship of Will's wanting money, while she had what ought to have been his share, which led her to say, seeing that he remained silent and looked away from her, I wonder whether you would like to have that miniature which hangs upstairs, I mean that beautiful miniature of your grandmother. I think it is not right for me to keep it, if you would wish to have it. It is wonderfully like you. You are very good, said Will irritably. No, I don't mind about it. It is not very consoling to have one's own likeness. It would be more consoling if others wanted to have it. I thought you would like to cherish her memory. I th thought. Dorothea broke off in an instant, her imagination suddenly warning her away from Aunt Julia's history. You would surely like to have the miniature as a family memorial. Why should I have that when I have nothing else? A man with only a portmanteau for his stowage must keep his memorials in his head. Will spoke at random. He was merely venting his petulance. It was a little too exasperating to have his grandmother's portrait offered him at that moment. But to Dorothea's feeling, his words had a peculiar sting. She rose and said with a touch of indignation as well as hauteur, "'You are the much happier of us two, Mr. Ladislaw, to have nothing.' Will was startled. Whatever the words might be, the tone seemed like a dismissal, and, quitting his leaning posture, he walked a little way towards her. Their eyes met, but with a strange, questioning gravity. Something was keeping their minds aloof, and each was left to conjecture what was in the other. Will had really never thought of himself as having a claim of inheritance on the property which was held by Dorothea, and would have required a narrative to make him understand her present feeling. I never felt it a misfortune to have nothing till now, he said. But poverty may be as bad as leprosy if it divides us from what we most care for. The words cut Dorothea to the heart and made her relent. She answered in a tone of sad fellowship. Sorrow comes in so many ways. Two years ago I had no notion of that, I mean, of the unexpected way in which trouble comes and ties our hands, and makes us silent when we long to speak. I used to despise women a little for not shaping their lives more, and doing better things. I was very fond of doing things as I liked, but I have almost given it up, she ended, smiling playfully. I have not given up doing as I like, but I can very seldom do it, said Will. He was standing two yards from her with his mind full of contradictory desires and resolves, desiring some unmistakable proof that she loved him, and yet dreading the position into which such a proof might bring him. The thing one most longs for may be surrounded with conditions that would be intolerable. At this moment Pratt entered and said, "'Sir James Chetham is in the library, madam.' "'Ask Sir James to come in here,' said Dorothea immediately. It was as if the same electric shock had passed through her and Will. Each of them felt proudly resistant, and neither looked at the other, while they awaited Sir James' entrance. After shaking hands with Dorothea, he bowed as slightly as possible to Ladislaw, who repaid the slightness exactly, and then going towards Dorothea said, "'I must say good-bye, Mrs. Casaubon.' and probably for a long while. Dorothea put out her hand and said her good-bye cordially. The sense that Sir James was depreciating Will and behaving rudely to him roused her resolution and dignity. There was no touch of confusion in her manner, and when Will had left the room she looked with such calm self-possession at Sir James, saying, "'How is Celia?' that he was obliged to behave as if nothing had annoyed him. And what would be the use of behaving otherwise? Indeed, Sir James shrank with so much dislike from the association, even in thought of Dorothea with Ladislaw as her possible lover, 
that he would himself have wished to avoid an outward show of displeasure, which would have recognized the disagreeable possibility. If any one had asked him why he shrank in that way, I am not sure that he would at first have said anything fuller or more precise than that Ladislaw, though on reflection he might have urged that Mr. Casaubon's codicil, barring Dorothea's marriage with Will, except under a penalty, was enough to cast unfitness over any relation at all between them. His aversion was all the stronger, because he felt himself unable to interfere. But Sir James was a power in a way unguessed by himself. Entering at that moment, he was an incorporation of the strongest reasons through which Will's pride became a repellent force, keeping him asunder from Dorothea. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 Hath she her faults? I would you had them too. They are the fruity must of soundest wine, or say they are regenerating fire, such as hath turned the dense black element into a crystal pathway for the sun. If youth is a season of hope, it is often so only in the sense that our elders are hopeful about us, for no age is so apt as youth to think its emotions, partings, and resolves are the last of their kind. Each crisis seems final simply because it is new. We are told that the oldest inhabitants in Peru do not cease to be agitated by the earthquakes, but they probably see beyond each shock, and reflect that there are plenty more to come. To Dorothea, still in that time of youth when the eyes, with their long full lashes, look out after their rain of tears, unsoiled and unwearied, as a freshly opened passion flower, that morning's parting with Will Ladislaw seemed to be the close of their personal relations. He was going away into the distance of unknown years, and if ever he came back, he would be another man. The actual state of his mind, his proud resolve to give the lie beforehand to any suspicion that he would play the needy adventurer seeking a rich woman, lay quite out of her imagination, and she had interpreted all his behavior easily enough by her supposition that Mr. Casaubon's codicil seemed to him, as it did to her, a gross and cruel interdict on any active friendship between them. Their young delight in speaking to each other, and saying what no one else would care to hear, was forever ended, and became a treasure of the past. For this very reason she dwelt on it without inward check. That unique happiness, too, was dead, and in its shadowed, silent chamber she might vent the passionate grief which she herself wondered at. For the first time she took down the miniature from the wall and kept it before her, liking to blend the woman who had been too hardly judged with the grandson whom her own heart and judgment defended. Can any one who has rejoiced in woman's tenderness think it a reproach to her that she took the oval picture in her palm and made a bed for it there, and leaned her cheek upon it, as if that would soothe the creatures who had suffered unjust condemnation? She did not know then that it was love who had come to her briefly, as in a dream before awaking, with the hues of morning on his wings, that it was love to whom she was sobbing her farewell as his image was banished by the blameless rigor of irresistible day. She only felt that there was something irrevocably amiss and lost in her lot, and her thoughts about the future were all the more readily shapen into resolve. Ardent souls, ready to construct their coming lives, are apt to commit themselves to the fulfillment of their own visions. One day that she went to Freshet to fulfill her promise of staying all night and seeing baby washed, Mrs. Cadwallader came to dine, the rector being gone on a fishing excursion. It was a warm evening, and even in the delightful drawing-room, where the fine old turf sloped from the open window towards a lilied pool and well-planted mounds, the heat was enough to make Celia, in her white muslin and light curls, reflect with pity on what Dodo must feel in her black dress and close cap. But this was not until some episodes with Baby were over, and had left her mind at leisure. She had seated herself and taken up a fan for some time before she said, 
in her quiet guttural, "'Dear Dodo, do throw off that cap. I am sure your dress must make you feel ill.' "'I'm so used to the cap. It has become a sort of shell,' said Dorothea, smiling. "'I feel rather bare and exposed when it is off.' "'I must see you without it. It makes us all warm,' said Celia, throwing down her fan and going to Dorothea. It was a pretty picture to see this little lady in white muslin unfastening the widow's cap from her more majestic sister and tossing it on to a chair. Just as the coils and braids of dark brown hair had been set free, Sir James entered the room. He looked at the released head and said, "'Ah!' in a tone of satisfaction. "'It was I who did it, James,' said Celia. "'Dodo need not make such a slavery of her mourning.' She need not wear that cap any more among her friends. "'My dear Celia,' said Lady Chetham, "'a widow must wear her mourning at least a year.' "'Not if she marries again before the end of it,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, who had some pleasure in startling her good friend the dowager. Sir James was annoyed, and leaned forward to play with Celia's Maltese dog. "'That is very rare, I hope,' said Lady Chetham in a tone intended to guard against such events. No friend of ours ever committed herself in that way except Mrs. Beaver, and it was very painful to Lord Grinsell when she did so. Her first husband was so objectionable, which made it the greater wonder. And severely she was punished for it. They said Captain Beaver dragged her about by the hair and held up loaded pistols at her. "'Oh, if she took the wrong man,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, who was in a decidedly wicked mood. "'Marriage is always bad, then, first or second. Priority is a poor recommendation in a husband if he has got no other. I would rather have a good second husband than an indifferent first. "'My dear, your clever tongue runs away with you,' said Lady Chetham. I am sure you would be the last woman to marry again prematurely if our dear rector were taken away. Oh, I make no vows. It might be a necessary economy. It is lawful to marry again, I suppose, else we might as well be Hindus instead of Christians. Of course, if a woman accepts the wrong man, she must take the consequences, and one who does it twice over deserves her fate. But if she can marry blood, beauty, and bravery— the sooner the better. I think the subject of our conversation is very ill-chosen, said Sir James, with a look of disgust. Suppose we change it. Not on my account, Sir James, said Dorothea, determined not to lose the opportunity of freeing herself from certain oblique references to excellent matches. If you are speaking on my behalf, I can assure you that no question can be more indifferent and impersonal to me than second marriage. It is no more to me than if you talked of women going fox-hunting. Whether it is admirable in them or not, I shall not follow them. Pray let Mrs. Cadwallader amuse herself on that subject as much as on any other. "'My dear Mrs. Casabon, said Lady Chetham, in her stateliest way, "'you do not, I hope, think that there was any allusion to you in my mentioning Mrs. Beaver. It was only an instance that occurred to me.' She was stepdaughter to Lord Grinsell. He married Mrs. Teveroy for his second wife. There could be no possible allusion to you. Oh, no, said Celia. Nobody chose the subject. It all came out of Dodo's cap. Mrs. Cadwallader only said what was quite true. A woman could not be married in a widow's cap, James. Hush, my dear, said Mrs. Cadwallader. I will not offend again. I will not even refer to Dido or Zenobia. Only, what are we to talk about? I, for my part, object to the discussion of human nature, because that is the nature of rector's wives. Later in the evening, after Mrs. Cadwallader had gone, Celia said privately to Dorothea, Really, Dodo, taking your cap off made you like yourself again in more ways than one. You spoke up just as you used to, when anything was said to displease you but I could hardly make out whether it was James that you thought wrong or Mrs. Cadwallader. Neither, said Dorothea. James spoke out of delicacy to me, but he was mistaken in supposing that I minded what Mrs. Cadwallader said. I should only mind if there were a law obliging me to take any piece of blood and beauty that she or anybody else recommended. 
But you know, Dodo, if you ever did marry, it would be all the better to have blood and beauty, said Celia, reflecting that Mr. Casaubon had not been richly endowed with those gifts, and that it would be well to caution Dorothea in time. Don't be anxious, Kitty. I have quite other thoughts about my life. I shall never marry again, said Dorothea, touching her sister's chin, and looking at her with indulgent affection. Celia was nursing her baby, and Dorothea had come to say good-night to her. "'Really? Quite?' said Celia. "'Not anybody at all? If he were very wonderful indeed?' Dorothea shook her head slowly. "'Not anybody at all. I have delightful plans. I should like to take a great deal of land and drain it, and make a little colony, where everybody should work, and all the work should be done well. I should know every one of the people and be their friend. I am going to have great consultations with Mr. Garth. He can tell me almost everything I want to know. Then you will be happy if you have a plan, Dodo, said Celia. Perhaps little Arthur will like plans when he grows up, and then he can help you. Sir James was informed that same night that Dorothea was really quite set against marrying anybody at all, and was going to take to all sorts of plans, just like what she used to have. Sir James made no remark. To his secret feeling, there was something repulsive in a woman's second marriage, and no match would prevent him from feeling it a sort of desecration for Dorothea. He was aware that the world would regard such a sentiment as preposterous, especially in relation to a woman of one-and-twenty, the practice of the world being to treat of a young widow's second marriage as certain and probably near, and to smile with meaning if the widow acts accordingly. But if Dorothea did choose to espouse her solitude, he felt that the resolution would well become her. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 How happy is he born and taught that serveth not another's will, whose armor is his honest thought, and simple truth his only skill. This man is freed from servile bands, of hope to rise or fear to fall, lord of himself, though not of lands, and having nothing, yet hath all. Sir Henry Wotton Dorothea's confidence in Caleb Garth's knowledge, which had begun on her hearing that he approved of her cottages, had grown fast during her stay at Freshet, Sir James having induced her to take rides over the two estates in company with himself and Caleb, who quite returned her admiration, and told his wife that Mrs. Casaubon had a head for business most uncommon in a woman. It must be remembered that by business Caleb never meant money transactions, but the skillful application of labor. "'Most uncommon,' repeated Caleb. She said a thing I often used to think myself when I was a lad. Mr. Garth, I should like to feel, if I lived to be old, that I had improved a great piece of land and built a great many good cottages, because the work is of a healthy kind while it is being done, and after it is done, men are the better for it. Those were the very words. She sees into things in that way. But womanly, I hope, said Mrs. Garth, half suspecting that Mrs. Casaubon might not hold the true principle of subordination. "'Oh, you can't think,' said Caleb, shaking his head. "'You would like to hear her speak, Susan. She speaks in such plain words, and a voice like music. Bless me, it reminds me of bits in the Messiah, and straightway there appeared a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying. It has a tone with it that satisfies your ear.' Caleb was very fond of music, and, when he could afford it, went to hear an oratorio that came within his reach, returning from it with a profound reverence for this mighty structure of tones, which made him sit meditatively, looking on the floor and throwing much unutterable language into his outstretched hands. With this good understanding between them, it was natural that Dorothea asked Mr. Garth to undertake any business connected with the three farms and the numerous tenements attached to Lowick Manor. Indeed, his expectation of getting work for two was being fast fulfilled. As he said, business breeds. And one form of business which was beginning to breed just then was the construction of railways. 
a projected line was to run through Lowick Parish, where the cattle had hitherto grazed, in a peace unbroken by astonishment. And thus it happened that the infant struggles of the railway system entered into the affairs of Caleb Garth, and determined the course of this history with regard to two persons who were dear to him. The submarine railway may have its difficulties, but the bed of the sea is not divided among various landed proprietors with claims for damages not only measurable but sentimental. In the hundred to which Middlemarch belonged, railways were as exciting a topic as the reform bill or the imminent horrors of cholera, and those who held the most decided views on the subject were women and landholders. Women both old and young regarded travelling by steam as presumptuous and dangerous, and argued against it by saying that nothing should induce them to get into a railway carriage, while proprietors, differing from each other in their arguments as much as Mr. Solomon Featherstone differed from Lord Midlicote, were yet unanimous in the opinion that in selling land, whether to the enemy of mankind or to a company obliged to purchase, these pernicious agencies must be made to pay a very high price to landowners for permission to injure mankind. But the slower wits, such as Mr. Solomon and Mrs. Wall, who both occupied land of their own, took a long time to arrive at this conclusion, their minds halting at the vivid conception of what it would be to cut the big pasture in two and turn it into three-cornered bits, which would be know-how, while accommodation bridges and high payments were remote and incredible. "'The cows will all cast their calves, brother,' said Mrs. Wall, in a tone of deep melancholy. "'If the railway comes across the near close, and I shouldn't wonder at the mare, too, if she was in foal. It's a poor tale if a widow's property is to be spaded away, and the law say nothing to it. What's to hinder em from cutting right and left if they begin? It's well known I can't fight. The best way would be to say nothing, and set somebody on to send em away with a flea in their ear, when they came spying and measuring, said Solomon. Folks did that about brassing, by what I can understand. It's all a pretense, if the truth was known, about their being forced to take one way. Let em go cutting in another parish. And I don't believe in any pay to make amends for bringing a lot of ruffians to trample your crops. Where's a company's pocket? Brother Peter, God forgive him, got money out of a company, said Mrs. Wall. But that was for the manganese. That wasn't for railways to blow you to pieces right and left. Well, there's this to be said, Jane, Mr. Solomon concluded, lowering his voice in a cautious manner. The more spokes we put in their wheel, the more they'll pay us to let em go on, if they must come whether or not. This reasoning of Mr. Solomon's was perhaps less thorough than he imagined, his cunning bearing about the same relation to the course of railways as the cunning of a diplomatist bears to the general chill or catarrh of the solar system. But he set about acting on his views in a thoroughly diplomatic manner by stimulating suspicion. His side of Lowick was the most remote from the village, and the houses of the laboring people were either lone cottages or were collected in a hamlet called Frick, where a water-mill and some stone pits made a little centre of slow, heavy-shouldered industry. In the absence of any precise idea as to what railways were, public opinion in Frick was against them, for the human mind in that grassy corner had not the proverbial tendency to admire the unknown, holding rather that it was likely to be against the poor man, and that suspicion was the only wise attitude with regard to it. Even the rumor of reform had not excited any millennial expectations in Frick, there being no definite promise in it, as of gratuitous grains to fatten Hiram Ford's pig, or of a publican at the weights and scales who would brew beer for nothing, or of an offer on the part of the three neighboring farmers to raise wages during winter. And without distinct good of this kind in its promises, reform seemed on a footing with the bragging of peddlers, 
which was a hint for distrust to every knowing person. The men of Frick were not ill-fed, and were less given to fanaticism than to a strong muscular suspicion, less inclined to believe that they were peculiarly cared for by heaven than to regard heaven itself as rather disposed to take them in, a disposition observable in the weather. Thus the mind of Frick was exactly the sort for Mr. Solomon Featherstone to work upon, he having more plenteous ideas of the same order, with a suspicion of heaven and earth which was better fed and more entirely at leisure. Solomon was overseer of the roads at that time, and his slow-paced cob often took his rounds by Frick to look at the workmen getting the stones there, pausing with a mysterious deliberation which might have misled you into supposing that he had some other reason for staying than the mere want of impulse to move. After looking for a long while at any work that was going on, he would raise his eyes a little and look at the horizon. Finally, he would shake his bridle, touch his horse with the whip, and get it to move slowly onward. The hour hand of a clock was quick by comparison with Mr. Solomon, who had an agreeable sense that he could afford to be slow. He was in the habit of pausing for a cautious, vaguely designing chat with every hedger or ditcher on his way, and was especially willing to listen even to news which he had heard before, feeling himself at an advantage over all narrators in partially disbelieving them. One day, however, he got into a dialogue with Hiram Ford, a wagoner, in which he himself contributed information. He wished to know whether Hiram had seen fellows with staves and instruments spying about. They called themselves railroad people, but there was no telling what they were or what they meant to do. The least they pretended was that they were going to cut Lowick Parish into sixes and sevens. "'Why, there'll be no stirrin from one place to another,' said Hiram, thinking of his wagons and horses. "'Not a bit,' said Mr. Solomon. "'And cutting up fine land such as this parish. Let them go into Tipton, say I. But there's no knowing what there is at the bottom of it. Traffic is what they put forward, but it's to do harm to the land and the poor man in the long run.' "'Why, they're lunnin chaps, I reckon,' said Hiram who had a dim notion of London as a centre of hostility to the country. Ay, to be sure, and in some parts against brassing, by what I've heard say, the folk fell on em when they were spying, and broke their peepholes as they carry, and drove em away, so as they knew better than come again. It were good fun, I'd be bound, said Hiram, whose fun was much restricted by circumstances. "'Well, I wouldn't meddle with em myself,' said Solomon. "'But some say this country's seen its best days, "'and the sign is, as it's being overrun with these fellows "'trampling right and left, and wanting to cut it up into railways, "'and all for the big traffic to swallow up the little, "'so as there shan't be a team left on the land, nor a whip to crack. "'I'll crack my whip about their earn before they bring it to that, though,' said Hiram while Mr. Solomon, shaking his bridle, moved onward. Nettleseed needs no digging. The ruin of this countryside by railroads was discussed, not only at the weights and scales, but in the hay-field, where the muster of working hands gave opportunities for talk such as were rarely had through the rural year. One morning, not long after that interview between Mr. Fairbrother and Mary Garth, in which she confessed to him, her feeling for Fred Vincy. It happened that her father had some business which took him to Yodrell's farm in the direction of Frick. It was to measure and value an outlying piece of land belonging to Lowick Manor, which Caleb expected to dispose of advantageously for Dorothea. It must be confessed that his bias was towards getting the best possible terms from railroad companies. He put up his gig at Yodrell's, and in walking with his assistant and measuring chain to the scene of his work, he encountered the party of the company's agents, who were adjusting their spirit level. After a little chat he left them, observing that by and by they would reach him again where he was going to measure. It was one of those grey mornings after light rains, 
which become delicious about twelve o'clock, when the clouds part a little, and the scent of the earth is sweet along the lanes and by the hedgerows. The scent would have been sweeter to Fred Vincy, who was coming along the lanes on horseback, if his mind had not been worried by unsuccessful efforts to imagine what he was going to do, with his father on one side, expecting him straightway to enter the church, with Mary on the other, threatening to forsake him if he did enter it, and with the working-day world showing no eager need whatever of a young gentleman without capital and generally unskilled. It was the harder to Fred's disposition because his father, satisfied that he was no longer rebellious, was in good humor with him, and had sent him on this pleasant ride to see after some greyhounds. Even when he had fixed on what he should do, there would be the task of telling his father. But it must be admitted that the fixing, which had to come first, was the more difficult task. What secular avocation on earth was there for a young man, whose friends could not get him an appointment, which was at once gentlemanly, lucrative, and to be followed without special knowledge? Riding along the lanes by Frick in this mood, and slackening his pace while he reflected whether he should venture to go round by Lowick Parsonage to call on Mary, he could see over the hedges from one field to another. Suddenly a noise roused his attention, and on the far side of a field on his left hand he could see six or seven men in smock-frocks, with hay-forks in their hands, making an offensive approach towards the four railway agents who were facing them while Caleb Garth and his assistant were hastening across the field to join the threatened group. Fred, delayed a few moments by having to find the gate, could not gallop up to the spot before the party in smock-frocks, whose work of turning the hay had not been too pressing after swallowing their midday beer, were driving the men in coats before them with their hay-forks, while Caleb Garth's assistant, a lad of seventeen, who had snatched up the spirit level at Caleb's order, had been knocked down and seemed to be lying helpless. The coated men had the advantage as runners, and Fred covered their retreat by getting in front of the smock-frocks and charging them suddenly enough to throw their chase into confusion. "'What do you confounded fools mean?' shouted Fred, pursuing the divided group in a zigzag and cutting right and left with his whip. I'll swear to every one of you before the magistrate. You've knocked the lad down and killed him, for what I know. You'll every one of you be hanged at the next assizes, if you don't mind," said Fred, who afterwards laughed heartily as he remembered his own phrases. The laborers had been driven through the gateway into their hayfield, and Fred had checked his horse when Hiram Ford, observing himself at a safe challenging distance, turned back and shouted a defiance which he did not know to be Homeric. "'You're a coward, you are. Get off your horse, young mister, and I'll have a round with you, I will. You daren't come out without your hoss and whip. I'd soon knock the breath out on you, I would.' "'Wait a minute, and I'll come back presently and have a round with you all in turn, if you like,' said Fred, who felt confidence in his power of boxing with his dearly beloved brethren but just now he wanted to hasten back to Caleb and the prostrate youth. The lad's ankle was strained, and he was in much pain from it, but he was no further hurt, and Fred placed him on the horse that he might ride to Yadril's and be taken care of there. "'Let them put the horse in the stable, and tell the surveyors they can come back for their traps,' said Fred. "'The ground is clear now.' "'No, no,' said Caleb. "'Here's a breakage.' They'll have to give up for today, and it will be as well. Here, take the things before you on the horse, Tom. They'll see you coming, and they'll turn back. I'm glad I happen to be here at the right moment, Mr. Garth, said Fred, as Tom rode away. No knowing what might have happened if the cavalry had not come up in time. Ay, ay, it was lucky, said Caleb, speaking rather absently, and looking towards the spot where he had been at work at the moment of interruption. But, deuce take it, this is what comes of men being fools. I'm hindered of my day's work. I can't get along without somebody to help me with the measuring chain. However, 
he was beginning to move towards the spot with a look of vexation, as if he had forgotten Fred's presence, but suddenly he turned round and said quickly, "'What have you got to do to-day, young fellow?' "'Nothing, Mr. Garth. I'll help you with pleasure. Can I?' said Fred, with a sense that he should be courting Mary when he was helping her father. "'Well, you mustn't mind stooping and getting hot. I don't mind anything. Only I want to go first and have a round with that hulky fellow who turned to challenge me. It would be a good lesson for him. I shall not be five minutes.' "'Nonsense!' said Caleb, with his most peremptory intonation. "'I shall go and speak to the men myself. It's all ignorance. Somebody has been telling them lies. The poor fools don't know any better.' "'I shall go with you, then,' said Fred. "'No, no, stay where you are. I don't want your young blood. I can take care of myself.' Caleb was a powerful man, and knew little of any fear except the fear of hurting others, and the fear of having to speechify but he felt it his duty at this moment to try and give a little harangue. There was a striking mixture in him, which came from his having always been a hard-working man himself, of rigorous notions about workmen and practical indulgence towards them. To do a good day's work, and to do it well, he held to be part of their welfare, as it was the chief part of his own happiness, but he had a strong sense of fellowship with them, when he advanced towards the laborers, they had not gone to work again, but were standing in that form of rural grouping which consists in each turning a shoulder towards the other, at a distance of two or three yards. They looked rather sulkily at Caleb, who walked quickly with one hand in his pocket, and the other thrust between the buttons of his waistcoat, and had his everyday mild air when he paused among them. "'Why, my lads, how's this?' he began taking, as usual, to brief phrases, which seemed pregnant to himself, because he had many thoughts lying under them, like the abundant roots of a plant that just manages to peep above the water. "'How came you to make such a mistake as this? Somebody's been telling you lies. You thought those men up there wanted to do mischief?' "'Aw,' was the answer, dropped at intervals by each according to his degree of unreadiness. "'Nonsense!' "'No such thing. They're looking out to see which way the railroad is to take. Now, my lads, you can't hinder the railroad. It will be made whether you like it or not. And if you go fighting against it, you'll get yourselves into trouble. The law gives those men leave to come here on the land. The owner has nothing to say against it, and if you meddle with them, you'll have to do with the constable and Justice Blakesley, and with the handcuffs and Middlemarch jail.' and you might be in for it now if anybody informed against you. Caleb paused here, and perhaps the greatest orator could not have chosen either his pause or his images better for the occasion. But come, you didn't mean any harm. Somebody told you the railroad was a bad thing. That was a lie. It may do a bit of harm here and there, to this and to that, and so does the sun in heaven. But the railway's a good thing, "'Ah, good for the big folks to make money out on,' said old Timothy Cooper, who had stayed behind, turning his hay while the others had been gone on their spree. "'I ain't seen lots of things turn up sin I were a young un. The war, and the peace, and the canals, and old King George, and the region, and the new King George, and the new one has got a new name. And it's been all alike to the poor man. What's the canals been to him?' They ain't brought him neither meat nor bacon nor wage to lay by, if he didn't save it with Clem in his own inside. Times have got wasser for him sin I were a young un, and so it'll be with the railroads. They'll only leave the poor man further behind. But them are fools as metal, and so I told the chaps here. This is the big folks' world, this is. But you're for the big folks, Mr. Garth, you are. Timothy was a wiry old laborer, of a type lingering in those times, who had his savings in a stocking foot, lived in a lone cottage, and was not to be wrought on by any oratory, having as little of the feudal spirit, and believing as little as if he had not been totally unacquainted with the age of reason and the rights of man. Caleb was in a difficulty known to any person attempting in dark times, and unassisted by miracle, 
to reason with rustics who are in possession of an undeniable truth which they know through a hard process of feeling, and can let it fall like a giant's club on your neatly carved argument for a social benefit which they do not feel. Caleb had no cant at command, even if he could have chosen to use it, and he had been accustomed to meet all such difficulties in no other way than by doing his business faithfully. He answered, "'If you don't think well of me, Tim, never mind. That's neither here nor there now. Things may be bad for the poor man, bad they are, but I want the lads here not to do what will make things worse for themselves. The cattle may have a heavy load, but it won't help em to throw it over into the roadside pit where it's partly their own fodder. We were only for a bit of fun, said Hiram, who was beginning to see consequences. That were all we were arter. Well, promise me not to meddle again, and I'll see that nobody informs against you. I never meddled, and I ain't no call to promise, said Timothy. No, but the rest. Come, I'm as hard at work as any of you to-day, and I can't spare much time. Say you'll be quiet without the constable. Ah, we won't meddle. They may do as they like for us, were the forms in which Caleb got his pledges, and then he hastened back to Fred, who had followed him, and watched him in the gateway. They went to work, and Fred helped vigorously. His spirits had risen, and he hardly enjoyed a good slip in the moist earth under the hedgerow, which soiled his perfect summer trousers. Was it his successful onset which had elated him, or the satisfaction of helping Mary's father? Something more. The accidents of the morning had helped his frustrated imagination to shape an employment for himself which had several attractions. I am not sure that certain fibres in Mr. Garth's mind had not resumed their old vibration towards the very end which now revealed itself to Fred, for the effect of accident is but a touch of fire when there is oil and tow, and it always appeared to Fred that the railway brought the needed touch but they went on in silence, except when their business demanded speech. At last, when they had finished and were walking away, Mr. Garth said, "'A young fellow needn't be a B.A. to do this sort of work, eh, Fred?' "'I wish I had taken to it before I had thought of being a B.A.' said Fred. He paused a moment, and then added, more hesitatingly, "'Do you think I am too old to learn your business, Mr. Garth?' "'My business is of many sorts, my boy,' said Mr. Garth, smiling. "'A good deal of what I know can only come from experience. You can't learn it off as you learn things out of a book. But you are young enough to lay a foundation yet.' Caleb pronounced the last sentence emphatically, but paused in some uncertainty. He had been under the impression lately that Fred had made up his mind to enter the church. "'You do think I could do some good at it if I were to try?' said Fred, more eagerly. "'That depends,' said Caleb, turning his head on one side and lowering his voice, with the air of a man who felt himself to be saying something deeply religious. "'You must be sure of two things. You must love your work, and must not always be looking over the edge of it, wanting your play to begin. And the other is, you must not be ashamed of your work, and think it would be more honorable to you to be doing something else. You must have a pride in your work, and in learning to do it well, and not always be saying, there's this and there's that. If I had this or that to do, I might make something of it. No matter what a man is, I wouldn't give two pence for him. Here Caleb's mouth looked bitter, and he snapped his fingers. Whether he was the prime minister or the rick thatcher, if he didn't do well what he undertook to do. "'I can never feel that I should do that in being a clergyman,' said Fred, meaning to take a step in argument. "'Then let it alone, my boy,' said Caleb abruptly, "'else you'll never be easy. Or if you are easy, you'll be a poor stick.' "'That is very nearly what Mary thinks about it,' said Fred, coloring. "'I think you must know what I feel for Mary, Mr. Garth.' I hope it does not displease you that I have always loved her better than any one else, and that I shall never love any one as I love her. The expression of Caleb's face was visibly softening while Fred spoke, but he swung his head with a solemn slowness and said, 
That makes things more serious, Fred, if you want to take Mary's happiness into your keeping. I know that, Mr. Garth, said Fred eagerly, and I would do anything for her. She says she will never have me if I go into the church, and I shall be the most miserable devil in the world if I lose all hope of Mary. Really, if I could get some other profession, business, anything that I am fit for, I would work hard, I would deserve your good opinion. I should like to have to do with outdoor things. I know a good deal about land and cattle already. I used to believe, you know, though you will think me rather foolish for it, that I should have land of my own. I am sure knowledge of that sort would come easily to me, especially if I could be under you in any way. Softly, my boy, said Caleb, having the image of Susan before his eyes. What have you said to your father about all this? Nothing yet, but I must tell him. I am only waiting to know what I can do instead of entering the church. I am very sorry to disappoint him, but a man ought to be allowed to judge for himself when he is four and twenty. How could I know when I was fifteen what it would be right for me to do now? My education was a mistake. But hearken to this, Fred, said Caleb. Are you sure Mary is fond of you, or would ever have you? I asked Mr. Fairbrother to talk to her, because she had forbidden me. I didn't know what else to do, said Fred apologetically and he says that I have every reason to hope if I can put myself in an honorable position. I mean, out of the church, I dare say you think it unwarrantable in me, Mr. Garth, to be troubling you and obtruding my own wishes about Mary, before I have done anything at all for myself. Of course I have not the least claim. Indeed, I have already a debt to you which will never be discharged, even when I have been able to pay it in the shape of money. Yes, my boy, you have a claim said Caleb, with much feeling in his voice. The young ones always have a claim on the old to help them forward. I was young myself once and had to do without much help, but help would have been welcome to me, if it had only been for the fellow feeling's sake. But I must consider. Come to me tomorrow at the office at nine o'clock, at the office, mind. Mr. Garth would take no important step without consulting Susan but it must be confessed that before he reached home he had taken his resolution. With regard to a large number of matters about which other men are decided or obstinate, he was the most easily manageable man in the world. He never knew what meat he would choose, and if Susan had said that they ought to live in a four-roomed cottage in order to save, he would have said let us go without inquiring into details but where Caleb's feeling and judgment strongly pronounced, he was a ruler, and in spite of his mildness and timidity in reproving, every one about him knew that, on the exceptional occasions when he chose, he was absolute. He never, indeed, chose to be absolute except on someone else's behalf. On ninety-nine points Mrs. Garth decided but on the hundredth she was often aware that she would have to perform the singularly difficult task of carrying out her own principle and to make herself subordinate. "'It has come round as I thought, Susan,' said Caleb, when they were seated alone in the evening. He had already narrated the adventure which had brought about Fred's sharing in his work, but had kept back the further result. "'The children are fond of each other. I mean, Fred and Mary.' Mrs. Garth laid her work on her knee, and fixed her penetrating eyes anxiously on her husband. After we'd done our work, Fred poured it out all to me. He can't bear to be a clergyman, and Mary says she won't have him if he is one, and the lad would like to be under me and give his mind to business, and I've determined to take him and make a man of him. Caleb, said Mrs. Garth, in a deep contralto, expressive of resigned astonishment. "'It's a fine thing to do,' said Mr. Garth, settling himself firmly against the back of his chair and grasping the elbows. "'I shall have trouble with him, but I think I shall carry it through. The lad loves Mary, and a true love for a good woman is a great thing, Susan. It shapes many a rough fellow.' "'Has Mary spoken to you on the subject?' said Mrs. Garth, secretly a little hurt that she had to be informed on it herself. "'Not a word.' 
I asked her about Fred once, I gave her a bit of warning, but she assured me that she would never marry an idle, self-indulgent man, nothing since. But it seems Fred set on Mr. Fairbrother to talk to her, because she had forbidden him to speak himself, and Mr. Fairbrother has found out that she is fond of Fred, but says he must not be a clergyman. Fred's heart is fixed on Mary, that I can see. It gives me a good opinion of the lad, and we always liked him, Susan. It's a pity for Mary, I think, said Mrs. Garth. Why a pity? Because, Caleb, she might have had a man who is worth twenty Fred Vincy's. Ah, said Caleb, with surprise. I firmly believe that Mr. Fairbrother is attached to her, and meant to make her an offer. But, of course, now that Fred has used him as an envoy, there is an end to that better prospect. There was a severe precision in Mrs. Garth's utterance. She was vexed and disappointed, but she was bent on abstaining from useless words. Caleb was silent a few moments under a conflict of feelings. He looked at the floor and moved his head and hands in accompaniment to some inward argumentation. At last he said, "'That would have made me very proud and happy, Susan, and I should have been glad for your sake. I've always felt that your belongings have never been on a level with you. But you took me, though I was a plain man. I took the best and cleverest man I had ever known, said Mrs. Garth, convinced that she would never have loved any one who came short of that mark. Well, perhaps others thought you might have done better. But it would have been worse for me. And that is what touches me close about Fred. The lad is good at bottom, and clever enough to do, if he's put in the right way and he loves and honors my daughter beyond anything, and she has given him a sort of promise, according to what he turns out. I say that young man's soul is in my hand, and I'll do the best I can for him, so help me God. It's my duty, Susan. Mrs. Garth was not given to tears, but there was a large one rolling down her face before her husband had finished. It came from the pressure of various feelings, in which there was much affection and some vexation. She wiped it away quickly, saying, "'Few men besides you would think it a duty to add to their anxieties in that way, Caleb.' "'That signifies nothing, what other men would think. I've got a clear feeling inside me, and that I shall follow. And I hope your heart will go with me, Susan, in making everything as light as can be to marry, poor child.' Caleb, leaning back in his chair, looked with anxious appeal towards his wife. She rose and kissed him, saying, "'God bless you, Caleb. Our children have a good father.' But she went out and had a hearty cry to make up for the suppression of her words. She felt sure that her husband's conduct would be misunderstood, and about Fred she was rational and unhopeful. What would turn out to have more foresight in it? her rationality, or Caleb's ardent generosity. When Fred went to the office the next morning, there was a test to be gone through which he was not prepared for. "'Now, Fred,' said Caleb, "'you will have some desk work. I have always done a good deal of writing myself, but I can't do without help, and as I want you to understand the accounts and get the values into your head, I mean to do without another clerk. So you must buckle too.' How are you at writing and arithmetic? Fred felt an awkward movement of the heart. He had not thought of desk work, but he was in a resolute mood and not going to shrink. I'm not afraid of arithmetic, Mr. Garth. It always came easily to me. I think you know my writing. Let us see, said Caleb, taking up a pen, examining it carefully and handing it, well dipped, to Fred with a sheet of ruled paper. Copy me a line or two of that valuation, with the figures at the end. At that time the opinion existed that it was beneath a gentleman to write legibly, or with a hand in the least suitable to a clerk. Fred wrote the lines demanded in a hand as gentlemanly as that of any viscount or bishop of the day. The vowels were all alike, and the consonants only distinguishable as turning up or down. The strokes had a blotted solidity and the letters disdained to keep the line. In short, 
it was a manuscript of that venerable kind, easy to interpret when you know beforehand what the writer means. As Caleb looked on, his visage showed a growing depression, but when Fred handed him the paper he gave something like a snarl, and wrapped the paper passionately with the back of his hand. Bad work like this dispelled all Caleb's mildness. "'The deuce!' he exclaimed snarlingly. "'To think that this is a country where a man's education may cost hundreds and hundreds, and turns you out this!' Then, in a more pathetic tone, pushing up his spectacles and looking at the unfortunate scribe, "'The Lord have mercy on us, Fred. I can't put up with this.' "'What can I do, Mr. Garth?' said Fred, whose spirits had sunk very low, not only at the estimate of his handwriting, but at the vision of himself as liable to be ranked with office clerks. "'Do? Why, you must learn to form your letters and keep the line. What's the use of writing at all if nobody can understand it?' asked Caleb, energetically, quite preoccupied with the bad quality of the work. "'Is there so little business in the world that you must be sending puzzles over the country? But that's the way people are brought up. I should lose no end of time with the letters some people send me, if Susan did not make them out for me. It's disgusting.' Here Caleb tossed the paper from him. Any stranger peeping into the office at that moment might have wondered what was the drama between the indignant man of business and the fine-looking young fellow whose blond complexion was getting rather patchy as he bit his lip with mortification. Fred was struggling with many thoughts. Mr. Garth had been so kind and encouraging at the beginning of their interview that gratitude and hopefulness had been at a high pitch, and the downfall was proportionate. He had not thought of desk work. In fact, like the majority of young gentlemen, he wanted an occupation which should be free from disagreeables. I cannot tell what might have been the consequences if he had not distinctly promised himself that he would go to Lowick and see Mary and tell her that he was engaged to work under her father. He did not like to disappoint himself there. I am very sorry, were all the words that he could muster. But Mr. Garth was already relenting. We must make the best of it, Fred, he began with a return to his usual quiet tone. Every man can learn to write. I taught myself. Go at it with a will, and sit up at night if the daytime isn't enough. We'll be patient, my boy. Callum shall go on with the books for a bit while you are learning. But now I must be off, said Caleb, rising. You must let your father know our agreement. You'll save me Callum's salary, you know, when you can write and I can afford to give you eighty pounds for the first year, and more after. When Fred made the necessary disclosure to his parents, the relative effect on the two was a surprise which entered very deeply into his memory. He went straight from Mr. Garth's office to the warehouse, rightly feeling that the more respectful way in which he could behave to his father was to make the painful communication as gravely and formally as possible. Moreover, the decision would be more certainly understood to be final if the interview took place in his father's gravest hours, which were always those spent in his private room at the warehouse. Fred entered on the subject directly, and declared briefly what he had done and was resolved to do, expressing at the end his regret that he should be the cause of disappointment to his father, and taking the blame on his own deficiencies. The regret was genuine and inspired Fred with strong, simple words. Mr. Vincy listened in profound surprise without uttering even an exclamation, a silence which in his impatient temperament was a sign of unusual emotion. He had not been in good spirits about trade that morning, and the slight bitterness in his lips grew intense as he listened. When Fred had ended, there was a pause of nearly a minute, during which Mr. Vincy replaced a book in his desk and turned the key emphatically. Then he looked at his son steadily and said, "'So you've made up your mind at last, sir?' "'Yes, father.' "'Very well. Stick to it. I've no more to say. You've thrown away your education and gone down a step in life when I had given you the means of rising. That's all.' "'I am very sorry that we differ, father.' 
I think I can be quite as much of a gentleman at the work I have undertaken as if I had been a curate, but I am grateful to you for wishing to do the best for me. Very well, I have no more to say. I wash my hands of you. I only hope, when you have a son of your own, he will make a better return for the pains you spend on him. This was very cutting to Fred. His father was using that unfair advantage possessed by us all when we are in a pathetic situation and see our own past as if it were simply part of the pathos. In reality, Mr. Vincy's wishes about his son had had a great deal of pride, inconsiderateness, and egoistic folly in them. But still the disappointed father held a strong lever, and Fred felt as if he were being banished with a malediction. "'I hope you will not object to my remaining at home, sir,' he said, after rising to go. "'I shall have a sufficient salary to pay for my board, as, of course, I should wish to do.' "'Board be hanged,' said Mr. Vincy, recovering himself in his disgust at the notion that Fred's keep would be missed at his table. "'Of course your mother will want you to stay. But I shall keep no horse for you, you understand, and you will pay your own tailor.' You will do with a suit or two less, I fancy, when you have to pay for him. Fred lingered. There was still something to be said. At last it came. I hope you will shake hands with me, father, and forgive the vexation I have caused you. Mr. Vincy, from his chair, threw a quick glance upward at his son, who had advanced near to him, and then gave his hand, saying hurriedly, Yes, yes, let us say no more. Fred went through much more narrative and explanation with his mother, but she was inconsolable, having before her eyes what perhaps her husband had never thought of, the certainty that Fred would marry Mary Garth, that her life would henceforth be spoiled by a perpetual infusion of Garths and their ways, and that her darling boy, with his beautiful face and stylish air, beyond anybody else's son in Middlemarch, would be sure to get like that family in plainness of appearance and carelessness about his clothes. To her it seemed that there was a Garth conspiracy to get possession of the desirable Fred, but she dared not enlarge on this opinion, because a slight hint of it had made him fly out at her as he had never done before. Her temper was too sweet for her to show any anger, but she felt that her happiness had received a bruise, and for several days merely to look at Fred had made her cry a little, as if he were the subject of some baleful prophecy. Perhaps she was the slower to recover her usual cheerfulness, because Fred had warned her that she must not reopen the sore question with his father, who had accepted his decision and forgiven him. If her husband had been vehement against Fred, she would have been urged into defense of her darling. It was the end of the fourth day when Mr. Vincy said to her, "'Come, Lucy, my dear, don't be so downhearted. You always have spoiled the boy, and you must go on spoiling him.' "'Nothing ever did cut me so before, Vincy,' said the wife, her fair throat and chin beginning to tremble again. "'Only his illness.' "'Pooh, pooh, never mind. We must expect to have trouble with our children.' Don't make it worse by letting me see you out of spirits. Well, I won't, said Mrs. Vincy, roused by this appeal and adjusting herself with the little shake as of a bird which lays down its ruffled plumage. It won't do to begin making a fuss about one, said Mr. Vincy, wishing to combine a little grumbling with domestic cheerfulness. There's Rosamond as well as Fred. Yes, poor thing. I'm sure I felt for her being disappointed of her baby, but she got over it nicely. Baby, poof! I can see Lydgate is making a mess of his practice, and getting into debt, too, by what I hear. I shall have Rosamond coming to me with a pretty tale one of these days. But they'll get no money from me, I know. Let his family help him. I never did like that marriage. But it's no use talking." Ring the bell for lemons, and don't look dull any more, Lucy. I'll drive you and Louisa to Riverston tomorrow. End of chapter 56